This audio presentation of the Voice of Isis by the Teacher of the Order of Christian Mystics is brought to you by AudioEnlightenment.com, copyright 2016, all rights reserved. Dedication. This edition is lovingly dictated to the memory of the founders of the Order of Christian Mystics, Pyramos and Ramiam, and to the Teacher of the Order, who on earth was called Helena Petrova Blavatsky. Preface. The path to mastery is marked by the severest self-discipline, absolute obedience, and unswerving allegiance to the chosen teacher or guru. Throughout the ages, this training has been administered most rigorously by various teachers, societies, and brotherhoods, so much so that the neophyte, once having pledged himself to any one occult school or teacher, was dominated as what he could eat, wear, do, think, and believe, having almost no freedom of body or mind. Such training was necessary in the past, and still is for some. The helpfulness of that method consisted in bringing the student to a realization of the greatness of his calling, the littleness of the personal self, the emptiness of the pleasures of sense, and the barrenness of physical life as compared with the fullness and glory of spiritual attainment. While the Order of the Fifteen recognizes that the occult law back of the outer observances required by former movements is as true today as ever, and that discipline, obedience, and faithfulness are as requisite today as of old, Still being an advanced order, it must employ advanced methods for attaining the same ends. The Objects of the Order of the Fifteen Object 1. Complete Individuality Through Union with the Higher Self The Order of the Fifteen is put forth to gather together those who are willing to face themselves and who are sufficiently advanced to consciously take into their own hands the responsibility for the disciplining of their lives those souls who are earnestly attracted to its teachings and will ultimately be drawn into its ranks and those who in former lives have passed through the severe disciplining and personal training mentioned above and hence should be ready to recognize the necessity for discipline and desire the conscious realization of the higher life so sincerely as to be willing to make its attainment their chief aim in life. They must give the same implicit obedience, not blind, but that which is born of perfect confidence and the same unswerving allegiance to their teachers of old. This time not because of vows to an earthly teacher or brotherhood enforced by penalty, but voluntarily and gladly, with no human voice to command and no great personality to follow. For in this case the teacher whom they must learn to recognize and obey is their own divine Father in heaven, their higher self, who speaks to them in the sanctuary of their own hearts. The ideal put forth by this order is therefore one of constant self-mastery and obedience to the personal guidance from within, and prompted by the earnest desire for spiritual growth and the ability to help humanity to a greater realization of the Christ consciousness. The teachings of this order are entirely constructive, for if only the true is persistently put forth, the false will disappear of itself. This teaching is the acme of individualism mastery, the manifestation of the real self for the individual and the acme of oneness for the race. Necessarily, the fundamental assumption of this teaching is the possibility of each soul coming into conscious personal touch, not only with his own Father in Heaven, but also with those great souls, the masters of love and wisdom, who are the elder brothers and guardians of the race. The Order of the Fifteen is one of the avenues through which these great souls are working to lead their followers into personal relationship. It is a testing ground for those who have passed the test of enforced discipline, an opportunity for them to prove their ability and willingness to follow the guidance that comes from within. Naturally, many are called, but few are chosen, for only those are finally chosen and admitted to full membership, who have proven their ability to stand firm and be trained to work unselfishly for humanity along the special lines laid down by this order through its agents. It is a far more advanced step to voluntarily give love, fidelity, and obedience to a teacher because your own soul recognizes the source of these teachings, the objects of the movement, and the sacrifice necessarily made by these agents that you may receive the teachings, than to give such allegiance because of any form of compulsion. Object 2. Personal Training in the Philosophy of Life the personal training of each pupil is carried on partly on the inner planes and partly by correspondence with the teacher of the order through the secretary. Such correspondence is open to all who need personal help with the problems of their soul life. The answers will contain explanations of the spiritual laws which apply to the individual needs of the pupil. Definite commands will not be given, for the training is designed to foster in the individual perfect freedom of choice 
and to develop the strength of will necessary voluntarily to apply the law to his own problems. The letters are signed by the secretary merely as an agent of the teacher, and only if the intuition of the pupil can grasp the fact that the instruction given is more than the human wisdom of the agents can its real significance be appreciated. Necessarily, such letters are more or less cryptic, and hence require meditation, that the light of intuition may reveal their true meaning. The method of teaching employed by the teacher of this order is one in which praise and flattery of the pupil plays little part. Rather, the teacher points out the stumbling blocks in this pupil's path to realization, and tests both his intuition, his sincerity, and his humility. Only the determined and the courageous can win final victory. Object number three a higher standard of purity on all planes. It is comparatively easy for one who is determined to lead the Christ life to curb his grosser passions, refrain from acts of impurity and injustice, and lead what the world calls an upright life. But the requirements for entering the mysteries are far more exacting. Ere he can safely enter the more advanced stages of occultism, he must learn to control the currents of his thoughts, as well as his words and acts. Hence, the Order of the Fifteen helps its pupils to gain a higher conception of purity in all planes, especially in their ideas in regard to the use of the great creative force. Object 4. The Esoteric Interpretation of the Bible While many orders, societies, and organizations base their teachings upon various Eastern scriptures or medieval teaching, this order teaches that the Christian Bible contains the same spiritual teachings and the same occult philosophy found in the older scripture. Furthermore, it is couched in terms which appeal to the Western type of mind once the esoteric key to its symbology and mysticism is known. This key, the Order of the Fifteen gives to its students, thus enabling them to apply the underlying laws of every parable, allegory, and miracle to their own spiritual growth. Object 5. Training the Senses to Respond to Vibrations from All Planes this order offers no formulas or exercise for developing psychic powers, teaching that all such faculties should evolve gradually as a natural result of normal spiritual growth. Hence, they should not be sought for or forced through special forms of concentration or sitting for development, etc. But as the soul evolves, the senses must respond to higher notes of vibration and awaken to higher states of consciousness. When this occurs, the pupil must be taught both how to protect himself from the many dangers of the psychic realm, and also how to make the best use of the newly acquired powers in furthering his spiritual growth. Perhaps the earliest recognition the pupil has of the divine guidance of his Father in Heaven is through symbolic dreams and visions. The teacher of the order aids the pupil in interpreting such spiritual lessons until he is sufficiently versed in the language of symbology and methods of interpretation to grasp the lesson for himself. This work is a part of the personal correspondence with the teacher of the order. Object 6. Preparation for the Coming World Teacher, the Avatar Like nearly all advanced thinkers along spiritual lines and all advanced spiritual movements of today, the Order of the Fifteen expects a great spiritual teacher to appear on earth during the early years of this century. Hence, one of the main objects of this order is so to train its pupils that, through their own intuitions, they may learn to recognize and respond to the influence of that great teacher upon the higher planes, so that when the days of the famine come, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord, the days when they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, the days which precede the coming of the Avatar, they shall not be deceived, but shall find and know. Only by a recognition of the great teacher upon the higher planes, or by recognizing him through his teachings, can humanity hope to know him when he appears in the flesh. Object 7. Special Training in Recognizing the Oneness of Truth Wherever Found While we have heard much of universal brotherhood and its various methods of attainment, from the reign of terror to the present day, still this order teaches a new conception of this much-to-be-desired state. Since the human race reflects truth, like a diamond reflects light, through many facets, universal brotherhood can never be achieved by all men thinking alike. Nor do we believe such an achievement desirable, for in nature we find perfect brotherhood expressed in many forms. The oak and the violet at its root receive the life force from the same soil, air, water, and sunshine, yet each develop to perfection. In the same way, the order of the fifteen strives to send out the one life and permits each soul to assimilate it, and grow to the perfection of his own individuality and perfect freedom. Hence our idea of universal brotherhood is universal recognition of the oneness of truth in its various expressions or unity and diversity, 
thereby manifesting perfect tolerance towards all. Introduction How often would I have gathered thy children together, as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not? The Egyptians recognized and adored the productive principle, both in nature and in man, under the symbol of Isis, the universal mother, the power of bringing forth in humanity the divine child or the Christ. The title of this volume indicates that its teachings are designed to bring forth in humanity a new conception of the spiritual life through the development of the mother love, the divine feminine principle of the soul, which brings forth in the daily life. Isis was also called the mother of God, the celestial virgin, and the queen of heaven, just as her counterpart, the Virgin Mary, is among Christian peoples, and was usually represented carrying in her hand the crux ansata. It was none other than Cyril, bishop of Alexandria, who openly embraced the cause of Isis and anthropomorphized her into Mary, mother of God. While we do not worship Isis or Mary as a personality, yet we recognize that which they symbolize, for it is only by a recognition of the mother principle of love and compassion that we can bring forth the Christ child individually in our hearts and lives, and collectively in humanity. Heretofore, most teachings of the religio-philosophic character have been given out as a form from the intellectual or father aspect of truth, and have in a measure appalled humanity by a sense of the great gulfs to be crossed and the great heights to be attained ere the father's house is reached. But in this volume the teachings are presented as from the lips of a loving, tender mother taking her children into her arm, weak, sinful, and disobedient though they be, and helping them over the hard places by teaching them at her knee how, by the mastery of the little things of daily life, they shall, step by step, attain to the status of the divine manhood exemplified in the Father. This volume is composed of the monthly lessons sent out by the Order of the Fifteen, considerably elaborated and enlarged. The lessons in this volume will no longer be issued separately in pamphlet form. These teachings are presented in love and compassion with the earnest desire to sympathize with and help upward and onward the mother's struggling sons and daughters. The Great Mother holds out her arms to all her children, be they pagan, Jew, Christian, or non-Christian, recognizing that each child must feed at its mother's breast and partake of the milk of her love and sympathy no matter what the circumstance of his or her physical life or what their religious training. These teachings will appeal most strongly to those whose hearts can recognize the great mother love now being poured upon the world to prepare it for the coming of the great spiritual teacher or avatar who is soon to appear and who will promulgate the teachings for the coming sixth sub-race and prepare a nucleus for the great sixth race. Chapter 1. Life's Duties Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Ecclesiastics 9.10 Believe thou not that sitting in dark forests, in proud seclusion and apart from men, believe thou not that life of roots and plants, that thirst assuaged with the snow from the great range, believe thou not, O devotee, that this will lead thee to the goal of fine liberation, from the voice of silence. Many students of the higher life find themselves surrounded by conditions which absolutely preclude their devoting themselves to study and to the observances which seem necessary for self-development. Life often seems to press so heavily upon them that both body and mind are weary to the point of exhaustion, and both men and women are reduced to the state of beasts of burden. Yet even here let us seek a remedy. There are two classes of duties, the real duties which must be performed, and the mere superfluidities of life which are wont to call duties, but which we voluntarily impose upon ourselves. No real duty is given you which you have not the strength to perform, or without a purpose to be gained by its performance. Real duties do not exhaust you, for as thy days, so shall thy strength be. Instead of letting any duty arouse in your mind the thought that it can by any possibility separate you from the inner light, or from your spiritual development, or your real advance along the path, or prevent you from drawing close and learning wisdom at the Master's feet, realize that it would be impossible for you to take one step onward while you are leaving any real duty undone. But to attain true renunciation of action without devotion through action is difficult. O thou of mighty arms, while the devotee who is engaged in the right practice of his duties approach the Supreme Spirit in no long time. The second class are imaginary duties or self-imposed tasks, which cater only to superfluities and are fulfilled simply to propitiate the world's opinion. 
The first duty of each student of the higher life is to make a careful analysis and decide what are real and what are superficial duties, then to so order his life that the real, vital, and first duty of caring for his immortal soul will not be crowded out. To do this, he must look upon duty in a new light. Many persons, recognizing the false light in which duty has been presented, strive to do away with it altogether, saying that nothing should be done that is not a joyful service. While we agree with this view for a certain stage of development, still it is often necessary to require children to perform duties which later in life they find to be a joyful service. All real duties confront you because in your evolution you have set up conditions which make just these tasks necessary to build into your soul certain qualities in which you are lacking. In short, they are the result of the great law of karma, and without the lessons they teach, your character is incomplete. Hence, they are the things which, when they are performed, and to the qualities they are meant to develop are incorporated into your being, will give you the strength and ability to take your next step. We hear many say the household cares or business duties occupy so much of their time that they cannot find time to enter the silence. Hence, there is no use trying to live the higher life, since the many interruptions make it impossible. Instead of taking such an attitude of mind, realize that such duties and interruptions are your task and make them yield you your lesson. Every morning select some text or thought and fix your mind upon it during the day, making every task, be it ever so trifling, yield something toward the main idea. If you are seeking poise, take for your daily meditation the thought of divine love. Think of this expressing itself as calmness, unchanged and unmoved by anything. If constant interruptions occur, realize that perhaps they furnish just the lesson you need, that is, the power to remain calm interiorly in the face of outward activity. Since all real duties are your task, in them lies your opportunity, and in their proper performance lies your victory. Not in the performance merely, but in the attitude of mind you hold toward them and the manner of their performance. If you perform a duty because you are compelled to and fail to incorporate its lesson in your heart, at your next step, you will find yourself confronted by another duty of the same general character, but far more difficult of performance. And this will continue until you not only perform the duty, but gain the lacking quality of soul this duty is intended to inculcate. If business cares seem to hold you in a net of sordid money-getting, learn from them the lesson of persistence, that just as no complication in business life can daunt you, so in your spiritual life nothing can prevent you from obtaining spiritual gold. Teach your subconscious mind to know and to realize that only that which can be brought to the Christ for his blessings is legitimate. Learn to have faith that you shall achieve if you learn this lesson. There was one real duty which confronts all students of the higher life that cannot be ignored, that is, to decide just what avenue of help is most beneficial, not only to their own advancement, but also the one which brings the greatest amount of practical help to humanity. It is not enough to say that you can gain good from all sources. For while that may be true, still your personal development is not the first duty that confronts you, for that comes as a result of living the Christ life and trying to help humanity. While you should do the individual duties presented to you, you should also lend your forces to increase the power of the organized movement put forth by the Masters of Wisdom for the help of humanity. Such organized movements are like great rivers which, although they depend upon teeny springs and streamlets for volume, yet unite these into something far different from and far greater usefulness than the individual springs and streamlets contributing to them. Hence your first duty is conscientiously, prayfully, and earnestly to seek for the special channel through which you desire to help humanity. And when found, throw in that channel all you have to give, whether it be money, the easy of all things to give, or love, devotion, and thought, or service. Fear not to seek. The pilgrim, who would cool his weary limbs in running water, yet dares not plunge for terror of the stream, risks to succumb from heat. Inaction, based on selfish fear, can bear but evil fruit. No soul can consciously advance who is not helping in the uplifting of all. If you cannot find time to enter the silence, still no power in heaven and earth can keep the silence from entering into you if you will let it, for the silence is the peace of God that passes understanding. While doing the duties of the day, your mind need not be chained to them. It is not what your hands are doing, but what your heart is worshipping that determines your growth. If you make business or household cares your God, you will of necessity retard your more rapid spiritual advance. For as long as you are worshipping a false God, your spiritual evolution is being retarded. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. 
If, on the contrary, you make of your duties stepping stones to the real worship of your heart, you will find them a great help. Hands and mind may both be occupied by well using them and in the very performing of the task, and because it is hampering, you must dive deep into the divine and seek in your own heart for the sustaining power and not depend upon earthly surroundings to bring it to you. Just as a tree which finds itself planted in the crevice of a rock must send its roots deep down to seek the streams that are hidden from sight, ere it can maintain its growth. Under such circumstances the tree often attains greater perfection than one planted on the plain, for the streams that run deep are refreshing and uncontaminated and are unfailing. If you are persistent and determined in this seeking, you will gain more growth from meeting everything as it comes to you than one who can sit for hours in silence, yet who has not learned to control the children of his own brain. There is no duty higher than the one which lies nearest, provided it be a real duty. It is not a real duty to try to relieve another from doing his plain duty, for it is better to do one's own duty, even though it be devoid of excellence, than to perform another duty's well. It is better to perish in performance of one's own duty. The duty of another is full of danger. Like the children of Israel, who had each to gather manna for himself alone, and could gather only enough for one day, so is each one given strength to perform all the real duties of each day. But if this strength is wasted in assumed duties, or is used up in doing for another that which is necessary for his development that he do for himself, then you are depleted in your duties, like the manna gathered in excess, become a menace to your growth rather than a help. The object of evolution is to gain wisdom out of every condition. Whatever the condition that confronts you, know well that it will never leave you until you have gained the wisdom it is intended to teach. Everything that comes to you in the way of trouble and sorrow is simply the result of your own shortcoming or lack of some soul quality which only such experience can teach you. In fact, this is the underlying idea of karma. Not that it is a punishment or even an inevitable law of suffering which you must endure to the end but that in the course of your evolution your higher self finds that you lack certain soul qualities, hence chooses to incarnate in certain families and under certain conditions which will bring out the soul qualities which are lacking. If you refuse to recognize the lesson or run away from the conditions ere they are conquered, you will have to meet them again and again in various forms in this and other lives until a victory is gained. Remember that the hard conditions of the environment are deliberately chosen by the soul that it may quickly gain the qualities needed. The instant this is done, the law is fulfilled. Hence there is no karma or anything else that can hold you to those conditions. Only thus can you find self-poise, for self-poise is the result of self-knowledge. The instant you begin to see that it is yourself who is responsible for all the disturbing influences that are around you, and that it rests with you to correct them, then you have begun in the right way to gain self-poise. The first thing to be gained is self-recognition. When buffeted by circumstance, you are apt to blame your suffering upon your conditions or upon others, or to think some divine power is punishing you. For it is most difficult to face yourself and recognize that the trouble lies in you. But while this is difficult to realize, still it is comforting to know that if the fault is within, the remedy also lies within. Once recognize this and really learn the lesson, not only mentally but intuitively, and you no longer have to experience the adverse conditions. When an earthen vessel is to be used, only a certain amount of fire is needed to harden and prepare the clay. But if it is a golden vessel to be placed upon the king's table, it must pass through a seven-time heated furnace, and be hammered and tested and purified until the gold is without a flaw, that it must be fashioned into the shape best adapted to its purpose. So is it with the vessel of clay which we call our personality. There must be all kinds of vessels, and each must have the preparation best adapted to its use. All wisdom gained from earthly experience is meant to help unfold your dormant faculties and make the personality one with its Father in Heaven. There is nothing that confronts you that is not a step in this great journey called the cycle of necessity. Therefore realize that it is not your task or duties that weary you or retard your evolution, but your attitude of mind toward them. The permitting of everyday trifles to so occupy your mind that you never let them go. The little joys of life are just as satisfying as the little cares are annoying. While you are facing the little cares, watch out for the little joys. Many little joys wake the heart until like a glorious blossom it opens to the sun. 
If you dwell in the little joys, they run together and soon break out in a mighty soul-satisfying happiness, which will be like a strong, deep undercurrent of joy, bearing you through all the cares and sorrows of life. Remember this, and begin at once to look for every ripple of sunshine. Open the doors and let it in. In every heart there is a well so deep and still that it can reflect only one star at a time. And this star, whatever it is, for the first time it is reflected there, the guiding star of your destiny. Just as a great telescope can sweep the heavens and focus upon any star desired, so can you have for your ruling star anything you determine to focus upon. If your star be household worries, a desire to live in the same style as your neighbors, to expand your business, or the love and worship of money, or any other condition, even the worship of a personality, while it rains it shuts out the light from all other stars. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Whatever it is that is reflected in this deep well of your innermost heart is the God you are worshipping. For worship is constant thought of the thing worshipped, a constant filling of the undercurrents of your mind with it, laying upon the shrine an offering to which you worship of your best efforts and thoughts. Whatever it is that occupies these deep undercurrents, whatever is poured into the deep places of your nature, even subconsciously, something that is always there no matter how busy you may be on the surface, that is what you are worshipping, for it is that which you are giving your life and thought force to create. By these currents of force you are literally molding the atoms of your bodies into vehicles through which that which you worship can manifest. You also create around you an auric world in which your dominant thought will be king and all else subservient, no matter how much lip service is given to other things. There is only one thing that you can rightly place in the holy sanctuary and hope that it will dwell there forever, and that is the Christ. Let the Christ be king over all your thoughts, aspirations, and desires, and all things shall be cared for. He who seeth me in all things, and all things in me, loosen not his hold on me, and I forsake him not. And whosoever, believing in spiritual unity, worship me who am in all things, dwelleth with me in whatsoever conditions he may be. The little things of life may occupy the service of your thoughts, but underneath all, in the holy sanctuary, the Christ dwelleth, and the Christ careth for all things. Your home, your children, your business, your petty cares are all but ripples on the surface, while deep down in the shrine of your heart dwells the Christ. Once having found this holy of holies and placed there in the one who alone is worthy of your worship, no matter how busy you are or how occupied with worldly cares, in an instant your consciousness can enter that sacred place and find rest and peace and communion. Then nothing can really fret you, for you carry the silence within you, the winds and tempest of earth only ripple a surface. In the deep places all is peace and calm. You have no fear, for you have entered the silence and have felt the strength and comfort and power of the Christ within. You know that his love pervades your life and all are safe in his keeping. All things are safe and sure. The trials of your business and your home do not upset you now, for you know how to keep calm, where to find peace. The moment you find yourself getting disturbed, slip back into this calm, quiet interior place and find refreshment. Let the radiance of the center fill your life. The Christ is there, and no matter how the storm rages on the surface, or how you rock in the little boat of your personality on the storm-tossed sea of life, Still you know that at the first call for help you will see the Christ walking on the water and will hear the command, Peace, be still. Chapter 2 The Cycle of Fulfillment And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. St. Matthew 29.30 the year 1912 marks the beginning of the most important era in the history of the world. As the earth, in its yearly journey around the sun, passes through a sign of the zodiac each month, so does our solar system, during its great journey around the central sun of this universe, pass through each sign of the zodiac. But in this greater cycle, instead of a month, our solar system requires approximately 2,107 years to traverse each sign. In this great journey, our solar system has reached and is now entering the sign Aquarius, the man from the east, one of the four sacred symbols of Ezekiel and the Apocalypse, also one of the four great divisions of the mundane cross. On February 7, 1912, the mystic planet Uranus also entered this sign in its own house, where it will remain about seven years. 
Hence the year 1912 marks the beginning of the first period of the cycle of fulfillment for this present sub-race. The word fulfillment sends a thrill of joy through the heart, but let us consider a wider meaning of the word. A fulfillment is a just compensation for that which has been accomplished or attempted, a reaping of that which has been sown, both good and evil. A fulfillment is not a recompense for mere suffering endured, for suffering of itself has no purifying or uplifting power. It is uplifting only when the lesson which necessitated has been learned, and the lacking soul quality has been built into the character. This planet has passed through much suffering and has had its lessons to learn, both as a living entity, the informing principle of the planet, and through its inhabitants. Moses, the great lawgiver, commanded the Lord's chosen people that, after the completion of every seventh Sabbath of years, they should celebrate the following year as a year of jubilee. This mystic cycle observed literally every fiftieth year has the same significance as the cycle of fulfillment. During the year of Jubilee all debtors were released from prison and all slaves set free. And in this cycle of fulfillment all the forces, powers, and capacities within the individual, the race, and the planet, which have been imprisoned for indebtedness to the law, will be released. This does not mean, however, that any will be exempted from paying karmic debts but that those who were in prison to the law for debts will be released or given an opportunity to work them out during this period. The lower aspects of all these powers and forces must first be reaped and the adjustment made upon the lower planes ere the higher phases of the fulfillment can be brought about. The reaping of the harvest has already begun, but ere it can be garnered into the great granary it must pass through the winnowing, the chaff and dirt must be blown away, and only the golden grain remain. The elements have been cast into the crucible, and the fires must burn until all the baser elements rise to the surface and are removed ere the gold can be purified for the king's use. The influence of Uranus in Aquarius will bring to the world many great and sudden changes, both in the physical condition of the planet and in the mental and psychic realm of its inhabitants. A partial cataclysm occurs at the close of every age, of the world, I say, which does not destroy the latter, but only changes its general appearance. New races of men and animals and a new floor evolve from the disillusion of the precedent ones. The earth will have to endure not only changes in climate, terrible storms and disasters of every sort, but also cataclysmic changes in its crust ere the adjustment to the new vibration is accomplished and the earth is prepared as a dwelling place for the new humanity. The great law of divine harmony is forever working in a sevenfold manner as 1. Order 2. Compensation 3. Karma four vibration, five cycles, six polarity, and seven balance. It will be noted that vibration stands in the center of these manifestations of the law. It is Fohat, the breath of eternal motion, or Thor's hammer, the swat sticker, by the action of which the sparks of life are thrown off. The seven aspects are like separate ingredients put into a vessel that bread may be made until the motion of mixing or vibration brings about an amalgamation and change of conditions in the ingredients. They do not become dough, but remain flour, yeast, salt, water, etc. Thus, through vibration, must the law in its entirety bring about the fulfillment of all earth conditions. Everything from the planets to the tiniest grain of sand or microscopic bacterium has its rate of vibration or keynote and its cyclic motion. The orbits of the planets may be called their cycles of vibration the wavelength of their oscillation, but within these greater oscillations there are many, many lesser vibrations or cycles, as the minute and the second vibrate within the hour. A windstorm has its rate of vibration or keynote, and everything within its path, while vibrating to its own keynote, must vibrate in harmony with the dominant note of the storm or be swept away. This planet is fulfilling the law as vibration and cycle has reached a point in the zodiac where it is entering into new conditions where it must respond to a new keynote, its cycle of fulfillment, and fulfill the law in its entirety or be swept away. As it responds to this new vibration, everything upon it must accommodate itself to the new conditions. The failure of certain factors to adapt themselves will bring about the storms and cataclysmic changes, which will adjust conditions to the new note with startling suddenness, just as a tree which remains rigid and refuses to adapt itself to the storm will be suddenly broken off or uprooted. Every planet in its course of development has to meet the forces sent forth from all the starry worlds and systems. Those which are in advance of it will send to it overwhelming force, almost greater than it can bear. 
while those which are less advanced will draw from it with a grasping force. But there comes a time in the life of every planet, as well as in the life of every individual, when a crisis is reached. In the case of a planet, this point is generally reached toward the close of the fifth or the beginning of the sixth great race. Then every effort is made to tear it to pieces. All the forces, both within and without, are exerted in an attempt at disruption, an attempt to tear the planet or individual into separate fragments. Only those who can endure this great cosmic testing and come out of the fiery ordeal alive can survive and continue their evolution. The heavens are full of wandering comets, asteroids, and fragments of planets, all that is left of worlds which have gone to pieces under this great test. These fragments are destined to spend eons of time wandering in space ere they can once more be gathered together and obtain the force necessary to become a planet, or until they are drawn into some evolving planet whose vibration are in harmony with theirs. Great alchemical changes are transpiring within and around the earth that will terminate in cataclysm or periodic activity. These are not altogether malign influences, for among the stars astronomy and astrology agree that there are no malign and no beneficent planets. In the ordinarily accepted meaning of the terms, all is cosmic law. The peculiar force exerted by every star in the firmament upon every other star is just that force which is needed for each particular star's well-being at the time. The earth today, in entering the first period of its cycle of fulfillment, is meeting the influence of stars whose force and light have been traveling for ages and ages, but which are only just now beginning to penetrate its atmosphere. Some of these forces might be called malign and some beneficent, but the influence of each is necessary to the earth's evolution. The coming of these forces is not accidental, nor are they coming in a haphazard manner. Millions and millions of eons ago, ere this earth was reborn, ere the sons of mine breathed into the evolution of this planet the breath of divine life. Those distant firmaments were set in their particular and appointed places, and the influences sent out from their centers were so timed as to reach the newborn earth at the exact period when those particular forces would be needed to push it on toward its fulfillment. Conceive of a constant pressure exerted upon the earth's surface from all the planets and stars, and at the same time a pressure from within, a force going outward to impinge upon all the stars. As long as these forces are evenly distributed, the result is that the earth crust becomes more and more consolidated and at the same time purified. Because of this pressure, many alchemical changes are taking place. Liquids are being transformed into solids, solids are being transmuted into gases, and gases are becoming luminous, ether, and so forth. Thus the earth is slowly being prepared to become a sun. In its present state, were the earth subjected to the forces which operate through a sun, it would be instantly volatized into a cloud of gaseous matter. It must be tested and tried, not as a punishment, but as a necessary preparation for its work as a sun. No planet can become a shining, burning sun until it has passed this crucial test, until the without and the within are perfectly balanced and have compacted it into a state that nothing can destroy it, in occult parlance, until it has become the diamond heart. Only when a planet has obtained atonement or has assimilated all the forces of the stars and planets and all the interstellar space can it be said to have conquered and become a sun, ready to take its place in the grand procession around the central sun. The sun of the solar system is such a conqueror and all the planets and stars of our cosmos are in varying stages or degrees of development toward this great end. So must it be with you. The pressure from without cannot harm you if the within be properly balanced. When the forces from within are balanced, the outer pressure will only strengthen the individuality and make you better fitted to become sons of God. Keep the within balanced and like the needle to the pole, steadily polarized to the Christ force so that nothing can move you. Gather the forces that are sent against you. Recognize them as necessary for your evolution and turn them to your advantage. The influence with each star exerts is determined by the thought force generated by its inhabitants, just as the influence of each individual is the sum total of the thoughts he continually harbors. For the aura of a man or a planet is the sum total of the thought atmosphere created by or attracted to it. The influence of the earth upon the cosmos is said to be malign. The struggle for supremacy, the selfishness, the greed for gold, and the vileness into which the misuse of the serpent power has plunged its inhabitants naturally emanate a malign influence. But nevertheless, the earth has a great potency for good. 
owing to the wonderful possibilities residing in a characteristic that is only just beginning to be comprehended, that is the result of the great test which the humanity of this globe must pass through. The earth is said to be malefic because upon her bosom is fought out the great struggle between good and evil. It is here that the great initiator, or Saturn, stands. This is his plane of manifestation. Here it is that humanity is confronted with the great problem of the creative power of sex and its higher possibilities, together with its temptations and its power to degrade and debase. But through the lessons learned by its terrible suffering, humanity is raised to a higher state. The overcoming and the learning of the lessons of the creative power will give not only to man, but also to the planet upon which this battle is waged, a glorious place in the cosmos. Therefore, instead of the earth being malign, the influence it sends out is one of patient endurance and determined victory. Victory over discouragement is one of the greatest victories man can win. For this reason, this planet sends out into space the most wonderful melody of all the planets. For only here is the chord of suffering endured and discouragement conquered blended with the keynote of the globe, the earth being the only planet that has a base clef of suffering to complete its chord. The earth is the eighth note in the celestial scale, and like the eighth note in music, while it completes one octave, it becomes the first note in a new and higher octave. Ultimately, the earth will stand forth as the brightest sun in the system. In fact, it will become a polar star and reach into an advanced system. It will send forth an influence without which the perfect evolution of all the other planetary bodies would be incomplete. This earth is the stage upon which is to be enacted a new and grander drama of life, and today the characters in the drama are being assembled and the stage is being set. The year 1912 is therefore but the dawn of the cycle of fulfillment, the time prophesied in the text quoted at the head of this lesson, the sign of the Son of Man. This sign is none other than the celestial sign Aquarius into which we are now entering. The Son of Man comes into the heavens because our solar system, for the next 2,170 years, will be passing through this sign, during which the forces symbolized by Aquarius will be focused upon it, and only after the purification, when all the tribes of the earth mourn, can come the power and great glory of the fulfillment or the attainment of the wisdom of the divine man. This sign is represented by a man pouring water upon the earth, symbolic of the fulfillment which comes as a result of the pouring out of the mother force or water. In nature, water is the chief factor which makes the earth bring forth, while in man, that which is symbolized by water, the great mother principle brings forth spiritual fruits. Since this is the cycle of fulfillment for the planet, the same condition must necessarily affect its inhabitants. As man is the microcosm of the macrocosm, he has within himself centers which should respond to every vibration of the planet. Hence, as the earth strikes its new keynote, man must vibrate or attune himself to it or be storm-swept by his failure, just as the fruit and leaves of certain trees are striped from the branches by a storm which only strengthens other trees. All nations are today feeling the necessity of adjusting themselves to a new condition upon which humanity as a whole is entering. This is especially noticeable in the political conditions in China, Persia, Turkey, Portugal, and Mexico, and in the industrial conditions in England, Germany, France, and America. We may expect such turbulent conditions to continue until every nation makes the necessary adjustment to the note of the brotherhood of man, or is swept away, as the ancient government of China has been. Within the nations, every organization and movement, whether political, economic, philanthropic, philosophical, religious, mystical, or what not, must be shaken to its foundation, must have all the dead leaves of old ideas and conditions stripped from it, and prove whether it be founded upon the eternal principle of truth, justice, unselfishness, love, and brotherhood, or upon the dictates of selfishness, ambition, injustice, and greed. And within the ranks of all organized efforts of mankind, each individual will have to face similar testing and adjustments, modified by his or her karma to prove the nature and the worth of principles of life he or she is following. But above all, the new conditions will affect all those who have devoted themselves to the study of the occult, who are delving into the deeper mysteries of being, who are trying to live the Christ life. For out of these must be gathered the mystic hundred and forty and four thousand who shall have the Father's name written in their foreheads, or the opening of the third eye. Many individuals find themselves suffering from poverty, sickness, or persistent adversities until hope seems dead. This is because they have turned their backs upon the world, 
and hence find all the world against them. They no longer serve the world, and it no longer rewards them. They suffer because, having turned from the world, they have not yet sounded the keynote of the new life by which alone they can enter into its rewards. They are passing over the interval between the two notes, and it will be longer or shorter according to their ability to awaken to the new vibration. This period is symbolized in occult literature by the great abyss. There is, however, a narrow bridge over this abyss built of naked swords which leads to the eternal city, over which all must walk with bleeding feet. But there is a hand to guide and a voice to cheer you if you but seek them in the darkness. It is always darkest just before the dawn. All old karmic conditions must be swept away ere the new era can manifest. Let no earnest seeker after wisdom grow discouraged, but hold fast to the guiding hand, and trust to the power which shall bring him safely through. The earth could no more bear the whole force of a sun without being consumed than you, as individuals, or this movement today as a unit, could express that which you are destined to express. Nor could you now stand in the fires of spiritual force which you must ultimately transmit any more than the inhabitants of the earth could live upon it were it suddenly to take its place as a sun. At some period you must be sons of righteousness, but you must grow into it. You must be brave to endure the growing pains, for you will never find the place of peace which will balance and hold all the forces under perfect control if you cannot endure the testing, learn the wisdom, and gain the blessings that every battle holds for you. Find the place of peace. Make the pressure within ever evenly and perfectly balanced that the pressure from without may strengthen you. Be calm and rest in the midst of the storm. Realize the absolute calm and rest which dwells in the midst of a vortex. Repeat constantly, I am strong, I can conquer. My forces are not scattered because they are evenly balanced and under perfect control. Then will the forces that come against you form a protecting aura of strength and power which nothing harmful can enter. Let this be your watchword. I am balanced. I am calm. If the law be with me, who can be against me? If you can gain this realization, have no fear for the result. Once let your conscience realize, if only for a moment, the peace and power of divine love, and you have donned a shield and buckler which shall preserve you in the day of trial. Some day you will find our consciousness functioning within that radiant center where love is all creative, and power is omnipotent, and glory is unspeakable. There you shall meet the Great Mother face to face. Chapter 3 Degrees and Orders Degrees of Evolution Before taking up the spiritual aspects of the teaching of the Order of the Fifteen, it is necessary to give a brief summary of its philosophical and geometrical basis. This chapter is necessarily somewhat mathematical and technical, and hence will be more or less difficult for some minds. But if anyone who find it so will carefully reread it after studying the chapters which follow, they will have little trouble in grasping its details. Its importance at the beginning of the book is that it has set forth an outline of the Order of the Fifteen, the reasons for its existence and its name, its relation to other orders and its special work in the Grand Plan. It is said that God geometricizes. This is a truth founded on the fact, already demonstrated by science, that all forces flow and act along geometrical lines. This is as true of the forces which create a world as of those which create a snow crystal. The cosmos, the known universe, is composed of seven degrees or states of matter. These states of matter correspond to the seven states of consciousness into which all manifestations of the one life are divided. Etheric, mineral, vegetable, animal, human, superhuman, and divine. This sevenfold division of the cosmos is illustrated by a plant. It first exists as a seed, in which are latent all the power and possibilities of the mature plant. As a seed, or its seventh degree, it has only the power to imbibe two kinds of food, water, the first kind, and heat, the second kind. These it assimilates and builds into growth which bursts the confining shell and permits the sprout to be born into the earth, or its sixth degree, outside its shell. With the development of the sprout and roots, it is able to select various classes of a new food, the third kind, earth, and develops a strength and stability that enables it to be born into a new world of air, its fifth degree. Here it puts forth special organs, the leaves, to assimilate the new food, the fourth kind, the gases of the air. It thus acquires a strength and ability to put forth a bud which soon unfolds into a blossom. This blossom opens its heart to another world, fourth degree, the light, 
where it assimilates still another food, fifth kind, the emanations from the sun. This enables the plant to replace its beautiful blossom by the fruit and to be born into a still higher degree, the third. The fruit now absorbs a new food, the sixth kind, life essence, which gives it the power to sustain life when eaten and thus enter a higher degree, the second. As it ripens, it absorbs still another food, the seventh kind, the creative power of the one life, which enables it to enter the first degree, manifest the intelligence necessary to register every step of its growth, and within the seed store up the potency and create after its kind. The matter composing a stone manifests the geometrical forms of the crystals composing it. The matter composing a daisy will manifest in the geometrical form of a daisy. The matter composing an animal follows the lines of that particular species. In the expression of these various geometrical forms, states of matter, and consciousness, each has its own numerical value. A crystal has a certain characteristic number of sides and angles, a daisy a certain number of petals, an animal a certain number of tissues, organs, senses, etc. The expression of the geometrical law of the universe can thus be traced in all the kingdoms. For all nature forms can be analyzed into a few single geometrical figures and their combinations. Every plant that grows follows certain geometrical lines, sending its roots in one direction, its trunk in another, and its branches in diverse other directions, yet all combining to make the perfect tree. All growth must be along these lines, for there is but one law of growth behind all manifested forms of the one life. The above illustrates perfectly the stages of your own growth. So study it carefully when you are inclined to be impatient at your progress, and realize that all advance is but a growth resulting from the assimilation of such food as you are able to digest. Man the thinker carries this same law into the mental world, and we find mankind separated into seven great classes called degrees, their subdivisions being called orders. But it must be remembered that these are but convenient terms used to represent the conditions under which, and the lines along which, evolution takes place, just as a daisy is divided into root, stalk, leaf, and blossom according to its stage of growth or degree of evolution. Yet all are but parts of the one plant. Those great spiritual beings are elder brothers, who have evolved through the orders of the four lower great divisions or degrees, and have attained all the wisdom to be gained there, from are now evolving in the orders of the degrees above the human, and hence are called initiates, adepts, mahatmas, or masters of wisdom, according to their stage of spiritual evolution. The Great White Lodge, which is the aggregate of all these great souls, who, through repeated experience and determined effort through many earthly lives, have obtained mastery, firstly over the passions, appetites, and desires of their personal self, and secondly over the forces of their body and the life currents of the cosmos, is working back of and within every movement in any way benefiting mankind, and is constantly manipulating currents of force for the advancement of evolution. This body of masters is called a lodge because, like a lodge, it is divided into degrees and orders corresponding to, and directly connected with the various degrees and orders of humanity. Every order in each degree is thoroughly organized for its particular work. The lodge must work in humanity through degrees and orders corresponding to the lines of its own division, and each master must work through the degree and order, which corresponds to the one in which he finds himself in the Great White Lodge. For such is the geometrical plan of the universe, and evolution can advance only along these general lines. Every avenue for aiding humanity is taken advantage of, and every channel is utilized to the extent to which it makes its use possible. For there is an order of mastery affinitized to every stage of human evolution. Therefore, every movement, whether spiritual, ethical, social, or political, that is working toward the betterment of mankind receives inspiration and help from the great spiritual beings who are affinitized to that particular avenue of helpfulness. No matter what lines of constructive thought you may be interested in, it will be possible for you to receive divine inspiration from these great teachers coached in terms comprehensible to you. In Revelation we read that there were 12,000 sealed out of every tribe. This symbol illustrates the above-mentioned law, namely that it is possible to reach the heights of spiritual attainment or mastery out of every condition of life. For the twelve tribes of Israel symbolize the twelve classes of humanity born under the twelve signs of the zodiac. Each great degree of humanity is divided into seven steps or order, which corresponds to the seven notes of the musical scale and the seven color rays of the solar spectrum hence manifest perfect harmony or the pure white light of the sun. 
They are determined mathematically and arranged geometrically in accordance with the one law, that is, divine harmony, which must necessarily act along geometric lines. Every human being manifesting during the present cycle finds itself in its proper order in one of these seven great divisions or degrees. The Seventh Degree of Humanity This degree is composed of seven orders and compromises all entities who have reached the self-conscious stage of evolution, but who have not yet progressed very far above the animal kingdom. It includes the lowest types of savages. The lower orders of the seventh degree are, as it were, the kindergarten of the lodge, and are just as truly under its guidance and protection as are the higher orders. In fact, the lowest order of this degree overlaps the animal kingdom in that it embraces those anthropoid apes which, as the degenerate descendants of certain Lemurian Atlantean races, contain a spark of the divine fire. Such anthropoids form an exception because they were not intended by nature, but they are the direct product and creation of senseless man of these early races. After the middle point of the fourth race, in the fourth round on our globe, no more monads can enter the human kingdom. The door is closed for the cycle and the balance struck. Since every spark of the divine fire is an emanation from a great master, all entities containing such a spark, no matter how obtained, must necessarily be a part of the body of their parent master, and their evolution must be watched over and guided by him until they are fitted to become one with him. The higher orders of this degree include the more advanced members of the lower races, and those members of the advanced races who may have made physical and intellectual progress, but who still have only a low degree of spiritual development. The Sixth Degree the sixth degree, with its seven orders, comprises all those in the position of teachers or leaders among the different races who are working consciously toward the betterment of humanity, but who have not yet realized their divine guidance or the assistance given them by the masters of wisdom, and who perhaps have never heard of the Lodge of Masters. Its lowest orders are composed of those untutored savages who, nevertheless, are leading and guiding those under them toward their highest conception of truth while the highest orders embrace those humanitarian or philanthropic workers among the more advanced races who are earnestly seeking the physical, moral, intellectual, or social betterment of the race. The Fifth Degree The seven orders of the Fifth Degree include those who are more or less interested in esoteric matters, who are not satisfied with the outer manifestations of life, but who are seeking for the soul of things, who have some knowledge of the law as a fact, and who are studying along general occult or mystical lines. The fourth degree. This degree is graded in sequence according to its orders, and embraces all those earnest students and teachers who have taken their lower nature in hand and are deliberately striving to lead such a spiritual life as will bring them into personal touch with the masters of the lodge. The third, second, and first degrees are more sacred and above our present comprehension, so it will be impossible to consider them at this time. For when one enters the third degree, he has become more than human, he has entered the superhuman. Yet this degree overlaps the human, fourth degree, just as the human overlaps the animal. The Orders of the Fourth Degree Since it is in the fourth degree that all who are drawn into this movement are now functioning, we will consider in some detail the seven steps or orders into which it is divided. The highest order of the lower, fifth degree, overlaps the lowest order of the fourth degree, just as the eighth note in music is the completion of the lower octave and the beginning of the succeeding higher octave. Admission to the organized work of these orders does not rest with any organization save the Great White Lodge, and it alone can grant or withhold membership, and it does this upon the inner planes with often no outward recognition on the physical plane. The object of these orders of evolution is the spiritualization of matter after the crucifixion is completed. The mathematical law for the formation of the orders is as follows, each order taking its name from the sum of the digits composing its number. The cross was not first introduced in the Christian era, but is the most primitive of all symbols, representing the real crucifixion or involution or the descent of spirit into matter, where it must be crucified upon the mundane cross and pass along the geometrical lines of evolution. The cross, being the fourth geometrical figure, represents the completion of involution, the turning point where evolution begins, or the fourth degree. This cross is also the tree of life, planted in the midst of the garden when mankind fell into generation, by whose fruit, if ye eat thereof, ye shall become as gods. 
We will therefore begin at the root of the cross with the order of the thirty-six, which may be said to be the root of the tree of life, or the guardian wall around the foot of the cross. Negative Orders The Order of the Thirty-Six This order is the negative aspect of the highest order one of this degree, or is the point where the force of the one enters the earth plane. Naturally, the persons composing this order are those who, through their normal evolution, have become aware of the Christ force working in them and in humanity as a whole, and who have lifted up their eyes to the cross and realized something of the meaning of the crucifixion upon it. As long as Christendom worships the Christ crucified, it is but driving the nails more firmly, for the Christ is crucified by being immersed in matter, that matter may be redeemed, a voluntary sacrifice to which man's disobedience has added cruelty and suffering. The Master Jesus is the great hierarchical ruler of the order of the One, and consequently must overshadow its negative expression, the order of the Thirty-Six. That which is known as the Christian religion is a manifestation of this order on earth, but this order also embraces all those, in whatever church, society, or organization, who have recognized the divine Christ force within them, and are determinedly seeking to balance this force in their lives. This order receives its name from the sum of the first eight numerals. Eight is the number of evolution, and therefore, according to the mathematical laws, evolution alone can admit a candidate to this order. The promulgation of the wisdom religion in this country is an attempt to build up a strong guardian wall around the cross by teaching the vital truth back of the symbols of Christianity, an attempt to cultivate and to water the taproot of the tree of life in humanity. Today, the order of the 36 includes all who have imbibed anything of the esoteric truth and are endeavoring to both live and teach them, be they called Christians, theosophists, or by any other name. It is the preparatory school of the followers of the Christ. It also stands for the great universal church, not necessarily orthodox, and embraces all who are willing to sanctify themselves and work consciously for humanity. The Order of the Thirty-Six is the first order in which the candidate consciously decides to enter the path which leads to mastery. All of its members have been acquainted with poverty and suffering, if not of body and estate, then of mind, through which they have gained such a realization of the difference between the Christ force and the man Jesus that they can recognize the universal Christ principle working in humanity, even when expressing itself through other avenues than the teaching of the Master Jesus. This realization is the first step up the Mount of Initiation. The Order of the Twenty-Eight After candidates have entered the Order of the Thirty-Six and have proved themselves worthy to continue by the character of their subsequent lives, at once a new order forms itself and grows naturally out of this order, just as a new lines are added to a crystal. This new order is composed of those souls who have advanced a little beyond their fellows and would correspond to the inner section of any occult organization put forth previous to the Order of the Fifteen. It includes those in the Orthodox churches who are no longer satisfied with the dead-letter interpretation of the Scriptures, but who have listened to the voice of their own Father in Heaven, and are willing to express a greater tolerance and accept broader ideas on spiritual matters. This is the order of the twenty-eight. It is the sum of the numerals of seven, the mystic feminine number. The end and the aim of this order is the unfolding of the teachings of Isis, the mother side of the Godhead, and the evolution of the feminine nature or soul principle through the power of love, in contradistinction to intellectual attainments. Isis represents the power to bring forth in humanity. Hence the geometrical figure symbolized this order is the square or the sacrificial stone on which the lower self is sacrificed, that the power to bring forth the Christ man may be obtained. It will be noticed that the orders thus far considered are upon the negative side of the cross. They must therefore be developed and given to humanity by the negative action of natural development. In other words, a soul will grow into these two orders, 36 and 28, unconsciously, as it advances towards freedom, with very little individualized help. But both orders are advanced collectively by the masters of the lodge. Admission to these orders depends upon natural law, the law of growth. A person enters them as soon as he becomes fit, either by the preparation afforded by life itself, or after the successful passing of well-defined initiations upon the inner plane, often without the consciousness of the personality. Positive Orders In accordance with the laws of evolution, whenever souls advance beyond the general development of an order, naturally a new order forms itself, just as a bud springs from a branch. In fact, two new orders, 21 and 15, form themselves simultaneously, both being on the positive side of the cross. 
The order of the 21. The order of the 21 is the sum of the numerals of 6. The 6 is a number of the Christos principle, or the generative power of the great creative force of the Father, manifesting in and through the universe, bringing forth all forms along geometrical lines. The 6 indicates the harmonizing of nature in its highest possibilities, through the operation of the Christos, or the informing principle, the laws of which are taught in this order. As nature grows geometrically and in harmony, so this order teaches man to evolve in harmony by a study of the laws of geometry and music as expressed through form, color, and number, all of which are governed by law of vibration. This, therefore, is preeminently the order concerned with the laws of nature and their bearing on the evolution of humanity. The persons drawn into this intellectual order are those who have a natural trend toward geometry, music, color, or mathematical studies. The Order of the Fifteen Many souls grow naturally from the order of the twenty-eight into the order of the twenty-one, while those who have specially developed their love nature pass into the order of the fifteen, it being the order that reaches into the higher octave of love, that is, divine love, yet it is possible to be in both orders at the same time. These two orders, twenty-one and fifteen, are put forth simultaneously because they are closely interwoven, the one twenty-one representing the head, or the development of the intellect, and the other fifteen representing the heart, or the development of intuition, the one the masculine, the other the feminine force. The order of the fifteen is the sum of the numerals of five. The five is the great mystical number of humanity, and was held most sacred by the ancients. On their temples where the numerals were carved in stone, the number five was inlaid with pure gold. The numeral five stands for humanity. Hence this order ordains to help humanity to reach the highest state of evolution. Its teachings deal with the human everyday problems which must be mastered ere man becomes more than man. This is the order of transmutation or alchemy, and while geometry and music are touched upon, more attention is given to the transmutation of all the baser qualities, including the elements or inner forces of all life, into the spiritual goal of regeneration through the power of divine love. The order of the fifteen has always existed, and traces of its various manifestations can be found in ancient and medieval history. The order of the Annunciation, held in such high esteem by royalty today, is said to have been founded by Count Amadeus of Savoy. But long before that, and all through the Middle Ages, the number fifteen was celebrated with many religious ceremonies and observances, the order of the Annunciation being but an adaptation to Romish ideas of the ancient order of the fifteen. The emblem of the Order of the Annunciation is a star of which is represented the Annunciation surrounded by fifteen love knots. This also symbolizes the Order of the Fifteen, for its mission has always been, even in the darkest periods of the world history, to announce the possibility of bringing into manifestation or birth the Christ Force, which is brought about by the spread of tolerance, liberty, and brotherly love. The Masons also retain a degree of this Order called the Degree of the Fifteen its main objects being devoted to the spread of toleration and liberty against fanaticism and persecution, political and religious, and to that of education, instruction, and enlightenment against error, barbarism, and ignorance. These instances all show that the Order of the Fifteen has always been the open door through which the light of the Great Law has reached humanity, and shown it how to evolve above the light of any one candlestick, be it ever so golden or its light ever so brilliant, and how to behold a divine law which imparts a light to all, giving to each as much of his candles able to manifest in the world. The Order of the Fifteen is the Order of the Holy Grail, whose lessons prepare for the initial initiation into the Order of the Flame. It is an expression of the Mother Force, the power of bringing forth. It is not what you know or believe, but what you bring forth in your life that admits you into full membership in this Order. The two Orders, Twenty-One and Fifteen, have already been formed on the Earth Plane, and as they are upon the positive side of the cross, the members of these orders must come into direct personal touch with the workers of the Great White Lodge. This has already been done, and a personal contact has been established. Like all other orders, however, membership does not depend upon recognition by any embodied teacher or teachers, but must be a conscious step taken voluntarily by each soul alone. Having taken a step alone apparently in the darkness, the pupil will be brought to the initiation which his demand will surely bring about. He will meet this initiation either unconsciously through natural worldly events, or events, however, which we have no difficulty in connecting with this great step, or consciously in the higher astral. 
The experiences met with at this period will not consist of a few great soul-stirring events, which when once passed entitled him to admission, but will consist of events which will bring to him a repetition of experiences, which will force him to face himself and bring to his consciousness every secret and open fault, events which will force him to gaze into the eyes of the self that he has created out of the personality which his real self or ego has created to train and function through, the self built up out of the thought forms he has created. It therefore contains the essence of the desires, ambitions, passions, and aspirations of his personality. It is the dweller on the threshold that each must meet, recognize as his own creation, and conquer. There can be no dodging the issue or turning back from these events, for it is a mathematical law that he cannot pass on until he has acquired strength to conquer these faults, one by one, as they are presented to him. If he refuses or is unable to conquer, his soul must wait and work in the lower orders until it grows stronger, until another cyclic opportunity for advance is afforded. It is not a matter of pledges or words. He can never obtain membership in this order until he is able to live the earlier teachings and demonstrate to the world by his life that he has at least passed the earlier tests and has made some successful attempt to let your light shine before men and that he has been born again and has been marked with the new name given by his father. Higher Orders The order of the ten has not yet been openly established on the earth plane, although its teachings have been given esoterically for many centuries. It was from a master guiding this esoteric order that the teaching of the wisdom religion was first given out to the Western world. The order of the ten is the order in which the teachings of the Christ receive their completion upon the earth plane. It is necessarily composed only of those who can receive direct teaching from the Master of Wisdom. These are the disciples who sit at the feet of the Master. The order of the six is the sum of the numerals of three, and will be brought to humanity by the coming avatar. The order of the three and the one. These perfected orders are beyond the comprehension of man in this present state of spiritual development. The order of the one overlapping a new third great degree, the divine. Chapter 4. The Wisdom Religion Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting get understanding. She shall give to thine head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. Proverbs 4, 7-9 The Wisdom Religion is the one original religion given to all mankind. The Greeks call it Theophania, or the science of the manifestation or appearance of the gods to men. It is the heritage of the human race, and no nation or people can claim it as theirs to the exclusion of others. All so-called religions, which are racial and limited, are but the various human interpretations of the one wisdom religion by various peoples, each adapting it according to their racial type of thought to the particular point of view, and limiting and overlaying it with their human misconceptions. It is the one or the first and supreme wisdom. Pythagoras termed it the gnosis, or knowledge of things that are. This seems to be the best definition, for it makes the great distinction between the teaching of many modern so-called religions, which deal almost entirely with theories about things which even the propounders thereof do not pretend to know, but which they expect their followers to accept because these theories have been accepted by their denomination for ages, and the one religion which was taught to man only by those who absolutely knew. Many centuries before the origin of the Christian religion there existed in the ancient land of Atlantis, and later in Asia, a wisdom religion which spread over the then known world. Fragments of this religion, carved upon temples, pillars, and tablets by the ancient Babylonians, Egyptians, Chinese, and Hindus, also by the Persians and Mesopotamians, are still decipherable. In the beginning this one wisdom religion was taught by the divine instructors, the sons of God mentioned in Genesis, and later by the sages of India, the Magi's of Babylonia and Persia, the prophets of Israel, the hierophants of Egypt and Arabia, the seers and philosophers of Greece, and by the Master Jesus and the initiated disciple of the early Christian Church, all of whom acquired this wisdom and knowledge through the regular channels, that is, through the mastery of the flesh and conscious communion and union with the divine. Nor has it ever ceased to be taught by advanced souls who gain their knowledge of this divine wisdom in the same way. Never, even during the darkest ages, has the world lacked the testimony of some great soul who attained to this divine knowledge in the one and only way, nor will a time ever come when this testimony is lacking. But as usual, that which is and was from its beginning divine, pure and spiritual in its earliest unity, became, by reason of its differentiation through the distorted prism of man's conception, 
human and impure, as reflecting man's own sinful nature. One application of the law, so the last shall be first and the first last, is that the one wisdom religion shall prevail upon the earth during the last races of humanity, as it did during the first. The great difference is that in the beginning humanity it was like a child learning the great truth from the gods direct, much as a child learns to lisp its prayer at its mother's knees. Later, when humanity grew up and entered the world's arena, it had to put into practice the lessons inculcated in its childhood. And at last, when humanity has reached the stage of manhood, we have the promise that the race shall become once more pure and innocent, not, however, with the purity and innocence of ignorance, but of wisdom. In other words, it will again practice the precepts of the wisdom religion given by the Father in the beginning, so that the condition at the last shall be as it was at the first, completing the old and becoming the first step of a new and grander dispensation as yet undreamt of by man. There was in every ancient country having claims of civilization and esoteric doctrine, a system which was designated wisdom, and those who were devoted to its prosecution were first denominated sages or wise men. The wisdom religion has always been divided into two parts, that which, while essentially divine, pertained nevertheless to matters comprehensible even to the unenlightened and necessary for their progress, and daily life was called the exoteric or outer doctrine, and that which was given only to initiated disciples called the esoteric or inner doctrine. The wisdom religion deals with things that are, and hence is not a religion of ritual or dogma, although it gives to them their soul. It takes but little thought to realize that all things that are must have deep underlying causes which produce the effects. These causes, naturally, can be known and understood only by the few. In every science, while much can be given to the world at large, still the deep, mysterious workings of the science, be that science what it may, can be discovered only by one who has made it a life study, devoting all his time, thought, and enthusiasm to its inner and less apparent causes. Unless there were some who could and did this study, no true idea of that science could be given to the world. Every experiment must be proved in the laboratory ere it can be given to the world. The scientist must know. If the many confusing technicalities were laid before the general untrained public, they would tend not only to be confused, but also discourage and perhaps work great harm. For instance, a poisonous drug, which in the hands of a trained physician may be wisely experimented with and its great potencies and powers to save life discovered, as well as its dangers, if given to the general public, might prove disastrous. Thus it was with the wisdom religion. It can reveal its inner truth only to those few who have devoted many lives to its study, and who have thereby evolved to a point where it can be taught them direct from God. For it would be unwise and dangerous to give many of its mysteries to untrained disciples, be they ever so earnest and sincere. Hence the esoteric or inner has always gone hand in hand with the exoteric doctrine. The esoteric, when mentioned outwardly at all, is set forth in parables and symbols, so that only those whose hearts are illumined by the light of the Christos can understand the deeper meaning. Yet such parables always contain an obvious moral precept, which is helpful to all who receive it. Many ask, if the wisdom religion is so true and of such benefit to humanity, and is possessed in its fullness by the masters of wisdom, why is it hedged about by so many apparently insurmountable difficulties? And why have the masters permitted so much misunderstanding and error to be given to the world as truth? And many similar questions. We read, Yet there must have been some very good reason for it, since from the very dawn of history such has been the policy of every hierophant and master, from the very day when the first mystic, taught by the first instructor of the divine dynasties of the early races, was taught the means of communication between this world and the worlds of the invisible host, between the sphere of matter not a pure spirit, he concluded that to abandon this mysterious science to the desecration, willing or unwilling, of the profane rabble was to lose it. An abuse of it might lead mankind to speedy destruction. It was like surrounding a group of children with explosive substance and furnishing them with matches. The first divine instructor initiated but a select few, and these kept silence with the multitudes. That is, only those who initiated who, of their own free will, and desire had shown a determination to penetrate into the hidden mysteries, and a capacity to use the knowledge gained for the good of all, under the direction of their instructors. When, however, seekers whose motives are pure and selfless are determined to penetrate into the inner mysteries and earnestly ask for guidance, the way to the desired knowledge always opens. For while it is dangerous to reveal the inner mysteries to those whose hearts are unprepared, it is equally dangerous to withhold them from those whose hearts are ready. 
There must be absolute fearlessness, for the pathway to the gods leads to the horrors of the lower astral world, whose debasing influence and obsessing entities will and must wreck their will upon the disciple who opens his door to the world unless he has grown strong and fearless through a special training which has brought about an influx of sufficient divine power and wisdom to enable him to understandingly to cope with such forces instead of being used by them. The allegory of Daniel cast into the lion's den, also the three prophets in the fiery furnace, are illustrations of this point. Each walked unharmed amidst his fearful surroundings because the Christ force, the angel of the Lord, protected him. No matter how eagerly disciples desire the secret it was, and still is the duty of every teacher of the mysteries, to withhold all esoteric instruction from them until, by the character of their lives, they have proved that they are ready to be entrusted with it. It is not enough for them to intend to do their best. It is absolutely necessary that they acquire wisdom to cope, like Daniel, with all the conditions and forces of life. Such wisdom can only be acquired after many lives of experience and severe testing. Hence, no mortal can tell when he or any other is ready for initiation into the mysteries. Only those divine instructors who have watched him life after life, and have noted how he was born himself in the various vicissitudes of moral experience, can judge as to his attaining mastery in the particular incarnation. Hence, the occult axiom, which is literally true and has never failed, when the pupil is ready, the teacher appears. The teacher here referred to is usually not a superhuman being, but is that person, teaching or thing, which will give the seeker the knowledge needed for his next step. And only when no human being or accessible teacher can fulfill the need does a more than human teacher appear. The pupil is not the judge of his readiness for the step, for he is not ready until he has gained the ability to recognize his teacher on the inner planes. Until that time it is his duty to take the steps one by one as life presents them until the next step brings him into the presence of his teacher. To come closer to the masters, try to do the works of the masters, for the more you strive to do those works, the closer you come. An apprentice works apart from the master workman while learning the preliminaries, but when he begins to do master work, he works under the direct supervision of the master workman and becomes his helper. Solomon, referring to this esoteric doctrine, says, With all thy getting, get understanding. And David emphasizes this point when he said, The fear of the Lord, or the law, is the beginning of wisdom. For until we gain a wholesome fear, or, to speak more correctly, awe of the great law, which the wisdom religion teaches, the disciple is not ready even to set out consciously on the path to attainment. The first conscious step upon the path is a comprehension of the sacredness and the desirability of the spiritual wisdom which is spoken of in the Bible as a pearl of great price, for the attainment of which a disciple gladly sells all that he, the personal self, has. When he has thus gladly sacrificed his all for it, he will realize that it is not something to be talked about idly or displayed before men, but something to be sought for in the inner sanctuary of the heart. The disciple must be willing to be proved worthy ere he can hope to receive. Solomon said, When wisdom entereth into thy heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee understanding shall keep thee. Every candidate for initiation must feel within himself the great self, the mighty Lord and protector. The I am, or ego sum, shows his full power to each one who can recognize the still small voice, and this recognition can only come through the cultivation of the spirit of love. We attain to a knowledge of this mighty Lord, our Father in heaven, when we do the works of our Father. First and foremost of these works are the manifestation in our lives of divine love and compassion. He who says he has realized the divine within himself, yet only as a power for his own upliftment, and who uses it only for his own advancement, has never even approached that realization. Such receive the condemnation of those who prophesied and did many wondrous works in his name. I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of inequity. The first action of the divine in the heart is to awaken love and compassion for the race. God is love, and the disciple cannot draw near to or have a realization of God without an awakening of that divine love and compassion, which is not limited to individuals, but which is poured out for all the world. For God so loves the world that he continually gives his only begotten Son, the emanation from himself, love, that whosoever believeth on his Son shall have eternal life. He who feels another's sorrows, who forgets self for others, has realized, in a measure at least, the divine. And while the works of the Father are what the world would call magic, still the greatest miracle of all is the miracle of loving. 
How few there who really and truly love their fellow men! How few there be who forget themselves, their own pleasure, their own so-called rights, their own happiness for another, for the meanest of God's little ones, for perhaps even a dumb brute! He who feels another's sorrow has touched somewhere upon the divine within. Therefore, when you would attain to this realization, empty out the personal and let the Divine Father overshadow you, and shelter and feed you with the mystic bread of which you can eat thereof, ye shall hunger no more, neither thirst. The wisdom religion teaches the means of accomplishing this union of the human with the divine, for there is no possibility of attaining mastery or of entering the kingdom of heaven unless the human is indissolubly linked to the God within. It is the firm belief in the possibilities of such union that helps one to attain it. This is the only possible path of attainment. The more this truth grows upon the candidate, the greater the power of the immortal God to manifest through him. And as the manifestation of the God within grows and waxes strong, the man of sin, or the mere animal man, dies, or is literally consumed in the divine ardor. As St. Paul said, The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And as we have been born the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. The wisdom doctrine not only teaches this, but the esoteric doctrine signifies much more, for it teaches the possibility of the recognition by initiated mortals, not only the actual presence on earth of a god or gods, but the actual blending of the higher self, the personal god with man. He is representative on earth, but to accomplish this, this candidate must feed his spiritual body on this divine realization, just as the physical body is fed with mortal food. For the bread of God is that which cometh down from heaven, and giveth life unto the world. Chapter 5 Concerning the Doctrine of Hell Fire And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night for ever and for ever. Revelations 20.10 The Christian Bible, like all great scriptures, is an inspired setting forth of the one divine wisdom in symbolic language. It deals with principles, not things. It describes qualities, forces, and spiritual events, not historical men, places, or physical events. It is a repertory of invented personages in its older Jewish portions, and of dark sayings and parables in its later editions, and thus quite misleading to anyone ignorant of its esotericism. It is less understood than more ancient scriptures, because all so-called study of it is proceeded upon the hypothesis that it is intended to present historical facts. In reality, no great scripture is historically true, nor is it supposed to be, by those who, having been initiated into its mysteries, understand something of their inner meaning. It is time this fact is more widely known. All scriptures and myths are collections of allegories and parables, grouped and arranged to illustrate symbolically some feature of the growth of the soul. Hence, while not historically true, as modern research has abundantly shown, they are universally true because they illustrate phases of experience through which every soul passes during its evolution toward conscious union with the divine. As far back as the early Gnostic sect of the Johannites, the forerunners of the Crusaders, who claimed to be the only true initiates into the secret mysteries of Jesus, and who claimed direct apostleship descent from St. John, it was taught that the stories as narrated in the Gospels were but allegories. Whenever possible, familiar historical incidents, names, and places are used to illustrate the points more clearly, and also to inculcate a moral lesson for them that are without, or not initiated, who are able to grasp only surface truth. Since scriptural stories and events do not agree with the proven facts of history, except incidentally here and there, the Bible has either been accepted in a literal sense and slavishly followed, even against all common sense and justice, or has been mutilated and only such parts as can seemingly be proved accepted, and the rest rejected or discredited. Bloody wars have been waged in efforts to harmonize its discrepancies, and sanction found in it for everything from debauchery to the buying and selling of brothers and sisters in slavery. In studying the seemingly preposterous myth and legends of gods and goddesses found in more ancient scriptures, we have no difficulty in understanding that they are not supposed to have an accurate historical basis, even though referring to historical or astronomical events. We do not attempt to pin them down to actual facts, but seek for the hidden meaning pertaining to the spiritual development of mankind, which we know they must contain. The Bible, instead of dealing with gods and goddesses, deals in exactly the same way with personages and places, some of which are taken from history, 
not because their use in this way pretends to be history, but because the historical facts readily lend themselves to the illustration of the lens intended. Other names and places used are just as fictitious as those used in the ancient myth, but they all have their inner occult significance. The numerical value of the very words themselves have a definite meaning and are purposely selected to indicate steps in the path of atonement up which each soul must journey. The Old Testament, written for the purpose of teaching the divine truth to the Hebrew, draws its symbology largely from Hebrew or Chaldean history and expresses its symbols in terms of Hebrew thought. But like the scriptures given to other nations, while the symbols used are expressed in a particular race thought, nevertheless the true meaning or the hidden lesson applies to all mankind. The New Testament is the symbolic history of the Christ force or principle in each heart, the journey of the awakened soul from the time of the birth of the Christ in the heart to the crucifixion on the cross of material desires, the final victory of the spiritual over the physical, and the resurrection and the immortality of the flesh, all of which must be experienced in some incarnation by every redeemed soul. It makes very little difference as far as the truth of the teaching is concerned whether or not a man by the name of Jesus ever lived. It is the teaching that counts. The multitude see the beautiful story, which is filled with living truth, and those who are ready sense the inner meaning. Thus each one gets exactly what he is ready to receive. As a matter of history, there was a great master by the name of Jesus, the greatest avatar yet come on earth, who did pass through the experience symbolized in the Bible during the pilgrimage of a soul toward mastery. The stories are woven about this great initiate, and the historic events and places are adapted to carry out the symbology and his teaching remains today the most sublime ever given to man. The Christian Bible is the deepest treatise on esoteric or divine wisdom ever given to man, for it contains all the accumulated wisdom of past ages together with a prophecy of times to come. A passage characteristic of the esoteric meaning of the Bible is found in Revelations 11, 3-8. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and when they have finished their testimony, that beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. This text alone should convince the most skeptical that only a symbolic meaning is intended. It scarcely needs to be pointed out that our Lord was crucified neither in Sodom nor yet in Egypt, but that both names were accepted symbols for that state of darkness in which the unredeemed soul wanders, and in which the Christ or higher self is daily crucified. Our Lord, or the great law of divine love, was and is today crucified both in Sodom and Egypt, or in the states of impurity and darkness symbolized by those names. There is no doctrine that has caused so much controversy as the doctrine of hell fire. As the race outgrows the repugnant idea of an everlasting physical punishment, there is a tendency to sweep this whole teaching into limbo, as being a boogie used to scare mankind in its childhood, but not to be dignified by serious consideration in its mature years, a something that pertained to the age of superstition and the childhood of the race. But back of the ignorant and repellent misconception of this doctrine, there is a pertinent and deeply occult significance, for such a doctrine would not be given the prominent place it occupies unless it contained the germ of a vital truth necessary for the growth of the soul. When hell is mentioned in the Bible, it means one of three things. Occasionally the suffering of earthly experience, but usually the unseen state, Sheol, the lower subplanes of the astral, the state of consciousness, or Hades, more correctly, it refers to the eighth sphere, the place of transmutation where evil is transmuted into good. When hellfire is mentioned, it refers to the purifying fires of karma. Hence, to say that the gates of hell shall not prevail against you means, firstly, that if your intuition is developed so that you can be guided by the Christ consciousness, neither the state of consciousness designated as hell, nor the suffering of earthly conditions, nor the denizens of the lower astral can deceive or prevail against you. Secondly, that by the creative power of the Christ within you, create within yourself a divine world so that there is nothing of you to be cast into the crucible of transmutation and be disintegrated, but that all shall be immortalized and rise with the risen Lord, that where he is, there ye may be also. Thirdly, that your intuition being centered in the Christ, no evil thing can come nigh thy dwelling, no falsehood can lead you astray. No astral entity can deceive you, and no false teaching appeal to you. 
all of which things are gates of hell which cannot prevail against the risen Christ consciousness. The devil is explained in the lesson on the false prophet, his accumulated evil thought force of the world seeking expression in humanity and deceiving all men. The inner meaning of the following passage, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it, is that men are children of the devil, and that they are born under the great delusion, the one great paramount lie, that the physical body, together with material existence, is the great reality. Instead, realize that the personality is but a garment or mask assumed by the real self, and that material existence is but the stage upon which a single scene in the drama of the soul's life is enacted. Nothing is true that is not from eternity to eternity. Hence the evil or the devil, which blinds the eyes of the personality, and throws its elusive glamour over all mankind, is the creator or father of all lies. This great lie, together with everything that tends to strengthen it and make it seem desirable, is like a millstone around the neck of everyone born into earth life. In occult parlance it is the world's karma, which all must bear. In this sense, humanity is a child of the devil, or as Job expresses it, man is born unto trouble, as the sparks fly upward. But in this very lament we see the remedy, for it is only by the hammering on the anvil of life and the burning of the karmic fires that the divine sparks are released to fly upward to unity in the Godhead. The lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, into which the false prophet and the beast are cast, is one of the seven manifestations of the great law, acting in its aspect of karma, which permits nothing to endure that is false, that cannot withstand the vibrations of divine truth. Its fires are the fires of purification and transmutation that consumes all that is impure or false, all that maketh a lie. And that which maketh a lie is not limited to the utterance of a falsehood, but includes everything that tends to create a false impression, everything that represents itself to be that which is not. Fire is the highest earthly element, and its action transforms or raises all substance to a higher condition. While the substance burned ceased to exist on the physical plane, they still exist in a higher state, leaving behind only that which belongs to the earth in the form of ashes. Brimstone or sulfur is used in daily life for purifying, bleaching, and subliming. Salt purifies and preserves, but brimstone sublimes and raises to a higher condition. It represents the earth plane, also that stage in which the novice is cast into the flame to be sublimed, where he has the dross of earth consumed that his spiritual pneuma may be released and rise to a higher manifestation. The fires are the blazing fires of karma, that the personality itself is lit, and to which it must stand until all is transmuted into gold. Brimstone is the means by which the other elements cast into the burning are prepared for their next step in evolution. But in accomplishing this, the brimstone must sacrifice its bodily form and be sublimed. This action is the foundation for, and the real meaning of the symbol of fire and brimstone used in our text. And like all such symbols, it survives because it contains a germ of truth. The lake, of course, is not a physical lake of fire and brimstone any more than the so-called hell is a physical place, but it is an actual condition. It represents the earth plane, also that stage must pass. The earth itself is passing through the same burning and purification that its substance may be prepared for the higher and future conditions which will prevail during the coming new race. The gases generated by the subliming action of the sulfur are gathering in certain areas preparatory to the great explosion of the future, and the humanity that is to survive these great cataclysms must have passed through the burning and purifying flames of karmic law, that they may be enabled to breathe the rarefied atmosphere resulting from the changed physical conditions which will then exist. Hell is separation from God, the psalmist cries, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. The physical body is in hell and does see corruption, for hell is made up of the fermenting, corroding, and corrupting influences which act upon the physical and mental bodies from birth until final disillusion. In the case of the mental body, these influences may last through many incarnations, until all that is false as habits, ideas, beliefs, and understanding is completely consumed and the mind illumined by spiritual understanding. All must willingly stand in this burning, but they must also perform the much harder task of standing aside and permitting others, even their own loved ones, to be sublimed, 
to stand in the burning and suffer through the conditions which karma presents to them. How many would gladly attempt to bear the hardships and suffering of their loved ones, rather than stand aside and permit them to fulfill their karmic destiny and exact justice? But their loved ones cannot be purified and passed on to higher things if their burdens are borne for them, and they are not allowed to meet their test and stand in the fiery furnace which they in the ages past have lit. For only when they can enter this fiery furnace and find the Lord Christ walking with them, by this recognition the fire loses the power to harm. Are they ready to pass on? If sentimental reasons are permitted to interfere with the loved one's performance of duty, the time of the purification is pushed back and more fuel is accumulated for the burning. Stand aside, then, and while giving all love, sympathy, and encouragement, allow all to meet their tests in burning that they may be purified and advanced to higher things. It is into this hell that the Christ principle descends after the crucifixion, and it is into this hell that each soul must descend, that all that belongs to the lower self or personality may be consumed, leaving only the purified spirit to rise to the heights beyond. This is the meaning of the doctrine of hell fire, and it manifests on the four lower planes. The soul, however, as the psalmist said, will not be left in hell, but will garner from it the experience necessary to clothe itself in immortality. Hell endures forever and ever, for there is no end to eternity or evolution, and there will always be something to burn and be purified and transmuted. This does not mean that any soul will stand in hell forever, but that each soul must pass through it. No one remains in it one moment longer than is required to transmute the base metal of personality into the pure gold of spiritual attainment. For karma is not a punishment or even an inevitable law of suffering, which we must endure to the end but rather in the course of evolution our higher selves finds that we lack certain soul qualities, hence chooses to incarnate in certain families and under certain conditions which will bring out the soul quality which is lacking. Everything must pass through the burning that it may be transmuted into love to lay at the Master's feet, while selfishness and all earthly dross is left behind like ashes. Every sincere seeker should gladly stand in the flames of the karmic hell, for only the false, only that which is impure or false can burn. All the false teachings, false doctrines, false love, false living, all misunderstanding and misconceptions, being but transitory, will be consumed, but nothing that is real, that is immortal, can burn. The true will emerge as pure gold. In that day we will know as we are known, for the coverings of falsehood and pretense will have disappeared in the burning. Therefore, let this realization of the fire that burneth and the worm that dieth not remain with you as the greatest comfort to your soul. Realize that all you have to do is to wait and trust and pray that everything that holds you back from your true spiritual advance may be quickly consumed that the burning may come to an end. That which burns is mortal and transitory and has no part nor lot in your real life. Realize that the burning cannot last one moment longer than you give fuel to the flames. As soon as the dross is burned away, the dawning of the resurrection morn will come. As soon as you cease to deceive, cease to lie, cease to be false, you cease to furnish fuel to the flames. Hence the burning will last only until that which has been accumulated is consumed. Stand still, then, in the burning that you may be purified. Weave for yourself immortal garments of purity and truth. Lay up for yourself treasures in immortal habitations, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. And when the fires of hell have become the crown of glory that shall illumine the saints, then shall they walk the streets of the new Jerusalem, the purified earth, in white raiment. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign for ever and ever. For these are they that have come out of the great tribulation. Chapter 6 The Eleventh Commandment but we beseech ye, brethren, that you study to be quiet and to do your own business. 1 Thessalonians 4.11 Which do ye not that I must be about my father's business? St. Luke 2.49 Beware of fear that spreadeth like the black and soundless wings of midnight bat, between the moonlight of thy soul and thy great goal that loometh in the distance far away. The Voice of the Silence, Blavatsky in the life of every earnest seeker after truth, after the first enthusiasm of the awakening to his spiritual possibilities and the wonder of his newly found joy, there comes a period of depression in which everything seems to fail him, and a shadow of discouragement, almost lack of faith, seems to spread over him. In his mind, questions arise at first fleeting, then growing more persistent. 
After all, is this great change that has come into my life worth the effort I have made to give up my old ideals and conditions and remodel my life? Are these new ideas practical, or are they mere ephemeral sophistries which fail me in my hour of need, and the teachers to whom I have listened? Are they not human beings full of frailties like myself, with no higher wisdom for my guidance, with nothing to give me that I have not already of myself? A great fear possesses him, lest conditions beat him back and compel him to resume the old treadmill of his former life, without hope and without being able to contact the spiritual power that sustained him at first. All his beautiful soul experiences, looked at from the slough despond, now seem to have been but fantastic imaginings, and the cry goes forth. What is the use of all the struggling? At this point, unless some understanding of the law is grasped, the seeker is apt to slip back, apt to repudiate all the good resolutions and vows he has made to his higher self, and like the man from out whom the unclean spirit was cast, he then takes unto himself seven other unclean spirits of worry, doubt, fear, and discouragement, and his last state is worse than the first. If, however, it is pointed out to him at this time that this depression is but a natural phenomena, through some phase of which most seekers pass, and which is just as natural as a night of darkness after a day of sunshine, he will be able to take advantage of this night period of the soul to strengthen his courage and faith. If he turns to the Bible for comfort, he will find it the twenty-third psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The period of depression is indeed the valley of the shadows of death, that is, the shadow of the death of his high ideals, a valley in that it is a depression between two heights. And just as surely as he has descended from one height into the valley, so must he, if he persevere, climb the height beyond. But if he insists on walking up and down the valley, for lack of courage to assay the height ahead, the shadow will descend and enwrap him. Beware, disciple, of that lethal shade. No light that shines from spirit can dispel the darkness of the nether soul, unless all selfish thought has fled therefrom. It is the shadow of thyself outside the path, cast in the darkness of thy sins. The rod and staff are given to every disciple, not only to lean upon, but also as an alpenstock with which to climb the mountain of attainment. There is an old injunction often used in a spirit of impatience and anger, or flippantly alluded to as the eleventh commandment, yet which contains a deep occult significance, that is, mind your own business. The Ten Commandments given to Moses seem to cover all phases of mortal life, so that he who keeps the Decalogue does his whole duty to God and man. Yet while the Ten in the Decimal System is accepted as perfection in the worldly affairs, the Duodecimal, Twelve, is a system often used in the computation of occult periods. Hence the seeker who is striving to live above mere worldly affairs, who is striving to shape his life in accord with the deeper mysteries of existence, has need of two more commandments to make up his duo decalogue. Whereas the Ten Commandments were delivered on Mount Sinai amidst thunder and lightning, the Eleventh and Twelfth Commandments are given by the still small voice that speaks in the silence. The Eleventh Commandment may sound irreverent, but in its occult significance it is far from being so. For if obeyed it covers a period of depression referred to above, the significance of the Twelfth Commandment can only be grasped when the Eleventh has become a part of your life. Each one of you who chooses, after due deliberation and meditation, to set for yourself a divine standard of life, has entered upon a new business, one which vitally concerns yourself. At the very outset of this new business you must meet yourself face to face, take account of stock, and find out what your real business is. To mind your own business does not mean merely negatively to refrain from interfering with the business of others, although that is included. The deeper meaning is to find out what your own business is, then actively to be about it. This applies particularly to you who have determined to live the higher life, you who have passed through the ecstasy of the awakening and are now passing through the natural reaction, the slow of despond, the valley of the shadow of death. The reason for the depression is that the moment you say to your higher self that you will henceforth live in accord with the will of that self working through you, you find yourself face to face with your old personality. This personality is composite, the aggregate of the factors and forces of the age in which you live. That is, it is made up of all elements from all the lower kingdoms, mineral, vegetable, animal, as well as the mental traits and tendencies that are the karma, not only of the soul, but also of the age, the race, the nation, the community, and the family in which you live, all of which are literally built into your physical, 
astral, desire, and mental bodies, a microcosm in very truth. Because this personality and its traits are not altogether your own, but are taken from the various kingdoms and other sources, the instant you determine to break away from the bonds of the flesh and express your real self, you take all these varied factors out of their customary vibration and impose upon them the will of the higher being, your true self. The new keynote is resisted by all the elements in the personality as well as in the environment, and the combined opposition of all is focused upon you. There is aroused within you every sleeping tendency, tendencies which heretofore you did not recognize nor even suspect. Many of these are but the reflex effects of the thought currents of the community. Others are tendencies stimulated by the influence of the zodiacal sign in which you were born acting in a negative way, also the negative aspect of your planetary influences, all acting upon the atoms of your personality, through your subconscious mind uncontrolled by the human consciousness, to say nothing of inspiration from the superconscious mind. You find yourself in the condition St. Paul speaks of. I find then a law, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. And the more determined you are to do the will of the divine self, the more unsuspected tendencies you find within you to transmute, tendencies which were quiescent or sleeping as long as you advance passively with the current of the community, but which are now awakened and fighting for life. Do not confuse the subconscious with the superconscious mind, as is so commonly done. The subconscious is the animal mind, that which is below the threshold of human waking consciousness, as sub means under or below. It is the sum total of the consciousness of all the cells, organs, ganglia, and centers of consciousness in the animal body synthesized by the animal soul. It controls all the vegetative functions such as respiration, circulation, digestion, reflex action, etc. It is also this mind that automatically reproduces that which is impressed upon it by human consciousness, such as a harmonious or inharmonious attitude toward life, ideas of health or disease, weakness or power, etc., Hence it can be called upon to adjust only such conditions as come within its domain, for it is but the servant of man's human consciousness, just as man's human consciousness should be the servant of the higher or superconsciousness. The superconscious mind is the intelligence of the real self overshadowing its human personality. It is man's touch with the divine. To come into touch with the higher consciousness, the activities of the human consciousness must be stilled, for when the mind is controlled, it becomes like a mirror to reflect and record that which comes to it from the higher self. It is the awakening into activity of these unrecognized forces that makes the darkness of the night period so depressing and awful. Each soul must face this darkness alone. Your attention is called as because scarce one passes through without bitter complaint. Your teacher or your predecessor may hold your hand in this and give you the utmost sympathy the human heart is capable of. But when the silence and the darkness come, you lose all knowledge of him. You are alone, and he cannot help you, not because his power is gone, but because you have invoked your great enemy. By your great enemy, I mean yourself. If you have the power to face your own soul in the darkness and silence, you will have conquered the physical or animal self which dwells in sensation only. When the light of the Christ has illumined your heart and has awakened the recognition of your divine possibilities, it must also awaken all the latent propensities in your composite personality. For the same sun which causes the good seed to sprout in the garden of your heart will also stimulate an even greater profusion the growth of the weeds which, unless ruthlessly uprooted, will choke out the life of the good seed. The business, then, that you must mind is to pull up the weeds or conquer the foes within one by one as they appear. Make no compromise. You must conquer or be overcome. For the very recognition of your divine birthright lashes into fury all those forces of the lower self which have held you in bondage for so long. However, while this step brings out every latent fault, it also awakens every latent power for good. In fact, you never know what you really are until the light of the Christ has illumined every corner of your being. Oftentimes, the unexpected beauty and strength revealed is quite as overwhelming as a shortcoming. The battle is not one-sided. In fact, he that is with you, your higher self, is greater than he, the personality or lower self, that is against you. When you find this state of depression and lethargy approaching, instead of trying to mind the business of another, understand that it is never another's business you are to mind, nor outside conditions you are to fight, but the very forces within that are bringing the doubt upon you. The first temptation, when confronted by this apparent disillusionment, is to pick flaws 
first in the teachings which have so greatly helped heretofore, then in the personality of others, hoping thereby to excuse your own shortcoming. But you can never find truth or happiness by dissecting it, only by turning your attention to yourself, and finding out why you now doubt and criticize that which brought you so much happiness and satisfaction at first. Then set to work to conquer with a full realization that every one of the awakened forces of the lower self are fighting to overcome the manifestation of the real self, and make you sink back once more into the passive condition, into which you were but one of the many, and your life but the result of the ebb and flow of the thought currents common to your family and environment, a creature ruled by circumstance and a slave to our conditions. You never have to fight another's battles, only your own. Because your personality is made up of atoms from the entire community and environment in which you dwell, as you overcome your own faults by creating their opposites, you add strength to the power that is striving to conquer the same faults in the whole community. Moreover, you cannot thus think back without lending your forces to swell the tide that will overwhelm you and all who are near and dear to you. Every time you remind another's business or ways for striving for the enemies outside yourself, you are adding strength to the things you would conquer. The Christ, speaking through the Master Jesus, has said, In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. The Christ power is the creative power of divine love that has brought you up out of the darkness and set your feet upon a rock that has literally gone before you to prepare your path. The place the Christ is preparing for you is not some post-mortem heaven inhabited by being suddenly perfected through the experience called death, but is the place, condition, and personality you are now in. If you have been called by the Christ to face these particular conditions, rest assured that the Christ has gone before to prepare the place for you. But while the mansion or dwelling place is chosen and prepared by the Christ within, still it is you who must furnish and equip and dwell in it. This is the business which you must mind. All worldly dwelling places must be shared by all the elements of confusions which go to make up the personality, a confused and imperfect reflection of the real self. Your real mansion is prepared for you by the Christ, but ere you can dwell in it, the Christ must come in your heart and life and receive you unto himself. The first step must be to drive out the aliens who are now dwelling in your mansion, since the great aim of physical existence is not personal salvation, but the redemption or spiritualization of physical matter, and the ultimate evolution of all humanity from its lower and merely human state of consciousness to oneness with the Christ consciousness, each individual soul finds itself confronted with a certain amount of matter from the various kingdoms which it is its business to spiritualize and redeem. A certain personality with particular traits, tendencies, passions, and desires, out of which, as raw material, the soul must fashion the furnishings of its mansion in the Father's house. How is this to be accomplished? Here you are concerned with the little physical inequalities and disquietudes of life, and you ask over and over again, If the Christ has called me to this higher life, why do not conditions immediately change? Why is there anything for me to do but to open my heart and receive the blessings promised by my Father? One reason is that if your Father in Heaven gave you all the conditions you now deem so necessary, wealth to use for good, leisure to study, opportunity to teach, etc., you would either find that when obtained they did not satisfy your soul hunger, or that you would sit down exactly as you are today, with all your faults and deficiencies nicely covered over, and would never recognize them, grow or advance, and be about your Father's business, the redemption of the world. Hence you must mind your own business, must empty, cleanse, purify, and refurnish your mansion, or the temple of the living God, that where I am ye may be also. In other words, to so prepare your mansion that the Father shall dwell with you, and the Christ shall be the light thereof. Why then waste time and force striving for the things of the outer world? Why fret and fume over the little difficulties you meet and prepare in your mansion? Why weep and ask for this or that thing? Why not just rest in the thoughts that the Christ has prepared this place for you, and that you must be about your business, that is, using the materials found in your personality environment to furnish the dwelling place for Him when He returns to take you unto Himself? For your Father's business is the redemption of the world, and each apparently separated individuality has a special part of that business to perform. Each of you have your own problems, and each problem brings you up against your own lower self and forces you to recognize just what it is that keeps your mansion in an unfinished state. 
Like Hamlet, so many feel that the time is out of joint, O oh, cursed spite, that ever I was born to set it right. If you study Hamlet, you will find that in his attempt to set the world aright, he only brought sorrow and suffering to himself and those he loved, and sacrificed not only his own personality, but the personality of others in his misguided attempt. No person has ever been born to set the world aright, except so much of it as he finds expressed in his own personality. If you mind your own business and let the faults of others go, trusting to the law to straighten them out, and confine yourself to straightening out your own faults, you will realize the joy that comes from such conquering. When you cease to worry over the faults of others, it will be like a physical burden rolling from your shoulders. If you have never done this, try it merely as a physical experience for your own happiness, and the results will prove its truth. The world can never be redeemed by preaching, talking, or even by ministering to the sorrows of others, relieving their distress, building model tenements or libraries, or by changing economic conditions. While all these things are necessary factors, they are only really helpful, as they are the result of true minding of the business of the Father, recognizing the absolute oneness of all, not only in a metaphysical sense, but also in the personality and the elements composing it. When mankind realizes this, universal brotherhood will be an accomplished fact. You will then realize in a practical way that everything you do or for another will react upon yourself. Then the injunction, do unto others as you would they should do unto you, will become the law of life. For you will realize that as you do unto others, you literally do unto yourself. That you must share the sorrow and joy, the privation or honors of even your most distant brothers and sisters. This will not be fighting another's battle or minding another's business, except as your own conquering helps all. It is as though a great building were being erected, in which each worker, by strictly minding his own business, which is his part of the great plan, whether he be bricklayer or architect, is making the work of all easier and advancing the completion of the entire structure. Each must share the result of the success or failure of any one to mind his own business. These results can be attained only by elevating to a higher rate of vibration first the thought forces, and then the physical conditions of the self, the family, the community. This must be accomplished according to the natural law of harmony. If you were in a congregation which was singing out of tune, the best way to bring about harmony would not be to stop the singing and talk about it, but to sing steadily and firmly in perfect tune yourself. Those next to you would catch and spread the harmony until all were singing in tune. It will be only the working out of this law of harmony that will ultimately redeem the round world and all that dwell therein. Only the manifestation of the Christ in your heart and life can bring peace on earth, good will toward men. Any line of conduct that really brings peace and goodwill is therefore an expression of the Christ or divine harmony. Chapter 7. Narcotics, Alcohol, and Psychism The human body is the temple of the living God. Within it are certain vital centers comparable to doors which open into inner shrines. Using these centers as points of contact, the life forces from the higher planes flow into the physical body through them as an electrical current flows through a wire. And it is through these centers that the Christ force must flow to reach and spiritualize man's various bodies before the redemption or resurrection can take place. By resurrection we mean the ultimate building up of a spiritual body within the physical by a process of gradually raising the vibrations of its particles to respond to the keynote sounded by the divine or higher self. These centers or doors are normally protected by nature with oily coverings or sheaths compared to both astral and physical matter, which permit the flow of the normal life forces and protect them from all others. These doors should be opened only by a gradual purification and development of the protecting sheath. Normally this takes place as a natural growth resulting from a life of mental and bodily purity and intense spiritual aspiration. It should not be forced or hothouse growth, for each door must be open and closed under the absolute control of the will. Each individual has been given these doors to guard and is held responsible for their keeping. Only as he can master them and in full knowledge open them to the knock of the Christ and close them to his enemies can he hope to conquer. It is only after long training and great spiritual growth that the entities of the astral world can be mastered and held at bay when the doors are opened. In fact, the first and most important work of the advanced disciple is to stand faithful watch over these doors. Keep thou the door of thine heart. The Holy Ghost is the mother principle, or the power of bringing forth. Hence the destruction of the sheath prevents the bringing forth or manifesting of the Christ force within you. The sin against the Holy Ghost, the unpardonable sin, unpardonable only because it is irreparable, 
is the separation of the personality from the guidance of the higher self through the destruction of the means of contact. This takes place through the breaking down of the doors or the destruction of the oily sheaths that protect the centers leading from the physical into the astral and psychic bodies. Once these sheaths are destroyed, the person is no longer able to close the doors and so becomes an easy prey to the denizens of the astral. Such a one becomes a helpless victim to any and all sorts of psychic imposition and deception. There is no such thing as a lost soul, but it is possible for the personality to persistently refuse the guidance of the higher self and ultimately break away from it entirely and become a lost human animal. The animal life force of such a soulless entity may incarnate several times, each time growing more degenerate, until it has finally exhausted the force obtained during its contact with the soul, and the aggregated atoms disintegrate and return to the elements from which they were gathered. The soul in such cases is not lost, but is indrawn to await a new opportunity to gather up the materials necessary to clothe itself in a personality. There are several abnormal ways in which the oily protecting sheath can be broken down and the doors thrown open, chief among which are the use of alcohol and narcotic drugs. Chemically speaking, ordinary alcohol is ethyl hydroxide. The ethyl, the spirit, vibrates to the highest rate reached by mere physical matter, the point where matter transcends the physical and enters the astral, the ethyl actually functioning on both planes. Narcotic drugs also contain an ethyl element. The ethyl, when taken into the body, immediately seeks to escape into the astral, and it naturally follows the usual avenues of communication between the two planes. But in escaping, it passes through the centers in a reverse direction to the normal current, and gradually burns off the insulating sheath until in time they are utterly destroyed, just as an electrical insulation might be burned off by interference with the normal flow of the current. This breakdown may be very rapid, as in the case of habitual drunkard or drug fiend, or it may be insidious and not show markedly for several incarnations. But the result is certain, and every indulgence in the substance mentioned is a step towards the end. Ultimately, this leaves the doors unguarded and open for all the horrors of the lowest astral plane to rush in and take possession of the temple of the living God, thus desecrated. Bulwer Lytton gives a realistic description of some of these horrors in his occult novel, Zanoni. In that story, the student opened the doors abnormally by the use of drugs and being unable to close them through fright at the sights that met his gaze, was haunted until his death. Tobacco, although classed as a narcotic, does not contain the elements so destructive to the psychic centers. In fact, when not used to excess, is rather soothing. It does, however, injuriously affect the heart and nervous system. From an occult standpoint, one of the greatest objections to its use is its tendency to form a habit. It goes without saying that the aspirant for the spiritual life must be master of all conditions and functions and a slave to none. Hence, while tobacco is not rigidly prohibited in the earlier stages of growth, its use is strongly advised against. Tea and coffee are stimulants, but not narcotics in the sense we use the term, as they do not contain the injurious elements. Their excessive use does affect the nervous system injuriously, although many sensitive persons find that their moderate use has a beneficial and tonic effect, but their use should not be abused. The drunkard and the drug user open the doors while in a state of debauchery, and in such a condition being particularly unable to defend themselves, they practically invite all the fiends of the underworld to enter and take possession. It is our duty to give our sympathy and help to this class of sorely afflicted ones, for since it took many lives to break down the protective sheath, it will require a long, hard fight to rebuild them. Hence do not let such unfortunate ones become discouraged. No matter how many times they may fall back into the old habits, every effort to conquer aids in the rebuilding, and the very fierceness of the struggle will ultimately strengthen the soul. But no matter how sincerely they repent, or what spiritual advance they make as a result of the suffering they undergo, when the aura is tainted with narcotics or filled with fumes of alcohol, and until the protective sheath of these centers are rebuilt, it is utterly impossible for a master or messenger from the great white lodge to contact or come anywhere near such a one, no matter how great the student's psychic or spiritual development. On the contrary, they will have a bitter fight to keep out their aura entities from the astral plane, and it will require many incarnations of such fighting ere the sheath can be rebuilt. These sheaths are not broken down in one incarnation, but since in each incarnation there is a tendency to repeat the same old mistakes until they are conquered, so in each incarnation there is a tendency to increase the weakness brought over from the past until the final breakdown comes. 
The rebuilding must necessarily follow the same law, that is, be brought about by gradual accomplishment through determined and persistent constructive effort. We read in the Bible that no drunkard can inherit the kingdom of heaven. In this sense, the kingdom of heaven means the highest spiritual plane, which can be reached only by perfect control of the doors or centers through which alone communion is possible. The Bible does not say that no drunkard can be saved, but that he cannot reach into the higher spiritual realms and come into conscious touch with his Father in heaven until he is conquered. He has destroyed the means of communication, and it is only after earnest and persistent effort through many lives that such a one can gradually rebuild the sheaths, purify the centers, and again make the body a fit temple for the coming of the Christ. Many drunkards desire to stop drinking, but being open to the astral plane, they are unable to resist the urge of these disembodied ones who have passed out of physical life while addicted to drink and have no means of gratifying their desires in the astral world. In order to gratify them, they must come into touch with the physical plane by entering into or obsessing someone on the physical plane ere they can again experience the effects of the drug. On the other hand, there are drinkers who simply say, I am done with drink and never touch it thereafter. In such cases, they are unconsciously rebuilding the centers until finally a point is reached where the doors can be closed at will, and it only requires some strong emotions to put the will into effect. This will is often aroused in a dramatic manner at the sudden conversions which so frequently result from various forms of religious excitement. It is only in a normal, purified, strong, and healthy body, with every function of its highest degree of development and every center under perfect control, that the Christ can fully manifest on earth. You can live the Christ life and attain to a high degree of spirituality and take many advanced steps without meeting all these requirements. But you cannot reach mastery without fulfilling all the law. One of the most noticeable karmic results of the use of narcotics and alcohol in past incarnations can be seen in the numerous non-spiritual subjective mediums of the irresponsible type who are to be found on every hand. Their doors, destroyed in past lives, now stand wide open, leaving them at the mercy of any and every entity who desires to gratify its animal senses upon the physical plane. Truly, their lot is pitiable one, the more so because they know not the terrible dangers they run. Another karmic result of the action of alcohol and drugs is to be found in a certain class of congenital imbeciles whose psychic centers cannot even connect with the ordinary centers of the physical body. In fact, many of them are the reincarnation of the soulless entities mentioned above. They have almost no voluntary control of any but the lowest animal functions and must finish out their incarnations in a sort of vegetative animal existence. Still another way in which the doors are frequently broken open is by placing yourself in a passive, non-resisting state and making the demand for psychic experience or sitting for development as it is called. In this practice, you are placing yourself in a negative state in which any entity dwelling on the lower astral plane can help you break open the doors. This either destroys the doors or abnormally forces the development of psychic centers instead of unfolding them as a natural accompaniment of spiritual growth. When results have been thus obtained, since the doors are not under the control of your will, they are open to any entity who desires to obsess you. Even if the obsessing entity is a disembodied friend or good moral character, your condition is not altered, for he must be near you constantly to protect you from the fiends. This is what takes place in ordinary subjective mediumship. As we said in Letters from the Teacher, the difference between spiritual communion and subjective mediumship is a difference both of vibration and method. The right way to contact the higher plane is to raise the vibration of your physical and psychic bodies and their centers until they vibrate in harmony with the keynote of the soul plane, at which pitch no evil things can come nigh thy dwelling. As we can only become aware of a thing when some part of our organism responds to its vibration, the psychic must have the proper development to come into harmony with the spiritual plane ere he can contact the masters or respond to things which touch upon or vibrate within the octave of their keynote. On the one hand, spiritual communication, the psychic, through spiritual living, loving thoughts, and helpful actions in many lives, must build into his or her character enough of the divine principle of compassion for all humanity to raise the vibration of all the bodies, either temporarily or continuously, to the note of spiritual love to which the masters of compassion naturally vibrate. On the other hand, subjective mediumship, the psychic, through various means, either mentally by stilling the thoughts, or physically by various yogi practices such as gazing at a crystal, a black spot, or sitting in a constrained position, 
through breathing exercises and many other still more objectionable practices, has gained the power of stilling the physical vibration becoming negative, or when through the oily sheaths have become weakened or destroyed, the psychic is naturally negative. In such a state, the physical atoms, not being held together by the vibratory rhythm to which they naturally respond, slow down and fly off to such an extent that they discarnate, entity clothed in atoms of, and vibrating to the note of astral plane, which is next to, and its lower degree overlaps the earth plane. They can gather up and clothe themselves in sufficient of the physical atoms thus thrown off to temporarily vibrate to the keynote of the physical plane, and become temporarily recognizable on that plane. In the first instance, the whole desire of the psychic is to uplift humanity. He is filled with compassion for the race and desire to give himself as a willing sacrifice to bring enlightenment to the world. This is true spiritual development. The teachers and masters whom he contacts do not see the little individual difficulties, or if they do, they understand the law and know that all is working out for the best. The only wisdom can really help. Given wisdom, love, and sustaining help, the disciples can, and indeed must, work out their own personal problems. As Paul said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. All spiritual communication is uplifting, and the spiritual atoms which the psychic has contacted and drawn into his body will rejuvenate and strengthen the physical, uplift the mental, and advance him on the path of spiritual attainment. In the second instance, by giving up the command over the life forces and throwing open or breaking down the doors of the sacred centers, the vitality is drawn upon and the atoms thrown off are used to bring to the physical plane the denizens of the astral. These may be pure or vile and are attracted to the medium in exact ratio to the state of the atoms which he or she gives off during the negative sitting. If you understand this, and the fact that most of the entities contacted upon the astral plane are not spiritual beings, but merely men and women with their most dense and outer garment, the physical body removed, you will understand the danger of giving yourself up to their use. Since they are using astral sense, they can see farther ahead than those on the earth plane, but such advice as they have to give should be taken just as you would take the advice of any earthly friend, subject to your own good judgment and common sense. Usually such entities are interested in the daily life of the sitter rather than their true spiritual advance. But if evilly disposed or lacking wisdom and a knowledge of the law, they can and often do deceive. They can only come to earth as they left it, that is, clothed in physical atoms. The fact to manifest on the physical plane they must steal physical atoms from the medium and sitters is proof positive of this. Often their desire is to help alleviate earthly conditions, but their advice, while valuable in many cases, is still in accord with worldly standards. In fact, their activity is much like that of a well-meaning but over-meddlesome friend on the earth plane. They desire to help their friends out of difficulty over hard places and often give advice which helps to make money out of a, the credulity of their fellow men. This, as you can see, but helps to sink the race deeper into the mire of earthly affairs. The first is the constructive the second, the destructive method of communication. In no case, unless they are masters, in which case they will manifest quite differently, as we will explain later, are they different from the people on earth, except that they are functioning in a body composed of finer matter. You cannot always tell which of the above-mentioned methods have been used by the teachings received, for even in subjective mediumship, the teaching may be of a higher moral character, just as some friend might give you a highly moral address. But no matter who the entity claims to be, he will not be a master of wisdom if the subjective method is used, for no master of the right-hand path ever uses that method. In this case, it is not a question of what teachings are given, but how they are given. One absolute test as to which method a psychic is using and from whence the message comes is the effect on the physical body. In spiritual communication, the psychic is clothed upon by spiritual atoms which self-effacement and compassion have drawn to him, and he grows more spiritual. If after the experience his vitality is augmented and a peaceful, happy, and vigorous feeling remains, even for days afterwards, if life seems fuller, trials easier to bear, and love more abundantly, you can rest assured that he has risen above earthly things and has been clothed upon by the Spirit, and has brought back lessons for the benefit of humanity. This is the form of communion with the higher planes it should be desired. But do not strive for it. Let it come as natural growth resulting from a life filled with loving, unselfish thoughts and deeds. In subjective mediumship, however, 
owing to the loss of physical atoms of vitality, the psychic is depleted and weakened, and soon shows it, not only in bodily health, but also in mental power. His nervous system is enervated, his mentality is dulled, and a great stumbling block has been placed in his path. If after communicating the psychic is exhausted, tired, nervous, cross, fretful, and uneasy, even for days, you can rest assured that he has allowed some astral entity to absorb his vitality and contact him by the second and destructive method. It must be remembered, however, that even the psychic who uses the constructive or correct method of communication is far more highly sensitive than the average and hence is easily affected by any lack of harmony in surrounding conditions, either physical or mental and often suffers from such conditions, although later is able to conquer or rise above them. This is one reason why in all ancient religions the Sibyl, or inspired priestess, was always surrounded by love, beauty, and harmony, and sacredly protected against all forms of inharmony. We are now nearing the end of the fifth root race of the fourth round, having just entered its sixth sub-race, and are reaching a point where, if we have been diligent, we should begin to lift up our eyes and see our father afar off and say, I will arise and go to my father. Many are beginning to unfold their inner faculties and realize the presence or perhaps hear the voice of the divine guide and teacher and receive messages and teachings from him. While the teachings of the masters are always true, for there can be no confusion since they are all one and give out identical teachings. Yet psychics who have never studied the philosophy of evolution and rebirth or the laws of communication with such beings cannot always grasp, hence cannot correctly interpret the lessons given, and much confusion results owing to the intellectual limitation of the instrument they must use or the physical brain. The physical brain cannot grasp or respond to ideas of which the pictures, or at least some conception, the seed, so to speak, has not been acquired through the outer sense organs, that is, through study, observation, etc., at this point, there are many, many avenues of deception, hence the great necessity for the pupil to come under proper instructions, and above all to learn that strict obedience to the laws which ages of occult training have proved to be the only safeguards is a necessity, which laws he cannot find out for himself in one incarnation. Nor can he find them out through the guidance of astral teachers, for no matter how well-intentioned such teachers may be, they are still limited to the stage of their own evolution. Hence only those who have passed through all stages of evolution and have mastered the law can give such training. Such great teachers do not impart this training through astral means, for they have left well-authenticated records and textbooks of their philosophy. Hence, like any other scientific study, only when the student has familiarized himself with the fundamentals of the science will the advanced teacher attempt to communicate with him. For those great teachers know only too well the temptations and deceptions of the astral plane, and their great desire is to protect humanity from these dangers rather than to lead into them. Much better for a teacher to throw a pupil into the water ere he had been told how to swim. Just as a college contains the accumulated wisdom and experience of all who have made discoveries in any line of study, while an individual experimenting alone has only his own experience to guide him and must make many blundering mistakes which a college training would have prevented, so it is in occultism. The Bible is full of references to these psychic centers. Whenever doors or gates are mentioned in the scriptures, the reference is to these sacred centers. The following are a few of the many references. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. The children of Israel were told to take the blood of the sacrificed lamb, symbolizing the Christ force sacrificed in humanity, and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. It is a sign that the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into your house to smite you. The whole story of Job is but a history of an initiation. In it Job laments as his chief sin that he opened his door to the traveler, and again he seeks. Have the gates of death been opened unto thee? Or hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? Both of these statements are incomprehensible from any literal point of view, but are plain in the light of the above. Wisdom is spoken of as, She crieth at the gates, at the entry of the city, at the coming in at the doors. In Isaiah we have the invitation, Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. This is the condition necessary to entering into communion with the spiritual plane, for the doors must be shut to the lower, ere they can be opened to the higher. In the New Testament we have these directions as to prayer or spiritual communion. 
But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, shut out all worldly and astral conditions, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. A most significant allusion to the necessity for mastery over the doors is given in St. Luke. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up, and hath shut to the door, but he shall say, I tell you, I know not whence ye are, depart from me, all ye workers of inequity. To whom can this dismal apply but to those without the gates? This plainly alludes to the state of development in which we have gained such mastery over the doors that we can shut them to all undesirable influences, even though they have supped with us, and say, Depart all ye workers of inequity, and make them depart, for you must be the master of your house. Again in St. John 10, 1 through 3 we read, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. Note carefully the promise given to the angel of the church of Philadelphia in Revelation 3, 7-13. through Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my words, and hast not denied my name. This promise is now being literally fulfilled as these are the last days of the cycle, and this movement is the open door referred to. The cry of the Christ rings in the ears of every student who reads this lesson. Behold, I, the Christ for, stand at the door, the heart center and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in unto him, and will sup with him and he with me. Just as there is danger in opening the doors of the individual, so it is with all spiritual movements. Every movement really sent out by the Great White Lodge is a vital center or door in the great body of humanity, and as such doors are open, it becomes the duty of every student who enters therein to sacredly guard his door, and see to it that only the Christ force shall enter, else, just as with individual doors, evil psychic forces will pour in. The door, which this movement symbolizes, is a door for all humanity. It is the door of the heart center through which the love force is poured out to all the centers. If a movement be established through mere psychism, emotionalism, or the desire of some personality to shine as a teacher, then the evil forces of the lower astral planes are poured out upon its followers instead of the Christ force, even if some of the teachings given out are seemingly helpful. It will be noticeable, however, in some movements that the spirit of loving fellowship is absent, and in its place is a tendency for their leaders to demand personal aggrandizement. Therefore, all the students of the higher life, when confronted with a spiritual movement, should seek in the silence the guidance, not of any mortal, but of their own higher self in regard to it. The question is not merely whether they find in the movement certain things which they can accept while rejecting others, but that they must determine what force is being poured out through the door or movements. For every person belonging to a spiritual movement, as well as its leaders, is absolutely responsible for the force that enters the body of humanity through them, as well as for the force they bring into the movement. If any movement is brought to your attention, and it be a true spiritual movement, it is the open door for you, and comes to you in response to your prayers for more light and help. If it be not a true spiritual movement, then it comes to you as a test of your ability to use your intuition and judgment. Therefore, do not accept the teaching of this or any other spiritual or occult movement until through prayerful consideration meditation you receive the confirmation of your own divine guidance that it is the open door for your next step. Chapter 8. A Study of Karma Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Galatians 6.7 the word karma is of Eastern origin and has no exact equivalent in the English language. It signifies the working of a great fundamental law. This law, whether conscious or unconscious, predestines nothing and no one. It exists from and in eternity truth, for it is eternity itself. And as such, since no act can be co-equal with eternity, it cannot be said to act, for it is action itself. It is not the wave which drowns a man but the personal action of the wretch who goes deliberately and places himself under the impersonal action of the laws that govern the ocean's motion. 
Karma creates nothing, nor does it design. It is man who plans and creates causes, and karmic law adjusts the effects, which adjustment is not an act, but universal harmony, tending ever to resume its original position, like a bow which bent down to forcibly rebounds with corresponding vigor. If it happens to dislocate the arm that tried to bend it out of its natural position, shall we say that it is the bow which broke our arm, or that our own folly has brought us to grief? It is not involved in decrees in darkness purposely to perplex man, nor shall it punish him who dares to scrutinize its mysteries. On the contrary, he who through study and meditation unveils its intricate path and throws light on these dark ways and the windings of which so many men perish owing to their ignorance of the labyrinth of life is making for the good of his fellow man. Karma is an absolute and eternal law in the world of manifestation, and as there can only be one absolute, as one eternal, ever-present cause. Believers in karma cannot be regarded as atheists or materialists, still less as fatalists. For karma is one with the unknowable, of which it is an aspect in its effects in the phenomenal world. While karma is the implacable law of cause and effect, bringing to you in exact justice the net results of your past thoughts, desires, and acts, it does not do so in detail, and hence it is not the avenging nemesis it is so frequently represented to be. For the only decree of karma, an eternal and immutable decree, is absolute harmony in the world of matter as it is in the world of spirit. It is not, therefore, karma that rewards or punishes, but it is we who reward or punish ourselves according as we work with, through, and along with nature, abiding by the laws on which that harmony depends or breaking them. It is not your acts that are the cause of karma but the possession or lack of certain soul qualities, which is the cause both of your thoughts, desires, and acts, whose effects are brought to you by the great law of harmony for readjustment. The lords of karma, spoken of so frequently in the Oriental teaching, would mean, in European parlance, the conscious forces which brings about the natural sequence of events. These forces, however, are not blind, unintelligent streams of force against which you must hopelessly battle, but are the conscious, intelligent executors of the law of divine harmony or love. Their sole object is to spiritualize and perfect both the planet and its inhabitants. Hence, disobedience to the law is not punished, but is adjusted, even though the adjustment brings about sorrow and suffering. The decrees of karma are not something to be endured as a punishment, but if in ages past you have made mistakes and failed to gain certain soul qualities, which are necessary for your further progress, these great entitized powers place before the soul the conditions which are made necessary by your past disobedience or inaction, which the soul itself chooses as the best means of learning the needed lessons and acquiring the needed qualities. The personality may suffer during the experience it undergoes in the conditions selected by the soul, but just as a tornado brings destruction, yet is beneficial in purifying the atmosphere and sweeping away old accumulated conditions which are detrimental, so with the karmic storms which sweep away the personality, for their purpose is to sweep away old false ways of thinking, that new soul qualities may be put forth and bear fruit. Although the tornado is a result of the inharmony and impurity created by man, still it is used as an agent of karma to dissipate the accumulated forces of evil and to readjust the atmosphere and permit new conditions more advantageous for the evolution of the planet and its inhabitants to manifest. Thus the tornado was not the cause of the destruction of life and property in its path, it was merely the agent for adjusting the cause set up by man. So with the storms of sorrow, disaster, and poverty in your life, everything that comes to you as trouble or sorrow is simply the result of your own shortcoming, your failure to learn the lessons which less painful experiences should have taught you. The fundamental idea of karma is harmony. It is not a punishment, not even an inevitable law of suffering which you must endure. But in the course of your evolution, your higher self chooses to incarnate in certain families and under certain conditions, which will bring out the soul quality which is lacking. The conditions chosen may be the result of causes set up by you in past lives, owing to a lacking quality, or if all these previous causes have been worked out, they may be chosen by the soul, de novo, to develop a new soul quality, without having had any previous connection with them. The main idea of karma, then, is not one of punishment for past failures, but that you may learn your lessons and gain as quickly as possible the soul qualities needed, that you may fulfill your destiny, your special place and work in the grand plan. 
When the lessons have been learned and the quality gained, the law is fulfilled, and there is neither karma nor anything else to hold you to the old conditions, except your own free will. And if you hold to them after you have learned the lessons, you are but setting up fresh karma. Therefore, instead of sitting down dejectedly and saying that you will bear everything as your karma, much as a child might stoically bear a whipping, rather be like the child who recognizes the justice of the whipping and sees behind it the loving desire of its parents to inculcate a needed lesson, and whose heart is filled with sorrow that it has made the whipping necessary. It is foolish to invoke your past karma with the idea of working it out more quickly, for the law will bring it to you as fast as you are able to conquer and learn the lessons from it. To thus demand that your karma be precipitated is to be overwhelmed by terrible suffering in order to learn the lessons which a little later you would be strong enough to learn with little or no suffering. To thus demand your karma would be to set up your judgment as superior to that of the Lord of Karma, thus showing a lack both of discretion and of humility. Hence, special trials might have to come to you to teach you the lessons which otherwise you might have learned happily while working out the law normally as life brought it to you. While you must learn poise and calm under all conditions, at the same time you must seek earnestly within yourself for the soul quality which your trials are most fitted to bring to the surface. And when you have recognized it, strife earnestly to cultivate that quality and manifest it in your life, then the old conditions will quickly begin to fall away from you, although you will pass through a period of severe testing to prove whether or not you have really learned the lesson and built the desired quality into your soul. Learning the lesson, however, does not mean merely recognizing it or gaining an intellectual conception of what is lacking, but gaining the power to manifest that quality, for the change must be within and not merely on the surface. Recognition of what is lacking is a necessary step in attaining it, but when recognized there comes the testing to see if you have really gained the quality or merely recognized the lack. For instance, if you know that your great lack is impatience or lack of control of your temper, as long as only it is an outward manifestation is controlled, you will still suffer from the effects of anger, for your friends will say, He managed to control his temper, but I could see he was boiling inside. If you are lacking quality is generosity, and you recognize the necessity of being generous, but give merely because you believe it your duty, or because you expect gratitude in return, those who receive your gifts will instinctively feel the grudging attitude of soul back of the gift, and will not send out the feeling of gratitude you are seeking. You will thus suffer from ingratitude until you can give with true generosity of soul. It is not your karma to suffer from specific acts of anger or ingratitude, but it is your karma to learn control of your temper and generosity of soul. If you are driving an automobile and notice something wrong with the engine and stop and adjust it, no harm results. But if you are careless and do not correct the trouble, and the machine is wrecked and you are injured, it was not your karma to be injured by an automobile, but it was your karma to be taught carefulness and common sense. Hence it is not your specific acts that bring you karma to you, but the lack of soul quality and any available events, conditions, or circumstance are used to teach you the necessary lessons. Your acts are like leaves on a tree, the result of the amount and character of the sap. If the sap is lacking in life force or is diseased, the leaves will wither and fall. But if the following season the sap is enriched and regains its lacking quality, the tree will put forth perfect green leaves. It is not the fault of the leaves that they drop, but a lacking quality in the leaves. As you realize that it is yourself who is responsible for all the disturbing influences which surround you, and that it rests with you to overcome them by eliminating the causes, you have begun in the right way to work with the law and gain self-knowledge and self-poise. Make yourself one with the law, and all its manifestations will work in harmony. The above is but one phase of the law. In addition to personal karma, there is karma of the family, the community, the nation, the country, the race, and the world, all of which modify and are being modified by the personal karma. For instance, we all suffer from the storms and rigors of climatic conditions, yet some have ample shelter while others have none. We all endure the economic conditions of society, its inequalities, its injustices, etc., yet some suffer more acutely than others according to their personal karma. All members of a family are subject to the same environment, but individual members modify or rise above it. Thus the individual, the family, the nation, and the planet are both individually and collectively learning their lesson. The lesson for the individual is to recognize his responsibility in bringing about such conditions, also the necessity for doing all in his power to bring about better conditions, not only for himself alone, but for all. 
for he cannot gain the soul qualities he is here to learn without advancing the evolution of the entire planet to a certain extent. Many students of life feel that a great injustice has been done them and that the masters whom they are trying to serve do not remove their physical burdens and push them into positions of ease where they will be able to work and devote their time and thought to the master's work. The masters are just as subject to the law of karma as is the lowliest of earth's children. They can work with it but not control it. A farmer does the best he can to cultivate his fields, but he cannot make a grain of wheat grow where a grain of rye has been planted. He can enrich the soil and cultivate it so it can bring forth a perfect crop of rye, but the environment or the field and the climate will still be the same, and the grain will still be rye, not wheat. This law is a benign and beneficent one, for it is only by reaping what we have sown and eating of the fruits thereof that we can ever learn to plant wheat instead of tars. Karma is looked upon by many as merely the result of their actions in past lives which determine their present conditions and environment. Well, it is this and much more. With the separation of humanity into the sexes at the close of the third race, or as the church puts it, the fall of man, the lords of karma took charge of the evolution of the personalized infant humanity, and personal karma became operative, the so-called fall of man being in reality not a fall, but a necessary descent into physical embodiment. Considering humanity as one, as the great body of the heavenly man reflected upon the lowest earth plane and broken up into myriad expressions, each soul or cell of this great body starts out with but one primal controlling desire, namely to gain the necessary experience to fit it to take its proper place and perfectly fulfill its function in the grand plan and become one with its Father in heaven. With this end in view, the soul marks out a path that influences in all its future incarnations the local karma of each incarnation being, but eddies along the mainstream. While the soul in its higher aspects always realizes its destiny, it must gain its experience in and work through various personalities and is responsible for the action of those personalities. It must build them up from life to life and is responsible for their creation, even to the matter of which they are composed. Thus the soul becomes the higher self or personal God and Savior of the various personalities. The personality may not heed the still small voice of the soul and may fail and fall in sin, but each failure must be corrected and redeemed and the personality brought back to its real work. The number of incarnations depends upon how swiftly the soul gains its experience and learns its lessons, or in how many by path the personality is allowed to wander, only to retrace its steps to the main path. It is the retracing of these wandering steps that is ordinarily referred to as karma, cause and effect, the cause being the going astray, violating the law, the effect, the retracing of the steps, the return to harmony. This is beautifully condensed in the Bible story of the prodigal son. Often incarnation after incarnation is spent in a sort of lethargy, experiencing again and again the same things without learning the lesson they are intended to teach. Sorrow and suffering and loss are often the only weapons that can awaken the personality from its lethargy to ultimately accomplish the main work. No two souls have or need precisely the same experience. If we take the circulation of the blood from the time it is propelled outward from the heart to perform its work to the time it returns again to the center, we will have a fair illustration of the working of the law of karma. Humanity as a whole is the bloodstream composed of myriads of personalized corpuscles, all propelled by the one living force and vitalized by the one breath to accomplish its great work in the heavenly man. Man is composed of free will and that his higher self has the will to accomplish its greater work, but the will of the personality is only free in a limited sense. It is free to stray from the path and the higher self cannot compel obedience but can only take advantage of every experience to mold the personality and ultimately bring it into the main channel. The soul, being complex in its nature, must seek for experience upon the plane of differentiation, physical plane, through masculine and feminine personalities. Just as the blood corpuscles start out from the heart to accomplish their work in the tissues, and after having been purified by the breath return to the heart, so these separated expressions of the soul start out from the center upon their great journey, called in the Eastern teaching the cycle of necessity, and having been purified by the Spirit, return to their Father in heaven. The blood may have a long, tedious journey and be met by apparently insurmountable obstacles ere it can accomplish its work and enter the stream that is returning to the heart, 
just so the soul may have to overcome great obstacles before it can return to the heart center. This point of return is the awakening of the personality to its higher self. It may be called conversion or what you will, but it is a recognition of its immortal destiny and a determination to walk consciously in the chosen path, its will one with its higher self. This, however, does not mean that the old karma has been wiped out, for as the Master Jesus plainly stated, For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Many ask how the doctrine of karma can be reconciled with the doctrine of forgiveness of sins, but a simple illustration will explain. If a beloved child through disobedience should pull down upon itself some heavy object and break a limb, its parents would forgive the disobedience, soothe its suffering, and lavish love upon it. But the forgiveness could not prevent the child from reaping the result of its acts, could not restore the broken limb, for that could be brought about only by slow and painful readjustment, the knitting of the bones, perhaps with some deformity remaining, no matter how great the forgiveness and love. All the obstacles encountered are not necessarily the result of the soul's minor karma, but may be necessary training to fit it for its chosen work. For instance, if you wish to train a horse to be a hunter, you would take it into the fields, put obstacles on its path, and teach it to jump. But if you desired it to be a staid family horse, you would teach it not to jump, but to jog quietly along a smooth, beaten roadway. You can see this law exemplified everywhere in nature. The seed contains the future tree, and if germinates beneath a rock, or if its growth is impeded by any untoward condition, it will struggle to overcome that condition. And no matter how distorted the growth of its form, it will find develop into an exact species of a tree pictured within the seed, even though its outward form is imperfect. Therefore, going back to our first simile, if the stream of your karma carries you to the feet or the hands, to the brain or heart of the heavenly man, do the duty that lies nearest you cheerfully and to the best of your ability, and diligently learn the lessons that its perfect accomplishments will teach. It is the duty of the feet to support and carry, the hands to execute, the brain to plan and direct, the heart to furnish the life force to all parts. But unless each performs its duty in its own place and performs it well, the whole man must suffer. Let go, then, the things that are holding you back. Throw yourself into the stream. Push out into the current while you will not get stranded in the eddies. Cease to cling so desperately to the rocks and snags against which you are tossed, for they are a sign of shallow water. Have faith to believe that your brothers and sisters are also in the stream in their proper place and are learning the lessons they have incarnated to learn. Have faith that your Father in heaven knows their needs as well as your own and is watching over them as well as you and has promised that no good thing will he withhold from them that love him. Chapter 9. The Self I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. St. John 11, 25, 26 Saith the great law, In order to become the knower of all self, thou hast first of self to be the knower. To reach the knowledge of that self, thou hast to give up self to non-self, being to non-being, and then thou can repose between the wings of the great bird, bestride the bird of life, if thou wouldst know, from the voice of silence. The I am, which is the resurrection and the life, is the true self. We are dead when our consciousness is identified with the lower personal self and bounded by the mortal body and its functions. The personal self, however, can be made a good and faithful servant, hence it is not to be despised, killed out, and swallowed up in a way so frequently interpreted, for without it the real self could not gain the experience of physical existence. It is a garment worn to protect the real self from the coarse and harsh vibrations of physical life, just as a diver dons a diving suit to protect him from the pressure of the water when he wishes to explore the earthen depths. But if it loses touch with the higher self, it is doomed, just as the diver when he loses touch with the upper world and his supply of air is cut off. If you are wedded to the idea of the lower personal self and consider it all important or all there is, you must reach a stage of growth in which your ideals, your enthusiasm and zest in life, which at one time gushed forth like a mountain freshet, must die or lose themselves in the sands of earth conditions or be dried up by the hot scorching sun of criticism and worldly disapproval. But if you bestride the bird of life or hold for your central idea the thought of the I am, not the mere personality, but the higher, 
divine self, or the Christos, even those former ideals, though dead, shall rise again, be spiritualized, never die. Just as the diver, if he holds fast to his source of supply, will be enabled to do his work, and when it is accomplished, will rise into the upper air and take off his clumsy accoutrements. Should he think, however, that the diving suit was himself, or should he lose his memory of the higher world, he could never rise from the depth and return to his real home. If in the face of all obstacles you go on trusting and centering your ideals on the true self, which is immortal, your faith can never die. For you will know that the real self can never be affected by the changing conditions of earth life. This is bestriding the bird of life. As long as you hold firmly to this idea, you hold the reins which shall guide the bird of life throughout eternity. The eye is the only symbol in the alphabet that stands both for deity, the straight vertical line symbolizing spirit descending into matter, and for personality. As you advance along the path and reach up through and above the personality and follow the straight line upward into divinity, the personality blends into and becomes the individuality. The Son becomes one with the Father. The small letter I symbolizes the personality before its spiritual awakening. The self, perpendicular line, overshadows by the higher self, the dot, who as yet cannot manifest on earth except as the germ of that which the lower self can reach up and merge into. The perpendicular line must reach up and merge into the dot before it can become the I. Even the materially minded recognize that the only path to worldly success is implicit faith and belief in yourself. This is but the lowest octave of the true success which results when you raise your belief from the personal level to the real self. The relative value of the real self and the personal self may be represented by a capital I painted in gold upon a dark shadowy background designed to make the golden letter more conspicuous. The personality must always be the shadow on earth of the real I, its office being to emphasize and give perfect expression to the real self and make its golden light stand out the more brilliantly because of the shadow. Manifested life is compared to the great bird, Paramahansa, for just as a bird grows to maturity and lays an egg out of which hatches another bird, so the cycles of manifestation emerge from the world egg, mature and deposit their eggs, Laya centers, out of which new manifestations, Manvantaras, of activity emerge. The winged globe and the winged wheel have the same symbology, namely that time is fleeting, but is forever progressing. This symbol is often called the winged eternity, eternity only in its eternal renewal of manifestation. The bird of life called Kalahamsa or black swan, black because unmanifested, symbolizes the higher or divine self, the I am that I am. Hence, to be stride, the bird of life, means to be master of all the manifesting expressions through which this great bird or winged wheel is passing, just as a rider must control and master his fiery steed. Our text, therefore, points out the possibility of such mastery and the only way by which it can be attained, that is, by an understanding of the self, merging the personality into the individuality over the straight line of your awakened spiritual consciousness. To accomplish this, think of yourself as one with the silent thinker, the great oversoul, the self, the bringing forth of all things, and swallow up the little personal self in this great conception of selfhood. Always think of the real self as an emanation from, or an expression of the divine, of which you, the personal self, are but the shadow. While you should make the personal self a perfect shadow or reflection of the divine, Still, even after that is accomplished, it must take its proper place as the humble servant of the self. If you make a sincere effort to do this, how much of misery, of unhappiness, of trouble will fall away from your life, as we have said in another work, O ye seekers for the way. To you comes a message from all the spheres through which the spirit of life eternal presses onward, pulsating, rising, falling, beating the outward form into nothingness, that the immortal spirit of all things may be revealed to you the soundless sound. What does this mean, this beating into nothingness? What is this outer form? It is the personality, your life in the outer world. But most of all these things, my business, my pleasure, my friendships, be beaten into nothingness. Yes, if they so completely occupy your attention that they prevent the real self from manifesting. For once you have set out upon the path to mastery, once having chosen to live the higher life, 
you have registered your desire and your willingness to let that self manifest, and all the forces of the universe work together to fulfill your vow. Therefore, be not amazed at anything that happens to the little self, but instead ask, why, why? That which holds you back is the personal self. Almost every trouble that confronts you is centered in this little self, and what others think of that self. Perhaps you are so humble that you think constantly on how little you are, and dwell upon it so that it is impossible for the silent thinker to inspire you, perhaps to do a great work. Perhaps you magnify every little deviation from that conduct which you have decided makes for spiritual growth. Perhaps instead of keeping your mind on your higher self, you are watching to see what others think of your beliefs, striving to shape your life to meet their approval, or trying to live up to what others consider a spiritual life instead of listening to the silent speaker and following your own divine guidance. Perhaps you are following some great ambition, trying to accomplish some great things for humanity. Perhaps some slight to the little self occupies your whole attention, perhaps some grief. There may be many seemingly laudable excuses given for allowing the little self to occupy the center of the stage in your life, but whatever they are, if you are honest with yourself, true and serious in your desire to be united to the mind of the silent thinker, you must admit that it is self that is occupying your attention and bringing about your troubles. This is comparable to the ignorance of the illiterate person who uses a small letter I where a capital I is indicated, for the little I is always subordinate and should never stand alone. You would not long fret or worry if, instead of focusing your attention upon the little self, its needs, its joys, its sorrow, its slights, or perhaps its honors, you permitted it to be swallowed up in an effort to realize your divine self. To think of the personal self only as a vehicle or expression or shadowy background on the physical plane of the great self, the higher self. Many dream of a grand work for humanity, but the little self sets boundaries upon it or decides what the work is to be, thus allowing many opportunities to go by while waiting for what they have decided is to mark the beginning of their great work. While the great work which each soul has to accomplish is born from the higher self, it must be accomplished through the little self or personality. Hence the events which mark its beginning will be just those which the little self can accomplish, and by which such accomplishments grow into greater things. To sit with folded hands for a miraculous beginning is just as disastrous as to try to use a capital I where the small I is needed. Again, it must be borne in mind that the work of each self will be brought to that personality by the great law, and it will never be another's work. Each personality is in very truth a ray from its higher self. But in passing through earth conditions, it has become clouded, obscured, distorted, just as a ray of light becomes distorted by passing through a dense medium. Therefore, no person should try to pattern his life after that of another, or after another's ideal, but after the ideal life of the soul is set forth in the allegorical life of the Christ-man Jesus. He should take account of his own disposition and idiosyncrasies, and seek to find the original intent of each characteristic, or the germ of good within every fault. For this reason, know thyself, is the watchword, rather than to pattern after another, be that other ever so godlike. For in the grand plan, while all are one in the unity of the Godhead, still each atom or personality has its own part to play, and is endowed with tendencies and characteristics, which, when corrected and sublimed, will fit in to take its own place, a place no other can ever fill. Since your personality is the distorted image of your higher self, it should be your first duty to straighten it out and discard the Orionus due to the elusiveness of the medium through which it is functioning and permit it truly to express the real self. The important point to remember, therefore, is not to copy the actions of others or try to square your life with the ideals of others, but bravely seek deep within your own being for the germs of action implanted in the personality by the higher self, and make the personality measure up to the ideal given you by your own higher self. In other words, find yourself. Do your own thinking and live true to your own divine guidance. We are wont to consider self as those who desire only happiness for the self or who refuse to let others have what they desire. We think ourselves very unselfish if perchance we strive to appear meek, seem humble, eager to talk about our littleness and the greatness of others and to prefer others to ourselves. But the truth is, and we would speak it in tones that would vibrate from pole to pole, that it is just as selfish to permit your humility to occupy the foreground in your thoughts and continually impose it upon the thoughts of others as to continually seek your own pleasure. For even though you are dwelling upon your own unworthiness, 
Nevertheless, it is the little self that is occupying your attention. The little self is your servant and must be set to work in the vineyard of your life and not stand all day idle, waiting for the Christ to come and give it work in the great vineyard of humanity. On the other hand, many teachers gain a considerable following by reiterating their own greatness, sanctity, and claims to holiness. They talk much of their wonderful experiences, their illumination, and their Christ-like character, and followers like sheep flock to them. But if each soul will do his or her own thinking, such claims to sanctity will at once arouse suspicion. For all scriptures and occult authorities proclaim in no uncertain way that whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. The true teacher must have evolved beyond the little personal self, and to some extent merged his consciousness into the divine, hence neither seeks nor permits adulation or worship for himself, but lets the divine in him speak through his teaching. Let your deep abiding aims, your aspiration, be ever upward. In fact, bestride the bird of life and soar into heavenly realms. Forget to look down to earth. If you stumble, do not waste a moment's thought over it, but remember the lesson from it and say, I must be up and doing. That is past and gone and shall not hold me back. Truly nothing can hold you back unless you hold to it. If the bird of life is chained to a perch, it cannot fly. It warbles not, nor can it stir a feather, but the songster mute and torpid sits, and of exhaustion dies. If you were running a race and tripped and fell, would you waste time carefully inspecting the spot where you fell and wondering how it happened? No, you would be up and on, intent only on reaching the goal, not even conscious of the bruises you have received. Thus must you run this race which ends in mastery. Be so intent on climbing the mountain that you have no time to think of your hurt feelings, no time to sit and cry, no time to enumerate either your personal grievances and slights, or your honors and exultation, no time to grieve over lack of appreciation of your efforts by those around you. While you are not to go over and over in your mind the things belonging to the little personal self, still you must not waste your opportunities. Do you full duty in life, be kind, loving, just, and true, yet always have your gaze fixed on high and on the realization of your oneness with the real self, like a thread of fire forever penetrating your being and filling your consciousness. The little self continually seeks to sit upon the throne of the higher self, and when you think you have made it the servant in regard to earthly things, it begins to assert itself on the higher planes of spiritual selfishness and spiritual pride. Determine that you will not remain identified with the servant or the personality, but will identify yourself with the master, the higher self. This life is but one day in the school of your soul. Your real life is not a school, but at home in your father's house. If things in school do not go as you would have them, nevertheless realize that everything that belongs to you or is a part of your soul is yours upon the soul plane. There are many expressions of the soul, and these expressions may manifest in absolutely different ways upon the different planes. That which belongs to you is yours upon the soul plane. Therefore, accept it upon the soul plane, but do not insist upon its physical expression also until the great law brings it to you. For its physical expression may not be for the personal self during this day of school. And if it does not belong to the personal self, why pin the self down to the little self, which, while learning its lessons in school, must have many of its beautiful possessions kept from it until study hours are over? You only prolong the deprivation by refusing to pay attention to your lessons for you thereby attract earthly atoms which do not belong to the real self, and which must be taken from you, making the little self bleed and suffer. You are like a ship which, while in the ocean, even if blown temporarily from its course, is still victor over currents, winds, tides, and storms. But if the same ship anchors for a time in ever so beautiful a harbor, it will become covered with barnacles, things that do not belong to it, and the longer it lies there, the greater the incrustation. The only way it can be set free is to have the barnacles scraped off, a painful process. Try to understand and realize that anything you cling to for the mere gratification of the personal self, no matter how desirable it may seem, is but a barnacle holding back your spiritual advance. Your higher self has now everything necessary for its perfection and will and must scrape off the barnacles ere it can indraw the little self into its own divine conscience and perfection. Dwell then in the higher self, which does not need the physical expression you desire, but has the reality in the oneness of the immortal soul of all, forever in the Godhead. One of the greatest temptations of those who are progressing and beginning to develop the higher consciousness is to think that they have reached the point where the divine illumination of conscious oneness with the higher self is soon to take place. 
So instead of merging their consciousness into the divine, they develop a great spiritual ambition for the little self to have an experience which shall lift them above their fellows and give them prestige. This is one of the most subtle temptations of the little self, which must be carefully guarded against. You can carry the burdens of the little self along only the first steps of the path long ere you enter the fourth gate. You must have left them behind. Like Christian in The Pilgrim's Progress, you must find them falling from your shoulders into the abyss and be able to let them go without a murmur. The abyss is the only place for that of the lower self which cannot be swallowed up, digested, transmuted, and permitted to manifest under and within the great divine self. Tear from your eyes the bandages of darkness and ignorance. Why will you suffer so long? Why put between you and all the loving great souls who are anxious to help you such a barrier, such a tremendous barrier as this lower self and its petty concerns? The spirit within you is immortal, divine. The soul of you is part of the soul of the heavenly man, and you owe it to your own soul to work with all your powers for humanity. This you cannot do while your horizon is filled with a little self, while you remember that you are a separate entity or anything but an expression of your true higher self, who is one with divinity. The real self, being one with all, is concerned only that the personal self learn the lessons necessary to bring it into conscious atonement with the divine, hence refusing to be turned aside from its purpose by the little trials and tests the personal self has to pass through. It sees only the great end, only the divine powers working through the little selves and leading humanity up to the divine. The self must become the true self, the higher self. Chapter 10 the doctrine of Avatara. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according to his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Revelation 22, 12-13. The order of the fifteen was put forth by the Great White Lodge for definite work in helping to prepare the way and make a place for the coming of the great world teacher, the Avatar. For ere such a divine being can appear on earth, there must be a nucleus formed of awakened souls, not only ardently longing for his advent, but who are sufficiently instructed in the law and developed through love to recognize him when he comes. The time has now come to give to our pupils such further information concerning this great event as the time permits. What is an avatar? For the term being used ought to be well understood. It is a descent of the manifested deity into an elusive form of individuality, an appearance which to men on this elusive plane is objective, but is not so in sober fact. That elusive form having neither past nor future, because it had neither previous incarnation nor will have subsequent rebirth, has not to do with karma, which is therefore no hold on it. In other words, a true avatar is a focusing of the individual cosmic Christ principle into and through the individuality of the great soul who has reached divinity, hence has no karma. Such a great soul must be an initiate into the mysteries, one who has overcome and reached nirvanic bliss, but who voluntarily incarnates in the flesh for the purpose of becoming a vehicle for an individualization of the Christos, that it may accomplish a special definite mission in humanity. Such as one sacrifices his life in the spiritual realms and offers himself as a vehicle because of his great love for suffering humanity and it answers to its great need for a more direct manifestation of divine love and wisdom. The whole doctrine of Avatara is so hedged about with mysteries whose elucidation belongs to the higher initiations that only a more or less imperfect outline can be given here. Generally speaking, however, an Avatar is not a mortal but a divine being who descends from the spiritual realms and suddenly appears on earth in a body composed of atoms which vibrate to the rhythm of the spiritual plane and hence are immortal. The Ophites and Nazarenes taught that. Therefore Christos, the perfect, united himself with Sophia, divine wisdom, descended through the seven planetary regions, assuming in each an analogous form, and entered into the man Jesus at the moment of his baptism in the Jordan. From this time forth Jesus began to work miracles. Before that time he had been entirely ignorant of his own mission. This is the true interpretation of the symbol in which Jesus is said to be born of a virgin. That is, he descended from the great celestial virgin Sophia as a direct avatar. From the life of Jesus as given in the Bible, it may be inferred that he was not a direct avatar, having been born of a woman. 
Nevertheless, he was a direct avatar, for that story is not a history of his physical life, but an allegorical account of the soul life of every great initiate. As above indicated, the Christos becomes individualized upon all planes, beginning with the highest spiritual plane and gradually descending to earth. In the case of the coming avatar, this individualization has already reached the higher astral plane, the next above the earth plane. When the mission of an avatar requires an appearance upon the physical plane, his spiritual body responds to his will, lowers its rate of vibration to the keynote of the physical plane, somewhat similar to the way steam can be condensed into ice, and he appears among men in a body to all intents physical, an appearance which to man on this elusive plane is objective, but is not so in sober fact, in that it is not a mortal body confined to the physical plane and subject to death and decay. Such a divine being is not born of woman, but simply appears in a body far more glorious, sensitive, and powerful than any mortal body could be. Such a body can manifest upon any plane of consciousness in response to the will of its possessor. Since such a great soul is one with his Father in heaven, he has all knowledge and all wisdom, hence would require no earthly instruction or schooling, for his consciousness would be one with the Christ consciousness, hence all-knowing. His manifested personality would transcend all racial characteristics and limitations, would be the type of perfected man. Hence he could not be pointed out as belonging to a particular race, but would embody the perfection of all races, and therefore would not arouse the race prejudice of even the most advanced. The appearance of an avatar is determined by the needs of humanity, and manifestation is as great as the highest ideal of the most advanced of mankind to man. He comes in answer to the cry of many, many hearts for more love and light, for higher ideals and for a clear understanding of the universal spiritual truth contained in the one wisdom religion. As more and more hearts send up their cries, the demand creates a vacuum or a negative vortex into which the positive complementary force of the Christ principle must flow and find an embodied manifestation humanity. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna, the Christ said, I produce myself among creatures, O son of Bharata, whenever there is a decline of virtue and an insurrection of vice and injustice in the world, and thus I incarnate from age to age for the preservation of the just, the destruction of the wicked, and the establishment of righteousness. This law is illustrated by the popular saying, the darkest hour is just before the dawn. Therefore, when we find that humanity has reached a point of great spiritual, mental, and social unrest, during which the established and recognized spiritual teachers have gotten so far away from their true spiritual guidance that the great mass of humanity are like sheep without a shepherd and are sending out their heart cries without ceasing. What is truth? Who shall show us the way? How long, O Lord, how long? This cry must bring forth its answer. In other words, when the enlightened thought of the day recognizes, as it does today, that its spiritual teachers are no longer in personal touch with the higher realms, and are no longer divinely called, guided and appointed to their offices, a new regime is demanded. When the ceremonies employed and the sacraments administered by priests and ministers no longer carry divine potency, it is time for a true priesthood to be established. When the covenant of marriage is no longer a sacred sacrament, but is degenerated into the mere recital of a few words before one who has no spiritual power to discern whether or not the man and woman belong to each other spiritually, as all divinely ordained priests have, and when through such ignorance the resulting mistake in marriages degrade the divine creative power into mere sex gratification, impurity, and lust, then there must come a fresh outpouring of divine love, purity, and wisdom. For there is never a sincere prayer uttered by the children of men that does not, by the very law of the universe, create its answer. Neither social, political, nor economic injustice and in harmony can ever be truly adjusted and regulated and graft abolished until the divinely appointed priesthood, who are under personal conscious direction of the progenitors and guides of the race, is reestablished. The question of the marriage sacrament alone demands a divinely appointed and trained body of spiritual leaders, a true priesthood, who have the power to know who should partake of that sacrament together and who should not. If there were no other need in humanity for an avatar, this alone would be sufficient to call one into manifestation, that a new order of true priests of the Lord or the divine law might be established. But there are many other crying needs expressed in present-day social, economic, and political conditions, as well as the awakening of many, many hearts to the need of more direct spiritual teaching. 
Hence all the signs of the time point to the necessity for a fresh outpouring of divine love and wisdom in this present age. As the avatar descends to the higher worlds and draws near the earth plane, all hearts who are open to his influence or respond to the keynote of his message come into more or less conscious touch with him, interiorly, through the illuminating power of his divine consciousness, and feel an unquenchable desire and an irresistible urge to purify, uplift, and make more harmonious that phase of work for humanity in which they are interested. And today all classes, types, and conditions of mind are feeling the influence of a great spiritual awakening, which is giving them a greater vision a greater realization of the needs of humanity and the possibility of their filling a wider range of usefulness and accomplishing greater results. And this no matter whether they are more or less blindly following the urge to do good along philanthropic, humanitarian, sociological, or political lines of endeavor, or whether they are occultists who understand the law and are working more or less consciously under the inspiration and direction of these great souls, the masters of wisdom whose love, wisdom, and power is back of and working through every effort for the betterment of the race in direct proportion to the ability of the various channels to assimilate and make use of their help. An avatar, then, is the focusing and embodiment of the same Christ principle that is manifested in all ages and all avatars, each of whom thus become the Christ for the age in which he appeared. Each direct descent of deity into physical embodiment, however, is preceded by many lesser and incomplete manifestations called avisha avatars. In these cases, an advanced soul, who has not yet reached full mastery, but who is sufficiently pure, loving, and compassionate, is chosen and overshadowed by the Christ principle for a certain time and for a certain purpose. In every organization, society, order, or movements working along truly spiritual, occult, or mystic lines, there will be certain advanced members who will be able to reach up into the spiritual realm and come into conscious communion with the avatar. From these advanced souls, one who is especially pure, gifted, well-trained, and worthy will be chosen as the mouthpiece through whom the message of the avatar will be given out to his particular society or movement. It is necessary, however, that this vehicle be capable of receiving and transmitting as much of the divine wisdom in its purity as the stage of evolution and degree of spiritualization of his bodies is capable of expressing. Hence, such a vehicle must be carefully trained, disciplined, and prepared that his faculties and powers may reach their greatest perfection. In each case, the Chosen One is a Christ only during the period of the overshadowing, at all other times being but the human and mortal personage. Not there is any limit to possible revelation, for the overshadowing is always the Christos, which is not a being, but that essence of divinity which is everlasting law, everlasting wisdom, the essence of truth from the beginning, from everlasting to everlasting. Jesus speaks of this overshadowing power as the Comforter, and tells his disciples that it is expedient for him to go away that the Comforter may come. This simply means that being the Avatar, he condensed or focused the Christos in himself, which at his departure would be perceived by mankind apart from its manifestations through his personality, and shine in every heart prepared to correlate with it. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. In other words, each truly spiritual, pure, and sincere society and movement will have some illumined soul who will be an avisha avatar to that society or movement to prepare its followers for the coming of the avatar, as John the Baptist prepared the Hebrews for the coming of Jesus. No doubt in many instances such as an avisha avatar will be considered by his followers to be the avatar in person, but this is easily determined if you remember that an avatar is not a mortal. When such a claim is made for any human being, however, great or wise, you may know that he could not be more than an avisha avatar and be mortal. Nevertheless, the essence of this message would be that an avatar, for water is still water, whether measured by a thimbleful or fine ocean. Furthermore, if he be a pure and enlightened avisha, he will not only refuse the title of avatar, but will exclaim with John the Baptist, one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He will also discountenance all adulation and personal worship. The characteristic of his teaching will include not only the much-abused universal brotherhood, but also the true tolerance that arises from a recognition of the divine guidance of other teachers and avishas. For one evidence of a true avisha must be a recognition of the divine mission of others. 
Necessarily, the messages of the various Avisha avatars will differ in details, methods of presentation, etc. For the ability of such a channel to give out the teaching depends upon such factors, as the line of endeavor he is interested in, his race thought, his mental and spiritual capacity, his habits of life, his knowledge of the laws and philosophy of the higher life, and the intellectual training his mind, through which all the teachings must pass, has received. In this way, the members of every society and movement shall hear the divine truth spoken in their own language, wherein they were born, that is, couched in the terminology, symbols, and characteristic methods of expression peculiar to their own avenue of truth. Thus all classes of humanity will be given the opportunity to do their part in preparing for the coming of the Great One by forming a universal center in which he can manifest. This does not necessarily mean a center in the sense of a segregated community but a universal center in the thought world from which the currents of force will radiate that shall affect the minds and hearts of the whole world. Each Avisha avatar will no doubt find a community for his own followers, and out of each community there must ultimately be chosen those advanced disciples who have been able to recognize the Christ in the air or on the higher planes, and hence are able to recognize him when he manifests in the flesh. These will be gathered together to be his immediate disciples and bodyguard, the avatar will not come to any one society, movement, order, or sect, but will come to humanity. His truth will be so divine and perfect, yet so simple, unbiased, and unprejudiced by the characteristic of any cult, that they will be equally applicable to all, no matter what their race, creed, or special trend or thought may be. We have in the Gospel of St. John, in language so simple as to be a complete and incomprehensible blind to all but the initiated, the whole doctrine of the avatara. We read, In the beginning was the Word, the Christos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God in that it was and is the totality of spiritual wisdom, the creative Word, the manifested Christ. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The Christ principle is the essence of divine life, without which there can be no life, and being divine, this life is the light of men, and is distinct from mere animal life, which is but the outward and densest covering of the divine essence. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended not, that is, it is hidden in the human body. These verses also bear testimony that this light of the Christos is once more to be manifested in humanity, as it has been manifested periodically from the beginning. This is but another and more compact statement of a deep esoteric truth and a most sacred mystery, which is filled volume after volume in more ancient scriptures. In all religions now on earth there is an exoteric or public and an inner or secret teaching. Something analogous is true of the manifested Christos. It has its exoteric manifestations and its inner essence. Heretofore, in every manifestation of an avatar, it has been the outer covering, as it were, of this power that is manifested through the vehicle, and even this had been more humanity could grasp or understand. In the coming avatar will be manifested more of the inner essence of the Christ than has ever been before possible, because thousands in the world today are shaking off the garments of their dense materialized conceptions of life and are responding to the higher spiritual ideals. Every great teacher, such as the Rastor, Gautama Buddha, Jesus, has founded a new religion, or at most a new expression of the one religion. They have all taught the wisdom religion, but in ways which appeal to the different people to which they came. While each of those great teachers has taken the world a step onward and emphasized some other phase of the divine truth, still they have founded but larger sects, rather than brought the world into one universal brotherhood. The Christian religion is universally acknowledged to be the greatest factor in modern civilization, and the time has now come for it to take an advanced step through the awakening of a sense of a deep, underlying, vital truth common to all religions in the hearts of all earnest seekers among Christian people, thus taking the first step on the return journey to the one wisdom religion. There are many prophecies in the Bible and elsewhere relating to the Avatar who closes this cycle, which have never been fulfilled in any sense. The book of Revelation is distinctly a history of the preparation for the coming of such an Avatar, in it is allegorically set forth all that must occur in the world during an avataric cycle. A careful study of this book will prove that it contains teachings identical with the above, as well as with those of the ancient revelations pertaining to the mysteries. This will be easily understood if the student will remember that the Bible covers the whole period of an avataric cycle, 
that is, from the first coming, to the reappearance of the Avatar at the close of the cycle. Jesus, speaking of the Christ principle within him, said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty, a most blasphemous assertion if referring to his human personality. This emphasizes the fact that it was not the man Jesus, but the Christos that manifested, and that it was the same power in all ages and all manifestations, and that the same divine power which manifested through the personality called Jesus will be the power to manifest through the avatar who closes this messianic cycle and plants the seed for the new. But instead of this return being merely the founding of new religion or sect, humanity, having passed the lowest point of the downward arc of the cycle and begun laboriously to climb the upward arc, the coming avatar must fulfill the prophecies already given, bring to earth as much of the divine wisdom as humanity can attain to the end of the sixth and seventh sub-races, and plant the seed for the future sixth great race, whose manifestation will usher in the golden age. The time of his coming cannot be given out but it will be in exact accord with the astronomical and numerical cycles hinted at elsewhere. Moreover, all who will be drawn into the coming brotherhood will find that they are in some mysterious way connected with the secret cycles of the Messiah. The Avatar cannot come until the cycle is fulfilled, until the stars are in their proper position, as we said in a former lesson. It is a fact that the creative force flows in cyclic waves, and in a cycle corresponding closely to a century of earth life. The ebb and flow of this great force is first downward, the first quarter of the century it passes from the spiritual world into the mental and psychic, the second quarter down into the physical, and then, in the last half of the century, back again into the spiritual plane, following the reverse order. But the deductions that have been drawn from these facts by some are arbitrary and misleading. As the force descends from the spiritual plane into the psychic, into the first quarter of the century, 1 to 25, it causes great creative activity in the psychic and mental worlds, and the masters take advantage of this fact to work with the tide. Consequently, all those who have developed their faculties so they can reach the higher psychic plane can meet the masters upon that plane, not upon the astral, and can benefit correspondingly by the great activity of that period. Later, during the second quarter of the century, 25 to 50, the force descends into the physical world and touches the lowest point of its arc, but it is still spiritual creative force. The natural deduction from this is, therefore, that the first quarter of the century, from 1 to 25, is most emphatically the planting and growing time, corresponding to the springtime of the year. It would be during this quarter of the century that an avatar would first manifest himself to his more advanced disciples and plant in their hearts the seed of his teaching. The second quarter of the century, 25 to 50, corresponds to summer, the time when this spiritual creative force, having penetrated to the earth plane, must bring forth its fruit upon that plane. Whatever has been planted must bring forth its fruit, provided it has been a fruitful season, and that is, providing the work has been faithfully done and the spring growth carefully nurtured. Should this part of the cycle of the century correspond with certain greater cycles, it would be possible at this period for the avatar to manifest openly among men. He being the fruit of the culminating cycles, the Master Jesus was spoken of as the first fruits of them that sleep. The word slept indicating not in manifestation. Should the avatar come, the result of his teaching and his contact with the earth would mature during this period. At the end of this quarter of the century, the force, having reached its lowest point, would turn upward and his teachings would raise humanity with it. The third quarter, 50 to 75, corresponds to the autumn when the fruit is harvested when we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The last quarter, seventy-five to a hundred, corresponds to the winter time when the ground is frozen. At that time, after the harvest has been gathered, and the spiritual forces indrawn, and the world has again fallen away from the true teachings, it becomes necessary for the Lodge of Masters again to send out an agent, or agents, on the physical plane to break the ground and prepare for the new springtime. At such a time, much of the activity of the Lodge is directed to the physical plane through physical embodiments. Consequently, these early years of the century are pregnant with power. As the years go on, this great creative force of love must be brought down to earth by those who can receive it, 
for only as we are able to reach up into the higher psychic realms and there meet and correlate with the great teachers is it possible to prepare for the coming to earth of the fruit or the embodied power of the Christ force in the person of the avatar whose coming and culminate of many cycles now makes possible and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven already the watchers have seen the Christ star the star that has announced to all wise men in all ages the appearance of an avatar Consequently, we believe that the Avatar will soon come, not in a physical body born of woman, but in a more ethereal or spiritual body, capable, nevertheless, of appearing objectively as a physical body as occasion demands. Instead of this being a time to sit down and con old lessons, it is time to be up and doing, but on lines altogether different from those suitable to the period of the breaking of the ground and the sowing of the seed. This is why the Order of the Fifteen is now put forth, to enable all who are ready to grow to the point where they can, through special instructions, come into personal touch with the Masters and the Avatar. It is asserted by many advanced thinkers that the present wave of psychic unrest is a sign of the near advent of the Avatar, and that a widespread development of psychic faculties will usher in his coming. This is indeed a sign of the coming, but it is not strictly correct to say that it will be the characteristic, for although there will be a period of great psychic activity, not, however, due to new senses, but to the use of the present faculties upon the inner plane. It will but serve to prove the mere psychic development is not the end to be desired. Behold the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. The spiritual understanding of the people shall be darkened, and they shall wander from sea to sea, seeking the word of the Lord. Today many are running to and fro after self-advertised teachers, seeking to develop their psychic faculties, and many who have begun to use their faculties on even the lowest stratum of the astral plane set themselves up as teachers or write books giving the world minute directions covering the whole field of thought and action, from the feeding of their animal bodies to the attainment of a depth ship. With the fragments of knowledge thus obtained, such teachers claim that every other psychic who has gleaned a few different fragments is wrong. This psychic awakening, conflict, and confusion will come as the first step in a wonderful wave of activity in all walks of life, tending to extreme selfishness and unbrotherliness, for each will claim the truth and start sect after sect, and like a pack of wolves tearing a carcass in pieces, each one will be ready to fight to the death to maintain and guard his bone against the whole pack. Then shall begin wars and rumors of wars, and the struggles for supremacy. Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son, and the children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. This will be but the beginning of the end, and the prospect would be hopeless indeed, did we not know that out of those who run to and fro, one by one there will come the few who will open their spiritual faculties, sweep away the mist of prejudice, and see the light of the Christos shining in their brother's heart. These few who will band together to help spread the light rather than to increase the confusion, and they will be the remnant who will survive the physical catastrophes and usher in the golden period of the present Kali Yuga age. These will not seek the kingdom through psychic development, but through the awakening of their love and compassion, they will find the Christ light illuminating their hearts and opening all the psychic doors normally and without effort. These will be the 144,000 who will meet the Lord in the air that is, in the higher spiritual plane, to which they can penetrate because of the love and compassion developed. Only when the Christ love is manifested and has thus awakened the hearts of a considerable number of disciples can a center be formed in which this power can be focused and individualized in the person of the coming avatar. When the birth of Jesus was announced, it was only after a particular angel had announced to Christ that the angelic hosts of heaven joined in their chorus. So today all who are faithfully guarding their flocks upon the mountaintop will first hear the announcement and then the response. The Order of the Fifteen is put forth in an effort to awaken the Christ love in the hearts of men, rather than to cater to the intellect or the desire for psychic development. For only those who can correlate with this Christ power can be gathered together as his disciples. The aim of this movement is especially to help all Christian people to find the deep, underlying vital truth common to all religions in their own, and thus truly, and in the only way possible, prepare for a universal brotherhood on earth in which each soul shall find the same vital truth spoken in their own language, 
couched and taught in terms of the religion in which he was born. This is the only way of bringing about brotherhood, for the dream of a brotherhood in which all classes of humanity and all varieties of race thought are forced to flow in one direction and accept as final truth couched in one set form, no matter how lofty the form or how beautiful its trend, is but a fantastic chimera born of the human mind, and whose attempted practical establishment has always ended, and will always end, in confusion, antagonism, and unbrotherliness far more intense than before the attempt was made. It is only by touching the deep, underlying springs of universal love that universal brotherhood can be attained. Therefore we ask one and all to seek to develop the Christ love in their hearts, remembering that only when it shows in their lives and makes them more Christ-like can it be said to have germinated. A seed may lie dormant for ages, but the instant it opens its heart to the life of the sun it begins to grow. So it is with the Christ seed. The Christ light is in every man, but we can say the Christ star has arisen only when it shines forth and illumines our daily life. The Christ love is a consuming fire, and all fire spreads. If the life remains cold and dark and selfish, the fire is not yet lit. This is the first step toward universal brotherhood, for when we find the Christ in our own hearts, we seek it in every other heart. Chapter 11 A Study of Reincarnation or Rebirth He asked his disciples, saying, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. St. Matthew sixteen thirteen fourteen. When the old teaching of reincarnation was revived in the Western world, it was necessary to bring to bear all the powers of logic to prove its reasonability, and its ancient and worldwide acceptance. Today this truth has permeated all classes of society, filling the world's literature and furnishing the motif for many successful stage productions, thus providing that the public is eager for the subject. This itself is an evidence of rebirth, for what else can this widely renewed interest in the subject be but a reincarnation of an ancient worldwide belief? For detailed proof of its reasonability, we refer the student to other authorities. Like many others that are true and generally accepted, proof that would convince all is out of the question for what is proof to one is not to another. For instance, a spiritualist might say that, if he had lived before, something might be given him by discarnate entities about a former life that could be verified by historical records. This would be no proof at all, for it would be an easy matter for any discarnate entity capable of communicating to secure the information from any records accessible to the investigator. As far as absolute proof goes, each one must take this law as he takes many other laws upon its reasonability. If it fails in this or in its ability to afford a rational explanation for the many discrepancies of life which are otherwise unexplainable, he is at liberty to reject it. But for those who do accept it, we will make an effort to remove some of the misconceptions and clear up some of the vagaries which, like barnacles, have attached themselves to the truth. Intimately, or rather indissolubly, connected with karma is the law of rebirth, or of the reincarnation of the same spiritual individuality in a long, almost indeterminable series of personalities. The latter are like the various characters played by the same actor, with each of which the actor identifies himself and is identified by the public for a space of a few hours. The inner or real man, who personates these characters, knows the whole time that he is Hamlet only for the brief space of a few acts, which, however, on the plane of human illusion, represents the whole life of Hamlet. He knows also that he was, the night before King Lear, the transformation in his turn of the Othella of a still earlier preceding night. And though the outer, visible character is supposed to be ignorant of the fact, and in an actual life that ignorance is unfortunately but too real, nevertheless the permanent individuality is fully aware of it, and it is through the atrophy of the spiritual eye in the physical body that knowledge is unable to impress itself on the consciousness of the personality. When the physical body is left in the tomb, the soul is clothed in the astral body and lives for a time upon the astral plane, in the exact environment for which its development fits it. A period of time is passed in digesting and assimilating the lessons of the past life, in the reverse order of their acquirement, and in realizing the inevitable trend of all its desires and actions while on earth. The progress made is in the growth and development of the seeds of good and evil sown during earth life. For this reason, unless reincarnation had been brought to one's attention upon earth, he would be very unlikely to know anything about it or come in contact with those who did, for there is nothing in his astral environment to suggest it any more than there was in his physical environment. 
after having passed through the various subdivisions of the astral world and passed on to higher states of consciousness, there comes a time in his evolution when after a long period of rest, during which his exhausted or experienced of spiritual bliss resulting from the realization of all his earthly ideals, he realizes his limitation and chooses once more to clothe himself in the flesh. He does this firstly from a comprehension of the great work of the redemption of humanity and the globe which he has gained upon the higher planes and of the necessity of fitting himself, through further earthly experience, for his necessary part in that work. And secondly, because of a strong desire to help on the evolution of the race, which evolution can only be accomplished by the purified soul clothing itself in fleshly atoms that it may train and purify them. The soul realizes that its lack of experience limits its usefulness, and a deliberate choice is made once more to function through a physical body. Being one with God, the soul has the power of choosing its path and its environment, subject to the law of karma, the one desire being to quickly fulfill the cycle of necessity and return to the Father's heart. Therefore, it chooses an environment, not as a personality would choose, for wealth, ease, or happiness, for it realizes that spiritual happiness must be born of earthly experience, must be the giving up of self for the upliftment of all, but an environment which will give it the best opportunity to gain the experience it lacks, the best environment that its karma will permit. It naturally incarnates among its old associates unless, as sometimes happen, there is some karma or needed lesson that takes it temporarily into a new set of association, a side issue. This clothing itself in flesh involves the training of a new instrument, brain and body, which is not correlated with the memory of the real self, and thus the why is forgotten, for otherwise the lessons would be no lessons at all. The experience of the soul might roughly be compared to a person away on a pleasure trip in a foreign country, where he suddenly realizes there is some task he has failed to perform ere leaving, or that there is some loved one who needs his help and he returns to take up the duty, even though the task be sordid and repulsive, and the loved one unappreciative. There is no person, therefore, who can say that at the present time he is having his last incarnation, for only when the soul reaches the stage where it weighs itself in the balance, and realizes that there still lacks something of earth's experience to fit it to take its destined place in the grand plan. Only then can it be known whether or not the earth urge will draw it back into incarnation. This urge is not always from karmic necessity, except during the earlier stages of evolution, for many souls return through pure love and compassion to help the world, even after they, as separate individuals, have gained all the necessary experience and wisdom. Therefore it is foolish for pupils or disciples to talk about this being their last incarnation, for were they advanced in wisdom they would know that their attitude proclaimed aloud that they were lacking in even ordinary discretion and common sense. We must also bear in mind that there are many more souls excarnate than incarnate. Many of them are waiting for the wave of civilization to rise to the special point that will permit them to fulfill their destiny in accord with karmic law. If the student will refer to what was said about the color rays in the chapter on evolution, it will be found to apply here. Since all souls belong to one of the seven great rays, they must wait for incarnation until the ray and sub-ray to which they belong is in manifestation. Thus, if a soul started its special work during the manifestation of a certain sub-ray of the red ray, while under special conditions hinted at elsewhere, it might incarnate and work out side issues in other sub-rays. Yet the main work could not be continued until the same sub-ray was again manifesting. There is no regular set time during which souls remain excarnate. It depends upon many conditions and ranges all the way from almost immediate rebirth to 500 years and in some cases far more. There is almost a greater diversity in times and seasons for rebirth as is found in the affairs of men. When it is taught that a soul incarnates sometimes in one sex and sometimes in another, or in each sex for seven incarnations alternately, only a very small fragment of a great truth was hinted at. This partial truth as time passed has developed some ridiculous and irrelevant conceptions. Again, it is asserted by many that sex does not inhere in the soul, but the fact is that sex inheres in every manifestation of consciousness, although on the higher planes sex manifests in quite a different way from that we know as sex in the physical plane. While the great mystery of sex in its fullness is as sacredly guarded today as it has ever been, still, as this is the beginning of a new cycle or the reincarnation of a period of the manifestation of this great mystery, it becomes the duty of those masters and teachers connected with this special line of work to again give to the world a suggestion of the inner truth connected with sex. 
But alas, the time is not yet ripe to entirely tear aside the veil and reveal the mysteries of the subject, although an effort is being made from the higher side of life to open an understanding of a few who can realize the divine possibilities of sex, that they may penetrate behind the veil. It is not the rule for a soul to change its sex when incarnating, but it is rather the exception. Since the separation of the sexes during the third race, the positive and negative rays always retain their characteristics and tend to incarnate in a body corresponding to their polarity. The exception occurs principally for two reasons. The first one, which alas at this period is only too common, is that if a soul gaining experience either through a male or a female body fails to appreciate the lessons of the opposite sex, if it despises the other and either cruelly treats it or holds itself superior to it, such a soul at its next incarnation may find itself in a physical body of the despised sex, for this would be the only way that such a soul could learn the lessons of that sex and reap the karma it had created. However, the sex of the incarnating soul would not be changed. It would always be a male soul in a female body, or vice versa. The world has no trouble in recognizing this, for such misfitted souls are frequent in every community, and there is no difficulty in noting the discrepancy between the sex of the incarnate entity and its body. Every male contains the potentiality of the female, and every female that of the male. And while we would not speak of this duality as sex upon the spiritual plane, as we use the term sex on the physical plane. Still, if the student will remember what was said in the chapter on karma in regard to each soul being part of the great or heavenly man and having a special work to do and a special place in which to fulfill its destiny, comparing it to the bodies we have done, it will be seen that some organs or souls must fulfill the function of the positive expression, masculinity, while others express the negative, femininity. Any other conditions would be unthinkable, for while we know that all expressions of life, from molecule to God, are perfect epitomes of the cosmos and contain the two opposite poles, positive and negative, within each, yet in the aggregation of either atoms, organs, or soul, each must function with either the positive or negative expression predominating. It is just as though you took a horseshoe magnet and cut it into pieces. Each piece would be a perfect magnet with positive and negative poles and if you could separate it into atoms, each atom would have its positive and negative poles. But when you put the atoms together to form a grand magnet, each would take its place on either the positive or negative side and express either attraction or repulsion. To carry this simile further, by reversing the current through the magnet, it would be easy to make that which was the positive pole become the negative and vice versa. This is what takes place when a masculine entity clothes itself with a feminine body. As to man evolving into an androgynous being in which both sexes manifest co-equally, as long as mankind is manifesting in separated sexes, it is a waste of time and energy to try to imagine such an existence. For until you have learned all the lessons possible in separated bodies, you can have no realization of what such a manifestation would be like. And you will never learn those lessons as long as you despise any function and refuse to master it. The two sexes can never blend into one until each has reached a perfect expression of his or her sex, and they have learned to work together in perfect harmony while separated. The lesson is not for one sex to avoid or ignore the other, but to learn how the twain may become one in all things, in heart, mind, and body, thus fulfilling the great law of sex. The second and rare cause for the change of sex is that a soul may have reached a degree of mastery, Yet, owing to the world karma, and to the restrictions of conventionality, such a soul may never have fully grasped or understood the opposite sex. For instance, a soul expressing the masculine principle might be deeply desirous of entering into the experience of the innermost depths of the opposite soul expression, so as to see its temptations, feel its oppression, learn its limitation, and thus be ready to take up special work in the coming age whose keynote is the equalization of the sexes and the liberation and restoration of woman to her proper place. Therefore, a great teacher in preparing to take the place of a leader in such an age might naturally desire to be clothed for one life period with a female outer covering. But even in this case, it would be evident to all thinkers that the sex of the entity differed from that of the body. Such a great teacher, moreover, might use that period, which would be her last earth experience, in entering into all phases of life. She might use the power possessed by all such teachers to merge the apparent personality into various other personalities. Thus, for a time, she might have to become one with and apparently manifest the qualities of a depraved sister, a swearing, roistering swashbuckler, a pirate, a learned scholar, or any other phase of humanity. 
she would thus, in a measure, be gaining the experience of humanity in the only way that would make the experience her very own. Knowing all the temptations and also the inner germ of love and hope that even the most degraded hide somewhere within. Such a great teacher might be compared to an author who, in gathering data for a coming work, lives for a time in each class of society. But in the case of the great teacher, the power would be hers to absolutely become, for a time, the personality she desired to study. Thus, when her great work began, she would know just how to deal with all types of brothers and sisters, and from the higher planes be ready to direct the reaping of the golden grain sprung from the seeds of divine truth planted during her last earthly incarnation. Such a complex personality was she who planted the seed of the wisdom religion in the Western world, and she is still directing its garnering from the higher planes. Chapter 12. Power. Alas, alas, that all men should possess a Laya, divine essence, be one with the great soul, and that possessing it, a Laya should so little avail them, the voice of silence. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of sound mind. Second Timothy 1 7. Man is made in the image of God. This image, however, is not the corporeal likeness of a personal God, for God has no personality which can be imitated. But if we take God to mean the supreme power which is sent forth from the Absolute, and through whose many manifestations all things are brought forth, then we must recognize that this God must have all power. It is the image of this all power that man has made. Jesus, who stands as a symbol of perfected man, said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. If this be true of the highest type of man, it is potentially true of all men. For all power is given unto man, because he is created in the image of God. Although in most men this power is latent, because man in the aggregate has not yet come into his birthright, atonement with his Father in heaven or higher self. The omnipotent powers of God operate through intelligent centers of power in the manifested universe, and to make it possible for perfected man to have all power in heaven and earth, and to fulfill the prophecy that he shall become as one of us, the gods, these centers of power must have their more or less active reflections in man, for man is truly the microcosm of the macrocosm. All the lower kingdoms have certain powers, but only man has the power of the Godhead, with which, when he manifests them on his own, he can create the new heaven and a new earth of the apocalypse, wherein dwelleth righteousness. When man awakes to a realization that all powers in heaven and in earth are latent within himself, in heaven the powers of the Godhead, in earth the powers of all creatures and all nature, he will begin to reclaim his lost heritage, lost only in the sense of his having deserted it. In most Eastern teachings we find hints of these wondrous powers and are told they represent steps up which every candidate for mastery must laboriously climb. The Western world is awakening to the use of some of these powers, especially the power to control disease and dominate environment. The powers of man are six in number, synthesized in a seventh, the astral light of Eliphas Levi, and correspond to the seven principles of man. Each power has its seat in a certain sacred center in the body. These seven centers, each with its seven subsidiary centers, are sometimes called the 49 crucified saviors, signifying that the vital power of these centers is at present misused and crucified, and ere they can become man's savior, they must be resurrected from the tomb of matter and made to function in a higher state. They are called the 49 fires because their light guides man to superman. These powers are 1. The supreme power, Parashakti. 2. The power of intellect, Jnana Shakti. 3. The power of will, Icha Shakti. 4. The power of thought, Kriya Shakti. 5. The power of life principle, Kundalini Shakti and six, the power of speech, mantrika shakti. Each power is an emanation from one of the Elohim, hence must be reflected in man to make him the image of God. For God, like the white light, in passing through the prism of matter, manifests in a sevenfold manner. Each power has its positive and negative aspects, and until we can correlate with the positive ray of its progenitor, we are buffeted by its negative aspect. It is impossible to consider these powers separately, for without the cultivation of all, none can be truly operative. The supreme power is the power which man has of correlating with divinity through the breath. All creatures breathe, and we are accustomed to say that breath is life. 
and ordinarily when man ceases to breathe he ceases to live objectively but man alone because he can bring his other powers to bear upon it can make the breath more than the mere drawing in of physical life within the auric zone of the earth there are many subtle forces unknown to science and barely mentioned by even the deeper students of mysticism because so sacred so potent and so powerful that their very names must scarce be whispered breath combined with will and thought is the power by which man reaches up to the higher worlds and opens an avenue through which these potent forces may reach this inner self and lift above mundane things at the same time regenerate his physical body there are those who holding the thought of health breathe for physical health and obtain it but it is possible to use the breath to obtain far more than mere physical health its misuse or negative aspect can also bring disasters undreamed of by the pseudo occultist realize that you are responsible for every breath that you breathe for through the breath you are spreading either god love or disease it is commonly thought that the outgoing breath contains a virulent poison and so it does if you permit it for it carries off certain effluvia from the decaying atoms within you are you willing to be a source of infection if this is your will and your thought then it is what you become when the breath is foul you are abusing your body it is sick and out of order it is within your power to be healthy to be a source of inspiration and life to all for health and life and love are as infectious as their opposites therefore every time you become conscious of it use your power of the breath to breathe in divine love to breathe in spiritual life that it shall so cleanse and transmute your physical atoms that your breath shall become as that of a little child mind or intellect should not be confused with the power of thought the human mind is the reflection in man of the great universal mind the divine ideation or what some call cosmic consciousness it is the vehicle through which thought operates in man mind manifests in a threefold manner the subconscious or animal mind the conscious or human mind and the superconscious or divine mind the subconscious mind is composed of the consciousness of every cell organ and nerve ganglia synthesized and overshadowed by the animal soul a reflection or shadow of this power can be traced in all the kingdoms even those in which it is still latent and which have no power of thought being the mind of the animal soul it is below the consciousness of the human reincarnating ego to its control are relegated all those functions which operate without man's conscious control respiration circulation secretion excretion etc but when these functions are deranged beyond the power of the subconscious to restore it appeals to the human consciousness for aid through pain or discomfort and man becomes aware that something is wrong the subconscious mind is the vehicle of the passions and desires normal to the animal soul and which it seeks to gratify but which must be controlled and directed to their highest use by the will of the human ego this lower or animal mind functions through centers in the medulla obligata the cerebellum and also in the solar plexus and other nerve ganglia containing gray matter when these centers are upset by inharmony or the baser emotions fear hate envy jealousy sorrow etc the functions controlled by them are inhibited or perverted and the physical mental and moral health suffers while if they are stimulated by peace tranquility and harmony or exalted by joy and love their normal functions are activated or increased with corresponding welfare of the whole organism habits are the result of training the subconscious mind to act in a certain way most vague and illogical dreams are the result of the subconscious mind wandering about in the astral world during the absence of the human ego from the body during sleep and therefore without its guidance or supervision hence it is comparatively easy to train the subconscious mind not to wander so that only the spiritual lessons given by the higher self through symbolic visions or logical well-remembered dreams will be brought back to the waking consciousness from the above we will see that we should treat the subconscious mind as well as the body as a good and faithful servant but should not look to it for a higher degree of intelligence than we could expect from the highest animal and certainly should never look to it for guidance in moral or spiritual problems the conscious or human mind manas is the consciousness of the human reincarnated ego inhabiting the body and limited by its faculties it functions through the cortex of the brain through whose center it controls the subconscious it is the great battleground where the ego is influenced from below by the animal mind and from above by the divine mind yet having free will to choose its own course of action it is called lower or higher manas according as it identifies itself with the desires of the animal mind or the desires of its father in heaven 
Its characteristic is self-consciousness, the feeling of I am I. The following are some of its manifestations when placed under the influence or control of material conditions. A. The power of the mind in interpreting our sensations. B. Its power in recalling past ideas or memory and raising future expectation. C. Its power is exhibited in what are called by modern psychologists the laws of association, which enables it to form persisting connections between various groups of sensation and possibilities of sensation, and thus generate the notion or idea of an external object. D. Its power in connecting our ideas together by the mysterious links of memory, and thus generating the notion of self or individuality. The following are some of its manifestations when liberated from the bonds of matter. A. Clairvoyance. B. Psychometry. The superconscious or divine mind is the mind of the higher self or Father in Heaven, one with God. This divine consciousness overshadows the human mind, much as the human overshadows the subconscious. It is from this source that the higher guidance called conscience and intuition comes, and its voice is often mistaken for the voice of some divine being or master. It functions through the pineal gland and pituitary body located in the middle of the brain. The power of will is truly a godlike one, for it enables man to follow the will of God, or setting up his own will, to follow his own desire in opposition to the will of God, or the great law of good. If God's will were merely reflected in or imposed upon man, he would of necessity have to follow that will, which would then be not a power given him to use as he would, but a leading string which he must follow. Man alone has free will. The animals are subject to the will of the entity governing the group soul of their species. An animal acts because of instinct, not because of free will. Man, through his power of will, can reach up into the world of divine mind and bring to himself all the power of mind or he can grovel with the beast in the world of desire, and by his superior powers intensify its evils. Thus it is that in a world created by a god of love, man has the power to create evil. Will is a power bestowed upon man, for the use of which man alone is responsible. He is not a mere puppet forced to follow the will of God. Thought is the power by which man creates images or molds within which divine ideation manifests. While imagination is the power by which he comprehends the subjective ideal, the outer semblance of which may come into objective manifestation through thought. For instance, a painter may in imagination comprehend ideal love, but he must use thought to mold the details in his effort to represent it on canvas. Psychology says that every thought tends to express itself in terms of muscular activity unless counteracted by a more powerful thought of opposite character. Thus, through the powers of thought, man creates his world, or as the Bible expresses it, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And because of this mold-making power, that which is repeatedly thought of will ultimately manifest. If we think continually of ourselves as poor or sick or unhappy, we are making it more possible for poverty, sickness, and unhappiness to manifest. In fact, we are creating a mold into which they must flow. Conversely, if we think of peace, plenty, health, and happiness, they are just as certain to manifest. Thought manifests in a dual way. It is the middle principle and together with mind and breath can be used to draw inspiration from the divine or it can be dragged down and made to waste its force on trivialities, self-pity, etc. When you recognize its power to make images or molds into which the life force naturally flow and shape themselves and become objective, it is not to be wondered at that if wasted on every ache and pain or poverty, troubles or petty worries, they grow apace and become objective. The power of the life principle is the magnetodynamic force which correlates man with nature, and through which he either dominates it or is dominated by it. It works in nature to readjust and harmonize spirit and matter. It is the power of rhythm, the power of all forces which take a serpentine path. Frequently persons say they know a storm is coming by their aches and pains and we know that all animals are warned by the same power to protect themselves from the approaching storm. In man, this power is far more than a common consciousness with nature, for by it, if he will so to be, he is literally the ruler of nature or the lord of creation. It is through this power that he impresses his state of development upon the cosmos. When storms, earthquakes, tidal waves, volcanoes, or catastrophes of any kind take place, many say, Behold the work of God. How insignificant is man? This is false. God never made a storm, an earthquake, or a catastrophe of any kind, for God is the great law of love. They are all evidence of man's power. 
Had man never sent out evil thoughts, wicked words, blasphemies, and curses, the earth or could never be so charged with destructive forces that a catastrophe was necessary to dissipate them and bring about equilibrium. Had man never exercised demonical cruelty to his brother man, neither the animate nor inanimate worlds would be at enmity with him. When a catechism takes place, instead of saying that man is but a helpless atom before the manifestation of nature, we should say, Behold, how powerful is man! For it is by the misuse of this power of the life principle, exercised through free will, that man has brought suffering and destruction into a world created by love. So it is with a man's body. Unless it has been purified through love and spiritual aspiration, this power of the life force, which an ordinary man is almost dormant, will bring about readjustments in his body comparable to earthquakes and cyclones. Therefore, to meditate upon this force or its center in the body and strive to rouse it into activity is extremely dangerous, for such practices have been known to cause insanity and instant death. The disciples said of Jesus, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and sea obey him? This indicates what perfected man can do when he uses his powers according to law of love. To overcome fear is the first step on the path, for fear can be conquered only by love. If fear were conquered absolutely, ere man learned to correlate his power with God-love, conditions would be far worse than today. For even fear is the servant of God. Fear is a paralyzing and disintegrating force, and if it were not that the catastrophes caused by man's disobedience engendered fear, the mistakes of man would become a solid wall of darkness, shutting him away from God. Fear is continually working as the great disintegrator, in reality helping the force of the evil created by man, which is like a miasmic mist, to precipitate and exhaust its power upon the earth in the form of storms and catastrophes, and in the human body is sickness, disease, and death, instead of accumulating indefinitely. When mankind learns the law of love, fear will have no more work to do and will cease to appall man at every step. God did not give man fear. Man himself brought it into manifestation. From another aspect, fear is love perverted. In one sense, fear is the angel of the flaming sword guarding the entrance to Eden, Eden being a perfected earth and a perfected physical body, with its trees bearing every manner of good fruit for man, that is, his powers. It was the tree which grew in the midst of the garden, or this kundalini or serpentine force which functions in the spinal column that proved man's undoing. Only when this force is mastered and fear vanquished can man re-enter Eden, cultivate the trees, and eat of the fruit thereof as a faithful husbandman. To conquer fear you must resolutely use all your powers to create good, for as long as you create evil you must have fear to help disintegrate and dissipate it. Beware of fear that spreadeth like the black and soundless wings of a midnight bat, between the moonlight of the soul and thy great goal that loom within the distance far away. Fear, O disciple, kills the will and stays all action. The path that leadeth on is lighted by one fire, the light of daring burning in the heart. The more one dares, the more he shall obtain. The more he fears, the more the light shall pale, and that alone shall guide. Dare, do, keep silent. Become one with the silence in which all forces are potent. Speech is one of the greatest powers, for it includes the powers of sound, number, color, and when written, form. We are all more or less familiar with the power of sound, both in the spoken word and the chanting of mantra, etc. One who masters this power has the world at his feet. This is illustrated to a slight degree by the ease with which an eloquent speaker can sway an audience. In this chapter but a hint can be given, for it would require a separate lesson to even outline this subject. The point of the development each soul has reached is revealed in the tone of the voice, just as the nature tones indicate nature's stage of evolution. We may carefully control our words and manner of expression, but the tones of the voice will reveal the true feeling back of the words. This inner attitude is quickly recognized, especially by children and animals. In fact, tone is the keynote of man's power over the animal kingdom, for by the tone he either arouses enmity or love and obedience. The spoken word can never die, but will go on working out the potency and power, not only of its tone, but also of its color, number, and form, and the thought pictures created by it in the minds of his hearers, together with the power of the will which sent it forth. Every word and tone spoken by man is registered upon the etheric substance of the Akashic records. This principle has been demonstrated, and is truth verified in a physical way in the phonograph. Speech is the first power for man to master as a medium, through which all his powers may be made operative on earth. 
It is said that before the voice can speak in the presence of the masters, it must have lost the power to wound. To speak in the presence of the masters means speaking as a master, or that the spoken word will carry with the mastery of conditions. To bring to your mind some of the practical effects of this power, we would ask you for one day to note carefully the effect your words have on those about you. Many pupils ask for something practical to do, develop occult powers and manifest the higher life. Noting the effect on your word is practical and most important in a practice which can be indulged in without fear of dangerous consequence. And until at least some conception of the power of speaking kindly and lovingly, but to some purpose, and some degree of mastery over it has been attained, the development of all other occult powers will be retarded if not actually prevented. God spake the word, and the word was created. Man speaks one little word, and a new world of gladness is created in his brother's life. Or man speaks a word, and a brother is disheartened, and gives up the fight. Or a sister's good name is taken from her, and she is pushed out into the darkness is pushed down under the feet of the multitude. Think what one kind word can do, how it can bring sunshine and peace and courage into your own life and the lives of others. Waste no force in frivolous or negative chatter, speaking only positive words, words of love, words of power. If your brother offend you, speak words of love that your heart may send back nothing but love. Never withhold a sincere word of love or endearment or word of help, encouragement or health. A kind word spoken even to a stray dog will not to return to you void. Know well that until you have mastered this power and can speak words of health, strength, cheer, courage, and love, you would better follow the injunction. Let your communication be, yea, yea, nay, nay. For remember well, whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. The meaning of this is that any unkind, boastful, or untrue word is bound to return for you to prove and adjust probably just when you think you have conquered. Be especially careful in regard to written words. When the world begins to understand this power, there will be fewer misleading statements sent out under the guise of occult teaching, which become snares and wiles to mislead those who are seeking enlightenment. We cannot emphasize too strongly this fact, that every idle word, either spoken or written, that man shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. As to how to attain and use these powers, they are yours now. They are in constant activity, and unless consciously directed toward the unification of mankind in God love, they are adding their force to the misery of life, both in your own body and in the whole cosmos. Hence, there is but one thing to do. Realize that God is love, and that the love is the one great law of all life, manifesting in you in this sevenfold path of power. If this realization seems difficult, set to work at it in earnest. Repeat it to yourself again and again. Breathe it. Vitalize it with the life principle. Think of it. Will it. Grasp it. Impress it upon every atom of your manifested expressions of being. And the ultimate result can only be victory. When you synthesize your six powers in the seventh, the power of becoming one in consciousness with God love, which is the power proceeding from the heart, and always spoken of as the power of the diamond heart or the heart doctrine, then you can have nothing to fear, for perfect love cast out all fear. This is the power of becoming one with your higher self. Its seat is in the heart, for in the heart are centers corresponding to and connected with all the centers, as an electric switchboard may be connected with many substations. Therefore, by cultivating the heart qualities and dwelling in peace and love, you can awaken and dominate all the centers and make their cultivation easier. This is not some far-off possibility, for the instant you synthesize all your powers in the heart and seek to subserviate your life and action to love love, you are one in aim with your higher self, and this higher self will manifest more and more through you. Then will there be no death, for death will be swallowed up in victory. You have nothing to fear, for you are all-powerful. You have but to direct your power in accord with the universal law of God, which is love. Look around you and see the evil man's powers have wrought when working contrary to the law. Then think what they could accomplish if they had this great law working back of and through them. If but two or three are gathered together in my name, the Christ love, ready to believe the spoken word of power as herein delivered to you, that you are today as gods, and that all power is given unto you in heaven and in earth, if you really will to become one with the great law of love, then the regeneration of the world would quickly be accomplished. And if but seven souls, or even three, can be gathered together and work consciously in a perfect realization of this truth, making a determined effort to work with the law, 
Soon there will manifest on the earth plane a practical center of right living of such force and social magnitude that the whole earth will feel its influence, and the deplorable conditions under which the world now suffers will begin to adjust themselves. There is no use reading a lesson such as this and thinking it a mere theory, for it is more than mere theory. It comes to you as the word of power. It says to each soul, what are you going to do about it? On which side of the battle will you fight? Into whose coffers will you pour your substance, gods or mammons? Choose ye this day whom you will serve. O fearless aspirant, look deep within the well of thine own heart and answer. Knowest thou of self the powers, O thou perceiver of external shadows? If thou dost, not then art thou lost. Chapter 13 A Brief Outline of Evolution, The Relation of the Masters to Humanity Just as the law of karma is indissolubly connected with the law of reincarnation, so is reincarnation indissolubly connected with the law of evolution, for without reincarnation evolution could not be carried on. Hence, a brief outline of the chief factors in evolution on this planet will first be considered. But in this short chapter, we do not attempt to cover all phases of the subject. We merely view it from one angle, with a full recognition that it may be viewed from many angles. As correctly stated by the naturalist Agassi, all things had their origin in spirit, evolution having originally begun from above and proceeding downwards, instead of the reverse as taught in Darwinian theory. At the first rebirth of our earth, for the law of cyclic rebirth applies to planets and systems as well as to man, it was brought into manifestation or created by a ray of pure white light from the absolute penetrating into the chaotic debris of previous world periods. As a ray of light in passing through a prism is separated into seven color rays, so this ray of spiritual light in passing through the prism of manifestation was separated into seven great differentiations or color rays called hierarchies. These are composed of spiritual beings manifesting the creative power of their color, for just as science has demonstrated that every color has its special and characteristic work in the world, so each of these spiritual color rays has its own part to play in the evolution of both man and the lower kingdoms. Each ray is presided over by one of the manifestations of deity collectively spoken of in the Bible as the Elohim, and an Eastern teaching as the Rishis, sons of wisdom, etc., who need this manifestation to perfect their experience, and to prepare conditions to further the evolution of the lower beings, the humanity of this globe under their charge. The great spiritual masters constituting the higher degrees of each ray gained their godlike perfection in previous world periods of almost immeasurable length, and gained mastery over the cosmic forces while upon the lunar chain of globes. Hence they are called our lunar ancestors or fathers, Pitris. But they are still needed the experience of guiding the evolution of this darkest because lowest of planets the earth to perfect them in wisdom. After they had enjoyed a rest or a period of withdrawal from activity and manifestation for incalculable eons, they took up the formation and evolution of this planet. By the power of concentrated divine will and wisdom, they consciously formed and brought into manifestation our earth as an advanced field wherein to train and further the evolution of humanity. They did this by first projecting from themselves into the centers, where the inert matter for the new planet was sleeping in darkness, the thought forms of that which was to be, and later projected their astral bodies. This inert matter comprised all the material on all planes which they, in the course of their evolution toward godhood, had thrown off and had not had the opportunity to spiritualize and redeem. Hence it was laid aside until they had gained the godlike power which would enable them consciously to redeem all their emanations and creations. If each soul was required to redeem in one life all its mistakes and spiritualize every atom with which it had been connected in even one life, the cycle of necessity would be never-ending. Instead of all these tasks that are beyond the strength of the soul and any one incarnation are held back until it has grown strong enough little by little to work them out. However, the essence of all the mistakes remains with the evolving planet as a part of the world karma, so that when the evolving soul reaches the point where it can begin consciously to redeem its leftovers, it will also help to redeem the same influence in the world karma. During the first two cyclic day periods of the earth, the Elohim are said to have passed through the whole triple cycle of the mineral, vegetable, and animal kingdoms in their most ethereal, filmy, and rudimentary forms in order to clothe themselves in and assimilate the nature of the newly formed chain. 
after ethereal human forms had been evolved by these lunar fathers at the close of the third day period, they gradually became so dense that it may be said that they clothed themselves in flesh, or coats of skin, as the Bible puts it. This was done consciously for the sake of evolution and experience, and not, as theology teaches, as a result of a fall through disobedience. It was a fall only in the sense of a descent into matter. These human forms, created and informed by the Lunar Fathers, had no self-conscious, only animal mind instinct, and could not continue their evolution until they had been endowed with human mind or self-consciousness. Animal consciousness attains to its ultimate perfection in reason, while human consciousness attains to its ultimate perfection in the direct knowledge gained through intuition. As the whole of a species is guided by one group soul, instinct is the power of the animal to respond directly to the consciousness of the group soul. The human animal being guided by his own father in heaven, or his own individual soul in intuition, consciously recognizes the direct guiding voice of his divine higher self. Hence intuition stands exactly over instinct on the spiritual path of evolution. Both are the voices of their respective souls, and the animal imparted collectively to the species, and man personally to the individual. The gift of mind was accomplished at the beginning of the fourth root race, by the projection into man of the divine spark from a still higher class of spiritual beings, the solar fathers, Pitris. It was at this time that the history of man as a corporeal being began. There are three streams of evolution going on in man at the same time, each advancing along its own path, and each inextricably interwoven with and assisting the other. It is this complexity that makes so much confusion in the study of reincarnation. There is the evolution of the animal body, evolved and informed by the lunar fathers, the evolution of mind implanted in the bodies by the sons of man, the solar fathers, and the evolution of character, which is the result of the overshadowing spirit, a divine emanation from the Absolute, working through both the Solar and Lunar Fathers, and forming the divine indweller, the God within us. The history of humanity shows that each of these lines of evolution has been made the object of worship. A. There are those who worship the perfection of the animal body, holding that their first duty is to bring it into perfection, maintain its health, and prolong its life upon the physical plane. Yet prolonged life in a physical body without spiritual perfection would be a curse rather than a blessing. This doctrine reached its greatest perfection among the Greeks, many of whom are now reincarnating and are putting forth the old ideas. B. There are those who worship the mind, considering it the supreme power. The so-called age of reason in reality is the age of the worship of mind. C. There are those who give exclusive worship to the studies which make for spiritual advance, even at the expense of physical and intellectual life, hermits and yogis, for example. Perfect evolution, however, can be attained only when the three go hand in hand, for spiritual evolution can manifest perfectly only as a result of the harmonious blending of all three, a perfect mind in a perfect body, illumined by spiritual intuition. The above accounts for the many discrepancies in life and evolution, for it is impossible for any human being to say that one is more advanced than another, one may be advanced along one line, while another may be equally as advanced along another line. Although we speak of the Lunar Fathers as our physical progenitors, it must be borne in mind that they are divine, having attained atonement ere the evolution of this planet began. After the astral forms or models were produced by the Lunar Fathers, the evolution of the external form, or body round the astral, is produced by the terrestrial forces, just as in the case of the lower kingdoms, but the evolution of the internal, or real man, is purely spiritual. It is now no more a passage of the impersonal monad through many and various forms of matter, but a journey of the pilgrim soul through various states, not only of matter, but of self-consciousness and self-perception. Thus it was that, aided by the emanations from their progenitors, the celestial solar fathers, who stand to the lunar fathers as our higher selves stand to us, the lunar fathers become the progenitors of humanity. These great classes of spiritual fathers who are still living and guiding human evolution from the higher realms are the divine men known to us as the masters of wisdom. There are many accounts of the presence of these divine men, the gods on earth, founding nations, establishing laws, teaching and guiding humanity face to face, to be found in the sacred writings of all ancient people, many of whom still claim to have sprung from the gods. The seven great groups of these spiritual beings are classified in a manner similar to the groups of colors in our solar spectrum, each group being called a ray, 
bearing the name of one of the seven colors, the red ray, yellow ray, violet ray, etc., just as the colors of the spectrum are emanations from the one white light, so are these spiritual creators emanations from the divine one, the absolute. These rays constitute seven great hierarchies, which are presided over by seven still greater celestial beings, each of whom is called the progenitor or father of his ray. It must be borne in mind, however, that each ray contains representatives of all the other rays. In looking at the sun, we see a halo composed of the seven colors in a concentric ring. These rings represent the hierarchies, and in reality conserve the forces of the colors composing them. The same law is illustrated in the rainbow, although only one segment of the circle is visible. Each great ray or hierarchy of master manifests in turn, and like the notes in a musical scale in rhythmic cadence, its progenitor or father presiding during its manifestation as captain of the host. All the masters belonging to a ray are most active during the manifestation of their ray, while those belonging to all the other rays, even the progenitors, are for that period subservient to the ray that is manifesting in activity. This does not mean that the other rays are dormant, but like a grand symphony, when one note or ray is dominant, all the others are complementary. Thus absolute harmony results. While we say a certain ray or color is presiding, in reality it is man's consciousness that is passing through the band of color or ray of force and consciousness, learning its lessons and gaining its forces. For example, a celestial being is the progenitor or father of the red ray or hierarchy of masters. Under him are the masters of his sub-rays and lesser sub-rays, and so on down to those souls who are achieving mastery and entering the ranks from the races now on earth. It is the aggregate of all these masters that is known to us as the Great White Lodge. It is called the White Lodge because, like the white light, it is the harmonious blending of all the seven rays. The Great White Lodge is divided, just as is humanity, into seven great classes or degrees, each of which is subdivided into seven orders. The seventh or lowest order of the Lodge overlaps or blends into humanity, just as humanity overlaps or blends into the animal kingdom. Not that the masters of the lowest order are not human, but more than human. The masters of this lowest order are still upon the physical plane, using physical bodies and working with and teaching humanity. There are also certain orders of masters who are guiding evolution below the human kingdom as group souls. Each of the masters composing the higher degrees is the progenitor or father of many human beings, for while gaining the perfected wisdom of former planets during their long periods of evolution, they were consciously creating, both by the power of divine will and by emanation. Every emanation of their life substance, and every cell composing their various bodies, has now evolved into the human kingdom. And the master of wisdom who originally sent out the emanation or cell is called its spiritual father, no matter what its present stage of evolution. Hence all mankind are the children of one of these great spiritual creators. In the same manner, we are the progenitors, and sometime must become the guides and saviors of every cell that has composed our various bodies in all our incarnations, as well as all the creatures created by our thoughts and desires, when eons hence they have evolved to a point analogous to present humanity, for they are the children of our creation. They are not, however, redeemed as individual atoms, but as more or less composite units. Each separate cell does not evolve into a separate human being. But according to its nature and stage of evolution, when cast off, will it become a part of an organ in a human body. Man's body, therefore, is an aggregation of many sentient lesser centers of consciousness, hence the necessity for man's ruling his subconscious mind, as it is the synthetic product of the consciousness of the lesser centers. In the early days of the fourth root race, when humanity were but children, having newly received the gift of self-consciousness or mind, they were guided and taught face to face by the fathers, the Elohim, just as a father and mother, for these great beings were both father and mother androgynous, might guide and teach a child. But when the child has grown to manhood, it must leave its parents guiding care, and go out alone to meet the trials and temptations of the world, and prove how much of the parents' teaching it is built into character. This is what humanity has been doing ever since that time. For by the end of the fourth root race humanity had grown up and become disobedient. With the destruction of Atlantis began the individual working out of that disobedience, and an endeavor to put into practice the lessons learned. The red ray is now manifesting through humanity, and has been for an immense period of time, the fourth round, the whole Bible being but a history of this ray. 
Consequently, the great being, who is the progenitor of that ray, is what might be called the commander-in-chief of the forces of evolution operative throughout this cycle. Humanity has to evolve all the way through this red ray, from its lowest subray to its highest. Having passed the middle point of its densest manifestation, humanity is now upon the upward arc toward more spiritual states of being. As the occult maxim, as above, so below, and vice versa, holds good for all planes and all laws, in reality, there being but one great law. To form a conception of what lies before us, we have but to consider what the lower aspects of red stand for. Red is the color of the blood, which in the body carries the life force. Hence, in its lower aspects, red is expressed by anger, passion, war, anarchy, and bloodshed. It is through these expressions of the fourth of the red ray that humanity has been struggling until it has reached the point where the lessons of the lower octave must be registered into the higher. The lifeblood of humanity has reached the point where, laden with the vileness and the effluvia of animal man, it is being purified by the breath of the spirit, and henceforth must take on a new tint, just as the physical blood is purified and changes its color in the lungs. Anger purified becomes love force, an energy that will conquer all difficulties. Passion must be turned to fervor and ardor for spiritual union. War turned to spiritual warfare, where good triumphs over evil. Light over darkness, anarchy becomes the one law of brotherhood. Bloodshed becomes the pouring out of the spiritual life force, for as blood carries the physical life force, its correspondence on the higher plane is the vehicle for the spiritual life force. The highest tint will be reached when the spiritual sun shines through this red ray and permeates it and brings out the rose tint of Christ's love and brotherhood. The vision of St. John as portrayed in the book of Revelation, and commonly accepted as a description of the end of the world, is simply the winding up of the dominance of the red ray. Although the same symbolic teachings are given in the book of Enoch, it does not mean that St. John copied from Enoch, but that both were teaching the same universal truth received from the same divine progenitor. In the Bible, much prominence is given to the word blood, and the blood of the Lamb which was slain from the foundation of the world. This refers to the force of the red ray, which is the life blood of humanity, predominating as it does at the beginning of every sub-race, and thus running through and permeating the whole root race. Those which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, are the ones who have learned the lessons of the red ray, the lessons of the vital life force, and have thus washed their garments or body white and pure in the stream of living spiritual force. They are those who have fought the good fight and are crowned victors, ready to take up the lessons of the next dominant ray. Only by evolution through all that pertains to the red ray, spiritual life force of the soul, its blood, so to speak, can humanity be washed in the blood of the Lamb and be redeemed. Certain texts in the Bible regarding blood, which are repulsive and inhuman in their exoteric meaning, if looked at in the light of the above explanation, at once take on a new significance, even the most abused and revolting hymn. There is a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains becomes quite comprehensible when viewed from this standpoint. You have no real spiritual life in you until you have correlated with the higher aspect of the red ray, which is indeed the blood of the Christ. Chapter 14. The Law Love is the fulfilling of the law. Romans 13.10 Study the hearts of men, that you may know what is the world in which you live and of which you will be a part, Regard the constantly changing and moving life which surrounds you, for it is formed by the hearts of men, and as you learn to understand their constitution and meaning, you will by degrees be able to read the larger word of life. Light on the Path, Rule 12. All life is law. There is but one law, love. All life and all law is vibration. Hence the law of love must manifest through the whole gamut of vibration, becoming thus both the law and the fulfilling of the law. When God, love law, sent his only begotten Son, the light, to earth, there shot forth a great shaft of living fire, vibrant with creative force, into the darkness or the germs of manifested life, where at once a cyclic motion was begun in every atom, and all things began their cyclic evolution, worlds, creatures, atoms, each with its own innate potency awakened to activity by the light, the spirit of breath which moved on the face of the waters. 
Some faint conception of how this ray of force cleaves the darkness can be gathered by watching a skyrocket shooting up into the blackness of the night. For some distance it is apparently a solid shaft of fire, yet in reality every particle is in rapid cyclic vibration. Every molecule is swirling at a high rate, and only because of this vibratory force is the rocket propelled onward. The law followed by the teeny atoms of fire in the path of the rocket is the same law that governs worlds, planets, suns, and systems. Each turns around its own axis, yet all continue upon their own appointed path up upward and onward in the new regions. While each turns upon its own axis and circles around its own sun, still the whole universe is being propelled onward through space, changing conditions through which it passes, and by the very force of its cyclic vibration setting all in contacts into a motion of its own. It is this great law, divine love, which creates all things and holds them to their appointed path, that they may evolve their germs of good and transmute their germs of evil, for evil is but opposition to the law. The light is the firstborn and only begotten Son of God, for it is the first expression of God force or love to manifest, just as terrestrial light is the primeval manifestation of our visible sun, and light includes within itself all vibrations. Just as the rays of the sun start the seed to growing in the earth and ultimately draw back again the force of the perfected tree, so the only begotten Son of God, through love, both plants the seeds of immortality in earth conditions, matures it and brings it into perfection, that it may be indrawn into the Father. The law manifests in seven major aspects. 1. Order. 2. Compensation. 3. Cause and effect or karma. 4. Vibration. 5. Cycles or periodicity. 6. Polarity. and 7. Balance or poise. No one aspect manifests alone but while each may predominate, in turn all the others manifest at the same time as subordinate factors. 1. Order. Not a grain of sand blown by the wind on the seashore, but is following the law's order, for the wind acts as a servant of the law. There being no such thing as chance, everything in life comes in orderly sequence. Nothing can come into your life outside of this law, there is always a place and a time for everything and a reason why it comes. It is according to law as orderly sequence. Everything is brought to you at just the right time and place to bring to you the help or the lesson needed to take your next step. All comes to you through divine love. 2. Compensation The law works as compensation in that in every experience, be it painful or otherwise, there is a compensating power to be gained or reward which is well worth the suffering necessary to build it into soul growth. This is also love. A woman when she is in travaileth has sorrow because her hour was come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. In the lower forms of life when an eye for instance is needed it is gradually developed for extreme sensitiveness acquired by the repeated stimulations given to the nerves of a certain part by the continual bumping of the organism into objects which it cannot see to avoid. The compensation is an organ of sight. 3. Cause and effect or karma. Inextricably blended with the law as compensation is that aspect known as karma. That is, effects of causes set up in previous times or former lives are brought to you in orderly sequence to be worked out, and in turn to set up fresh causes. The great point to understand in this manifestation of the law is that karma is neither a reward nor a punishment for past deeds, and still less is it an avenging nemesis remorsefully exacting an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but is the effect of causes in the sense that it brings to the soul the opportunity to learn certain lessons which it has not learned in past lives, hence which the law of love brings to it through this manifestation that it may gain the soul quality needed for further progress. 4. Vibration. All events which are brought into your life in orderly sequence with the intention of compensating you are brought through the aspect of cause and effect by the law's vibration. This teaches you to correlate and attune yourself to the infinite vibration of divine harmony so that through the law as vibration the evil or inharmonious aspects of life may be dissipated and the rhythm of all life be attuned to the infinite. 5 cycles or periodicity. There can be no concept of life outside of or apart from vibration, and all vibration is cyclic. 
Everything manifests in cycles from the sprouting of the teeniest blades of grass, its fruition and decay, to the times and seasons of suns and systems, manvantara and pralayas. Every event is governed by cycles, period of activity, a period of rest, corresponding to the downward and upward sweep of manifestation and obscuration of the outbreathing and inbreathing of the great breath of Brahman. The life of each individual is also governed by cycles within cycles. All students notice periods of great spiritual uplift, followed by periods of depression and deadness. These extremes can only be overcome by the knowledge of the law as periodicity or cycles. When the period of depression comes, balance it with the forces received during the exaltation, recognizing that it is a period of inbreathing, the time to indraw and digest the lessons of the active period. Only thus can balance or poise be attained. 6. Polarity Until all the aspects of the law have been brought into perfect polarity and attuned to the divine rhythm of the great law of love, Polarity is broken up into many lesser polarities which manifest under the law of opposites, good and evil, like and darkness, male and female, etc. If we break a magnet into a thousand pieces, each piece will have its positive and negative pole, but its power will be but a faint reflection of the power manifested in the one. When true polarity is attained, all will be in perfect harmony with the positive pole of divine love, the negative pole of human love reaching up unwaveringly and merging itself into that love and all the forces interacting in perfect rhythm from pole to pole. The polarity of the law has literally been broken and separated into its various aspects instead of manifested in its entirety. Man, through his disobedience, has broken the law. Yet he must become one with the law, or the hammer of Thor will break him into pieces. Just as a ray of white light in passing through a prism is broken up into its seven aspects of color, each manifest in an individual force. So the law of love is passing through the dense darkness of physical life is broken up and deflected so that seven aspects work individually, bringing about chaotic conditions. If we isolate the red ray at one extreme of the solar spectrum, its effect would be heat and overexcitement tending toward feverish and inflammatory conditions with little illuminating power. At the other extreme of the spectrum, the action of the violet ray would be to kill low forms of life, both bacterial and organized cell life, and in higher forms to cause disorganization and insanity. And each of the other color rays has been found to have its own special action, which when separated from others is inimical to man. But each, when used with wisdom or synthesized into white light, contains a quality of helpfulness. In fact, these various aspects are the forces, each with its own individual work to do, alluded to as the seven sons of Fohat, or the seven differing manifestations of force, all of them contained within the one white light of divinity. Only when these seven sons are united in their parent ray can there be light, for while separated they manifest color rather than light. So it is with the law of divine love. When the law is broken and its differing aspects strive to work individually, as they do in this world of effects, there is confusion, darkness, and a turning away from God, or a manifesting of the opposite pole of good, evil. But in reality, there is only a lack of positive polarization. 7. Balance or Poise The heart of these various activities of the law is balance or poise, for only when poise is attained, or that center where vibration is so rapid as to be peace, can all the aspects of the law be synthesized and perfected. All temptations met with on the path come through the various aspects of love, even Jesus in the wilderness, being obliged to face and conquer the love of power, dominion, and ambition. On earth we see love manifested as love of gold, love of power, love of self, love of pleasure, love of animal gratification, and so forth, all perverted or negative polarizations of divine love. Divine love and human love are often thought of as quite separate, while in reality they are but opposite poles of the one force. There is no manifestation of the law on earth capable of touching the depth or reaching the heights in its cyclic sweeps as polarity or human love when not wedded to wisdom. Through love perverted has man touched the depths of degradation, yet because love is a divine law, one from the beginning, it must forever sweep upward and onward, and like a mighty whirlwind gather up all it touches. In its journey back to its source, love gathers up and synthesizes its seven manifestations, and thus fulfills the whole law of being. God is love, and God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, light or love made manifest, 
to descend into the darkness of the unmanifested mass of substance or matter, that out of it love might work the fulfillment of the law. From the earliest dawn of creative thought to the present moment has love thus worked its way up through matter. Many say that before Jesus came there was but the thundering of the inexorable law of the Old Testament, or what the Hindus called karma, but that Jesus came to substitute for the law the glad tidings of redemption through love. But Jesus himself said, I come not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. The law, which we are wont to call inexorable justice, in reality could be neither just nor inexorable where love left out. For love is the one and only reality which endures from eternity to eternity. Hence Jesus, the perfected man, did not come to do away with the law, but to straighten out man's misconception of it, to emphasize the fact that justice becomes injustice and cruelty when love is left out. That law is love, and that which we look upon as an awful inexorable punishment is in reality but the force of love striving to counteract man's disobedience to the law and lead him back into the path where love alone can redeem. Hence the glad tidings of Jesus were simply to point out the world that love is the fulfillment of the law, is the recognition of the law is love, and that only through love can it be fulfilled. There can be no punishment, injustice, or fear for those who recognize and live at one with the law of love. A careful analysis will show that every test, trial, or temptation is brought about through the negative polarization of love, by a breaking up of the law, a refusing to find balance, and a consequent revolving around an individual center, a getting out of harmony with that which keeps all things in their appointed path. This negative polarization is the cause of so many unhappy marriages. Man feels the stirring of the divine love force within him, pushing his whole nature onward toward God consciousness, and instead of at once polarizing himself to this divine love, he often seeks to polarize himself to some human love which the law does not bring to him, and thereby forces him, both himself and that of the other, out of harmony with the law. And sooner or later the divine fire in both atoms must die out, and like burned-out cinders they fall back to earth filled with disappointment, sorrow, and coldness. He fails to realize that just as he focuses his consciousness upon the positive pole, all that belongs to him, his own, the little swirling love atom that is his earthly complement, must come to him as he becomes one with the law, for its lawful place is by his side, and without its help he could not fulfill the law of love. Heretofore man has been misapplying the law and placing himself under its negative aspect evil, and through the ensuing suffering has been learning to lift up his eyes afar off and long for his father's home. But the time will come when man must balance the effect of the negative aspect suffering by manifesting under the positive aspect love and reap his reward. The suffering may be the means of turning man Godward, but the ultimate knowing of God can only come through love. The negative aspect of divine love has evolved up through humanity until the turning point was reached and now the positive aspect must come into manifestation. Jesus outlined to the world a grander conception of the divine love in what is known as the new dispensation, but it takes very little thought to realize that this new dispensation has never yet manifested in humanity as a whole. It has never been more than a grand ideal to which only a few isolated examples have attained. This new dispensation can never be realized until man begins to polarize his whole life to divine love, and manifest its positive or good aspect as he has its negative or evil, thus gaining perfect equilibrium. This is the esoteric meaning of the injunction, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. In other words, when you have polarized all your life and love to divine love, and when you are living thus harmonized to your proper place in the stream, all that is yours must be swept onward with you. As long as you refuse to understand the law and think of yourself as an atom separated from the mass or pick out for yourself another atom to revolve around you are destined to remain in the negative polarization and fall to earth again and again, as do the sparks in the sky rocket which have lost their oneness with its fiery heart. Men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Their deeds may not be absolutely wicked, but they tend away from the positive pole of light or divine love, and hence must manifest darkness rather than light. The lesson to be learned is that you do not have to seek for something afar off or foreign to your nature, for you are living in a world of love created by a love which embraces every atom in the universe in its fiery heart, that you will suffer until you learn to desire the light. 
that light or love is turned into darkness as long as it is broken up into lesser loves. There is but one way, the way of the Christ, the only begotten Son, the light, which is the way, the truth, and the life. You must deliberately turn your heart toward divine love and realize that the instant you thus turn you are vibrating with the stream, and must of necessity be swept onward and upward, and must draw with you every other atom that is in any other way harmonized to you. Then help, strength, power, companionship, and love must come to you, because you are harmonized to the stream of divine love, which is ever working toward perfection. You suffer only as you get out of harmony with the law by passing it through the prism of your lower personality, and hence producing various colors rather than light. The world is struggling in the stream. The rocket has been shot from its mortar and cleaves the darkness in one swirling stream of fiery particles. Many in the stream know not whither they are bound, but they are in the fiery current. They whirl round and round, each little soul a vortex of fire each cycle of each spark seeming to be a complete universe, shutting out all else, apparently vibrating to some force whose center is within the atom. Yet in reality all are being drawn onward and upward in love in a straight line back to the source whence they came. As the fire and force of the rocket are drawn to their source, the sun, the storehouse of both light and force, while that which belongs to earth, the stick and the ashes, falls back to earth. Love fulfills the law for each atom, for each soul. The lessons of each are brought by love. Only the hearts that are cold and dead to divine love and persistently seek human polarization fall back to earth as cinders. Those that are alive and glowing sweep ever on. As you go out into the world, you must dwell in this current of divine love. And as you feel its force thrilling through you, know well that its center is not in the little puny life around which you revolve, but in the heart of the one life. That the main lesson is not that you find satisfaction in being in the stream but that you lend the fire in your heart toward propelling the rocket even higher, and that fire within must be the indwelling Christ force. The positive pole cannot manifest without the negative pole. The divine cannot manifest without stirring up earth conditions. Your temptations will come through love. That which is purest will seem to stir up the most impurity. That which is divine will bring sorrow and discouragement. How then shall you become one with the law? By polarizing your love to divine love, by merging your spark into the heart of the vortex, where all is rest and harmony and peace. This is the work of this order, and this is your work. You cannot expect the world to attain peace and love unless you manifest peace and love, not merely to one atom, but to all. You must demonstrate your ability to stand still amid the swirling currents of life and hold on to the center of the whirlwind, the heart of love. Recognize that the turbulence and disasters and suffering are but the results of the outpouring of divine love, that they come not as karmic retribution, but that through the vibration of love the law may be fulfilled. You must lend your love to make this order a great fiery stream of divine love that shall draw to it and make glowing all the little fiery hearts that are following crooked paths and growing cold and falling back into the darkness. Your mission is to point out how that which is apparently evil can be polarized to good how discouragement can be turned into ardor, how suffering can be turned into joy. Study the lessons in the book of life. On every page will you find the word love. Many pages may be clouded and obscured. Many may be almost obliterated with tears. Many may be besmirched with mire. But because you have been drawn into this fiery stream of divine love, you will have the power to decipher the pages, to trace the story of the love that has been guiding you through all the dark and sorrowful pages. You can show the stricken ones in the heart hungry that they are still in the stream, that it is love that is leading and guiding them, that the law is whirling them round and round only to bring them and their backs to God, that there are other pages in the book pure and unsullied, wherein they may learn to write their names. Chapter 15. World Chains Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made. Genesis 2, 1-2 through 2. Whirling, glowing ether, fluidic but cohesive, throwing off sparks. Encountering moist air, it sends up clouds of vapor in its rapid motion. The Great Mother sends out her breath to blow cool and moist upon the fiery offshoots of the Father. Little by little, it gathers density until the children suited to its condition begin to move in its fiery heart like teeny flames, yet flames that have life and independent motion. All life is now gaseous light. The spirits of the gases hover over the glowing, vapory mass. They fan it with their wings that it may cool and harden. 
Within the womb of the world mother an infant globe slowly takes form. At last upon this whirling sphere there descends, in one great rush, the spirits of the great ones destined to prepare this ethereal dwelling place for humanity. These are men indeed, men, divine men, manas, who reach their godlike state on former chains of worlds. They begin their work on the first and earliest globe of this chain in its most ethereal condition. Their work is to inform and prepare this life essence for future use. They blow their cool breath upon the glowing, vapory globe, and lo, it solidifies into the prototypes of that which becomes rock and mineral, imprisoning the spirit of life. Their lifeblood becomes currents of living force. They hover over the face of the great deep. Into the waters they breathe their life breath, and the waters are filled with innumerable living forms. From the waters and the cooling rocks a great mist arises. It is the spirit or life element of the coming humanity. It separates into masses. They take form and become ethereal beings floating like clouds over the still ethereal planet. Through all this first realm the creators are engaged in preparing the earth, in forming the prototypes of that which is to be. It is the breath of their nostrils, the blood streaming of their life forces that is both transforming and reappearing in the life of the elements. Ere the earliest types are ready to take on denser ethereal forms, they pass into a sleep, which in this early stage is but a slight cooling down of the globe. Then a new day dawns, the second round. A new form of life appears, the vegetable. Once more must the parents of the race guide the pure, but as yet incorporeal beings, the second race, and teach them how to inform the planet. The manas must enter, through the breath of their nostrils, into the formation of the new globe. They must permeate the mineral to give it consciousness and penetrate the vegetable, very like the water of the ocean flowing through coral or some spongy substance, leaving behind its informing principle. As yet humanity is globular and ethereal, but must become acquainted with the globe on which it dwells. It becomes the mineral, the stone, the water, the air. The oceans are of carbonic acid, and the air is saturated with its evaporation. Gigantic trees form from the carboniferous exhalations of the early races. The immense coal beds were thus created by the informing beings, the progenitor of the coming humanity. After a prolaic night of short duration, they are ready for a new globe. They awaken to a new condition the third round. Different strata have been formed. The earth crust is formed over the minerals and the giant trees. Now gigantic reptiles and beasts roam the earth with bodies and functions adopted to the existing conditions. Humanity is not yet ready to take solid form. In the fourth round, humanity falls into generation, is endowed with mind by the sons of mind. God breathes and demands nostril the breath of life, and he becomes a living soul. As humanity reaches the lowest point of this fourth round, the human body solidifies. The spiritual powers and psychic faculties are now limited, and all but lost in a dense physical envelope, mind begins to develop. From this point onward, man must work out his own redemption, together with that of the earth. Up to this time, his evolution and that of the earth have been guided and directed by the manas, or the rishis, the progenitors of all that live and breathe on earth. The above is an extract from a cryptic lesson given by the master to the order explaining the formation of a world chain, but which the limits of this lesson are far too short to fully explain. However, although there has been much speculation, much confusion in the minds of students concerning these world chains, we will endeavor to explain herein only certain of their most practical phases, for a complete understanding of the subject belongs to the mysteries of the higher initiation. Just as man's body is the lowest expression of his sevenfold constitution, so is each visible planet but the lowest, densest aspect of a sevenfold chain, called by occultists a world chain. A world chain is composed of seven globes of differing states of matter and consciousness, all existing at the same time and all interpenetrating. The globes of any one chain must not be identified with the visible planets, for only one globe of each chain is visible, each physically visible planet being the physical globe of its own chain, just as the earth is the physical globe of the earth chain. The other six globes of each chain are composed of finer and more ethereal states of matter to which our physical senses do not respond. They are invisible and hence to us apparently do not exist. In its descent, involution, into physical manifestation, life appears successively on each of the seven globes during one day period called a round, seven of such day periods or rounds being required to complete the cycle of manifestation, or involution, turning point, evolution, 
Our Earth has the now visible representative of its superior fellow globes, has to live, as have the others through seven rounds. During the first three it forms and consolidates. During the fourth, our present round, it settles and hardens. During the last three it gradually returns to its first ethereal form. It is spiritualized, so to say. It may appear as though the evolving lives step from globe to globe of the chain, but in reality they merely evolve into new states of matter and consciousness. A new globe or plane of consciousness manifests when the consciousness evolved in the preceding round can no longer express itself on the old globe. In passing from globe to globe, a new principle is developed on each. Man can penetrate into the consciousness of the stage through which he has passed, but cannot penetrate into the realms that embody principles which he has not yet evolved. As man evolves, his consciousness is born into a new globe or state of consciousness, literally born into a new world which did not exist for him before, where all the familiar things of his daily life and of nature appear in a new and hitherto unsuspected light. This is due to an expansion of consciousness which enables him to respond to the vibrations of a higher globe, enabling him to grasp deeper meanings and understand teachings which he formerly regarded as mere vagaries of unbalanced minds or mythical word pictures of no practical value. Cycles and epochs depend upon consciousness. We are not here for the first time. The cycles return because we come back into conscious existence. Cycles are measured by the consciousness of humanity and not by nature. It is because we are the same people as on past epochs that these events occur to us. Undeveloped man responds chiefly to the vibrations of the physical globe, those things which he can see, hear, taste, handle, etc., and cannot comprehend or function in the globes belonging to the psychic and spiritual planes. Many so live in for the gratification of their animal appetites, desires, and passions that although they are living on earth, they are dwelling in the world of desire, or the globe embodying the desire principle, where desire reigns supreme. For such, every thought, act, and experience of life is interpreted from the standpoint of animal desire. Others dwell so completely in the mental world that the desire world, and even the physical world, has little power over them. Many function in the dream world, the astral envelope of the physical earth, in which the physical, desire, and mental worlds are all reflected. Some are able to reach up into the soul world and receive their mystic soul birth, while a few receive their birth into the spiritual world, where their consciousness becomes one with their Father in heaven. The phenomena of true conversion is but the birth of the consciousness into the soul globe or plane. The majority of humanity, however, function in the three lower worlds, physical, mental desire, at the same time, or vibrate from one to the other. The mental world, however, has two aspects, a high and a low, and since man is endowed with free will, he can chain mind to the lower worlds and make of this great gift but a servant to gratify desire and intensify physical life, or he can use his gift of mind to reach up into the higher worlds of soul and spirit. Man must ultimately function and gain experience on all seven globes at the same time, checking up, balancing, perfecting the experience of one by that gained on the others, thus rounding out his sevenfold nature into the real man. Only thus can he gain mastery over the portion of goods given him by his Father in heaven. What is referred to in the above quotation as taking place in each round is the ultimate characteristic evolved while the life wave was passing around the chain of seven globes during that round. And what is referred to as humanity or man is, of course, not man as we know him today, but stages in the involution or descent into matter of that which became man at the middle point of the third race of the present fourth round. During the first round, the center of the stage of action was occupied by the mineral kingdom. The mineral dominated the entire chain, reaching its greatest density on the fourth globe. In the rocks formed during that period, science finds no trace of either vegetable or animal forms. During the second round, the vegetable kingdom occupied the center of the stage and dominated the earth chain, the mineral kingdom being subservient. It was upon the fourth globe of that round that giant vegetation flourished in an atmosphere of carbonic acid gas. The remains of that vegetation are still preserved to us in the form of coal. The rocks formed during and after that period record the characteristics of the vegetation but no trace of animal life, for the animals had not yet taken on or descended into solid physical form. During the third round animal life dominated the globe in the form of giant reptiles and monstrous animals whose remains science has found preserved in many places. During this period both mineral and vegetable kingdoms were subservient to the animal. 
The rocks at that time contained traces of both vegetable and animal life, but not of man, for he was still astral or superphysical. During this present fourth round, it is man who descends to the physical plane and dominates the globe through the power of mind, all the lower kingdoms being subservient to him. Since man is the microcosm of the macrocosm, in his spiritual evolution he must pass through stages analogous both to his own physical evolution and that of the planet. Just as during his interuterine life he passes through the evolutionary stages of the early races, vegetative, animal, and human. The first three rounds would be represented in man's spiritual evolution by the innocence of ignorance. During this period he goes on his way actively doing neither good nor evil, vegetating indifferent to the higher ideals, yet not groveling in the lowest. Persons in this stage take life as they find it, with little thought as to its significant or its deeper problems. They are happy and carefree, neither very good nor very bad. Average good-natured persons with whom the world goes well, and who experience little sorrow or suffering. There must come a time, however, when, like the planet, the evolutionary urge involves them in the still deeper, denser conditions. Their carefree conditions change, since they pay little attention to the higher ideals of life and concentrate all their efforts on physical gratification. They come to live more and more in their animal natures. They become carried away with animal desires, with the love of money, for the gratification of creating creature comforts, with ambition, with great selfishness resulting in extreme cruelty to their brother men. All these conditions gradually plunge them into the denser animal realm where, like the immense animals that roam the earth during the third round, they prey upon one another, living only to enhance and gratify their animal natures and prolong their animal pleasures. In this period of spiritual growth, the animal passions dominate. Man now seeks to escape sorrow and suffering through indulgence in animal desire. In obeying the inner urge toward harmony or happiness, he madly plunges into all manner of animal excess and self-indulgences with little regard for the rights of others, but freedom from suffering still eludes him. Ultimately he reaches a point where the real man begins to control, corresponding to the period when man began to dominate the earth. As with the planet, so with the race and the individual, the vegetative and animal stages lead steadily toward a condensation of conditions. Just as the passing of the gigantic vegetation of the second round added to the density of the globe in the form of coal and the enormous animals of the third round by their deposits of bone, so during the corresponding periods of his evolution has man helped to create for himself denser physical conditions, karmic conditions of suffering and sorrow, which he must experience and redeem. Little by little, through sorrow and suffering, he awakes to the realities of life. Sorrow and suffering are to man what matter is to spirit, the sinking into the densest and most limiting condition of expression. And the object is the same, that is, for spirit to gain experience in physical conditions and thereby redeem matter, for man to gain his soul experience and thereby redeem the causes in the world which produce sorrow and suffering, namely sin and disobedience, as well as to redeem the matter in which he clothes himself. Hence, while the law of karma will bring to all the suffering they have earned, at the same time as they conquer, they become redeemers for the race, for they cannot conquer for themselves alone. They have been born from the world of thoughtless action into the realm corresponding to the period when man was endowed with mind. They have begun to respond to their higher mind. Once having reached this point, they can go no more back. Life no longer flows smoothly. They can no longer be thoughtless and carefree, for they must henceforth take in their own hands the working out of the great problems of their spiritual lives just as man at the corresponding stage took over the guidance of his physical body. They must seek for themselves the solution of life's problems. When you have reached this stage, you have entered the fourth degree of humanity, where you consciously take up the work of spiritual regeneration. In this degree, you consciously start out upon the path and must conquer all the kingdoms below you, both in yourself and in the world. All who are interested in these teachings, for example, have reached this point. And to you we will say that you are not mere creatures of impulse driven hither and thither by a relentless fate, but are children of your Father in heaven. You have reached your majority and are being tested. You are encouraged to take up the great work of your own redemption. Your guidance is now no longer that given a schoolboy, but rather the supervision of a loving parent over one who must of his own free will follow the principles taught by that parent. It is comforting, however, to realize that you have this power to walk alone or you would not be where you are today. If you were still a child and spiritual leading strings, the great problems of life would not confront you, for the law of divine love brings to the soul only such problems as has the strength to meet and conquer. 
Your heavenly Father would not that any perish, yea, not one sparrow falleth to the ground, but the Father knoweth. Seek then to reach up in consciousness to the soul world, to the globe of divine love, a new world in which you can dwell if you will. Your heavenly Father has prepared a mansion for you in that world, which you do not have to pass through the change man called death to enter. But you do have to let go and cease climbing to the things of the lower world, for that to which you cling and which you permit your mind to dwell in is the world in which you must function. You may do your duty in the lower world and still dwell with your Father in his world of love and glory. Realize that he is watching over you, and his world envelopes you and will manifest to you if you will but open your heart to let it in. Like a human parent, but in a degree far transcending the human, your father suffers with you, yet understands a necessity for you to conquer alone. The greatest gift to man is free will. It must be your will to reach out for the guiding hand that is always within reach, even in the darkest night, ere you can find it. All is law, and all law is love. It is the life essence of this law, the Christ force, which has overcome the world, or which has brought about the physical evolution of the planet. Hence it must also bring about your spiritual evolution, and bring to perfection all who choose to work in harmony with the Christ. Nothing can overwhelm you if you make this great truth the foundation of which you build your life. Chapter 16. Purity What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20. Your body is the temple of the living God. It is your duty to see that in every way it has kept a fit dwelling place for the God within. The chief requisite for this is absolute purity of body, mind, and heart. When we speak of a temple, it naturally suggests the idea of sacredness. Hence, you should not only look upon your body as something to be kept clean and wholesome and in perfect health and strength, that it may be a fit instrument, but you should also sanctify it and keep it holy and undefiled. Nothing must be allowed to enter it, either as food or drink, that will injure it, make it unhealthy, or lessen your control over it. This animal body of yours has certain desires and tendencies which are perfectly natural to it, just as they are to any animal. But since you, the immortal self, are dwelling in it, you, the immortal self, must control the animal with its desires and tendencies, and make it subservient to the law of being. The lower animals, having no individualized spark of the divine dwelling in them, receive their touch with the divine through a group soul, which guides the evolution of each particular species collectively through instinct. Hence the animals follow their natural tendencies when not perverted by contact with man, and these tendencies, not being perverted, are necessarily right and proper. But man, having a higher guidance and instinct, must control the animal tendencies instead of being controlled by them. No natural function of the body but is pure and wholesome when used for a proper purpose. No natural act is of itself impure. It becomes impure only through impure thoughts concerning it. The animal can follow only its normal instincts, but you, by debasing your God-given intelligence, have the power to sink lower than the beasts, or by claiming your birthright and asserting your manhood to rise far above them. Love in its highest expression is the one power which you possess in common with the gods. It is a divine force of attraction which seeks equilibrium in the union of the masculine and feminine expression of the divine. It is a natural force expressing itself in a perfect purity on all planes, spiritual, mental, and physical. When it is confined to the physical plane, you are apt to lose control of it, and the animal body, through which is it is expressed physically, is left to follow its own desires. Thus the animal perverts this divine force, and by the aid of intellect devises abnormal ways of gratifying its appetites instead of expressing the pure love of spiritual being for its mate. What was divine love becomes debased and impure. The body is defiled and the temple of living God desecrated. Not alone impure acts, but also impure thoughts, even if only subconsciously held, are a source of defilement. Science has demonstrated that thoughts are things, forces which create ethereal forms that attach themselves to their creators seeking expression through their bodies. The science of psychology, the science of the mind, teaches that every thought tends to express itself in a bodily act, and does so express itself unless counteracted by a stronger thought of opposite character. Therefore, your impure or evil acts are not committed because some evil stands at your shoulder, urging you to do the impure or evil deed. But you yourself are responsible, 
for you have created the impure thought forms that are but striving to express themselves through their creators. Or you have so attuned your mind to impurity that the impure thought forms created by others are drawn to you. The normal animal passions when excited and inflamed by impure thoughts find abnormal and necessarily impure expressions. The whole problem rests upon your ability to purify your thoughts concerning all the forces and functions of your body. Learn that there is no natural function of your body that is not normal and right if put to its proper use and governed by pure thoughts. Thou shalt not let thy senses make a playground of the mind. To keep the thoughts pure you must first fight every impure thought the instant it appears. Learn to take an interest in pure things and fill your mind with thoughts concerning them. Determinately conquer the tendency to investigate impurity. Do not be always hovering on the borderline of suggestion, seen in every word and look some hidden suggestion of impurity. Expend as much energy and take as much interest looking for pearls of purity as is generally spent in seeking for the impure. For what ye seek you shall surely find. Determine not to entertain an impure thought any more than an impure visitor would be entertained in the bosom of your family. By interesting yourself in purity and filling your mind with pure thoughts, you cut off the supply of life and energy from the impure thought forms, and if you persistently create their opposites, after a fierce struggle for life, they will soon cease to trouble you. For you have created thought forms of purity which will transmute the impure, and will and must express themselves in pure thought and action. These pure creations will become the warrior who fights for you. Often it is a great surprise to find that the thing you looked upon as such a dire temptation a short time ago will now scarce attract a passing glance. You have conquered it. This divine creative force of love, which is the link that unites you with God, finds its greatest earthly expression in the sex forces. It also has a corresponding expression on all planes, spiritual, mental, and physical. The sex forces are always creative and cannot be brought into operation without a definite creation on all planes, their higher aspects creating upon the higher planes, their lower upon the physical planes. The spiritual essence will create upon the spiritual plane. The mental will recreate upon the mental plane, following out the patterns set by the thought form which are fashioned by the desires, thus making them conscious living entities which attach themselves to man, their creator, expressed through him and demands that he sustain them. Thus, if only gross animal thoughts are held at the time the forces are used, you create gross animal thought forms which drag you down, so that you grow more and more animal. But if pure love and high aspirations as for a holy sacrament are held at the time, you will be able to express more and more clearly the ideal held. The physical essence will create upon the physical plane, but if denied its natural expression on that plane, that is, the creation of a body in which a divine soul can incarnate, it will still create upon the physical plane. Being perverted from its normal and thrown into abnormal channels, it will send its quota of creative energy toward the creation of disease, death, and pestiferous plagues, for its natural function is completely perverted, and that which is, should have been put to the highest use, and which should bring the greatest blessing to mankind, has now become its curse. When the creative life force is brought into activity in purity and love as it finds embodiment in the lower kingdoms, it will clothe itself in forms helpful to man. But since the opposite conditions are too often the rule, the creative force adds its power to those forms which are antagonistic to and prey upon man. These evil things, however, are not a direct creation, but are the result of the impure thoughts and perverted creative force of man permeating the atmosphere of the earth and filling its aura with life force expressing itself through living entities working in a reverse way, seeking avenues through which to bring forth evil instead of good in all parts of the earth, even where man has never trod. The entities thus created, being man's perverted physical creations, must draw their sustenance from mankind. Just as a child draws its life and nourishment from its mother breast, so these unnatural creations must also flourish, and in some way draw their life from man's blood, blood-sucking parasites, cancers, and all pathological bacteria, for example. Do not blame God for sickness and disease. They are man's creations. Humanity as a whole has created these conditions for ages, until the aura of the earth is saturated with what is known to science as disease-breeding germs, bacteria, parasites. Scarcely anything you eat or come in contact with is free from these enemies to human life, making everyone born under the flesh in bondage to the flesh, as the Bible puts it, or in occult parlance, subject to the world's karma to a greater or lesser degree. 
Nevertheless, all of the microscopes show that the germs of disease are constantly entering your body through air, water, and food. To the pure and heart and mind and body, these abnormal creations will prove harmless. Thus is literally fulfilled the promise. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Know well, there are no evils created to tempt or disease to harm you, but those of man's own creation. Since man has thus proved himself a creator of evil, it is time for him to realize his fact, recognize his power, and determine to create good instead of evil. Cohabitation must never take place except between persons legally married to each other. There can be no possible exception to this rule. Legally married means that the law of the land in which they dwell must legalize in the eyes of the world any sexual union. But unless the union has already been made in heaven through pure love, the physical union cannot bring about peace and happiness. For like all true sacraments, it must be entered into and registered upon all planes. Nothing can be gained by breaking the laws of the land. If they are crude or inadequate, your effort should be to uplift them. Every principle which evolution has proved to be for the benefit of mankind must ultimately be used for its highest purpose. Cohabitation outside the legal marriage state is but breaking the law and adding complication to be worked out later in sorrow and suffering. Even though the marriage law is but a man-made law and is far from perfect, it is nevertheless a shadow on earth of the divine law, the divine marriage of the soul. Man's marriage laws have been objectionable features, but the lesson for humanity to learn is that marriage is a holy sacrament, not to be lightly entered into or lightly set aside. Hence, if through ignorance and perversion man degrades this sacrament, he will never learn its sacredness, especially by ignoring it or refusing to bear the consequence of his acts. The fundamental teaching of this order is that in every soul there is a divine guidance, which, if the human personality will listen, will clearly indicate what is right and what is wrong. Hence, no one is forced into an unhappy marriage without going against this inner urge. He either enters in because he is blinded by passion, because of the desire for worldly position, or some reason other than the one great reason, namely because the soul speaks to its mate in divine love. The law of divine love will bring to each soul its true marriage, a union and perfect purity in all planes. This, according to the one life theory, is of course impossible for all, but since reincarnation is a fact, the soul, through repeated experiences, learns to follow its divine guidance, hence will ultimately find its true mate. But they can be spiritually as well as physically married to their mates only when the old accounts of both have been balanced, and the old complications set through the mistakes of the past have been worked out. To ignore the lessons necessary to be learned is but to prolong the period of separation between the two, for they can never come together in perfect purity until each has learned the lessons which kept them apart and have found out how to fulfill the law on all planes, that is, having reached a point where nothing but the spiritual attraction or true love leads them into a physical marriage. To break the law on any plane by refusing to bear the results of your acts simply results in your having to come back and take up the same old lessons where you left them and continue in them until they are learned. The marriage state is the highest and holiest relation between man and woman. Anything that detracts from its holiness should not be tolerated. The idea that it is inherently wrong is an insult to an institution which was placed before man as an earthly expression of his highest attainment, the union of the soul with the divine. Until you have grasped at least something of the holy reflection on earth of this divine marriage, your consciousness can never enter into it upon the higher planes. Hence, if you are not ready to enter into this holy sacrament with the realization of its sacredness, its purity, and the possibility of overcoming the vile ideas which the world has cast upon you, you had better not swear falsely before God and man by taking upon yourself its vows. If mere companionship or so-called spiritual mate is all that is desired, that can be attained without physical contact. But mark well that mere companionship or spiritual union does not include the privilege of personal contact or physical union. It is not the words pronounced by the minister, priest, or magistrate which bind you, no written documents, but the spiritual potencies of the law which you invoke by your vows and the intent of your soul in making the vows. And it is these forces which will demand the fulfillment of the vows, no matter what verbal or written contracts to the contrary you will make or what mental reservations you may hold. If you refuse to fulfill them in one way, you must pay the price in another, for you will be free only when the debt is fully paid. It makes no difference whether the ceremony be Catholic, Protestant, Mohammedan, Mormon, or civil. Whatever land you are in and whatever law you invoke to bind your soul is the one with which you should comply, 
for it is the power of one divine law you invoke no matter what the ceremony employed. Whatever law you accept at the time of the marriage is a representative of the divine law, and make your vows accordingly. That is the law that holds you. There are three parties to the marriage vow, the man, the woman, and the law of the land. This vow can be annulled and withdrawn with the consent of all three parties. Also, if one of the parties has violated the vow, he or she cannot hold the other to it unless they choose to overlook the violation, and thus, in effect, renew the vow. If, however, one overlooks the violation and accepts the resulting conditions, let him not complain and seek sympathy for his hard lot, for he has deliberately chosen that lot and must abide by his choice, work out its karma, and learn its resulting lessons. If man and wife cannot fulfill the vow by living in love and harmony, it is far better for their soul growth to ask the third party, the law of the land, to release them from it. For there is nothing more detrimental to spiritual advance than nuptial in harmony, because of the perpetuation of the inharmony through the creative power, and because of the inharmonious and impure creations brought forth. It is also far better for the children of such a union to pass through the experience of legal separation of the parents might entail then to be brought up in an atmosphere where love, trust, and understanding were lacking and in harmony reigned. When the laws of God and man have been compiled with, and consummation of the union in pure and holy love is a sacrament, under such conditions, if at the time the thoughts are exalted and pure, and the creative energy is permitted to function through its normal and natural channel, there will be upon the spiritual plane a creation which will correlate with the divine creative force and draw to the participants a wonderful blessing and help, while upon the mental plane thought forms of purity will gather as a protecting band around the unborn child to ward off all inimicable and evil influences, and a perfect body should result. Also, through the spiritual force drawn upon, an advanced soul may be attracted to the body, if the desire is to create the body of a child, it should be looked upon as a sacred and religious rite, for there is nothing more important to the race than the perfecting of the vehicles for its continuous and its upliftment. This is far more important than building churches, preaching sermons, or sending missionaries to the heathen. The thoughts of both parents should be concentrated upon an exact mental picture of the body they desire, and the creative act should be carried out with this ideal in mind, and the greatest purity of thought. Thus there can be created a beautiful love child, which will be a blessing and a joy throughout life. If a physical body is created, when it is not wanted, it is created by the mere husks of the creative force, while the real power of creation is expended on other planes in following out whatever pattern is set by the desires. Since the thoughts were not concentrated on the physical plane to produce a perfect body, such a child is robbed and will naturally lack a part of its birthright, the whole race being proportionally defrauded. All life comes from the one life of the Absolute, and normally should evolve back to God in perfect purity and harmony, but instead everything that grows, be it herb or animal, has to contend with the malign influence of the perverted currents of life force, the result of man's misuse of the creative power. This is a literal fulfillment of the curse record in Genesis. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. The curse was not pronounced because of the act of one man and woman nor was it because of the third race, symbolized by Adam and Eve, fell into generation, for the power to create was the great gift given to humanity of this globe by the Elohim. With the gift the divine guidance to use as a right was also given, but as early as the latter part of that race, in direct disobedience to that guidance, mankind began to abuse and pervert it, and humanity has perpetuated that mistake ever since. The curse was not pronounced as a punishment, but as merely a statement of the natural consequence which would follow the use of a creative power in a perverted way. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and also in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all days of thy life. Even in eating our choicest fruits, when partaken of air, they have gained the victory or ripened over the adverse conditions resulting from currents of perverted life forces we suffer. If the race is to be propagated in vileness, every child that is born must bear the burden of a thought of something vile and impure connected with its birth. It is no wonder that children so conceived have little love or respect for their unwilling parents. Children born in love and purity, while subject to this word karma, or in bondage to the flesh, will still be overshadowed by a mantle of purity, which will ward off many temptations to impurity and vileness and will find their environment such as to lead them in paths of purity rather than by ways of evil. For this reason the salvation of the race depends upon the pure in heart conceiving children in love and purity, for if the perpetuation of the race is left to the impure and ignorant, conditions must grow worse. 
Without this thing which we are wont to look upon as vile and pure, the race would very soon become extinct, and if mankind continues to debase and degrade this great gift, the race will still become extinct, for as we have said before, nearly all disease can be traced to the perverted activity of the creative force. In reality, sexual desire is but the effort of the soul to express divine love through the physical vehicle, and should be looked upon as the lower or negative pole of that love, and God is love. When we debase, degrade, and befoul sexual desire, we are debasing the highest physical expression of the God within us. Just so long as parents fail to fill their children's minds with thoughts of the purity and the holiness of the sex relation, the thought that is evil or vile will be perpetuated in the race. Just so long as it is thought of as something unclean and vile, just so long it will be so. For the creative power of thought will clothe itself in the vile garments of the impure ideas, and the sins of the fathers will be visited upon the children under the third and fourth generation. Purify, then, not only your acts, but your thoughts. Persistently refuse to entertain impure ideas. Combat them with ideas of purity and divine love. This does not mean, however, that you should deliberately close your eyes and refuse to admit or recognize that there is evil in the world. For a wise physician must recognize the first symptoms of a disease that he may combat it ere it gains a foothold. Remember always that knowledge is power. Learn to look things in the face with a full consciousness of your power to create good where evil now exists. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Chapter 17. The Origin of Man In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him, male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam, in the day when they were created. Genesis verse 1 through 2. Man is a little world, a microcosm inside the great universe, Isis unveiled. There is much speculation among students of all schools in regard to the origin of man. Some hold to the orthodox idea that God literally fashioned a man out of clay, and in some mysterious manner animated him with breath. Others hold to the Darwinian theory that man and the ape descended from a common ancestor, both being the result of a wholly physical or more or less mechanical evolution. Between these extremes, the great mass of thinking people are seeking something more satisfying to a rational mind than the former and more elevating than the latter. To this great class there comes from out the ages the arcane teaching of those great souls who reached their godlike state before this world was born and who have been the manipulators of the evolutionary law under which this planet and its inhabitants have reached their present state. These great souls have always been and still are the guides and teachers of mankind. Hence those whose reason postulates or whose intuition recognizes such godlike beings can safely accept their teachings, for they are in a position to know. This ancient wisdom has never been lost, but because of man's gradual refusal to accept and follow it during his ages of darkness and ignorance, it has been temporarily withdrawn from the public teaching, and carefully preserved, although always accessible to every soul who seeks it by the right method and in the right spirit. There are reasonable grounds for both the above-mentioned theories. Man has both a spiritual evolution which comes from above, and a material evolution which belongs to the earth. His physical body is the highest attainment of a physical evolution through all the lower kingdoms where it has passed through stages analogous to the mineral, vegetable, animal, in an ethereal form corresponding to the stages through which the planet passed in previous rounds. His spiritual evolution is the result of the voluntary descent of immortal egos into more or less perfected animal, human bodies, and their subsequent effort to control and spiritualize those animal organisms. These arcane teachings, preserved in their purity upon imperishable records through all the ages, tell us that during each day period, or round seven, great races follow each other successively, each being made up of seven sub-races, which in turn are composed of many tribes, kingdoms, and nations. These races and sub-races do not begin suddenly or end abruptly to make way for the next, but overlap for untold ages ere the old ways give to the new. For example, the majority of mankind belongs to the seventh sub-race of the fourth root race. The Chinamen and their offshoots in branchlets, Malayans, Mongolians, Tibetans, Hungarians, Finns, and even the Esquimaux, are all remnants of this last offshoot, although humanity is already entering the sixth sub-race of the fifth great race of the fourth round and some few children are even now being born who will become the teachers and prophets who will prepare for the coming of the sixth great race. 
Following the cyclic law, each of the tribes, nations, sub-races, and great races has its humble birth, its youth, its maturity, during which it reaches the zenith of its power, then its gradual decline, decay, and final disappearance, as the recorded history of nations known today clearly shows. All that a race acquires, however, is stored up to reappear in its purity in the next race. The reason for the decay is that the race has acquired all that its physical evolution enables it to express. Further accumulation of knowledge must be postponed until a finer and more responsive organism has been evolved. Therefore, while an entirely new race seems to appear, in reality it is but the reincarnation of those souls who compose the former races. In this round, the majority of persons in the Western nations have evolved through the fourth great race and through the sub-races of the fifth, Aryan, to the point where they are now just entering its sixth sub-race, although among all nations there are laggards belonging to less evolved sub-races. During the first great or root polar race, the germs of that which was to become man were sleeping, as it were, through the chaotic conditions of the then ethereal world, a sleep of oblivion in the waters of the uncreate. Hence man today can have little comprehension of the first race. As the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, misty or cloud-like forms composed of but two elements, air and water, arose, having a sentient life, yet not human intelligence. These cloud-like forms, composed of the most ethereal matter compatible with objectivity, took the shape of gigantic semi-human monsters, the first attempt of material nature at building human bodies. This was the second, or hyperborean race. This race was sexless, their mode of reproduction being by fission or division, just as a cloud might separate into two parts. These misty forms became more and more dense by the gradual absorption of the new element, Earth, until the second race, being also sexless, evolved out of itself, at its beginning, the third, androgynous race, by an analogous but already more complicated process. The emanations that came from their bodies during the seasons of procreation were ovulary, developing into a large, soft, egg-like vehicle, which gradually hardened, when after a period of gestation, it broke and the young human animal issued from it unaided, as the fowls do in our race. Not a strange procedure when we remember that even today a child is born in a membrous sack or a large, soft, egg-like vehicle. At the middle point of the second race, he is still gigantic and ethereal, but growing firmer and more condensed in the body. A more physical man, yet still less intelligent than spiritual, for mind is a slower and more difficult evolution than is the physical frame. These primitive beings were still composed of astral matter and today would not be visible. Hence they left no physical traces by which science might discover them. The evolution of the physiological man out of the astral races of early Lemurian age, the Jurassic Age of Geology, is exactly paralleled by the materialization of spirits in the seance room. Only toward the middle of the third race, Lemurian, did solid bones develop, the sexes separate, the body become clothed with coats of skin, and take on human form as we know it today although at that time it was of gigantic proportions. It was from this point onward that truly human evolution began, as symbolized in the Bible by Adam and Eve. Previous to this time, the races were cold-blooded like the present-day amphibians, reptiles, fish, and in the invertebrates, taking on the temperature of their surrounding. But from this point on, humanity gradually became warm-blooded and maintained a constant body temperature. Thus it will be seen that man is truly the microcosm of the macrocosm, for in his physical development and in his modes of procreation he has passed through all the stages nature has used and still uses in the lower kingdom. The mineral reproduces by exuding its essence, the vegetable by budding or by seeds, each part of the plant as a slip being capable of reproducing the entire plant, just as a part of Adam's body, his rib, reproduced Eve and the animal by the sexual process. The body refers merely to the evolution of the animal body of man, and in some respects may resemble the Darwinian hypothesis, the great difference being that according to these teachings, the beginning of man were not upon the physical plane, and all stages were not passed through in physical matter. This is why science has ever failed in its search for the missing link, or the common ancestor of man, and the ape. Man did not descend from the ape or from a common ancestor, but the ape descended from man, 
being the perverted and degenerate offspring resulting from the sins of the latest third and early fourth races. After the middle of the third race, a dual evolution begins. Spiritual beings, called Solar Fathers, or Pitris, who had reached their highest state on previous world chains, consciously descended to earth and breathed into the human animal forms the breath of life, as recorded in Genesis. That which is called the breath was something with which animal man was then endowed, a power and capacity added to the mere animal consciousness he possessed before, for it was the breath of divine life, a human soul, a spiritual overshadowing. This same teaching is represented in Genesis by the Adam of the first chapter being created by a sexless animal, the culmination and last of animal creation, the Adam of the second chapter first being created a bisexual animal, then being endowed with a human soul. This Adam, the early third race, was created before the animals, and each animal was brought to him to be named. Later on, this Adam evolved out of his bisexual state into that of the separated sexes, Adam and Eve. Then the sons of God, semi-divine beings, saw the daughters of men, the evolved human animal forms, that they were fair, and they took them wise of all which they chose, and begat the future sub-races. The union of the sons of God with the daughters of men added to the elements in humanity, air, water, earth, a new element, fire, or intellect. Fire is a sacred and higher element which only comes to earth as the gift of the gods to man, and man alone of all creation can control it and use it unafraid. But only the highest of the human forms are ready, hence comparatively few receive the divine incarnation, while many receive the spark of self-consciousness and still more received but an overshadowing of the semi-divine beings, who in future stages of evolution were ultimately to become their fathers in heaven. Some projected a spark, some deferred till the fourth. Those who entered became Arats. Those who received but a spark remained destitute of higher knowledge. The third remained mindless. This stanza contains in itself the whole key to the mysteries of evil, the so-called fall of the angels, and the many problems that have puzzled the brains of the philosophers from the time that the memory of man began. It solves the secret of the subsequent inequalities of intellectual capacity, of birth and social position, and gives a logical explanation of the incomprehensible karmic course throughout the eons which followed. These differences were not the result of injustice, but were due to the inequalities of the animal organisms, just as we find today in a field of wheat, all of which was planted at the same time, with the same seed, and in the same soil. Varying degrees of perfection, some ripe for harvest, others unripe, others not yet begun to head out. The great law shows no partiality. All will reach their perfection in due season. As involution progressed, the response of matter to the molding and guiding power of spirit became less and less, proportionate to the increasing density of the forms through which it had to act. And only when the human brain had evolved into a fit instrument to respond to the divine spark could man become a rational, self-conscious being. Until then, he was merely a human animal, begetting his kind according to animal instinct, but unable consciously to create according to his will and desire. He is now a perfectly concrete or compacted body, at first the form of a giant ape, and now more intelligent or rather cunning than spiritual. For on the downward arc he has now reached a point where his primordial spirituality is eclipsed and overshadowed by nascent mentality. In the last half of the third race his gigantic stature decreases and his body improves in texture, and he becomes a more rational being, though still more an ape than a diva. The fourth race, like the fourth globe or round, is the lowest point of involution or the turning point the gift of mind having evolved through all the ages of the third and the first part of the fourth race reached its truly human stage about the middle point of the fourth. The hitherto dumb races acquired our present human speech on this globe, on which, from the fourth race, language is perfected and knowledge increases. At that time the psychic powers held sway but were beginning to be dominated by the rapidly developing intellect and will. Under the guidance of his divine ancestors, man had been taught all the arts and sciences, as well as the control and proper use of all the powers within himself and in nature. When he had grown up, as it were, his divine instructors withdrew, leaving him free to use his powers as he would, of his own free will, put into practice the precepts they had inculcated. 
But with the exercise of free will, the temptation to use his great knowledge for his own sensuous pleasure and for his self-aggrandizement was too great, and gradually he chose to follow the lure of the senses rather than the call of the spirit. It was during this period of evolution that the seeds of karma were sown, whose terrible harvest the world as a whole has been and still is reaping even unto this day. His spiritual progenitors, seeing the awful result of man's failure in love and mercy, temporarily removed the greater part of the race from the scene of its debasement through the great cataclysms which destroyed the continent of Atlantis, a memory of which is recorded in the scriptures of many nations today as the Great Flood. Many legends are extant concerning the nations of that fourth or Atlantean race, and today a new interest in their history is awakening in the minds of all classes of thinkers, and many theories and even circumstantial accounts are being given out concerning their civilizations. The reason for this is that those souls who formerly composed the Atlantean race are now reincarnating in large numbers in the Western world, where they must reacquire their former knowledge, redeem the failure of the past, and rise to a higher state of spirituality than ever before. The Atlantean race was the culminating point in the evolution of the physical, mental, and psychic powers, their intellectual powers had reached as great perfection as their physical and psychic powers, but spirituality was more or less dormant. The result was that they controlled and manipulated the physical and psychic currents of forces and dominated both the animal and elemental worlds. They thus reached a stage of civilization in some respects far higher than man has subsequently attained. In our present age, however, the same degree of perfection must again be attained, but dominated by the higher spiritual evolution. It is this culmination that we are now rapidly attaining, and for which the advanced souls of the former race are again incarnating. It is the Atlantean civilization which is symbolized by the Tower of Babel, a civilization whose base rested on earth, but whose top reached into the higher realms farther than man of that day was entitled to go. By the perversion and displacement of their powers, their impurity and selfishness, they fell into monstrous evils. Striving only for personal power and gratification, many become terrible black magicians, misusing and perverting the force of life. All, however, were not wicked. Some followed the precepts of the divine teachers and used their great powers for good. Certain of these were gathered together especially out of the fifth sub-race, and during the sixth and seventh sub-races were taught by the sons of God how to perpetuate the sacred teachings and carry them over the period of the cataclysms which marked the close of the race. They thus became the teachers and guides of future races, as symbolized by the Bible story of Noah. During the sixth and seventh sub-races, all classes were warned of the coming disasters by their spiritual teachers, and were exhorted to repentance and a change of life. All who listened and believed escaped and settled in various distant mountainous regions. This teaching is corroborated by the discovery today in such widely separated countries as Egypt, India, Central and South America, of similar and even identical hieroglyphics, symbols, architecture, etc. The reign of the black magicians grew worse and worse and the enslavement of their fellow men and the perversion of their forces became more awful until the earth crust could no longer withstand the perverted currents of force. And after a series of cataclysms lasting through the sixth and seventh sub-race, it finally sank beneath the waves. Owing to these cataclysms, great numbers emigrated to distant lands and became the seed from which sprang the great masses of the present race. In fact, the yellow races of Eastern Asia today are their direct descendants. History repeats itself, and the same thing is happening today. Humanity is being worn through various sources. Prophets today, as of old, are proclaiming the near approach of catastrophes and cataclysms, and the call to repentance, love, and brotherhood is heard in the land. The approaching cataclysm, however, will not be as widespread as those of Atlantis, the close of this cycle being but the close of the sub-race, fifth, instead of a great race. The fifth great race is our present red or white Aryan race, the characteristic of which is the increasing spiritualization of matter through man. Up to the turning point, at the middle of the fourth race, spirit was being involved into matter, but from the time on, matter has been evolving towards spirit. We have evolved through the sub-races of this fifth race until we are now just entering upon its sixth sub-race. During this coming sub-race, the seed will be planted of that which will be reaped by the sixth great race, just as the fifth sub-race of the Atlanteans planted the seed of this present fifth great race. This fifth race, however, has some 16,000 years of its cycle still left ere the close of its seventh sub-race, 
and the great cataclysm which will mark its end. In the sixth great race, the Christ principle will find its greatest expression and its greatest power in and over matter, thus spiritualizing and lifting both life and matter on all planes into a higher state. This race must also witness the culmination and fulfillment through divine love of all the efforts put forth during all previous races. Thus will it usher in the golden age. This race will cover but a short period of time as compared with the earlier races. The seventh race will bring into manifestation the golden age and synthesize all that has been gained, thus becoming the great fulfillment, the culmination of man's evolution in this day period or round. During this race, the highest attainment of man's evolution will be gathered up preparatory to informing the humanity of a new globe or day period, the fifth round. As in the days of Atlantis, so today, those whose hearts can respond to the higher note today, being imparted to humanity through the various avenues of teaching utilized by the progenitors of man, will first be prepared, then gathered together into a definite center of civilization, where they can have an opportunity to receive the direct teaching and guidance of the same great souls who have always prepared for the unfoldment of wisdom at certain cyclic intervals. This great center, however, will not be limited to any one sect, avenue of teaching, or any one organization, society, or order, but will be composed of all those symbolized in revelation by the mystic hundred and forty and four thousand, who stood on Mount Zion, having their father's name written in their foreheads. In other words, those who have received their mystical name and through the power of the Christ have developed their spiritual perception. Every movement which is striving to give out pure spiritual teaching is an avenue used by the great ones to reach a certain class of persons. But only those who are ready and have received the mystic mark in their foreheads will be able to enter in. The Order of the Fifteen being composed largely of the reincarnated souls who in the days of ancient Atlantis were entrusted with the task of preparing a place of refuge and promulgating the arcane teachings must again take up the reincarnated work for ideas, teachings, and movements incarnate as well as souls. All who at that time responded to its call will naturally be attracted to this particular movement today, and according to their point of development and the work they accomplished, then they will be given a special place and a special work to do in preparation for the coming of the new sub-race. Many who repudiated the teachings in those days and through the resulting suffering have learned their lesson will through this order be given another opportunity to retrieve the past and take an advanced step in their spiritual life. Chapter 18. The Symbol of the Serpent Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Genesis 3, 1-5 in that remote period during which both sacred and profane history admit the fact that the gods confabulated with infant humanity, the serpent was the symbol of the god Saturn. In Egypt, Sat-an, later Saturn, giver of esoteric wisdom, one of the Elohim, the sons of God. He is referred to in Job as the great initiator sent by the Lord to test Job, the whole book of Job being the story of an initiation. From the earliest ages the serpent was recognized as the symbol of esoteric wisdom. Many nations worship it as a symbol of the sun, the giver of life. Only during the dark ages of medieval history was it degraded and limited to signify the force of evil or de-evil. Jesus recognized the serpent as a symbol of good when he admonished his disciples, Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as dove. The Assyrian priests were called serpents as were also the Druid priests. The masters of wisdom and all initiates into the sacred mysteries are called Nagas, or serpents of wisdom, because by overcoming temptations they are said to have cast off their outer skin and to have been born again, thus becoming sons of will and wisdom and immortal. They have met the great initiator and have wrested from him his rod of power. Again, the serpent is an old glyph for the astral light, the medium of both white and black magic, good in its spiritual aspect, but evil in its lower. The primitive symbol of the serpent symbolized divine wisdom and perfection, 
and has always stood for psychical regeneration and immortality. Hermes called the serpent the most spiritual of all creatures. Moses, initiated into the wisdom of Hermes, called it more subtle than any beast of the field. The strange veneration in which the Ophites held the serpent which represented Christos may become less perplexing if the students would but remember that at all the ages the serpent was the symbol of divine wisdom, which kills in order to resurrect, destroys but to rebuild the better. Moses is made a descendant of Levi, a serpent tribe. Guatemala Buddha is of a serpent lineage through the Naga, or serpent race of kings, who reigned in Magadha. Hermes, or the god Tot, Toth, in his snake symbol is Tet, and according to the Ophite legends, Jesus, or Christos, is born from a snake, divine wisdom, or Holy Ghost. That is, he became a son of God through his initiation into the serpent science. From time immemorial the serpent has symbolized the sex force, good when lifted up, as Moses lifted it up in the wilderness, that all were suffering and dying from the stings of the poisonous vipers, the perversions of the sex force, might be healed by the vision of purity revealed by the brazen serpent, evil when allowed to crawl in the mire of earth, biting the heel of the woman, and placing enmity between her seed and it. It is said that, before our globe became egg-shaped and the universe also, a long trail of cosmic dust or fire mist moved and writhed like a serpent in space. Thus our globe was prepared by the serpent force for the great test humanity came to this planet to experience, that is, the ability to control the creative power and create in the image of God through the spiritualization and perfect blending of the separated sexes. This great lesson, when learned, will enable man to become as one of us, or divine. After man became involved in matter, as outlined in chapter 13, and the androgynous third race had gradually evolved through its various stages, the separation of the sexes took place. This, however, was not a sudden change affecting the entire race, but was the result of a gradual evolution lasting through the entire latter half of that race. This is symbolized by the story of Eve being taken from Adam, solace, while he was in a deep sleep, the deep sleep being the prolia or night period between the third and fourth races during which the separation was perfected. The word Adam means red earth and refers to the third race in which the humanity of the red ray was first clothed in an earthly body. The Adam and Eve spoken of later as one man and one woman symbolizes the sexes functioning separately in the great Atlantean or fourth race. Hence the dawn of the fourth race, the androgynous forms of the early third race had disappeared, and only the separated sexual forms known to us today remained. In one sense, the Garden of Eden symbolizes the pure and perfect physical body in which infant humanity was originally clothed. According to the same symbology, the tree which is in the midst of the garden is the spinal cord, the sap of which is the kundalini force, or the serpent force, a dynamic creative power functioning through the spinal cord, its lower aspect being expressed through the sex organs, and its highest aspect functioning through the pineal gland. The fruit of this tree is the spiritual power gained as the result of the opening of that which is known as the third eye. As man, through experience, gains wisdom, he uses this mystic power gradually to bring about its higher physical manifestations, as well as the psychic and spiritual. It slowly ascends the spinal cord through the central canal until it reaches and stimulates into activity the pineal gland, the function of which is called the opening of the eye of wisdom. It is not, however, the physiological change in this organ which opens man's consciousness to divine wisdom, but following the biological law, function makes structure. It is the attainment of the higher function which results in the anatomical and physiological change. Only through the function of this kundalini power can mankind gain the experiences that both good and evil have to teach. A moment's thought as to the early symbology will show that there is an underlying meaning common to all. Saturn, the initiator, Satan, the tempter, the astral light, the creative power of sex, etc., namely that it is, in very truth, the power to become as gods that is indicated. Being the distinctive heritage of the fourth race, this power to create sexually became at one at the same time the great temptation and the great opportunity. 
In fact, it was the one experience for which this globe was created, and for which humanity fell into generation and became clothed with coats of skin. The infant race at its outset was confronted by the initiator, Saturn, the serpent, who was commissioned to impart, as the crowning gift, the creative power, which humanity only then was prepared to receive. The so-called temptation was but a test of man's ability either to use or abuse his divine gift. Ever since that time, man and woman individually have had to meet the same test. Man created in the image of God and endowed with the God power of creativeness must prove his ability to use his power wisely or through its abuse learn the lesson and gain through suffering the experience that physical existence in separated sexes alone can teach. The power was given him not as a temptation, but as a step in evolution through which he must pass in perfect purity. Just as in this day a teacher who gives out a new advanced truth is condemned for the evil resulting from its misuse, so Saturn, or Satan, has had to bear the responsibility arising from the failure of man to use the creative power in purity and holiness. Man has chosen to become as gods, knowing the evil through the misuse of this power, but ere the cycle closes, must become as gods to know the good. The culmination of his degradation was reached by the Atlanteans, who not only used this force for animal gratification, but also perverted it to accomplish their horrible practices of black magic. It was for this sin that the continent of Atlantis and most of its inhabitants were destroyed. While the sinking of Atlantis destroyed much of the dangerous knowledge of how to pervert this force into black magic or evil, Yet enough remained to perpetuate evil and misery on earth and make a hell out of what was given to man to be his paradise. The whole experience, including the sin and suffering which the perversion of this force has created, is an initiation, not only for the race, but also for the planet, which when successfully passed will make the planet the completion of the octave of the system and the beginning of a new and greater system. The banishment of Adam and Eve from Eden was due to the fact they could not face the flaming sword of purity, which turned every way and barred them from obtaining the fruit of the tree. This banishment meant that man could no longer dwell in the etherealized body or Eden, with his spiritual faculties freely functioning and able to talk face to face with God. Instead, the immortal soul is forced to dwell in a body of dense physical matter with the spiritual centers dormant, so that only by the sweat of his brow can he obtain spiritual bread. This means that only by laborious effort can man open the inner doors that communicate with the higher planes and consciously bring to himself the spiritual food upon which his soul must live. At every attempt to re-enter Eden, man is met by the angel of the flaming sword placed by God to guard the tree of immortal life from man's impurity. Thou shalt surely die is usually considered a penalty for man's defilement of Eden, but in reality even this death sentence was but the working of the immutable law of divine love. For immortality under conditions of impurity, sickness, and suffering would be a punishment far surpassing even the medieval conception of a physical hell. Only when man can face the sword of the spirit and allow it to cleave from him every cloak of impurity and once more enter the garden naked but not ashamed can he meet the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The cool of the day refers to the close of the cycle of wandering outside the garden. The day period the period of stress and strain, of heat and passion, which both the individual and the race must face and conquer, ere they can attain poise or cool, quiet perception, in which state alone they can become aware of the Lord God, or the law of good manifesting in the garden of their human personality. The so-called temptation was the act of one of the sons of God, who was the direct channel through which the power to create reached humanity. The giver of this gift, Saturn, or Lucifer, star of the morning, is a bright archangel who fell or descended from heaven to confer this gift of immortality upon man. Saturn, or Satan, is that aspect of Jehovah which brought humanity its great test, and in this sense may be regarded as its tempter or initiator, while Lucifer is that aspect of the same force which confers the crown of victory on those who conquer. There are many passages referring to him as one of the Elohim. This personification, denominated Satan, is to be contemplated from three different planes, the Old Testament, the Christian fathers, and the ancient Gentile attitude. He is supposed to have been represented by the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Nevertheless, the epithet of Satan is nowhere in the Hebrew sacred writings applied to that or any other form of Ophidian. 
His so-called fall was by no means one of sin or failure, but a voluntary descent to earth to bring to man the creative fire, the gift of the gods, for only through the mastery and proper use of this force can immortality be obtained. The story of Prometheus is but another expression of this ideograph. There is no evil outside mankind that can produce a Satan in the orthodox sense of the devil. It is only through terrible perversions of the creative power that it has become the evil, or de evil, as time passed by his vile, lustful thoughts on this subject and his misuse of the life force. Man has created a composite thought form which may be said to be entitized into a living force of evil, commonly called the devil, which, with an army of so-called lesser devils, arrayed in serried ranks, continually fights against the power of good or God. These are the vipers that tormented the children of Israel and all other races. This army must be met by good, and will be annihilated only when thought forms of purity are sent forth by man in sufficient numbers and force to overcome the evil creations. Being the creation of man, functioning in its lowest aspect, this evil can be conquered only by man, its creator. The conquering must take the form of a transmutation, that is, the substitution of vitalized thoughts of love and purity for those of lust and evil. In the childhood of the race, a great wave of serpent worship, originally intended to symbolize this truth and its purity, spread over the world. This, however, in time became degraded, and the reptile itself was finally worshipped as a god. It was kept in a filthy den, and the youth and beauty of the land were thrown to it for prey. It was fed on human beings, and so it grew fat, and the stench of it filled all the temple, even to the outer courts. Humanity is again walking in the same old path, according to the law of cycles, and today is but repeating the sad story upon a higher plane, the mental. First, undue exaltation and worship, as witnessed in the days of phallicism, then materialization and consequent defilement, until today the world's idea of the serpent power sex is that of a monster grown fat upon the youth and beauty of the land. The teaching in regard to the sex function have always been held most sacred, and for this reason they have been veiled from humanity in general, and revealed only to those whose purity of heart and life permitted them to grasp something of their deeper truth. Because of this veiling of the truth, there have sprung up in the minds of those not instructed in the mysteries many misconceptions, chief of which is that this great God-given power is in and of itself inherently impure and accursed. This belief has given rise to doctrines which teach man to despise and try and kill out this greatest of gifts. But as long as this serpent of sex is accursed and degraded by man's thought, it is doomed to crawl upon the ground and bring forth its progeny of vipers and darkness and filth, and woman is doomed to conceive and bring forth in pain and suffering instead of purity and joy. Woman has suffered the most, but by that suffering she should have developed her spiritual intuition. The sex force is considered impure only because the spiritually blind have decreed that it shall be considered impure. They assume that they are wiser and holier than he who created them, he who breathed into them the living fire of creative force. Being wiser than the gods, they have decreed that the normal expression of the sex function within the married relation shall be considered vile and it shall go and be suppressed. The result is already apparent. Go over the world's history and you will find that after every period during which the married relation consummated in pure and holy love, was relegated to second place in gaining spiritual development, and the normal sex function was taught to be inherently impure and calculated to hold back the participants from spiritual growth and final liberation, that it was something to be suppressed and killed out, there invariably followed a wave of licentiousness in which filthy substitutes, practiced for so-called mere physical release, were not only condoned but taught as preferable to the normal relation and taught in the name of religion, or spiritual development, or occult or esoteric science. If such practices were advocated by the outcast of humanity, the world would stand aghast, and societies for the suppression of the vice would quickly spring up. But when such perverted teachings are given out under the name of spiritual or esoteric truth, as though secrecy could make impurity pure, by those who are well advanced upon the path, many, many blinded ones forget even the common standards of morality and decency, and eagerly clutch at such an excuse for the gratification of inherent vileness under the cloak of esoteric teaching, which lends to it an air of respectability. The greater the height attained, the more disastrous the fall. The greater the influence of such a teacher, the more serious and far-reaching the effects of the lapse from purity." 
Instead of there being any latitude permitted to those who are advanced upon the path of attainment, the rules are far more strict. What would be but a slight lapse from virtue in a savage or in an ignorant becomes a cyclone of inequity sweeping many before it, in one who has entered the inner degrees of occultism. For upon each inner step every vibration is multiplied a thousandfold. This is why the disciple should absolutely master, or gain perfect control of, not suppress, all life forces ere he attempts to enter the inner degrees, or his failure is foreordained. Let this point be clearly understood. There can be no spiritual teachings of any kind, either esoteric or exoteric, that are not founded upon absolute purity, not only of body but of mind. The higher and more esoteric the teaching, the more rigid the standard of purity. All planes interblend, and all acts upon the physical plane have their correspondence upon all other planes. Therefore, what is impure on the lowest plane is a thousand times more so upon each successive inner plane. If a pilgrim were approaching a sacred shine, he would not knowingly enter with his feet slimed with the mud of the public highway, and hope to leave no stain upon the pure alablaster floor of the inner court, for even the faintest footstep would be more noticeable there than the filth that covered the public highway an inch deep. This subject has been the greatest stumbling block for many teachers who are otherwise trying to uplift humanity, because it is the greatest test of the humanity on this globe. Only when this lesson is learned will others await it under different conditions. But there must be some brave souls who are willing now to face the world's misconceptions and slander, and stand boldly for the uplifting and purifying of the subject. The world must be taught the difference between the wise, normal use of this function in perfect purity, in the married relation only, and killing it out or suppressing it. Many talk loudly about overcoming and killing out this force. But if you could look into their hearts, you would see that their overcoming is usually but satiety. They have crawled through the filthy places of life, and have slimed their impure ideas of sex over everything until they have grown sick. Then they put on monkish habits, and talk loudly about having outgrown all such animal instincts. Many others have never known anything but the impure side of sex. Their ideals have been so shattered by contact with the world's misconception that they, in their natural purity, have put the thought of it from them as something too vile to be considered. This shrinking from the subject is a natural result of the world's attitude. For, alas, even those who set themselves up as teachers on the subject are apt to but stir up the filth and leave things worse than they were before. This is invariably the rule if the world's standards of morality are ruthlessly set aside, especially those pertaining to the legal marriage relation, which is not only a sacred sacrament, a symbol of the marriage of the soul, the union with the higher self, becoming one with the Father in heaven, but is also a bulwark of safety to society that must never, under any pretext, be weakened. As to the final disuse of this function, as long as man has his present anatomical structure and physiological functions he must learn how to bring to perfection, purify and use for its highest purpose the body and functions he now possesses, and not waste time speculating on what conditions will obtain in future world periods. For only when new conditions are given him can he grasp more advanced lessons. It doth not appear what we shall be. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. But we cannot awake until we have purified and used every function we possess for the glory of God. Hence the order of the fifteen desires to teach humanity how to prepare for the future by taking the next step here and now. The time has come when woman must take her place as the priestess of the Most High, the revealer of purity and truth to man. She it is who must lift the corner of the veils that hides the face of the Divine Mother Isis. Isis is called the Divine Mother because hers is the force, both in nature and humanity, that brings forth. She is spoken of as having seven veils, alluding to the protection thrown around the sacred mysteries connected with the bringing into manifestation of the creative force, God the Father, sent out through the masculine expression. The seven veils are the mysteries upon the seven planes of consciousness and manifestations. The first and the lowest of these veils, the mystery of physical birth, has never yet been lifted, nor can it be by profane hands. In the ancient temples of Isis it was death to so much as touch the veil before her shrine, and on many tablets recently unearthed a carven serpent has been found having seven heads, which symbolizes the same mystery. The Phoenicians are said to have originated the alphabet from the symbols made by the writing of the sacred serpents. 
This was another advance or creation and evolution attributed to the serpent god Saturn. For letters serve to manifest ideas, and their invention placed man upon a new step in evolution. Since through the ages woman has been made the plaything of man, and taught to use her powers to entice and beguile him, as the only method by which she could attain her ends. In this new women's era she is confronted with tasks which her training makes most difficult, that is, the facing of herself and her real motives. From which she must turn her feminine powers of love, intuition, and beauty to the upliftment of the race, instead of to the beguilement of man, that she may satisfy her vanity, love of conquest, and desire for a creature comforts. Although man, being the positive pole upon the earth plane, by his superior physical powers, has throughout the ages enslaved woman, still woman, upon the more subtle plane of desire, has dominated and enslaved man. Hence it is woman who must break the shackles, first of her own desires and then for the race. This she can never do by playing upon man's chivalry to attain the gratification of her own ends, be those ends love, ambition, vanity, ease, and comfort, or what not. Many otherwise admirable women have debased their God-given instincts, love of home, and desire for children, first by awakening and playing upon man's animal passions to satisfy their ambition, and then by appealing to his chivalry, forcing him into what must inevitably prove an unhappy marriage. For quite as many men are blinded and led from the path of purity, because of women's ambitions and desires as women are led astray through man's passion. And until woman awakens to her responsibility and understands her real mission, that is, her powers to play upon man's heart, stimulate his noblest aspirations, and thus lead him to the heights of spiritual attainment, instead of into mere physical union without love, she will continue to be the slave she is today in spite of any political or social liberty she may obtain. It is woman who must lift up the world's ideas of the sex force from the mire and degradation of man's misconception and give this great power its proper place in the temple of the living God, the body, as the highest expression of the divine in man. Just as it was woman who gave to man the apple of discord, so must woman pluck the golden apples that grow at the top of the tree of life and give them to man to eat. Chapter 20. The Memory of Past Lives Both thou and I have passed through many births. Mine are known unto me, but thou knowest not of thine. The Bhagavad Gita, Chapter 4 Tell him, O aspirant, that true devotion may bring him back the knowledge, that knowledge which was his in former birth. The Voice of the Silence, Blavatsky The memory of past lives is given not for amusement, nor to satisfy vain curiosity, but to include a needed lesson. As we stated in the chapter on karma, the destiny of each soul is ultimately to take its proper place in the divine plan. While the soul may spend many lives in perfecting its power and working out minor karma, still at certain cycles, usually every seventh year, the destiny of the soul will be its main task, retarded or accelerated according to the karma to be worked out, just as the seventh wave of the sea rises higher on the shore than the other six. When a person is ready to take a decided step in his work of destiny, he must see what he has accomplished toward it in the past, and how to avoid the mistakes and side issues that led him astray in former lives. He may not remember all the details, but step by step as he needs them, the main lessons will be revealed to him. If he is about to repeat a previous blunder, the memory of it will be given him, often in a dream or vision. And if he is not carried away by the mere remembering, or does not push it aside as a fantasy or delusion, and if he sincerely desires light and help, and is striving to follow his intuition, he will see the lesson and understand its application to his present condition. There is no chance remembering. All follows an exact law. It comes when the higher self sees that the personality is ready, when the physical brain has been trained to vibrate to some extent in response to the will of the higher self. Many ask, why is not the memory of past lives more common? Well, there is a deep reason for this. In our evolution we have passed through many sad and embittering experiences which, if remembered, would so depress our spirits, so discourage and hamper us that we would make little progress. Also, did we remember who we were and who our present companions were? In many cases, we would find it so hard to forgive the injuries, so hard to forget the troubles we had passed through in connection with them, that our spiritual growth would be retarded. Since the law, acting as karma, demands perfect compensation or adjustment, one great object in each new life is to readjust the mistakes of the past. When an opportunity to do so comes to us in this life, if we could remember all that had passed would be far harder than love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, 
Bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. Hence it is in love and wisdom that the knowledge of past lives is withheld. Many think that they could remember who they were in the past. It would be all joy and wonder. But in the majority of cases it would be a bitter disappointment and a sad and depressing remembering. Therefore we will never be permitted to remember our past lives until we have advanced beyond the point where the griefs, the ills, and the unkindness done us can affect us, make us worry or become discouraged, and thus retard our progress. We will not remember until we have gained the poise which nothing can disturb, until we have become centered in the thought that to manifest divine love is all there is worth striving for. Most souls find the memory of the trials and sorrows of one life as much as the person bounty can bear. Therefore, the complete remembrance of it all had endured in its many lives would tend to crush it. It is memory that haunts, that drives to insanity. No one day can hold enough sorrow to dishearten utterly the personality. It is the accumulated burden that overwhelms. A most important lesson to learn is to put from you all that is past. Live in the present. Let the dead past bury its dead. Until the soul has learned that what is past is registered within the real self as a lesson learned, a needed experience gained, and can let it go and not be crushed by its memory. Until the personality shows its strength of character by not brooding over mistakes, until it has exemplified this stability in its present life, its Heavenly Father, in loving mercy, draws a veil over the memory of previous incarnations. When it can bear without flinching or shrinking the memory of the sorrows of one life, it will be ready to bear a more extended memory. Another reason why we do not remember is that at each incarnation the soul clothes itself in a new body, the brain cells of which have never responded to the past conditions, and only when the brain is capable of responding to the memory stored up in the higher self can that memory be impressed upon the waking consciousness. In other words, the personality per se cannot remember the past because it has experienced but the present life. Another reason is that many, many of our lives have been so commonplace or trivial that they have registered little of value in the real self, hence have little of importance to remember. For out of each life it is only those experiences and those lessons which have made for soul growth that are immortalized by being registered in the real self. Only good is immortal, evil is but transitory. The memory of a past life is often awakened by reading about or seeing the picture of some historical character. This arouses the consciousness of having lived at that time or in that place, or perhaps that the reader was himself the character mentioned. This is apt to give rise to ridicule, for many upon whom the memory of past lives is dawning seem never to have been anything but kings and queens or notable characters in history. Well, there's a reason for this, for like most mistakes, it is rather a misunderstanding or a misapplication of the remembrance than a deliberate attempt to deceive. It is a result of ignorance of the law. In such a case, the probability is that the person did live at the period remembered, and perhaps took a prominent part in the events enacted, but he was not necessarily the principal character. The feeling of peculiar sympathy or aversion that one feels in such a case is precisely what he felt at the time of the event. In the past, he may have been deeply interested in the characters under consideration and fond of imagining himself in their place. Thus, when the attention is turned to those old times, it awakens the old currents of feeling, and he thinks he actually was what in the past he had wished to be. Often there is another explanation. The noted personage may have stood out as the keynote of his time, and the circumstance that produced his eminence were lessons that many other souls learned. In fact, the leading character enacted the drama for all the lesser personality belonging to the same group, and all learned the lesson through the one. The great body of humanity is like the physical body, composed of cells and organs, each with its center of force or nucleus, which takes up impressions and transmits them to all the atoms composing that center or organ. The hand learns to execute a certain movement, and every cell of each finger retains the impress or latent memory of its share in that movement. So the cells of every organ learn their lessons not so much as separate cells, but all together as an organ, that is, a hand, a foot, a head, a heart, etc. For example, through the action of Abraham Lincoln, the whole nation learned that slavery should be and could be abolished, and the lesson was impressed more or less deeply on each soul according to its sympathy or activity in the matter, but only Abraham Lincoln actually freed the slaves. He could not have done this, however, without the aid of the thought force of the nation. He was the executor of the will of those who thought freedom. 
Every character in history had many persons who belonged to the same group, to the same nation, who were carried along in evolution by the same current, who learned by the failure or profited by the success of that character. As the soul at first remembers only the most important events, personages and lessons impressed upon its consciousness, when that memory begins to be awakened, it is natural for it to think it was the central figure. Many psychics receive messages which they interpret to mean that they were the Virgin Mother, St. John, John the Baptist, Elijah, Moses, or some other noted Bible character, and find to their dismay that many others have been told the same. Since they are unable to conceive how all could have been the one character, much confusion and loss of faith in their guidance results. The true explanation is that all such personages were types or expressions of some of the cosmic rays differing phases of experience through which their father had passed in his evolution. When a disciple is told, for instance, that she was the Virgin Mary, it means that she belongs to that expression of the father ray, that is, was emanated and started on her earthly evolution during the period when the father was correlating with the Virgin Mother principle, when he was experiencing the lessons of the great mother Isis, and so on through the whole list of characters. There are hundreds who are sure there are Mary, Queen of Scots, hundreds who were Martin Luther, Julius Caesar, Cleopatra, Helen of Troy, etc. If they understood the law, however, it would be great and easy to understand and determine whether or not they were great personages whose names were given. A careful study of the character, giving due consideration to the three streams of evolution, physical, mental, and spiritual, will readily determine this. Study their mistakes and successes and try to calculate what would be needed according to the law of compensation or karma to overcome the mistakes or reap the reward. Study their mentality and your own, and know well this is no retrogression. There are ups and downs that may seem like retrogression, but they are like the ups and downs of a gravity railway. The downs are always above the level of the starting point. A personage of history prominence may at this time be incarnated in a very lowly station, but he will still have the same characteristics that made him great. He may be placed in a lowly station to learn lessons of patience and humility, but his character will still be great, and the important lesson learned in the prominent life will be indelibly impressed upon his present personality. If he were the central figure of the group either for good or evil, he will always be a central figure, no matter in what walk of life he may incarnate. An Abraham Lincoln might incarnate as a plowboy where conditions made education and culture almost impossible, but he would always have the ability of a Lincoln to master conditions. Many declare they find it impossible to live out their true selves, but the inner development will always manifest no matter what the environment. If a soul fails to demonstrate that it is spiritually advanced, it simply means that it has not attained to or created the state it desires to manifest. The pilgrim of the soul is like an earthly journey. We may see the distant goal, yet may have many sad experiences and much weary travel ere we reach it. If one is absorbed in petty cares to the exclusion of higher aims, it means that he has not outgrown petty conditions. For if he had, he would find time to follow the higher leadings and manifest them in his life. Abraham Lincoln found time to study law while splitting rails. Isaac Watt discovered the force of steam while apparently absorbed in the petty care of minding the baby. Although environment does modify the expression, still the real inner development will always manifest, no matter what the environment. Accomplishment in spite of difficulties is the best proof of inner development and strength, for difficulties only spur us on to express the powers we have won. The general rule is that after one has cultivated his mental faculties and developed his brain to a higher degree, he passes through an incarnation devoid of all chance for education. This is firstly to give him an opportunity to develop his hard qualities, and secondly, to prove how much of a former culture he has really assimilated. No one can prove his character unless he is forced to depend on his real inner powers. Hence, no matter what the gain has been in the past, whether toward physical, intellectual, or spiritual perfection, he must of necessity pass an incarnation where all outward help toward the things attained are lacking, that he may prove himself. When one is told that in the past he was some great personage, it is wise to look up the history and customs of the time indicated, and search for any glaring discrepancies between his own character and the character of the person under consideration. If discrepancies are found, they indicate error somewhere. 
For example, if a woman is told that she was an Egyptian princess, or if a man is told that he was beheaded while king of Egypt, a glance of history will show that the Egyptians carefully excluded women from participating in the mysteries, hence there were no Egyptian priestesses. History will also show that the Egyptians had a superstitious horror of any sort of mutilation of the body. This was inculcated by the fundamental tenets of their religion. Under no circumstance was a king or even a person of common social rank mutilated either before or after death. The worst possible punishment for the lowest criminal was the cutting off of his ears. Therefore, this would most convincingly point to an error in such a message. In this instance, we find that Egypt was once overrun with foreigners, much as it was at the present time. Some of them were kings and queens who followed the customs and religion of their own country. There were also numerous cities whose names have long been lost to histories, which, while paying tribute to Egypt and inhabited largely by Egyptians, nevertheless followed their own customs. Thus a woman might have been a priestess, or a king might have been beheaded while in Egypt and yet not been Egyptians. This will show how easily psychic messages can be confused, and how absurd it makes one to repeat them without verifying them. While such discrepancies do not always mean that the one giving the information has misled them, yet, under such circumstance, a careful investigation of the message and a consideration of its source is advisable. It may be, however, that he has misinterpreted the message. His brain may have given it a twist in accord with his personal bias. A careful study of history, together with sincere prayer for light and help, will generally straighten the matter out. It has become the custom for untrained or pseudo-psychics to flatter their friends or sitters by telling them they were great personages in the past. In this connection, it is a very good plan never to believe such tales unless confirmed by your own soul or by history. For all must come under the law of probability and common sense. The whole object of rebirth is for each soul to attain all-around soul perfection, learn all the lessons life can teach, and thus be prepared to do its work in the grand plan. Even if it were possible for a man to gain all knowledge and have all experience in one life, nevertheless the stupendous task of evolution, from an atom to a god, would require incalculable eons. Comparing our life period to a day, as well might be expect a child to acquire an experience and wisdom of a lifetime between sunrise and sunset, if such a prodigy were possible, evolution would still be unsatisfied, for the child would have neither the ability nor the organism whereby to utilize the knowledge and do the work of a man, for it would not have reached man's estate. Perfection could not be attained in one life. When a student is earnestly and sincerely seeking for light, and is striving toward self-mastery, he frequently gets a strong impression that he has a special work to do. This is generally the first glimmering of a bona fide memory of the past and of his soul destiny. It is frequently given in dreams, and perhaps is remembered in the waking consciousness only as an intangible impression. Many wonder why they must grope so long in the dark, but here again there is a reason. The soul must struggle toward the light alone, just as a plant by its struggle gains the strength to push up through the earth to the sunlight. One may be given the outline of his work which he, both karmically and constitutionally, is destined to accomplish, but the exact manner of its fulfillment is always left to its own judgment. He is helped to think and use his own power of judgment to decide wisely. He is shown the goal and the path, then is left to his own devices as to the best manner in following it. His judgment may be at fault, and he may make mistakes, but if he is working in sincerity and love for his fellow men, the one guiding him must let him experiment. The masters dare not interfere, for they know that strength and wisdom come from learning lessons, and if the pupil is doing the best he can, it will be but a matter of time ere he will reach the end of his mistaken line of activity. If a memory of the past mistake is necessary, it will be given him, but if the exact step in his future work were mapped out for him, he would become a mere puppet, the executor of another's will, and not a free agent. Perhaps when the outline of his work is given him, the pupil makes a mistake of thinking that he is ready to begin at once. In reality, the command is to begin the work of preparation. Such a disciple is in the position of a child who heedlessly rushes off before he has heard what his father really desires, or how he must prepare himself for the task. He hears the command work, but does not wait for the end of the sentence. No one is ever required to do work for which he is not prepared. A teacher would not teach advanced subjects without special training. A physician would not prescribe without years of technical study. A man would not be placed in charge of a bank or business concern without long years of special training for such work. And yet many a psychic who hears the cry, 
son go work today in my vineyard, never stops to hear more, nor dreams that any preparation is necessary. In fact, such usually take great pride in their attitude of trust, for they have no need of preparation or special knowledge, that their heavenly Father will guide and teach them in all things. While it is true that they will be guided and helped, yet there is an old axiom which says, God helps him who helps himself, which being interpreted means that he who uses common sense and places himself in the current or trains his brain mind so it can receive and comprehend the higher truth, makes intelligent help a possibility, while he who depends entirely upon astral communication must make himself so negative that his mind is a fertile field for the sowing of tars by the enemy who is always waiting to sow them among the weep while the husbandmen sleep. There is no royal road to divine wisdom. There is, however, a straight and narrow path to spiritual unfoldment. It is found only by wedding knowledge to understanding and love to wisdom. It must be trodden step by step often in weariness and with bloodied feet. Even Jesus, although his mission was announced both at his birth and at his baptism, spent over thirty years studying with the teachers, adepts, and masters, before his brain-mind was capable of correlating with the divine wisdom of which his soul was fully cognizant. While book-learning is in no way necessary for spiritual development, yet it is necessary if one is to be a teacher of the higher laws and the higher philosophy, or is to be a leader in spiritual thought, to perfect the instrument or brain through which the divine inspiration is seeking expression. The astral world is full of false teachers who promise many wonderful things and seek to gain your attention by telling you how great or how good you are. Hence, discrimination is the first faculty that must be perfected. It can only be gained by careful training and a thorough understanding of the law. The astral plane is called the Hall of Learning, but the pupil is warned that, in it thy soul will find the blossoms of life, but under every flower a serpent coiled. No purity of heart or desire for truth can protect from this serpent's sting those who willfully neglect to cultivate their minds and familiarize themselves with the laws of that plane. If a person has not the opportunity to carry on a study of the laws and philosophy of the higher life, this is proof positive that such a one is not yet ready to teach. He may be selected as a teacher, but for the time he is being prepared along a particular line. For the training of the heart, or the love nature for obedience, and for ardor, or for love for humanity, and the perfecting of patience by the cheerful performance of daily tasks, has first to be developed in the character. When the pupil is considered by the master to be a fit instrument in these respects, obedience, love, sympathy, patience, etc., then will he be brought into the environment which will give him the opportunity to acquire knowledge of the spiritual laws and the philosophy. The pupil is never asked to leave a plain duty undone to take up the work of teacher, for just so long as a duty confronts him, which would prevent him from beginning the work, he should know that his preparation is not complete. Instead of chafing at the confining bonds, he should cheerfully go ahead preparing himself in body, mind, and soul, remembering that he has all eternity before him, and that it is much easier to make up for delay rather than to rectify a vital mistake made through precipitation. When he perceives the outline of a work to be done, let him prepare himself to do it to the best of his ability. But let him be humble and be ready to see and acknowledge his shortcoming, but without exaggerating them, and the guiding hand will not let him stray far from the path. Pupils should, therefore, study most carefully the law of all spiritual unfoldment. Never does the higher self make a mere automaton of a pupil, nor sow the seed of final failure by flattering him or by appeals to his ambition. On the contrary, his earliest memories are more apt to be mistakes than of triumphs, and the first lessons given will be those which will inculculate humility. His training is a process of guiding, overshadowing, and the awakening of all dormant faculties, and once awakened each faculty must be put to the most severe test ere the pupil is ready to be used. Only thus can he raise his vibration to the spiritual keynote. Never is the pupil told to do this or do that blindly. He may be the victim of the arbitrary commands of some entity who is taking advantage of his lack of training and discrimination to use him as a cat's paw. If so, he will find that obedience will lead him to violate common sense and bring him in all kinds of trouble. When such commands are received interiorly, the pupil must consider them with the gravest doubt and is perfectly justified in refusing to obey. For arbitrary commands are against the whole law of evolution and are therefore never given by the higher self or by the masters of the great white lodge. Absolute obedience to the higher guidance is required of all who would do the master's work, 
But such guidance never violates common sense, and even the vow of obedience is never required until the pupil, through repeated experience, has learned to have implicit faith in his guidance. Chapter 21. The Cycle of Necessity. I and my Father are one. The higher self is the Father in heaven who is continually striving to lead and guide the human personality or the Son among the rocks and quicksands of physical existence called the Cycle of Necessity back to conscious oneness with Him. Until the personality can consciously receive its teachings direct through the voice of the silence, the higher self must take advantage of every opportunity and event in the earth life to impress upon the physical brain cells of the personality the main lessons which the Incarnation is intended to teach. For every earth life is carefully chosen by the reincarnating ego and is brought about under the best conditions and in the best environment possible under the limitations of karmic law, to learn a certain great lesson necessary for the next step in experience. That is, the environment chosen is not the easiest or most pleasant for the personality, but the one which through its temptation and trials the omniscience of the higher self deems best calculated to develop the soul qualities necessary for spiritual advance. Often the personality, owing to the denseness and sluggishness of the particles of its physical brain center, fails to respond to the vibrations of this higher intelligence and cannot understand the guidance, hence ignorantly places karmic barriers between itself and the desired end. In such cases, life itself must be the teacher. Indeed, life after life is often spent in learning one great lesson. Since the personality has free will within certain karmic limits, it cannot be coerced into following its divine guidance. Hence, if like a boy playing truant from school it refuses to learn its lessons, it must return day after day, life after life, to the same lessons until the lesson is built into the character as a soul quality. Therefore, it is of the greatest importance for all students of the higher life to at least begin to learn how to control the higher centers of their physical brains and render them capable of registering the vibrations sent them from higher intelligence. Like wireless telegraphy, no matter how perfectly the message are sent, unless the receiving apparatus is attuned to the keynote of the sender, the message cannot be intelligently received. As all our souls are but differing expressions of the one life, each must bring back into the one life a special experience. Unity does not mean an everlasting recurrence of one experience for all, but all experiences in the one. As each different part of the body has its own function, the experience of which is subject to and is registered in the brain, the sum total of the experience of all organs and parts being necessary to complete a man, so are all soul experiences comprised into the one life. Thus is personality transmuted into individuality. Individuality is never lost. It grows more complete as it finds the complementary phases of individuality in all the units of the one. The more a man individualizes the use of his hands, feet, or brain, the more perfect a man is he. For if the hands or feet or brain are left to follow their own subconscious or animal instincts, the man remains but a clod. Only man has the power to individualize himself, and the urge toward disadvantage is imparted from the higher self or real ego. A master is one who has trained all parts and functions of his body to their highest possible individual development, and holds them all subject to his will. Animals are subject to the will of man, and can only gain what is called higher intelligence in an animal through the emanations of man's thought and will. Some animals can respond readily to man, and some cannot. Some men can easily respond to the higher self and learn, while others less evolved cannot respond so readily. Yet all souls bring their individual contribution of experience into the one life. Animals seem to follow more perfectly than man the laws of the one life and are less rebellious than man. The reason for this is that animals lack free will and blindly and obediently follow the group soul of the species. Thus all wolves have the same instincts, all serpents the same characteristics, etc., Hence, you know what to expect from any animal of any given species under similar conditions. In the beginning, each soul is given its particular work and place in the grand plan, and the experience necessary to attain this end must be gained by clothing itself in various personalities. The faults and drawbacks which prevent this attainment loom so darkly before the soul that paths are chosen which, no matter what the suffering involved may be, will correct the faults and remove the barriers to the fulfillment of that soul's destiny. Perhaps the destiny of the soul is to be an important worker for the upliftment of humanity, with a definite place in that work. 
Such a soul may begin the work, or at least lay the foundation in the earlier incarnations when the soul is young and experienced, and has not gone far from the sheltering love of the Father's house. But later, the various personalities built up life after life by the soul to use as instruments may become rebellious, stray from the path, and set up side issues, either as desires or complications, all of which must later be experienced and their essence of wisdom and power assimilated. For there must be free will. The personality must be free to choose its path, to follow or not to follow its divine guidance. Man alone of all animals can choose whether he will or will not listen and obey. The Father, the higher self, gives to each son, the personality, the portion of goods belonging to him, that out of which he must weave his destiny. The son then departs into the far country of physical existence. Each son has his own portion, the portion belonging to him by right. If by karmic action he has earned a pleasant portion, wealth, position, and love of friends, with these he must cultivate soul growth and bring back to his father's house the greatest experience and the deepest lesson of divine love that it is possible to garner through those earthly blessings. If he has earned or chosen as his portion poverty, loneliness, sorrow, and sickness, he must garner the golden grains of wisdom from these experiences also, for all experiences are necessary. But the soul who can learn from another's experience need not pass that way itself. The personality must learn, either by actual experience or by observation and sympathy with others, that the side issues are not what the higher self desires it to experience, and it must ultimately learn the great lesson, attaining the position and do the work mapped out for it from the beginning. After eons of time and myriads of incarnations, the soul gradually gains more and more power over the various personalities through which it functions, and center by center subjects their physical matter to its own vibrations. The soul thus learns by experience how to manipulate matter and how better to express itself through a physical instrument the body. When the ego has succeeded in building up an instrument in whose physical brain centers a sufficient number of spiritualized atoms which vibrate in harmony with the higher self are implanted, the instrument or personality may be said to be unfolding in its inner faculties. At this stage of evolution the greatest care is needed. For, as indicated in a previous chapter, there are many enemies waiting for the opportunity to push back into the darkness, or mislead for their own personal ends, the one who has labored so long and patiently to reach this advanced point. Let us suppose that one has reached this point and has kept the door of his heart, and is conscious of the loving guidance of his Father in Heaven. The great danger at this stage makes a careful study of the philosophy and laws of being essential. The voice of the silence has to penetrate into triumph over prejudice, the result of false education, and act through a physical brain. Since a physical brain can only register that which vibrates in harmony with its capacity, and since through all the years of its life it has been trained to vibrate only to physical stimuli, it must be gradually regenerated, or being the medium through which the message must pass to reach the brain consciousness of the personality. All that it passed through it will necessarily be colored by something of its personal characteristics and prejudices. In other words, a message received from the higher self, or from a master of wisdom, can be interpreted only in the term afforded by the knowledge, training, and capacity of the physical brain of the personality. Thus, without special training, misunderstanding and misapplication of the message is more than probable. Many psychics blunder and subject themselves to ridicule and suffering by blindly accepting as literal the interpretation made by their untrained brains of messages which they know come from a true source. If this interpretation proves misleading, they are made miserable and perhaps turn away from the guiding voice which is trying so hard to help them. In such cases, the following rules should be strictly adhered to. First, by spiritual aspiration, prayer uttered or unuttered, meditation, above all, by love for all mankind as shown in the daily life, raise the vibrations of all the particles composing the brain center. Second, by a careful study of proper books and by a close observation of nature, Strive to familiarize the physical brain with the laws governing independent psychic and spiritual communication. Third, carefully write out any message received, but do not talk about it to others. Then, before showing it to anyone, go over it again and again, bringing to bear all your powers of logic and common sense to get its most probable application to your own life. For all messages from a proper source are in accord with the law of absolute justice. No true master ever tells a pupil to do anything that will in any way infringe upon the rights of another. Messages that cannot stand the test of love, compassion, and justice are either mistakes of understanding or deliberate attempts to mislead. 
for it must be remembered that there are masters of darkness ever watching and waiting to take advantage of those whose inner faculties are unfolding. Such perverted entities, understanding the laws of communication, are able to reach the students at an earlier period of this development than are the masters of light, because their vibrations are more nearly akin to the earth plane. For instance, the teacher and masters of the Great White Lodge can communicate with a pupil only over waves of selfless love, high aspiration, compassion, purity, and humility, while those of the left-hand path can use vibrations of ambition, self-seeking, pride, and vanity. But their messages, while apparently lofty and pure, especially at first, have always the germ of some great personal power or reward to be gained by the pupil. Subtle flattery is always a feature of their instruction, while those from the White Lodge carefully point out the pupil's faults and tell him how to conquer them. The story of Dr. Faustus is a materialized dramatization of the method used by such masters of evil. Until the pupil has cleansed his heart of all self-seeking, he is open to attacks from the first-mentioned source. You are never safe if the devil, the power of all that works against God or good, can find a single vibration of ambition or selfishness over which he can enter. As the higher self can communicate only over vibrations akin to himself, so the devil can tempt, but can lead astray and deceive only over vibrations similar to his own. Hence, to protect yourself, send out vibrations of selfless love and compassion to all humanity. Each soul has an evil genius created by it during its long pilgrimage through matter. This is fully recognized and plainly taught in the temptation of the man Jesus. For ere he could gain mastery and enter his earthly ministry, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. Every neophyte is led by the Spirit, the higher self, into a mental wilderness where, alone in the dreary waste of physical experience, he is tempted by the devil of his own creation. The fasting for forty days is that period during which he must abstain from his old thoughts and habits, must cease to seek for outward help and learn to seek within, must turn to his Father in heaven listen to the voice of his higher self, and refuse longer to be guided by physical vibration. It is a period during which the neophyte is left without spiritual food and hence must fast, when it seems that no help can reach him. Only after this prolonged fast in the mental wilderness does the devil come to tempt him. In the parable of the prodigal son, this is the period of his homeward journey, when he has refused to eat the husks and has not yet reached his father's house. It is always here that the devil meets each soul and tempts, in other words, long ere he has really found that perfect vibration of love through which alone he can hear his higher self speak. The evil genius are those akin to him. The masters of the shadow can speak in tempt over vibration of selfishness. This selfishness and ambition often require a long time to be transmuted into love for others, for they have a way of hiding behind all sorts of sophistries. Up to this point the pupil has had to contend with but petty temptations and appetites, but now, having consciously taken an advanced step, through prayer and fasting, he has deliberately entered the wilderness to be tempted. The first temptation coming from the sign of evil is generally that of power. Command that these stones be made bread. The devil says, Command and demand all that you need. You are not sick or hungry. You are the Christ. Therefore command that the earth, which karmic law has bereft of soul nourishment and spiritual satisfaction, shall be turned into bread to satisfy your physical wants, even though the very eating thereof binds you tighter to the wheel of physical existence. The second temptation comes in the form of self-righteousness. The devil takes the hungry soul up into a high place upon the very pinnacle of the temple of the body, and there showeth him how the soul has conquered the flesh, growing holier than others by the control of lower appetites how it has reached the gates of the holy city, and has become a guide and example for many less holy and less pure followers. Then the devil declares, Thou, if thou be the Son of God, or if thou be the Christ, as you have affirmed, cast thyself down, for you can do what a lesser soul could not do without sin, that which would be sin in one not placed upon so high a pinnacle of the temple within the holy city, is for you but a certain license earned because of your holiness. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. Therefore you can do that which would be sin in others. The third temptation is one of ambition. This only comes to the soul who has reached the mountains of spiritual understanding. The neophyte has painfully climbed the mountain, has entered the silence, has heard the voice and seen with his spiritual eyes. He has gained certain psychic powers, and lo, all the kingdom of the world and the glory thereof are spread before his sight. 
His evil genius points out that by his awakened psychic powers he can gain the whole world, that men will bow down to him and give him fame and glory, because he is a little in advance of the average, that he can charge large sums for interviews, psychic readings, etc., can be feted and honored and listened to by the multitude, can be heralded from place to place, be interviewed by the newspaper and receive much public acclaim, all of which is a very real and terrible temptation and watch which only those who have actually stood upon the exceedingly high mountain, and in their sole vision have actually seen the kingdoms of the world at their feet, who have heard the tempter say, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me, cannot understand or appreciate, for this temptation cannot come until the neophyte has approached the mountain's top. An understanding of these temptations should make each judge leniently the shortcoming and failures of those who have stood upon the heights, but who have fallen down to worship either the beast, the dragon, or the Antichrist. Let every one cultivate in his own garden the fruits of the Spirit, namely love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Every time you stop to censure or condemn another an enemy, your evil genius comes while you sleep, and sows vile weeds in the garden of your soul, weeds which will grow apace and which must be rooted up ere the fruits of the Spirit can be garnered. Every time you indulge in thoughts of evil, you are filling your garden with all sorts of predatory creatures, all of which must be driven out ere you can become one with your father, and sit down at his table to eat of the fruits of the Spirit. The cultivation of the fruits of the Spirit will leave you no time to see the shortcoming of others. To eat of these fruits will be sit down at your father's table and sup with him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Chapter 22. The Path. Thou wilt show me the path of life. Psalms 16.11. Now for the fourth prepare, the portal of temptations which do ensnare the inner man. Man is a crystal ray, a beam of light immaculate within, a form of clay material upon the lower surface. That beam is thy life guide in thy true self, the watcher and the silent thinker, the victim of thy lower self. The Voice of the Silence, Blavatsky. Every student who has earnestly sought association with his order has done so because of an inner urge which, whether verbally expressed or not, manifests as a determination to set out in earnest upon the path of discipleship which leads to the goal of final liberation. Yet few there be who are aware of the many snares and delusions and the many requirements necessary to attain that great end. Many think this path but a figure of speech, and that all that is necessary is to live an average life, to have good intentions, to be honest whenever circumstance permit, to be true whenever it seems to pay, saying with a shrug of the shoulder, No one is perfect, and I am doing the best I can under the circumstance. Such persons have not only not entered the path, but have no conception of what the path is. How many, many there are who earnestly and yet sincerely believe they have entered the path, yet who after years of earth life, years of striving and study and meditation, find themselves apparently no further advanced than when they set out. Hence many become discouraged and turn back, saying it is a hopeless task, or that only after many lives, some say at least seven more, they may begin to attain. But the truth is that unless you begin to attain today, this present moment, you have not entered a path, for this path is made up of regular steps, each one a definite attainment. These attainments are not mystical dreams of a faraway perfection to be attained in the dim future, but something that belongs to your everyday life. The first step in mastery must be taken now in a definite practical way, for until this is done the greater steps will be forever remain untaken. The path is the path of renunciation, yet it is also a path of glorious achievement. Upon it you will find many things to comfort you during the long nights of darkness and the days of combat, many resting places, many joys. The renunciation does not mean the renunciation of all human sympathy, all natural human traits, for you must be all things unto all men, and this you cannot be if you become what the world calls a crank. The renunciation must be the renunciation of the domination of the lower self and the disciplining and training of its desire and appetites, the self you have built up out of false conception of the events through which you have gained the experience which entitles you to enter upon this definite step. Those who have chosen this step are like soldiers who have donned their armor and are waiting to go forth to victory. The goal is reached through definite attainments, spoken of as gates opening into new stages of the journey. These gates are definite attainments here and now in this present life. Each step means a struggle, a literal shaping of every act and thought toward a definite end, 
which is fully outlined in the mind and made the objective point of the life. The first gate to be passed is the attainment of charity and tolerance for all, a realization of divine love, and an earnest desire to become one with the Christ force, which is manifesting in your fellow man. This is the first gate to be entered because intolerance is a bar to further progress. Hence, while there is the least intolerance in your heart, this barred gate will shut off even a vista to the path. To conquer intolerance, realize divine love as a white light which can only manifest on earth through its many prismatic colors, and that each color, if true and undefiled, has its place in the heart of the pure white light. For the white light could not be complete if one color ray was missing. The color ray symbolized the seven great types or classes of humanity with their various idiosyncrasies. To attain true tolerance, realize that your brothers and sisters, with all their differences of opinion and various ways of looking at divine truth, are nevertheless necessary parts of the grand plan, and that without them you would lack. Only a realization of the oneness of all and their necessity for the completion of the whole can bring true tolerance. You may talk of loving your brothers yourself, but not until you have at least a mental grasp of the truth that your brother is necessary to your own growth can you really manifest it. As long as you look upon yourself as a separate and aloof from your brother, this great bar of intolerance will remain across the entrance to the path. In the above, we have emphasized the constructive idea of tolerance. For many think tolerance means so vague and indefinite idea of what you self-believe that you are willing to follow the teaching of every phase of truth anyone may expound to you. But such, of course, is merely confusing, for you cannot be truly tolerant until you are quite sure which avenue of teaching best suits your soul needs. Seek earnestly for the particular line of teaching which most appeals to you and which proves most helpful to your spiritual growth. Then, while recognizing the good in all others and being tolerant of all divergent ways, be well grounded in your chosen teaching, so that you cannot be misled or carried away by sophistry but will remain unmoved as long as the teaching feeds your spiritual hunger. Only thus can you take your place as a shining beam in your own colliery or avenue of teaching. It is like a military evolution. The figure is perfect only when each individual is in his own place, in his own company, and is paying no attention to the others except to recognize their part in the evolution and work harmoniously with them. Charity is that all-embracing love which seeks for the good in all. It does not mean that you are to condone evil, for to do so is to spread it. It means that while you are never to condone a personality for his or her failings, you are to stand firm for the principles of right, truth, justice, and purity whenever you are tempted or see them violated, so that there can be no misunderstanding as to the principles you uphold. The second gate consists of the attainment of harmony, both within yourself and also with your surrounding or the power to be so harmonized to divinity that you pass through the turmoil and in harmony of life without permitting them to upset you. At this gate you must conquer fear, for this is a necessary part of the attainment of harmony, for only perfect love cast out fear. Many pupils knock a long time at this gate and wonder why it does not open to them. They desire harmony above all else and cry out continually that they are sending out nothing but love to their fellow men, yet receive in return in harmony on kindness and cruelty. If such candidates would look within themselves instead of around them for the harmony they seek, they would find that the great specter fear held them enthralled. They fear a thousand things, chiefly that the world does not understand what they are striving to manifest, for if it did it could not send back so much in harmony. They fear the opinion of friends, poverty, sickness, death. In fact, their fears are too numerous to mention, and in their hearts, although the beautiful flower of love has been planted, Yet the many noxious weeds of fear have sprung up so thickly that the plant is unable to bloom and send out its perfume to harmonize the condition in which it grows. Therefore they will knock at this gate in vain until they have vanquished fear, or until they have learned to trust and believe in the divine overshadowing love which casteth out fear. When this is attained, they will awaken to find the gate of harmony already ajar. This spectre, fear, while it seems a giant, is in reality but a shadow of the night, let the candidate realize the divinity of his real self, that it is deathless, immortal, and cannot be harmed. Let him repeat constantly, I am fearless because my real self is divine, and there is nothing to fear. Divine love is the law of my being, and I can trust in this great law to conquer all conditions. With it I am strong, powerful, forceful. Manifesting this love, I cannot be discouraged, frightened, or turned aside from the path of spiritual attainment. As he permits his conscience to dwell in this thought, 
there will grow up in him the strength and power to conquer. Then, ere he knows it, he will find his gate standing wide open, and the light of its portal flooding his whole life with the glory of its love and harmony. The third gate is that of patience, that is, having earnestly cultivated divine love in your heart and tolerance and charity for all, having harmonized yourself to the Christ and to your surrounding, and having conquered fear, there must ensue a longer or shorter period in which you wait for your scarce know-what. This is beautifully expressed by the psalmist, My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. And again the heart cries out, And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. Deliver me from all my transgressions. You are waiting for the divine law to bring to you the result of your attainments. This is a very trying period in your life, because feelings that you have attained to love, harmony, charity, tolerance, etc., you can understand why you must tarry so long at this third gate. Yet there is a great necessity that it should be so, for without the virtues of patience and trust and confidence that whatever comes is best, you would be utterly unable to cope with the more active trials and temptations that will assail you when you reach the fourth gate. This waiting develops the patience which affords the soul a chance to learn the great lessons, keep silent, also how to enter into the silence and become one with it. For you have not mastered patience until you have learned to quiet the mentality, enter the silence and realize the meaning of the text. Be still, and know that I, the great law of love, am God. When you have consciously sought membership in the order of the fifteen, you are supposed to have passed, in a measure at least, the first three of these gates, and are now knocking at the fourth, the gate which opens to your consciousness the path itself. You are now ready to obey the voice of your higher self, which is urging upon you a conscious and persistent effort toward mastery, instead of drifting aimlessly as heretofore on the sea of life. The entrance of this fourth gate is a most momentous event, for it marks the end of the first great cycle of your spiritual growth. Since from an occult standpoint the four contains the potency of the ten, one plus two plus three plus four equals ten, and since four, or the square, is the most perfect earthly figure, at this point you must square yourself as it were with earthly conditions as you find them, for at this step you face the fourth dimension in which all things interpenetrate. At this point you must face yourself, for over this gate is written the Pythagorean precept, Man, know thyself. When you strive to obey this precept, you will become aware that there is at least one great iron bar which closes this gate to you, but within yourself you can find the power to lift this bar and permit the gate to swing open. No one can recognize and lift this bar but yourself. Until this fourth gate is reached, your life has been more or less unconscious growth in love, charity, tolerance, harmony, fearlessness, and patience. But now you face a serious conscious struggle. You must now begin to take account of yourself within as well as without. You have been able largely to control your actions and your words. You now become responsible for your own creations, the children of your thoughts, and must, to the silent thinker, be united. This silent thinker is not that which is known as the voice of silence, but the silent undercurrent of thought which is continually penetrating your brain, although what might be called the active thoughts may, like ripples on the surface, make you unaware of what is transpiring in the depths. The instant you begin self-analysis, you will find there are many deep thoughts which come into your mind without your volition and seem to think themselves. These are of two kinds. If they are uplifting, grand, or beyond the power of the physical brain to express, they come from the silent thinker. If they are frivolous, contemptible, or vile, they are but the reflection of the world's current of thought to which you have united yourself and permitted to flow through you. The children of your thoughts, unseen, impalpable, that swarm around humankind. But of whatever character they may be, they are the index of the self you are to study and to conquer. For to know thyself means to go down deep into the source of selfhood and decide just what the great motives are with all determining your character and prompting your action. These motives can be determined by careful study of the impalpable thoughts which intrude themselves upon you against your volition. Thoughts are things, and man in the aggregate during his evolution has thrown off thoughts of all kinds, and these accumulated thought forms have become great vortices of force into which each soul is naturally drawn, according to its affinity with the one or the other type. In other words, you permit your mind to be so filled with the currents of the world thought surrounding you that your brain becomes a fit vehicle for, and develops within it definite channels through which certain classes of thought currents naturally flow, just as a stream automatically follows a channel dug for it, 
and the longer it flows in one channel, the broader and deeper the channel becomes, and the more difficult it is to change the stream. It is well known that the brain of a thinker differs from that of a savage not so much in size and weight as in the number and depth of its convolutions, which convolutions are developed by the functioning of the centers they contain. Another means of self-analysis is carefully and fearlessly to interpret your dreams and visions, for the silent thinker is continually guiding and warning you by means of such experiences. Dreams are of three general classes. First, confused, incoherent ideas, more or less imperfectly remembered the result of inharmoniously physical or mental conditions which keep the lower mind more or less active yet uncontrolled by the presence of the ego. Second, the experiences of the human mind wandering uncontrolled in the lower astral world. Third, the symbolic dreams and visions, coherent and usually clearly remembered, the result of the personality doing the best it can by using the thought materials of the waking consciousness to illustrate the spiritual truth or lessons given by its higher self during the sleep of the body. Hence, a careful analysis of dreams will show what general stage of development the candidate has reached and what general problems he must face and conquer. You do not have to experience the two lower classes of dreams if you train your brain mind to refuse to accept such experience. When this training is accomplished, you will dream only when your higher self desires to give you a lesson or a warning. It is with these inner thought currents that the candidate who knocks at the fourth gate must determinately grapple, first recognize and then control. No thought currents coming from your higher self or from the masters of wisdom can flow into your conscious until, by determined conscious effort, you have swept away all trifling thoughts and you have prepared channels for higher thoughts. At this step you become responsible for the effect of every outside influence that impinges upon your consciousness. You become responsible not only for all the emanations which you send out to interpenetrate all space and impinge upon every other human being but also responsible for every thought you permit to enter your consciousness from any source. While you cannot expect to conquer all at once and absolutely shut out every undesirable thought, still you can refuse to dwell upon a thought and can determinately think some constructive thought which will ultimately create a channel through which like thoughts will naturally flow. In other words, you must be the chooser, the willer, the master of your thoughts and you will remain before this gate until you carve out new channels through which the currents of thought from the silent thinker can flow into your consciousness. Hence, patience is the supreme quality to be cultivated at this gate. There are many barriers which hold you back at this point, until you can recognize that there is nothing in all the universe that is important enough to stop your onward march, that the silent thinker is your true self, one with divinity. When these barriers are reached, so many, many cry out, What shall I do? How shall I conquer? Give me some definite step to take that I may know I have really entered the path. Why this questioning? When through all the ages wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the streets, she crieth in the chief place of the concourse, in the opening of the gates. The first step is plainly set forth in the voice of true silence. Before the soul can comprehend and may remember, she must into the silent speaker be united, just as the form to which the clay is molded is first united with the potter's mind. Here you find the first step, the great step, pointed out. Indeed, this step is the beginning and the end, for only as you strive for and accomplish this feat can you truly enter the fourth gate and win final victory. How can you get from this injunction the help your heart longs for? the definite step that shall make you something different, something greater, better, higher, that shall give you power. While we do not countenance attempts to cultivate abnormal powers, we are told again and again that if you are a child of the Father, and are doing the works of the Father, then you will have the powers of the Father abiding in you. How is this to be accomplished? Just as clay is united to the potter's mind, when a potter starts to make a wonderful vase, a marvel of beauty, a poem of symbology, a lesson for all who look, he does not copy something another mind has brought forth. Such a production would be spurious. The true potter, the artist, is original. Long before one stroke is made, even before the clay is moistened, his mind has created every detail of the vase. This is an illustration of how you must go to work. Unite yourself with the mind of the great potter, the great oversoul, the thinker, him of whom you desire to become an expression. For to you he must first become the silent thinker, ere he becomes a speaker. Before you can remodel your life, you must catch a glimpse of the divine plan in the mind of the silent thinker. Tolerate no defect. See a vision of the perfection you desire to reach, and work consciously in harmony with it. 
This cannot be accomplished until you have realized the possibility of closing the door of your mind to all undesirable thoughts. To do this, practice making your mind a blank and shutting out all thoughts, and when this has been accomplished in a measure, you will be ready to open the door to such thoughts as you desire. As long as thoughts of discouragement, impatience, self-deprecation, or other similar thoughts can fill your mind against your will to the exclusion of the thoughts you have chosen, you have not united yourself to the silent thinker and cannot hear the voice of the silent speaker. Therefore, while the task is arduous, it is not hopeless. As we said in the beginning, there are many joys along the path, chief of which is the consciousness of your divine guidance and the realization that you are but following in the steps of every great soul who has attained mastery. And the very fact of determinate facing this fourth gate brings you into a thought current, which has been both created and strengthened by the many pilgrims who have passed this way, so that it may be said that you have left behind landmarks and guideposts for your direction. There is scarcely a temptation that can assail you that many of the loving elder brothers have not passed through and conquered, hence they are stretching out guiding hands to help you. The very force with which they conquered remains as a sacred aura around this gate. In fact, the thoughts they have left behind might be compared to a golden thread reaching all the way. And as long as you hold to this thread, you cannot lose your way. Ere thou canst near the goal, be thine hand is lifted to upraise the fourth gate's latch. Thou must have mastered all the mental changes in thyself, and slain the army of thought sensations that, subtle and insidious, creep unasked within the soul's bright shrine. Strive with thy thoughts unclean before they overpower thee. Use them as they will use thee. For if thou sparest them, and they take root and grow, know well these thoughts will overpower and kill thee. O fearless aspirant, look deep within the well of thine own heart, and answer. Knowest thou of self the powers, O thou perceiver of eternal shadows, for on the path forth the lightest breeze of passion or desire will stir the steady light upon the pure white walls of soul. Chapter 23 Earth's Finer Forces Earth, my mother, bid me learn truth in darkness to discern. Like thy forces silently, work in true humility. Hymns of the Order of the Fifteen In the Orient the foot is held in high esteem for its symbology, spiritual understanding, as well as for its beauty and symmetry and frequent ceremonial washing are enjoined both by religion and hospitality. Shoes are worn only for protection, it being a breach of etiquette to enter the presence of a high dignitary with the feet covered. In places of worship the shoes are left at the door, the devotee entering the holy place barefooted. Moreover, oriental temples are seldom found with any floor but Mother Earth. The pious Muslim sprinkles fresh earth in his shoes so that when compelled to wear them he will still have his feet upon the earth for he knows that it is through the soles of the feet that the nourishing magnetism of Mother Earth enters the body to give life and health to her children. The yogis of the East go barefooted in compliance with this law, and their habit of sitting upon a mat of rushes spread upon the bare ground is to gain the valued aid of the earth forces in their spiritual development. The magnetic forces that enter at the feet pass out at the head, therefore the yogi covers his head with a silken turban. Silk being a non-conductor, prevents the escape of the earth forces, and stores them up in his body to be utilized for his further development. To wear silk upon the feet insulates the body from the earth forces, and impedes the flow of the currents of your personal magnetism back to the earth in perfect equilibrium. As the magnetism is the force upon which obsessing or controlling entities feed, persons receiving communication from the astral world are frequently advised by their controls to wear silk upon the feet thus interfering with the normal exchange of forces and storing up the personal magnetism for the use of the controlling entity. Naturally, such practices belong to the destructive method of psychic communion and hence are to be avoided. To obtain power and enter into close touch with your nature, it is desirable at certain times to put off your shoes and after rubbing the feet with a little vegetable oil, walk barefooted while the dew is still upon the grass. While helpful and advisable, this practice is by no means the most important factor, for true spiritual development is the result of manifesting the Christ force in the heart, and all external forces are but secondary. Without the spiritual growth, no amount of magnetic forces can produce spirituality. Walking barefoot in the dew is practiced in many of the occult schools of the East, as well as by the barefoot friars of the Christian era. Very early in the morning the earth is giving forth its magnetism most abundantly. 
the forces which with the sun has filled the earth during the previous day have germinated in the darkness, as all life must, and in the morning are breathed out by Mother Earth in sufficient quantity to sustain her children through the day. While the sun rules the day, and by its creative power causes all life to germinate, still it is only the masculine force, the father, and alone it cannot create. But when it is joined with the air, its expression, and commingled with water, the feminine force, deep within the bosom of the earth a wonderful alchemical change called creation takes place. It is thus that moist earth the mother, when fecundated by the sun the father, expressing himself through air, brings forth. When the earth is parched and dry, the magnetic rays from the sun cannot penetrate it, but are deflected and dissipated, so that instead of fecundating, they wither and burn the vegetation. It is through Mother Earth that the life forces are incubated and brought forth, not only by nature, but for mankind. After the magnetic rays from the sun have fecundated the germs of physical life, they are developed and given forth by the breath of the earth. Well has the earth been called our mother for only through the dual forces generated in the earth is life manifested and nourished. It is not sunshine alone that gives life, but it is sunshine absorbed, fecundated, and sent forth by the earth, assimilated by all vegetation through its roots and by all animal life through the soles of its feet, that gives the magnetic nourishment of the dual forces with perfect life and health. Modern medicine has accepted this fact under the name of Knipe treatment without knowing its rationale. Walking barefooted is now prescribed throughout Europe and at many sanitariums in this country as part of various nature cure procedures. In the ancient schools of the prophets and among the pupils of all the great teachers of the mysteries, great attention was given to the study of nature. The disciples, being separated from the world, were required to spend time in meditation close to Mother Earth, always with their feet bare and their heads covered. The earth forth, if allowed uninterrupted play through man's body, bring to him, just as they do to the plants, the kind of magnetic nourishment suited to his requirements, in exact accord with his capacity to utilize it, to reach perfection on all planes. As well might we expect a rose to grow to perfection, and a bloom with its roots suspended above the earth, as for man to develop without contact with the earth. For not only does he draw health for his physical body from the earth, but also a power which aids in unfolding his inner faculties. We might give the rose sunlight, air, and water, and might tend it with all care, but unless Mother Earth was permitted to first imbibe the forces of the sun, air, and rain, and by her wonderful alchemical power transmute them into life force, the rose could not grow. In a similar manner, a mother eats and drinks and breathes, and by transmuting all the constituents of nourishment, brings forth their essence in the sustaining life force in the milk with which she feeds her babe. The prophet Isaiah said, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publish peace. The earth breathes, the mountain acting as her lungs. They are upheaved by her efforts to throw off in greater abundance the magnetic life force. While in the human body impurities are breathed out and fresh air is breathed in, just the opposite takes place in the case of the earth entity. Impurities sink into the earth and are indrawn and purified, and are then breathed out as pure magnetic currents of life force. Hence, upon a mountain, the currents would be felt most strongly, and a disciple dwelling there, if at all developed, would thus be enabled to carry the good tidings and publish peace with greater power. It is not mere elevation that permits this action, but the porosity and character of the rock formation. Each portion of the earth's surface gives out its particular and characteristic force, which influences not only the climate and vegetation, but also the mentality and nervous system of its inhabitants. In a general way, the force thrown off by mountains is the masculine or father force corresponding to the will. It is a hardening force, which is exhilarating, yet which makes for ruggedness and stability and gives the power to endure. For instance, the Rocky Mountains may be considered the backbone of this continent. They form a great wall or barrier which is continually being strengthened, so that when the cyclic cataclysm occur, as they must not only at the end of the root race the fifth, but also in a minor degree at the end of its fifth sub-race. The Rockies will indeed be a backbone that shall preserve the portion of the continent which is destined to survive. Hence, while excellent for hardy pioneer types, barren and rugged mountains send out a force which is very hard for a spiritually advanced or sensitive person to withstand or correlate with, nevertheless from them should be gained the power to endure, the power of stability and perseverance. 
Only those advanced souls who have mastered or correlated with these forces or persons whose centers are not developed to respond to them can endure a lengthy sojourn in high mountains. On the other hand, the characteristic of the sea coast, especially in southern or tropical countries, is the mother force, the power to bring forth corresponding to love. This force is typified by gentle moist breezes, fresh warm air, and golden sunshine. The characteristic of southern regions near the sea coast is growth, and just as they produce prolific vegetation, so will they tend to bring forth in the spiritual life. The dangers to be encountered and the trials to be met will also be characteristic of these regions. Instead of the over-exhilaration of the mountain regions, there will be a tendency to lassitude and languor, and to put forth little effort toward the spiritual life. Instead of the depression of rocks and barrenness, there will be the depressing influence of fogs, marshes, and excessive rainfall. The daily trials will be com comparable to the many stinging insects, the prickly cactus, and other thorny forms of vegetation. Moreover, the weeds, or the pseudo-forms of occult or spiritual growth, will grow apace and tend to choke out the true seed. In the air from the mountains the father forth predominates, while the air that sweeps across the sea gathers up the mother force which has been purified by the action of the salt. Hence, from an occult standpoint, the most favorable outward conditions for spiritual growth should be found in regions where the breadth of the mountains meets that of the sea, and far enough south to avoid using up a large part of your life force overcoming the rigors of the climate. You may thus find an explanation of many of your trials in the character of the region you inhabit, for the inhabitants of a region are subject to the earth's karma in that region. But remember that wherever you find yourself, you are there because you need the lessons of just these conditions. And until you have mastered them and the law in a natural way takes you elsewhere, it is useless to try and escape them. For if you run away, they will meet you in other and perhaps more trying forms until conquered. Once understood what each factor is, your environment corresponds to symbolically in your personal life, and you have the key to its mastery. Just as nature conquers and overcomes all difficulties arising from the environment by adapting herself to them, so must you. Each region has special advantages which compensate in a measure for its drawback. The luxuriance of growth which is denied to a rugged climate is compensated for by the greater fragrance of its flowers, the superior flavor of its fruit, and the greater energy of its inhabitants. So if your spiritual growth seems hampered or dwarfed by an uncongenial environment, remember that you must compensate for this lack by giving forth greater perfume. If your conditions permit the development of many higher faculties and luxuriant spiritual growth, do not forget to send forth the subtle perfume of love and attractiveness for which no amount of mere growth, mere knowledge, mere intellectual attainment can ever compensate. The perfume will arise from your rose of life in proportion as you conquer the factors in your life which hold you back. When the angel of the Lord spake to Moses out of the burning bush, he said unto him, Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. While this might have a literal meaning in connection with the magnetic forces of that particular spot, it has an inner significance applicable to all disciples who can hear the angel of the Lord. It refers to an initiation. The bush is the same thing often spoken of as a tree, the tree of life, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, etc. The tree is the spinal cord, whose sap is the kundalini force. It is the tree of life and death, until by conscious power this force is lifted up and made to function in the central canal of the spinal cord. Then it becomes a tree of life in the midst of the garden. To attempt to force the development of this power, or to strive to awaken it without a personal teacher who has mastered it, is to invite undreamed of disasters on all planes and in all bodies. It should develop only as a result of natural growth. The whole story is most simple if looked at as an allegory meant to symbolize an important initiation. We read that Moses kept the flock and led them into the desert. That is, he kept the flocks of thoughts, inherited tendencies, passions, and desires, the portion of goods delivered to him by his higher self to keep and control. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God. As all students who have truly undertaken to lead and guide the flocks, belonging to their lower personality, can verify, the first effect of the attempt at control is to turn life into a lonesome desert. How often do we hear this student complain at this period of sadness and depression is as though he were forsaken and left alone in the forest. Just as the shepherd, alone in the desert, must fight off wild beasts, shield his flock from the elements, find pasturage for them, and keep them from strain, 
So the neophyte must fight the lonely battle with his lower personality in this desert of depression that seems to have enwrapped him. But when he reaches the darkest point, the backside of the desert, he finds the mountain of God. He can only reach this mount by fearlessly entering the desert and conquering its terror. Here the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. He had met with the realization of the fire of divine love. The sun of righteousness had illumined his heart. He had arisen and met the Lord. This point is reached when the pupil is able to hear the voice of the Master. When the kundalini force has passed up through the spine and touched the pineal gland, opened the third eye, the disciple is able to see the glory of the Lord surrounding him. This is a physical effect which always accompanies spiritual illumination and is comparable to a fire which burns without consuming. But while this is a physical effect accompanying illumination, remember it is not the cause of illumination, merely an effect. And out of the midst of the bush he will hear the voice of the Lord. But first comes the summons, Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, as the feet symbolize spiritual understanding. So the shoes symbolize a conception of truth which has been molded and adapted to the understanding. Before the student can receive spiritual illumination, all old conceptions or coverings to his understanding must be put off or laid aside that the understanding may receive the light direct. It is not that the old conceptions must be despised, for we do not despise our shoes when we take them off, but that the understanding must be absolutely unhampered before spiritual illumination can come. The law back of this manifests equally in the outer world. The pioneer in any plane of activity must turn aside from the path marked out by the dictum of others. No doctor, scientist, or explorer ever makes a great discovery until he metaphorically puts off his shoes or drops the limitations imposed by authority and strikes out into the unknown, untrampled and free, even though he reaches starting point over a beaten pathway. When a disciple does this, he has reached a point where he can receive definite instructions from the Master and the operation of natural forces and how to control them and correlate with them in accord with the divine law of harmony is one of the first lessons given. Again we read, He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. Miry clay, being non-porous, is the least magnetic, and precludes the escape of the life force from the earth, while rocks, high hills, and mountains are distinctly advantageous. Science is beginning to discover that it is the earth itself that brings forth, rather than the rain or even the sun, they have discovered that far better crops can be raised when the topsoil is kept loose and pervious to the magnetic forces. In reaching these results, however, it has not been fully understood the cause. The wonderful results secured in the arid land of the West without irrigation by the process called dry farming is only proof that Mother Earth holds within her bosom all the nourishment needed to bring forth to perfection. If she is given conditions under which she can absorb the father force and transmute it within her womb, in the process of dry farming, the ground is plowed deeply, the subsoil packed firmly, and surface pulverized and kept loose and porous by frequent harrowing. Phenomenal crops have been raised where the rainfall was slight, and on ground considered for generations as arid and forever unproductive, owing to the impossibility of irrigation. Science, while obtaining results, has only partially solved the problem. It is not only because of this method conserves a little rain that falls for that of itself would be inadequate to produce the wonderful crops obtained. It is because the loose, porous soil permits the absorption and outbreathing of the forces to go on uninterruptedly, and the vital forces from the sun, after being fecundated, can be sent forth freely and in abundance. Those who have never investigated this new process of farming will marvel at the result, for it is real magic, the magic of Mother Earth. It is the alchemy of the mother transmuting the sand of the desert into gold, golden grain for her children's sustenance. It is early in the morning, just before sunrise, that the magnetic forces are flowing most strongly upward. This upward flow gradually decreases until at high noon the forces are equalized and then begin to be indrawn again. The mother is drinking in the power of her lord, the sun. Precisely the same action is taking place at noon between the earth and the sun, as takes place at the time of union between man and woman. The sun, masculine, is giving, pouring out, and the earth, feminine, is receiving and drawing into her womb the force that shall fecundate and bring forth physical life. 
The very first step in practical occultism is acquiring a knowledge of how Mother Earth works her miracles, and by what means the divine creative force of the Father combines with and fructifies the force of the Mother, for as above, so below. Since at noon all the forces of nature and man are focused on the earth plane, it is wisest to have the principal meal of the day at noon, for then the physical forces can best transmute the food with the least drain upon or disturbance of the higher forces. From the above it is plain that the student should contact the earth whenever possible, but alas, this is not always feasible in crowded cities, for the pavements, in varying degrees according to their formation, are obstacles to the passage of earth forces. Also the leakage from gas mains, electric conduit sewers, are all deterrents. The habits of civilization which demand the feet, created to be a natural absorber and transmitter of these forces, shall be encased in tight and pervious shoes, also prevents contact with these forces. Shoes are a necessity in a city, yet everyone should find time to stand barefooted on the earth for a few moments early in the morning. Chapter 24 The Light and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Fix thy soul gaze upon the stars whose ray thou art, the flaming star that shines within the lightless depths of ever being, the boundless fields of the unknown. From the Voice of Silence, Blavatsky in the voice of silence we read of four periods called modes of truth, through which the candidate for discipleship must pass ere his feet can be truly planted upon the path. Until he awakens to the desirability of the spiritual life, and has heard the voice of the divine in his heart, the candidate is passing through the first period, called in the Hindu, Ku, or the assembly of misery, or walking in darkness. When his gaze is turned toward the star of initiation, he calls down upon himself more rapidly his past karma, this period is called Tu, or the assembling of temptation. In the third period, he meets and conquers all temptation and wipes out all old karmic debt, which period is called Mu, the destruction of temptation. And only in the fourth period, called Tau, does he consciously enter upon the path. Just as the candidate requires four periods of creation through which he must pass ere he can create for himself a new life and a new world, his path, so in the creation of the planet there are four days or periods in which there is a completion of mere earthly conditions, the path of the planet, preparatory to the real purpose of evolution, which is to prepare a field or the path for the continued evolution of mankind. The first creation is that of light, symbolizing the light of the Christos, which breaks into the darkness of man's ignorance and sin and turns his attention toward a higher life. This light perceived in his heart is called the star of initiation, because the first glimpse of its glory initiates him into a new world, and the memory of that flash leaves him no peace until he seeks its source. This light shines in the darkness of the unawakened soul, and the darkness comprehended not. It moves like the Spirit of God over the face of the restless water of humanity, and awakens to life to which is latent therein. The darkness is pregnant with the potencies of all things, both good and evil, which at the breaking forth of the light becomes energized with new life, and begin their slow evolution toward perfection. As with the earth, when God said, Let there be light, so with the candidate. The instant he perceives the light of the Christ within, every hidden thing within him is energized and awakened to activity, for only by this fermentation can the evil be transmuted and evolve into good. In the second period is created a firmament, and the waters are separated from the waters. In the life of the candidate, this period is passed in learning to separate his higher from his lower nature, in learning to separate the desires, symbolized by water or illusion, which drag him down from those which tend toward the higher life. By this separation he creates for himself a positive ideal toward which to strive heaven, and recognizes the overshadowing of his higher self, the firmament. The acquired meaning of the word firmament is to make firm, the true meaning being an expanse or the circle within which a definite creation takes place. In the second period, the candidate creates for himself a definite circle or defines the limits of a spiritual aura within which must evolve his spiritual body, just as the earth evolves within its firmament or the limits of its auric zone. In the third period, the dry land, the seas and all vegetation producing seed after its kind is created. In the candidate, this is the period in which he brings forth and conquers his lower nature. He here gains the power of standing on a firm foundation, the dry land, 
and separating from this all that is illusory, the sea. He deliberately plants, and by the power of the divine will, brings forth such seeds as he chooses. Only when this is accomplished to a greater or lesser degree can he really enter the path itself. Only when he has grasped enough of the philosophy of the workings of the divine law to give him a reason for the faith that is within him, a reason that cannot be shaken by doubts or sophistries, can he have a firm foundation upon which to stand. Each pupil is passing through one of these periods of creation, but only when he has reached the fourth has he really created the path. In ancient temples the sacred shrine was approached by seven steps, the fourth of which was a broad terrace upon which most of the ceremonies took place. Only the few initiated priests and priestesses were permitted to ascend the higher steps, for the fourth step symbolized the path, and only those who had conquered the steps of approach and had created the path could go higher. Some of you have reached this fourth step or period, while most of you are struggling upon one of the three lower, still assembling the various trials and temptations which must be met and conquered ere the path is entered. The trials that come to you are more than mere tests. When the God said, Let there be light, the light began to penetrate into the darkness, the cast-off matter of a previous world period, all that had not been transmuted into good. This is the outer darkness into which the unprofitable servant is cast, which simply means that all the matter which should be the servant of the Lord, the Christ, but which fails to respond during one period of manifestation, must pass through a period of outer darkness or lie in the grave until the resurrection of the dawn of the next Manvatara. In many respects the darkness might be compared to a compost heap into which all refuse, effete and unusable matter is cast, there to ferment in darkness until the next springtime, when it can be spread upon the earth and its life force, transmuted by the power of the elements, can be utilized to bring forth flowers. This accumulated mass is darkness because it is composed of dead matter, incapable of reflecting light. In the same way, the candidate in his past lives has left a trail of darkness composed of effete emanations, which he has failed to redeem. This is often poetically alluded to as the trail of the serpent. In the voice of the silence, it is the shadow of thyself outside the path, cast in the darkness of thy sins. Like the darkness of chaos, it is pregnant with the germs of that which must ultimately come into the light and be redeemed by its creator, that is, be transmuted into force that shall bring forth life more abundantly. It was only in the fourth day that the path of the earth's evolution was really entered upon, that is, when the greater and lesser lights, the stars, the days and nights, the times and seasons were created. Only when this period was reached was the earth ready for the evolution brought over from a past world period to continue. The loathsome, creeping things of the darkness were not created by the light, but were all in the darkness simply awaiting the energizing force of the light to quicken them. The light was sent into the darkness not to stir up evil but by the omniscient law, which recognizes that only by fulfilling its destiny can evil be transmuted into good. The evil weeds must grow, be uprooted, die, and give their life force back to the soil, ere their power can manifest as food for man. So with the candidate, he must penetrate the darkest depth of his being, and not deny, but face and recognize all he finds therein, then he can conquer. This he does through the divine power of the Christ when he said, Let there be light. There is then created in him two great lights, the masculine form of the sun and the feminine force of the moon, the greater to rule the day, the lesser the night. The sun force is the masculine quality of reason which gives him light, courage, and power to grapple with the temptation and problems of his everyday life, while the moon force, lesser only that it has less apparent, is the intuition which will illumine the darkest night and give him the power to understand the forces of his inner nature. The instant the star of initiation sends down this twofold ray into the darkness of his earth heart, every creeping thing, not only in his heart, but also in his environment, comes forth. The instant he speaks the word, all this darkness filled with thought currents of evil, powerful, malignant, deadly beyond description, but heretofore inert, asleep, quiescent, will be stirred into life, in this way precipitating his karma upon him. In the creation of the earth it was the assembled gods, the Elohim who spake the word, Let there be light, and the chaotic mass out of which the new world was to evolve began its evolution. It was the offscoring, that which they themselves had left behind, when they reached godhood in previous world periods, and consequently it was their own creation and theirs to redeem. So with the candidate, the darkness, the evil, the temptations that assail him are his own. 
He has created them in ages past, and when he comes to this conscious step where, of his own free will, he determines to create his immortal body, all this leftover material must be purified and redeemed, for only out of it can he build his immortal habitation. Try to think of a God consciousness so comprehending this law, and so recognizing the needs of the creatures of the darkness, and so filled with the determination to bring good out of evil that, in speaking the word, the full comprehension of all the steps of the evolution of the chaotic darkness, with the attendant suffering and misery, through which it must pass as a result of the purifying process was fully grasped. Moreover, having the consciousness that the light he was sending into the darkness was his very self, his consciousness, his soul substance, and that all the sins and suffering that man would pass through on the road to redemption would be his own, that every pang must be suffered with a godlike power to understand its keenest bitterness, still in divine compassion, seeing the end from the beginning, would nevertheless speak the word unfalteringly, and in speaking it take upon himself the whole burden of the transmutation of the evil into good. This is the true meaning of redemption through love. For the world was not redeemed by the crucifixion of one man, however much that man manifested the Christ, and however much of the darkness was redeemed thereby. It is by the daily and hourly crucifixion of the conscious power of the Godhead, the Christ in matter, the living in the darkness and suffering with, until, atom by atom, the whole is transmuted by his life force, the symbolic blood, that the redemption of the world is accomplished. Every earnest soul who recognizes this principle and takes upon himself the redemption of his own creations thus becomes a redeemer to that extent, and releases the Christ from the cross through the crucifixion of his own personality. Do not think of the Christ as an impersonal force, a mere law of action, but as the full consciousness of the Godhead, which is literally wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our inequities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes are we healed. For in him the Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Some conception of this divine sacrifice must penetrate the conscience of every sincere follower of the light, and in a lesser sense he must have the same willingness to suffer and endure with, and through his creations, and for the same reason, that is, that divine compassion, which would not that any perish, but all have eternal life. This is an effort to make your finite minds grasp an infinite reality, but at least a faint conception of this infinite love and compassion, and yearning to create and redeem, must be grasped ere the candidate can hope to set foot upon the path. For this thought is the illumination given by the star of initiation, or the light shining in the darkness. Only the light of this star or this divine love can give him strength to brave the lions in the way. The vision of the light may be but a fleeting glimpse, but it will awaken within him a response that will forever urge him on until victory is attained. If you carry this lesson into your own lives, you will see why so many undreamed of trials and temptations are the first result of your determination to lead a spiritual life. The more powerful the light, the more earnestly you determine to lay every corner of your life open to it, the more you let the light shine out into the darkness of surrounding conditions, the more will the germs of unsuspected traits and temptations awaken to life and assail you, and evil conditions surround you, conditions of sickness, poverty, lack of love and appreciation, many other adverse things. These conditions do not come to you to hurt you, nor are they sent by any great being who desires to see you squirm, as a scientist might impale a beetle on a pin or cut off a frog's heart to see how long it would beat. But they come to you, their creator, to be redeemed because they were latent in your personality, and the first beams of the Christ star penetrating the darkness awaken them to life. They are not sent to see you prove your strength by conquering them, although you grow stronger with everything you conquer, but they are the denizens of your deep, creatures of your own past evil thoughts, the devils which behold the Christ, the light and tremble. The word tremble is not used here with the idea of fear, but with the idea of quivering with the vibration of a new life, as it imparts a higher rate of vibration to the latent substance of evil. Hence a recognition of this fact and a determination to redeem all by the power of the Christ will transmute it into good. Therefore, do not be surprised if things assail you more than formerly. Do not expect that seeking for spiritual wisdom will make life easier will mean that all your trials are over. Do not seek the Christ life for the purpose of making your pathway in life smooth, your body free from disease or your environment free from inharmony and trial. 
For if you seek it for this purpose, know well that you have not really spoken the creative word and must reap bitter disappointment. These things must come, and if you are strong and determined and earnest and fearless and keep on crying, let there be light. You will have the power of the light to pass this step, for this step is the destruction or transmutation of all temptations into the strength necessary to enter consciously into the path. Take courage. Never say, I cannot, for by the power of the Christ within, you can. There is nothing in yourself or your environment that you cannot transmute into good, for all constitute the worldly goods given you by your Father in heaven, out of which you must create your immortal habitation. Whatsoever you put behind you and say you cannot conquer today must pass into the outer darkness, outer in that it is out of your present life, there to remain until you are strong enough once more to take it up and redeem it. Your loving Father will help you. In tenderest pity he sees your struggle and your despair. But if you give up and cry, I cannot, then in mercy you are lifted out of the path and another night's sleep is given you in which to gather strength. You must await the light of another day. For know well that you must come again and take up the task again and again until all is redeemed. It is often remarked that many reach a certain point of development and then apparently fall back. This means that they have failed in some important tasks and are awaiting the coming of a new day period. But the enemies he slew in the last battle will not return to life in the next birth that will be his. Fear not, go forward, even though the darkness be full of life. If thou wouldst not be slain by them, then must thou harmless make their own creations, the children of thy thought, unseen, impalpable, that swarm around humankind, the progeny and heirs to man and his terrestrial spoils. But if thou fix thy soul's gaze upon the stars whose ray thou art, it will lead thee into the path. Be not discouraged, for you are able and strong. You shall come forth victorious. But ask not that one drop of bitterness pass until it all is transmuted, until you have drained the cup, and in its dregs have found the jewel of great price, for which a man will sell all that he hath to possess. Keep on crying, let there be light, create and redeem, for thereby shall you pass through the fifth and sixth periods, and shall come to the seventh when ye shall rest from your labors, and the God within shall see his creations, and pronounce them good. Just as this is true of each individual, so it is true of this movement, and as a movement it must pass through the same periods or stages. The trumpet blast has gone forth, let there be light, and all the hosts of evil are stirring into activity at the sound. The movement must be created by the united effort of every candidate, for each is individually responsible for its success. Wherefore, take upon to you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. And above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Chapter 25 The Two Tables of Stone And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communion with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God, Therefore the Kabbalists say correctly that man became a stone, a plant, an animal, a man, a spirit, and finally God, thus accomplishing his cycle or circuit, and returning to the point from which he started as the heavenly man, from the secret doctrine, Blavatsky. The great law of the universe, that which manifests forever in man, Adam, and world as a law of spiritual evolution, works forever onward and upward toward more perfect manifestation. This great law, or the flame of divine love, burns forever, sending out its light, its sparks, and its fire mist, which, cooling gradually, condenses into ethereal, and later into what we know as dense matter, producing the physical aspect of planets, creatures, men. The law under which this force of divine love operates is unchangeable, but its manifestation in any system of worlds are guided and varied by the planetary deities, or the divine intelligences ruling the planets composing the system. In our solar system these great beings are called, in the Bible, the Archangels or the Elohim, and in the Eastern teachings, the Rishis. This earth is the culminating point of this system, but in some respects the least evolved. It is the point of greatest ascent, the lowest arc of outward ongoing, where, having reached its lowest manifestation in matter, the law must turn and evolve upward. Ere the law can gather up the forces of the other six planets, complete the last note in the octave of the solar system, and make it the first note of a higher octave of planetary manifestation. There must be a great testing and balancing, both of its inhabitants and of the planet as a whole. 
In the foundation of the solar system it was the force of Saturn, as Lucifer, star of the morning, that was the first to emanate from the symbolic dot in the circle and expand into the circle itself, or the limits of manifestation during this great cycle, the circumference of which God is the center. His is the force of inertia, a stability, of perfect balance of the positive and negative forces, without which a cosmic center could not manifest in matter, without which the other planetary forces could not act. And as Cronus, the reaper, his force will be the last to be withdrawn, or return to the bosom of the infinite. It is Saturn who says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. In the book of Hermes we read, Among the gods is none like unto him, into whose hands are committed the kingdoms, the power, and the glory of the worlds. Many names hath God given him, names of mystery, secret, and terrible. God calleth him Satan, the adversary, because matter opposed spirit, and time accused even the saints of the Lord. For Satan is the magistrate of the justice of God or karma. He beareth the balance and the sword. Therefore Satan is the minister of God, lord of the seven mansions of Hades, matter our earth, the angel of the manifested worlds. As the great tester and initiator, Saturn initiated man into the mystery of the power to create, by the right use of which he shall eat of the tree of immortal life and become as the gods. It is the perfect balancing of its positive and negative manifestations and the right use of this godlike power to create that this is the great test of mankind. Upon the mastering of this problem the fate of this planet depends. Thus Satan grows into the grandiose image of one who makes of a terrestrial a divine man, who gives him, throughout the long cycle of Mahakalpa, the law of the spirit of life, and makes him free from the sin of ignorance, hence of death. Saturn, then, is the one of the Elohim who falls from heaven to take charge of the evolution of man on this lowest planet, the densest field of manifestation. He it is who becomes the lawgiver, he who writes with the finger of God the great law of divine love upon the two tables of stone, or man and woman, now for the first time manifesting in separate, dense physical bodies. He stands upon the top of Mount Miru, or Mount Sinai, the mountain of the gods, and delivers to man the law. Those who can behold him see that his countenance, as Lucifer, son of the morning, the herald of the new day, shines with the light of divinity. But for the multitude he is hidden by the devouring fire in the clouds of smoke, and they know him only as the tester, the adversary. For the enlightened he is the fire of the Lord, for the multitude the cloud upon the mountain. The same ideal is symbolized in the Bible by Moses receiving the law on Mount Sinai, Mount Sin, the mount of the moon, or generation and regeneration. The numbers of the name Moses, 345, are those of I am that I am, 543, so that Moses and Jehovah are at one in numerical harmony. But the numbers are reversed, hence Moses is but the reflection on earth of the lawgiver on high. Therefore I am that I am, Moses, Michael, Jehovah, the tribal god of the Hebrews, and Satan or Saturn are all symbols of varying aspects of the one great lawgiver. In all philosophies and scriptures we find the term stone, used not in a literal but in a mystical sense. One fundamental meaning of the symbol is that power or force which is the foundation of man's manifested existence. Man is symbolized by a stone because here on the lowest of the planets he has reached his densest expression or state of consciousness, a state so dense from the viewpoint of his divine consciousness that it is like that of a stone as compared with man. The old alchemist also used the term stone in a symbolic way. One meaning of the philosopher's stone, the alkahest, or elixir of life, is the perfect blending of the masculine and feminine forces, or the transmutation of the base principle into a perfect harmony, which turns everything it touches into pure spiritual gold. Only when man had reached the point of densest materiality did the great law, working through Saturn or Michael Jehovah, make it possible for him to manifest this foundation stone of his spiritual evolution upon two separate tables. Hitherto man had been androgynous and ethereal, but because he had reached his densest state, it was necessary that this stone be broken, or that the positive and negative aspects of the creative force be separated in order to manifest in physical matter. For the dense animal bodies of the first physical race, the third race, were able to manifest only the lower aspects of the positive force, and were utterly unable to manifest the negative or feminine force. The perfect balancing of these two forces, which Saturn demands before the soul on its return journey can reach its father's house, is the great task which humanity must fulfill in spirit and in truth. 
but it can be fulfilled only when the two tables or stone become one. The positive aspect of the law is written upon the masculine table in positive raised letters. This table has been set up in the marketplace and its laws have dominated the world. The negative aspect is graven deep into the feminine table, and its markings have been filled with the mire and filth of man's lust, so that for ages he has been unable to read the writing, and has imagined that the law was written only on his own table, and that the feminine table was a blank given to him as a toy, upon which, with his soiled and clumsy finger, he could trace whatever characters he desired. Sometimes he has striven to write beautiful eulogies, but in most cases lust and dominion have been his themes. And so, through all the dark ages of man's mentality, the idea prevailed that this feminine stone was man's to use as he would. But the fires of suffering into which man has cast the negative stone is purifying its clay, and is burning the divine character into her soul, so that she knows the law of her being is divine, and is perverted only by man's refusal to recognize the writing, and give her her true place by his side. In the Bible we read of the stone that was rejected by the builders, but which, through the power of the Christ, is to become the chief stone of the corner. But this mystic stone cannot be perfected and become the cornerstone of the temple of the new humanity until its two halves are united, until the positive letters of the one fit into the negative character of the other, and the two are fused into one through the power of the Christ. Until the cycle in the world's history, every system of religion and exoteric philosophy has rejected the feminine stone, and either taught the absolute separation of the sexes, segregating women in convents and men in monasteries, or has in some way rejected woman and forced the stones to remain separate, even to the extent of denying the woman a soul and barring her from paradise except to minister to man's desires. The day of the fulfillment of the prophecy is now dawning, and those who can grasp the significance of the blending of the two tables of the law have a great work to do, that the coming sixth sub-race may lay this chief cornerstone, upon which alone the temple of humanity can be erected by the sixth and seventh great races. Humanity is facing its great initiation. Miguel Moses has brought down the two tables of stone, and it must be you, if you are ready with clean hands and a pure heart, who must set up these tables in the Holy of Holies, instead of the marketplace, and read out of them the law to the children of earth, who are so eagerly waiting to learn. Individually, at the very entrance of the path back to Eden, there confronts you the angel of the flaming sword, Miguel, the great region of Saturn, with the two tables of law. He gives them to you, saying, This is the law, this is the problem, learn ye it, work it out and teach it to the children of earth. Why is it such an enigma? Why must the cloud and the burning of the mountain hide him from your sight? Why do you let the world go on worshipping the golden calf, leaving the great problem of the law to be solved by the few who are unafraid, and who are willing to climb the mount of attainment and receive their great test? The children of earth are making mock, are degrading themselves and burying the law beneath the horrible mire of their own sensuality, because they will not read it from its tables. Again and again have the prophets of the Lord sought to bring the law before the multitude, and many sincere teachers who have led their followers out of the darkness of Egypt, after wandering many years in the wilderness, and laboriously climbing the mountain receiving the dual law, have nevertheless cast it out of their control and broken it. And even though they may be the means of pointing the way to the promised land to many followers, these teachers, like Moses, will be debarred from entering into during this incarnation. It takes clean hands and pure hearts and brave determined souls to lift this banner of the law before the world, but it must be accomplished. This is the beginning of a new cycle, when an advanced step must be taken into this old, old problem. Every soul who is now interested in it has in ages past been among those who have tried and failed and suffered. But there must now come to strength of all the past efforts and the wisdom which the suffering has impressed upon each soul. Many as women have had the iron of slavery driven deep into their souls, and hence find within them an inborn quality which cries out not for vengeance, but recognition, equality, and readjustment. Others as men have helped trample underfoot the feminine stone, and striven to obliterate the writing of the finger of God, yet have found their boasted supremacy unsatisfying. They have felt the need for something more than a plaything, more than a household drudge and childbearer, more even than an enshrined idol. The soul knows it needs that help which can only come from the complement which God himself has supplied. For the manifestations of the law having been separated, neither can be complete without the other. They are like children who are reading an interesting story, but who have lost the sequel. 
They find life an unfinished story. So the two types, all those who have reached the point of evolution, where the soul cry is heard, are ready for the readjustment and are crying out for something that shall make straight the crooked path and lighten the great burden of misery for the world. The natural outgrowth of these karmic conditions is unrest and dissatisfaction in marital relations. The woman question is a burning one. Many are eager for political freedom, some few as eager to prevent it. But the political side of the question is but a bubble upon the surface of the greater question of the unification of the two tables of stone, showing that the great stream of humanity is passing over shoals which cause the bubbles to come to the surface. Only as humanity reaches into its deeper levels and its foaming waters and conflicting currents have been blended into one steady stream can it flow in peace and power down the channels of time watering all the land and making the desert places in life bloom as the rose. Mankind must recognize that the law can never be fulfilled until its two tables have been cleansed from the pollution that obscures the writing, and each has been given its true value, and they have been fitted together and become one. Then it will be seen that neither man nor woman is superior, nor can either, by any possibility, rightfully usurp the place or perform the duties of the other. In fact, neither one can fulfill the whole law without the harmonious blending and cooperation of the other. Man is the positive expression of the law on the physical plane, but negative upon the spiritual plane. Hence it was necessary that he dominate during those stages of evolution, in which the conquering of the rude outward condition of physical life were of prime importance to the welfare of the race. In the united life of the family to him belongs the condition of the outer world, the physical labor, the fighting, the providing for and protecting of the home, the execution of that which is planned by the two, in fact, all outward manifestations of the law. True woman is positive upon the spiritual plane where man is negative, and negative upon the physical plane where man is positive. To her belongs the control of all those questions which deal with the higher life. She must use her intuition in the directing of all activities pertaining to the altruistic side of life, just as man uses his reason in worldly affairs. She should be man's moral and spiritual monitor, and should be his source of inspiration and spiritual help. The two should work co-equally in all matters. Many masculine souls now incarnated in feminine bodies are working strenuously and with all the masculine characteristics to bring about the political freedom of women, which they are instrumental in preventing her from obtaining in the past. But it is the true feminine influence that is needed in the political arena, not masculine influence in feminine garb, for it is just as necessary there as in the home, the state and nation being but a larger family. No business or worldly affairs should be carried on without the inspiration and moral sanction of women, and no feminine plans be carried out without man's active help and cooperation in making them positive and practical on the earth plane. In other words, women, while she cultivates her intuition, love, sympathy, and spiritual aspiration, should have those qualities balanced by reason, logic, courage, and common sense. Man, while cultivating the positive qualities of courage, reason, and executive ability, should balance them with love, sympathy, and intuition. The two should blend perfectly just as spirit penetrates matter, and is the cause back of all outward evolution, yet without which outward form it could not manifest on earth. Just as both sun and water are essential to the growing plant, and excess of either bring disaster, but the perfect blending of the two make the earth bring forth in abundance, so should the perfect blending of man and woman make this earth a fertile field for the perfect evolution of the new humanity. Only thus can the two tables of stone fit into each other and be fused by the power of the Christ into the chief stone of the corner, upon which the fire of divine love may act co-equally to transmute it into pure spiritual gold. Chapter 26 Healing Prayer O thou loving and helpful Master Jesus, thou who gavest to thy disciples power to heal the sick, we recognizing thee, and realizing thy divine presence within us, ask thee to lay thy hands upon us in healing love. Cleanse us from all our sins, and by the divine power of omnipotent life, drive out the atoms of inharmony and disease, and fill our bodies full to overflowing with life and love and purity. Many pupils, when they receive this prayer, either address it to a personal Jesus, or refuse to use it at all because they object to praying to a personality, be he ever so godlike. We wish it understood, therefore, that in this prayer we do not pray to the man Jesus, but that we recognize him as the high master who is at the head of the healing hierarchy, ever ready to answer such a call that this prayer sends out. Only such a call can pierce the clouds that hide the earthly from the divine and make a channel through which the divine healing forces can reach you. 
We also use the name Jesus because of its great potency. The name Jesus having been used for centuries in connection with the thought of personal help and healing power. To utter a name is not only to define a being, but to place it under and condemn or obligate it through the omission of the word to the influence of one or more occult potencies. Things are, for every one of us, that which yet the word makes them while naming it. Therefore, do not hold the erroneous idea that you are to worship any personalized deity, be he ever so high, but endeavor to realize the divine presence within you of the Christ force, which the Bible allegory makes a living factor in the world in which the Master Jesus personifies. Pause for one moment and try to grasp the idea that to realize the presence of the great healer, as in the prayer you say you do, is for the moment, while the realization lasts, to become one with the divine. You then understand that the real self is not a mere personality made up of worn-out and dying atoms, but is something divine, one with God, all-holy and all-powerful, one with all good from eternity to eternity. This realization may be but a flash, but in that flash you have partaken of all that can be imagined of power, strength, and glory. With this understanding of the prayer never repeated without pausing at the words and realizing the divine presence within you, for it is not something outside yourself, but an inflow of the divine made possible by the opening of your heart and consciousness. If your eyes could be opened to see the effect the repetition of this prayer produces on the higher planes, the forces it brings to your aid, you would realize its beauty and its power. When you say, Lay thy hands upon us in healing love, it is a literal adaptation of the words, Thou hast made thy angels thy handmaidens, and thy ministers a flaming sword. For the angelic host minister to all pure hearts who desire their help. The hands which you ask the great master to lay upon your head are his powers to accomplish, which powers are executed by this host of angels, who have the power to carry the divine force to you. When you recite it in harmony, the angels crowd around you like flocks of doves, to ward off harmful forces and protect the germ of your physical, mental, and spiritual life. For it is a spiritual battle cry, calling to your aid the angelic host, whose joy it is to succor those who fight the good fight. The Bible speaks of the angels as always beholding the face of the Christ, that is, their development is such that they can see nothing on the earth plane but the Christ principle, or the face of the Christ in each heart. If that face is obscured by clouds of selfishness and impurity, they cannot see you and consequently cannot bring you help. But the instant the cry for help goes out from the heart, they fly to your aid at the command of their leader. Angels have always been recognized under various names in all religions. They belong to a different evolution from humanity, although closely allied and necessarily have different lessons to learn and different work to do. They are complementary to humanity, strong where humanity is weak, weak where humanity is strong. They stand to humanity as a true wife should stand by her husband. In fact, they may be said to represent the feminine aspect of humanity. They are the ministers and stewards of the mysteries, the hosts of the Lord that carry out his commands. They are the go-betweens and messengers and have a might and a power unknown to mortal man. We must never forget the love we owe these ministering ones. Upon the highest plane of spirit, life is the one life which can be nothing but perfection. The repetition of this prayer is like a projectile fired through the earth's atmosphere, creating a passage through which the one life must necessarily flow. As it passes from plane to plane, it manifests upon the soul plane. The plane of creation of redemption is a spiritual love. Thus does the Son of God, the one life, descend from his Father to redeem the world through love. When his spiritual love reaches the plane of generation, the physical plane, its manifestation in the body is purity. Thus the Christ manifests on the spiritual plane as the one life, on the soul plane as love, and on the physical plane as purity. This is the rationale of all healing, and through a recognition and realization of the presence of this spiritual life force, and its working out in a threefold manner produces that harmony which is health to both mind and body. It also harmonizes condition in your environment. Unkindness or hatred in your heart produce inharmony and sickness by condensing your aura and shutting off this force of life from you. If you send a thought of hatred towards a person, you put a wall around yourself which only your own loving thoughts and prayers such as the above can pierce and break down, and which shuts out the life force from you and permits disease to flourish. Whenever you desire help, physical, mental, or spiritual, either for yourself or others, repeat this prayer, meditating on each word and trying to realize its true meaning on all planes of your being. 
realize that there are currents of spiritual force which are potent and bring renewed life and strength to your physical body, as well as peace and content to your mind and happiness and joy in your soul. And in this prayer you are consciously invoking these forces. As the Master Jesus gave to his disciple the power to heal a sick, and has never withdrawn that gift, so every true disciple who firmly believes this and faithfully strives to manifest the Christ principle within him has now the power, through the laying on of hands by the summoning of the angelic host, to bring this one life into manifestation and thus dissipate ills and promote health and harmony. Once more, healing prayer. O thou loving and helpful Master Jesus, thou who gavest to thy disciples power to heal the sick, we, recognizing Thee, and realizing Thy divine presence within us, ask Thee to lay Thy hands upon us in healing love. Cleanse us from all of our sins, and by the divine power of omnipotent life, drive out the atoms of inharmony and disease, and fill our bodies full to overflowing with life and love and purity. Chapter 27 The Silence But Thou, when Thou prayest, Enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. St. Matthew 6.6 6. We have so many inquiries from our pupils for some method by which they can strengthen their will and hasten their spiritual growth that we desire to give a brief outline of the first stage of this process. We cannot emphasize too strongly the fact that there is but one way to grow, that is, according to the law of growth followed by nature. Grow as the flower grows, unconsciously but eagerly anxious to open its soul to the air. So must you press forward to open your soul to the eternal. But it must be the eternal that draws forth your strength and beauty, and not desire for growth. For in the one case you develop in the luxuriance of purity, and the other you harden by the forcible passion by personal stature. In this one paragraph is contained the great secret of all growth, and the student must grasp its significance and master it. Indeed, until the essence of the truth underlying the above direction has been mastered and incorporated into the consciousness, to attempt any practice calculated to unfold inner faculties is fraught with grave dangers. We begin this chapter, therefore, with the injunction to all our pupils to take the idea contained in the above quotation and meditate upon them until they are fully understood, understood not as words merely, but as vital life experiences ere they attempt further advance. The student should pause here and clearly distinguish between concentration, meditation, prayer, and entertaining the silence. Concentration is focusing the attention upon a chosen object or idea. It is the first step toward accomplishing any given end, either in the physical, mental, or higher worlds. Meditation is turning over in the mind a thought or idea that you may see it from every standpoint and grasp all its phases and relations. It is an active mental process which occupies the undercurrents of your mind, evil why may be overseeing more superficial affairs. The proof that we can meditate while engaged in daily affairs is found in the fact that, if we have some great joy or sorrow, it will remain in the background of our consciousness no matter what we do to distract our attention from it. Apply the same principle to your spiritual life, and make the attainment of that life your main thought and aim. Prayer is an aspiration of the soul toward the divine. It may also be a request, not for creature comforts or physical things. Answers to such prayers are but the results of mental magic, but for spiritual food, love, light, courage, etc. In fact, prayer creates a magnetic line of force which unites you with the supply. Entering the silence is an ecstatic state in which the human consciousness is transcended, and while it lasts, all sense of the personality is lost. While we teach that life itself brings to the earnest seeker all the discipline necessary to strengthen his will, and that the ruling of his life brings the most rapid spiritual growth, still it is well to have a definite time set apart each day for concentration upon the end for which he is striving. To meditate upon the above quotation, let the pupil set apart a certain time each day, preferably in the early morning, rising ten or fifteen minutes earlier if necessary, and sit in a quiet spot, in the same chair if possible, and repeat the foregoing passage with a prayer for light and understanding, and meditate upon it. Try to picture mentally the growth of a flower. Follow every step of its unfoldment. First the teeny seed buried in the dark earth, then the forest within the seed which makes it, by and by, burst through its confining shell. Let your mind enter into, in fact for the time being, become this flower. 
Dwell upon the period of darkness necessary while a seed is sending forth its thread-like feelers, groping everywhere in the dark and gathering nourishment from the earth. With unerring instinct it follows the law of its being, selecting such nutrients as will assist its growth and rejecting that which is unharmonious. Follow the seeding through every phase of its growth. At each step apply the same law to your own growth. Think of the soul as planted in the darkness and loneliness of the material conditions of this earth, yet containing within it the possibility of fruition, its immortal destiny. Do not try to follow the seed through every step of its life journey at the first sitting, but meditate day after day upon one step or stage of growth, correlating yourself with it until you are sure you have mastered its lessons and have realized their application to your own spiritual growth. Above all, make the point very clear that the seed has no personal desire to grow, nor to excel some other seed, but that it is fully occupied in fulfilling the law of its being, to open its soul to the air. When you have mastered one phase of growth, you are ready to pass on to the next, and only when you have, at least in some measure, grasped all the lessons thus taught you, are you ready to enter into the silence, where you can learn from the divine and hear the voice of your higher self. The Master, whom as you thou hast not seen, but whom thou feelest. For only when the flower blooms does it open its heart to the silent power of the sun, and drink in the magnetic forces which could not be assimilated until the bloom unfolded. In the same way must the student open his heart to the sun of righteousness, ere he is ready to learn from the voice of the silence. Let no pupil think, however, that when, through meditation, he has reached the silence, henceforth he has no need of meditation. For no one can enter the silence until by meditation he has opened his heart to the influence of the divine as the petals of the rose open to the magnetic influence of the sun. While an effort may be made at first to, toward its realization, later it must become a state into which you can enter at will, shutting the door of your mind on all daily affairs and finding rest, peace and communion, even in the midst of the turmoil of life. But remember that while aid, such as concentration, breathing, etc., are helpful in their proper place, they do not of themselves cause spiritual growth. They are only aids. The growth must come from dwelling in the consciousness of the divine within you and manifesting the Christ force in the daily affairs of life. When the ability to meditate has been acquired and the pupil is ready to enter the silence, he should first spend a few moments in deep breathing, following the method called the complete breath. The greatest factor in deep breathing lies in the thought held at the time. This is the difference between deep breathing as practice for mere physical culture and for control of life currents. While the physical culturist is breathing merely for health, the occultist realizes that much more than physical health is to be attained. For through the power of breath combined with will, he can draw on the spiritual life essence which permeates the higher strata of Earth's atmosphere. By the act of consciously breathing, we correlate with this essence and draw it more completely into the body. This breath is the fundamental breath of the entire science of breath, and the student must fully acquaint himself with it, and master it perfectly before he can hope to obtain proper results. To accomplish this requires attention, effort, and persistence, but it is essential to further progress along this line. When fully mastered, it will become automatic. Do not neglect or belittle it because it seems simple. The following exercise will give you a clear idea of what the complete breath is. 1. Stand or sit erect, breathing through the nostrils, inhale steadily, first filling the lower part of the lungs. This is accomplished by the diaphragm, which is descending exerts a gentle pressure on the abdominal organs, pushing forward the front walls of the abdomen. Then fill the middle part of the lungs, lifting the chest and upper ribs. In the final movement, the lower part of the abdomen will be slightly drawn in, giving the lung support and helping to fill the highest part of the lungs. The three movements are not separate, but continuous, the entire chest being expanded in uniform movement. Avoid all jerky movements and strive to attain a steady, continuous action. 2. Retain the breath for a few seconds or heartbeats. 3. Exhale slowly in the reverse order, chest first and abdomen last. 4. Rest the same number of counts as in number 2. The rule is to inhale for a convenient number of heartbeats, 6, 8, or 10, retain the breath half this number, make the exhalation the same length as the inhalation, and the rest between breath and the number of counts as in 2. During the inhalation, hold the thought that you are breathing in the forces of love, strength, courage, and purity, or any other virtues you desire. 
that during the pause they are filling you full to overflowing, and that during the outbreathing you are sending out help, comfort, health, and love to all mankind. Think of what you need as flowing indirect from the divine, thus making a direct line of communication over which the divine can reach you. Dwell upon the fact that this divine force which flows through you is not your personal force, and therefore when you breathe out, determine that you will send out only the force of the divine, untainted by your personality. Realize that you are thus creating a reservoir of power, that you can draw upon it in any unlimited quantities as a seed draws to itself the power of the eternal, and by assimilating it grows naturally, yet does not monopolize that power. Realize that this power will purify the vessel, the personal self, always to be looked upon as a mere channel, that you are simply filling up the vessel that it may overflow to all, as a flower sheds abroad its perfume, and that if you are thus enabled to help others, it is not because of your personal attainments or power, but because of the power of the divine flowing through you, because you have become a center through which the lodge can work. Remember, therefore, that you must keep the channel pure and free from all contaminating influences, that as little as possible of your own personality shall enter into the good you are unable to send forth. For a seed must be a healthy seed, or no matter how much of the divine force is poured into it, it will never grow. Indeed, if it has a canker, the divine force would but hasten its decay. It is often a help to stand before an open window, especially one facing the east. Raise your arms in front of you with fingers outstretched, and try to feel the force like a tangible thing which you can grasp. As you indraw the breath, clench your hands and draw toward your heart, as if it were hands full of force, and feel it permeating your whole body. Any action such as this will help you to realize that you are drawing in the divine life. Never under any circumstance perform this exercise when nervous, cross, or while holding any unkind or vindictive feeling in your heart or the consequence will be disastrous, for you will be drawing to you more of the same forces. If this exercise is performed in the evening, it will be well to fix your gaze upon the stars in such a way as to exclude all sights of earth, if possible. After a few short breaths, sit in an easy chair, always the same one in the same place, if possible, or lie flat on your back with your arms outstretched in the form of a cross. Meditate a few moments and send up a strong aspiration of love, it should not even be a definite thought, but a great yearning for the divine, and a realization that you, in your higher self, are the master. And in the words of Malachi, If I be a master, where is my fear? Then sink into the silence. To acquire the ability to enter the silence properly will take time, for you will find your mind fairly bombarded by thoughts, often of a trivial nature, which you must determinately still. This may require weeks or months of practice. For as you silence thoughts on one stratum of consciousness, your mind will still be active, but in a more interior way. Merge into one sense thy senses, if thou wouldst be secure against the foe. Tis by that sense alone, which lies concealed within the hollow of thy brain, that the steep path which leadeth to thy master may be disclosed before thy soul's dim eye. Do not be discouraged, have patience, candidate as one who fears no failure, courts no success. When you find your mind wandering, bring it back, and if necessary, repeat, Peace be still. Often it is a help to repeat the word silence or repeat your given name again and again. But when you have gained the power of silence, stop even these helps. Your mind must be like a still mountain lake, without a ripple, capable of perfectly reflecting every passing cloud. If the surface of the lake is agitated, even by a ripple, the images of its surface will be distorted. So it is with the mind. Only when you have attained to this quietude of mind can you hope to hear the voice of the silence without the intermixture of personality, and observe without distortion the heavenly images reflected in your brain from your Father in heaven. It is important that the student school himself to think definitely and clearly of the personal guidance of his higher self, his Father in heaven, who is the I am I, while the personality is but the servant. Should a student attempt to enter the silence with no definite idea as to whose voice he is listening for, who the master is upon, whom he is to fix his whole attention, and in a negative attitude, as so often happens, he is in great danger of receiving impressions from astral entities, either departed friends, elementals, or powerful but perverted entities, who would deliberately mislead and deceive him, and use him as a tool to further their own ends. For this reason the attitude of soul that must always be held is one of deep humility and ardent aspiring devotion to the divine. There must always be the positive expectation of entering the presence of the divine of listening reverently for the voice of your Father in heaven. He that is of God heareth God's words. 
there must be a definite and fixed determination to listen to nothing else, and to permit nothing else to enter your aura. Have no fear, however, for fear, O disciple, kills the will and stays all action. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Dare, do, keep silent. If two or three are entering the sounds together, let no one desire to be used as a spokesman for the rest, for the very desire opens a door for personality, and makes possible and easy delusions from the astral plane. Let each listen only for himself, not for another. If one should speak at such a time, let the others know well that if the message is true, and if they are in a state of mental poise, the endorsement will be given in their own hearts. This power of distinguishing intuitively between the true and the false is often the first conscious touch between you and your higher self. That the Lord, or the divine intelligence, does this guide humanity through the voice of the silence is amply testified to and plainly set forth in the Bible, both in the Old and New Testaments, as well as in all other sacred scriptures. Indeed, the Bible is full of allusions to those who listen to the voice and those who refuse to listen. As we said in a former chapter, the Bible is a symposium of allegories illustrating the spiritual truth needed by the entire fifth race of the Red Ray. Hence, if it's plainly stated, in language so familiar as to be almost trite, the children of God were led and directed by the voice in past ages. It is equally true today. For there has never been given to man any statement that would give him reason to believe that there had been a change in the laws of spiritual communication, or that the voice of the Master Jesus were no longer true. The voice of God speaks today to all who listen, as plainly as it spake to the pure in the heart of old. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. When Jesus told his disciples to enter into the closet and shut the door, the closet referred to the silence, and the door with which they were to shut was the door of the mind. The Father, who seeth in secret, is the higher self, who does not require words, but who seeth in secret, that is, in the silence, through vibrations of love. The open reward is the peace, comfort, and spiritual upliftment, which comes as the result of such communion with the Father in heaven. Chapter 28 Nature's Mystic Alphabet I will meditate also on all thy work and talk of thy doings. The man who is endued with this devotion, who seeth the unity of all things, perceiveth the supreme soul in all things, and all things in the supreme soul. The Bhagavad Gita. It is desirable that all occult students form some definite idea of the true meanings and relations of sound, number, color, and form, for they stand at the foundation of all occult training. Although this theme is so stupendous that nothing more than this briefest possible outline can be attempted in this lesson, still there have been so many vandal hands digging about this foundation, disrupting, disorganizing, and giving mere surface interpretations, that many a student in his bewilderment thinks that this foundation is tottering. This lesson is meant to be but a hint, an incentive to deeper study. For everything in nature has its voice which speaks in tones so positive that it cannot mislead if we open our ears to it. Every shade of color in nature indicates a potency which can be measured by its wavelength and its rate of vibration, and have its tone determined. We read, The very hairs of your head are all numbered. This is literally true, for the color of the hair together with its texture determines the number of its vibrations, just as the texture of a violin string determines the number and character of its vibrations. And the vibrations of the hair, as part of the keynote of the body, are one indication of the character or the measure of a man. Every flower and herb of the field, every leaf and twig of the forest, by its color and form, its odor, its environment, and its manner of growing, proclaims in unmistakable language its nature, its potencies, and its uses, when interpreted according to the law of correspondence. As above, so below. For all nature's shapes can be traced back to and analyzed into simple geometrical figures. A circle, a dash, a pyramid, a square, and a circle— just as all musical notes produce characteristic geometrical designs when made to pass through sand or other suitable material. Do not think, however, that this analysis is a simple task, for very few colors stand out alone any more than there are straight lines or exact geometrical figures in nature. We find a multiplicity of combinations of color and form, hence, to get their true meaning, they must be separated into their elements. Only the true student who can devote much time and study to the subject can hope to penetrate far into the secrets of nature. Nevertheless, we are told, there is nothing covered, 
that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. We also read, Help nature and work on her, and nature will regard thee as one of her creators and make obeisance. And she will open wide before the portals of her secret chambers, lay bare before thy gaze the treasures hidden in the very depths of her pure virgin bosom. Unsullied by the hand of matter, she shows her treasures only to the eye of the spirit, the eye which never closes, the eye for which there is no veil in all her kingdoms. This is not a chimerical dream, but an actual possibility. It is what is really meant by living close to nature. Sound, number, and color are the three manifestations of deity in nature, nature's alphabet, so to speak, and these three produce a fourth form. Loosely speaking, sound is the first letter of this divine alphabet, and according to the note of vibration or number of sound is color produced, although the sound may not be audible to the human ear, and by the interaction of these three is form created. Thus is the word or the creative sound made manifest, for without these three factors nothing can be produced. That which is called the keynote of any personality is never one musical tone, but a combination of tones, a chord. There are many ways of finding this chord, but the surest is by listening in the silence, first asking for guidance, and striving to harmonize yourself with the divine that is within you, your Father in heaven, then endeavoring to silence all other activities of your mind and listen for the answer. Many students make the mistake of selecting exterior colors and notes and surrounding themselves with them because those colors or tones appeal to them and imagine they belong to them. The effect of this is to hold back the development of their real key note, for it is generally quite different from that which they imagine. The vibrations produced by the outer colors and tones focus upon the student and drown the inner. Moreover, your true color or tone is something which you must reach out for and strive to develop within you. The instant it is thus attained, the next higher color or tone becomes your keynote. It may be said that man is continually playing his psalm of life in the base clef of human vibrations. Hence he experiences in harmony, sickness, and sorrow, until he listens to and strives to sing the melody of the treble clef as sung by his higher self, and make his bass clef but an accompaniment. When this is done, the bass clef gives fullness and richness to the chords and makes the melody complete. There are three primary colors, red, yellow, and blue, a trinity which may be compared to body, soul, and spirit. Each is produced by a particular tone with a definite rate of vibration or number and wavelength. These three form the triangle, the first geometrical figure to manifest on earth. From these three emanate four other supplementary colors, the square, orange, green, indigo, and violet, and by blending and interblending of these seven, together with black and white, are all other colors produced. In numbers also the same law is operative, for by blending of the first seven together with eight, the number of evolution, in which the power of the numbers is evolved into a higher octave in the same way that the colors are lifted into a higher octave by the admixture of white and nine, black, the number of initiation, are all numbers produced. In the musical scale we again find this correspondence, there being seven notes, the eighth or repeated note being the point of evolution into the next octave. The sharps raise the tones while the flats deepen them. The pause or interval in which the one octave dies and the new is born is comparable to nine in number or black in color. Although on earth this pause seems to be silence, yet in reality, upon the spiritual plane, it is a definite tone which comprises all preceding tones and may be called the assimilation of tones, just as black swallows up all colors, yet on earth is no color. The seven colors are born from the pure white light or no color on the physical plane, which in turn is born from darkness or black. Hence black and white in essence are one and the same thing, the two ends of the divine spectrum, with all the manifestations of color as vibratory steps between them. Pure white is not known on earth, what appears as white always being tinged with yellow, blue, or sometimes violet. According to the tenets of Eastern occultism, darkness is the one true actuality, the basis and root of light without which the latter could never manifest itself or even exist. Light is matter, and darkness pure spirit. Even in the mind baffling and science harassing Genesis, light is created out of darkness, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and not vice versa. In him, in darkness, was life, and the life was the light of man. On earth all colors are swallowed up in black, for in black no colors are visible, while all colors live in white. Black and white are represented by the straight, vertical line, which after its descent to earth passes through various geometrical forms, 
the first of which is a triangle composed of the three primary creative rays, their numbers being 3, 5, and 7. Red is the keynote of physical man and his evolution, and its rate of vibration is the slowest of the three primary colors. Being the most physical, it lends its influence to all the others, yet within it are the potencies of all. It is a masculine, not a feminine color, although in a certain sense all three primary colors may be called mother colors, in the same way that three letters of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, Mem, and Shin, are called mother letters, and with much the same meaning. The hierarchy of the red ray is one now manifesting on earth, and when man has evolved beyond red, in all its varied shades, he will have become something more than what is known today as man. Within this red ray, however, all the colors manifest as sub-rays more or less tinged with red. All colors are raised to a higher vibration by the pure white light of spirit shining through them. Hence, evolution through the red ray is accomplished by the lightning and added brilliancy of its shade. For instance, a pale rose pink is the lightest expression of red, while the red of Venus blood is its darkest. Red is the color of the vehicle of the life force, but not of the life force itself, prana, which is orange. Therefore, the blood through which the life force manifests is red. Almost everything that grows, just as it pushes up through the soil, shows a red or pink surface, which later changes to green. All red flowers, fruits, grains, vegetables, and meats tend to warm and enrich the blood and strengthen the physical body. Some of the lower aspects of red are warmth, life, passion, and war, while its higher aspects are strength, courage, and love. The planet corresponding to the red ray is Mars, its metal iron. Just as the soul is the vehicle through which the spirit manifests, so is yellow the vehicle through which the pure spiritual light manifests. Pure yellow is therefore the soul color, and according to its brilliancy does it show forth the overshadowing white light of spirit. It is the messenger of the gods, for it governs the psychic powers by which the inspiration of the gods reach the human mind. This is symbolized by the customary use of yellow or gold hanging upon the altar, and gold fringe or embroidery on the altar cloth, and by the flame of the sacerdotal candles. For yellow is the vehicle of the ray of pure spirit or the flame. It is the color which lends to all other colors their spiritual significance. All yellow flowers and foods are vehicles through which psychic force can enter the body to strengthen the psychic currents. A free use of yellow cornmeal in the diet and corn water as a drink frequently proves a wonderful tonic, if not a cure, for certain psychic disorders. Its planet is mercury and its metal also. Blue is a truly feminine color. It is the color of the auric envelope and of the firmament which forms the blue arc of heaven, which shuts it in and protects it. It is inspiring and uplifting, for the firmament is studded with stars, which lift the thoughts above mundane things to other worlds. This is the office of blue wherever found in nature, to inspire, uplift, soothe, calm, and comfort. In all its meanings, it is the opposite or complementary of red, while yellow lends its force to both. Blue being the color of the auric zone is the color of the mother principle which encloses, enwraps, spiritualizes. All blue flowers have a tendency to allay fevers, cool, and comfort. Its corresponding planet is Jupiter, its metal, tin, and aluminum. Of the supplementary colors, orange is the color of the pranic life force that flows in the blood. It is a cheering, warming, forceful color having for its planet the sun, the symbol of life physically and spiritually. Red and orange are the two most masculine colors, the one being the blood, the other the vital life force in the blood. All orange flowers and foods contain an exceptional amount of life force, and whenever orange is found in nature, it is vibrant with life force. Its corresponding metal is gold. And because this metal absorbs and focuses the sun force, it was used to cover the roofs of many ancient temples and for vessels used in certain sacred services. It is pertinent to the times to note that this highest metal, like the highest spiritual concept, is now debased and used for barter. Green is a feminine color, the middle note in nature, F natural or Fa, the middle principle between the material and the spiritual. When nature strikes her true note and throws out her cheering green in the spring, it penetrates into the hearts of men and awakens in them a desire to grow, to do, to create, to accomplish. No one thinks of calling a tree spiritual. Yet who can look up into the waving green branches of a noble tree and not have a soul lifted up from nature to supernature? Green is the color of the human intellect, the lower manas, the highest point attainable by physical man and nature. It is the keynote of the physical plane. 
Hence is always restful and pleasing to man. It is the color of worldly power and its success due to intellectual attainments. Its lower aspects manifested as envy, greed, etc. It is a necessary link between nature and supernature. Therefore, do not despise this color, the humble works of nature, or even a perfect animal soul. For without its perfect functioning, there would be no stable basis upon which and through the higher forces could activate. There have been many ridiculous theories advanced as to why nature is green, some holding that it is due to yellow sunlight pouring through blue ether, etc. But were this true, everything would be green. Nature is green because green is the point or keynote in the vibratory scale to which physical nature upon this planet responds and to which is evolved. Its planet is Saturn, the binder, and also the reaper. He who limits physical manifestation and reaps from it the seed of spiritual attainment. Saturn is the ruler of the earth in so far as the Saturn force must be faced and conquered by this planet. Its metal is lead. Indigo is by no means blue, as so many miscall it, but is a color by itself. It represents spiritual mind, the power of the spiritual plane brought to earth and manifested through physical man as contrasted with human mind or intellect. It is human intellect joined to soul and permeated by spirit, forming the higher triad of incarnated ego. While green represents the highest point to which physical nature and the intellect of man can reach, indigo represents the same intellect overshadowed and inspired by something far above the divine mind. It is the power of inspiration, higher manas, which enables man to project his consciousness into realms above those capable of being reached by the intellect alone. Like its ruling planet Venus, indigo has its two aspects. For while it always represents spiritual mind, it is often submerged and held down to worldly concerns in spite of its ability to soar into the universal mind and bring to man divine thought. All indigo color in nature, if properly used, is helpful toward the development of this godlike power of lifting the human consciousness above that of the intellect. Its metal is copper. Violet is not an earthly color. True violet is not a mixture of red and blue, although it is usually represented on earth by such a mixture but is a color apart from which belongs altogether to the astral plane, its physical counterpart being but a reflection. It is said to be ruled by the moon, yet not really by the moon, even though moonlight contains a high percentage of violet and ultraviolet rays. For true violet comes from the mystery planet concealed from physical sight by the corpse of the old moon, which gradually disappears during the sixth great race, allowing the mystery planet to be revealed to the seventh great race. The potency and power of violet is due to the rays of this mystery planet penetrating to earth and creating the astral body, the body of sensation in which the inner forces work. Where violet is found in nature, it tends to focus the astral currents and act on astral matter. In fact, it has the mysterious power of holding the potency of the astral and commanding its forces. And as the astral body of all things is the pattern of the physical, the violet ray can be utilized in perfecting an astral pattern of a superior form and in destroying harmful astral matter. Violet has the power of guarding the astral, admitting the helpful and excluding the harmful astral forces. It is ruled by the moon and its metal is silver. All other colors are mixtures or shades or rates of vibration between these seven colors together with black and white. Among numbers, zero symbolizes limitless time in eternity, unmanifested deity. Its geometrical form is the circle from which all numbers are born. One is unity, creative force, life, the father, mother, son, descending to earth in an undifferentiated state. Its geometrical form is the dot within the zero or the germinal point of the mundane egg, the nucleus in the cell. Two is separation, the father separates from the mother and becomes mundane. The dot cannot manifest on earth without having two dimensions, length and breadth and two poles, positive and negative, masculine and feminine. It is represented by two geometrical forms, either the straight vertical line or the dot with two lines of force emerging from it, both forms commonly found in nature. Three is the Trinity, sacred and divine because it is the Father, the Mother, and the Son manifesting in humanity, or man and woman united in God. Its geometrical form is the triangle. Four is the completion of physical creation, the most perfect of mundane numbers that holds within itself the power of ten. One plus two plus three plus four equals ten. Its geometrical form is the square, the base of the pyramid. Five represents humanity or man and is one of the most mystical of numbers. 
for man is the climax of physical evolution, the crowning point of all the lower kingdoms and the forerunner and image of God. Man is the universally structured type. In one aspect, all lower types rise toward man and are completed in him. In another aspect, the specialties of type break up and distribute downward from man to form the lower kingdoms of life as his proper base and support. Moreover, man is the only species that stands erect, with the cerebrum poised at right angles to the spine, the only species that utilizes two limbs from the function of locomotion for the exclusive service of the mind and brain, the only species whose length of the extended arms and legs is equal to the height of the body, the only species in which the segments of the spine are measures of the angles of the cube, the only species with a spoken language, an alphabet, a recorded history, and a prospective future. Five is also the number of the digits on man's hand. While some animals, anthropoids, have five digits, still the thumb, which in man is the great factor in the usefulness of the hand, is but rudimentary, and in primitive man noticeably undeveloped. Thus the size and the shape of the thumb becomes an index to the stage of man's evolution. It marks the difference between anthropophus and anthropoid. Its geometrical figure is that formed by man, his two feet outspread, his arms outstretched, and his head upright forming the five-pointed star, the magic pentagram. Six is man with something else added, or man considered as the lord of creation. Six is primarily the number of nature. It is the number of the Christ principle, but only as it pertains to the manifestation of the essence of universal power in nature. Hence, six pertains to man's power over nature. Its geometrical figure is the interlaced triangles. The triangle pointing upward is light, signifying man's divine nature and his ability to receive from the divine. The one pointing downward is dark, signifying his physical nature. The two intertwined symbolize the fact that only by the perfect blending of these two natures can man attain wisdom. Its symbol is the pentagram. The interlaced triangles form the foundation stone of the objective universe. Man can only attain to wisdom as he can correlate his consciousness with nature. By some, six is called the number of unrest and incompleteness. This is true in the sense that it is the unrest of nature ever becoming, ever changing in form that the great creative principle, the Christos, may manifest more fully. Six is formed by a circle, that which is unmanifested, with a line running upward, symbolizing the unrest of a determined aspiration, reaching out to and trying to manifest ever greater degrees of divinity. Seven is the most sacred of all numbers, for it represents the point in man's evolution where he becomes more than man. Its symbol is the interlaced triangles with the dot in the center, the dot being the same germinal point or creative center found in the mundane egg, which is now manifested through nature and man. In other words, it is the perfect blending of the four and the three, the human and the divine. The three represents fire, while four symbolizes the earth. Thus, three and four, or fire and earth, must be blended by the great mother principle, water, ere creation can be perfected. This symbol is called the seal of Solomon, or wisdom. Eight is the number of evolution, or the spiritual motion of cycles, the breath of the cosmos. Its symbol is two ciphers touching and blending. Eight is also the double square, or the foundation stone, with the cornerstone laid, upon which the higher life shall be erected. Nine is the number of initiation. It is the most mysterious number which never changes. No matter how multiplied or added, the sum of the resulting digits will always equal nine. That is, nine plus nine equals eighteen, equals nine, or three times nine equals twenty-seven, equals nine, etc. In it, all numbers are swallowed up to emerge once more in a new cycle. Ten. Thus it is truly the number of initiation, for the various initiations are steps in the soul life. No matter how you have multiplied sensations, experience, knowledge, or attainment, you cannot pass your great initiation until you have returned to that from which you started, just as all multiples of nine return to nine. Nine is also three times three, or the trinity of trinities, nature, man, and God. According to Hermetic philosophy, it stands for the lamp of Hermes, the mantle of Apollonius, and the staff of the patriarchs. Hermes has made it the number of initiation, because the initiate reigns over superstition and by superstition, and alone can advance through the darkness, leaning on his staff, enveloped in his mantle, and lighted by his lamp. In nine we find again the cipher with which we started, but with a straight line descending from it. Later, when the initiation is completed, this line will take its place to the right of the cipher making ten, 
completing the cycle and making man more than a man. All even numbers are mundane and pertain to the physical plane, while all odd numbers are divine. They contain something which cannot be measured by the two forces, positive and negative, always operative on the physical plane. These are the principal meanings of numbers. All others must be determined by the law of correspondence. The lesson to be learned from these examples of the one law is the importance of little things, for to the occultists there are no little things. Everything that is, every thought, word and deed, has its sound, number, color, and form. These letters of nature's mystic alphabet are always creating, spelling out words, which words are telling the story of your life, writing it indelibly upon your countenance and upon the everlasting Akashic records. Strive, therefore, to write the history of this day of life in letters of gold. Let all your colors be pure, bright and radiant, for whether you realize it or not, your colors are continually emanating from you and are implied in your history on every person and thing you come in contact with. They also bring back to you their physical results which are built into your form so that, in the very truth, your physical body, as well as the spiritual mental astral, is the result of your thoughts. Truly it is said of man, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Chapter 29 The Word and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. St. John 1.14 By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Psalms 33.6 As humanity advances, a point is reached where there is a widespread recognition of an esoteric teaching beneath the letter of the law and consequently many scholars are digging with vandal hands into the sacred mysteries, and without heeding the advice of the sages, are flinging to the world all sorts of scholastic explanations, calculated rather to bring prestige to themselves than in any way to elucidate the mysteries for the good of humanity. The day is past when the majority of mankind is content to accept any translation of the Bible as literally true, for like all scriptures, its teachings are given by means of parables and allegories, both the Old and New Testament, setting forth the vital truth in symbolic language. That is, the inner and deeper truth are veiled under symbols which of themselves inculculate a complete moral code, but which are not meant to be taken literally. From the beginning there has always existed an exoteric teaching understood by the multitude and an esoteric teaching given only to the few whose training has fitted them to understand it. And in this cycle of spiritual unfoldment, it is unvisable that a few of these mysteries be at least partially unveiled, that the spiritual discernment of the few may lead to the knowledge of the many. The Word is the voice of the higher self, the Christ within, and is the personal God of each individual, because the fleeting human personality is but the shadow cast by that which is a direct ray from the divine, the Christ within. The sun forever keeps its appointed place in the heavens, but its rays reach and penetrate every portion of the earth. Without those rays nothing could be brought forth upon the earth. Yet we do not deny that the rays of the sun, although we know the sun is still in the heavens. Just so the higher self is the ray from the infinite, without which nothing spiritual can be brought forth in animal man. This higher self is dual, one with God, yet its earthly shadow, the human personality, is but an emanation or spark of the higher self clothed in atoms of physical matter, just as the sunbeam clothes itself in a growing plant and brings forth a perfected fruit. Thus the higher self is both the Father in heaven and the Christ within, or the sun in the heavens and the sunbeam imprisoned within the fruit. The higher self overshadows the personality, ever striving to guide and teach it that it may bring forth the spiritual man its fruit. This guidance is accomplished in many ways, in dreams and visions, by the still small voice, called by many the conscience, or if these ways fail to impress the dense atoms of the physical brain, the personality is permitted to follow the dictates of its own rebellious animal will, and learn through bitter experience to listen to and obey the dictates of the word forever being spoken within. Let me cease, O thou perfectly awakened, to remain as an ape in the world forest, forever ascending and descending in search of the fruits of folly. Ordinarily, many, many lives are spent in sowing the seeds of disobedience and reaping the harvest of suffering, ere the personality will heed the guidance of the divine. This overshadowing Father in Heaven is called by some of the Oversoul and by the Roman Catholic Church the Guardian Angel, whose power over the personality is exerted through the still small voice. But in reality, this Guardian is the real Self, the God within, higher Manas and Bodhi permeated by Atma, 
of whom the various personalities are but temporary garments worn for certain occasions and for certain purposes, but all of which are thrown off and disintegrated when the real self is clothed with immortality, just as are the blossoms when the sunbeam clothes itself in the fruit. Science has demonstrated the fruit is all imprisoned sunshine and water, the father and mother forces, the dual aspects of the creative force, except a small residue of earthly solace left behind as ash. Just so will the word gradually clothe itself in spiritualized matter, with but a modicum of earth. One phase of this mystery is that as the disciple advances along the path to mystery, the word becomes manifest to the human consciousness for purposes of revelation. Even if it be but for a momentary flash, that experience is evidence of an advanced step. Ultimately, the manifestation of the word or the Christ consciousness will become continuous, as in the case of the Master Jesus who said, I and my Father are one meaning that his personal human consciousness was so blended with the divine that all times he could function in the consciousness of his Father in heaven. When this point is reached, the word is consciously incarnated in the flesh, or the fruit is perfected. This Christ consciousness at first may come only in moments of extreme spiritual exaltation or ecstasy when the human consciousness is transcended. Plotinus defines this as the liberation of the mind from its finite consciousness, becoming one and identified with the infinite. By many teachers this is called cosmic consciousness, but cosmic consciousness is far more all-embracing, for it is the power to enter into and partake of the consciousness of everything in the cosmos from Adam to God. To one who has obtained perfect mastery over the lower personality, the Father, the Higher Self, and the Son, the Personality, have become one and the stream of divine wisdom flows uninterruptedly through both. Physiologically speaking, this means that by repeated victories of the word over the flesh, through the fulfilling of the law in many lives, the higher self has gradually gained increasing power over its physical vehicles, and at last has built up, atom by atom, a fleshy body so spiritualized that the atoms of its physical brain readily respond to the vibrations of the Christ consciousness, thus enabling the word to dwell in the flesh among men, or the Son to become one with the Father. The human personality, by schooling itself to listen to and obey the inner voice at last, so stills the vibration of the human intellect that the word is an infallible and ever-present guide in the smallest detail of the earth life. In other words, the flesh, which is so long warred against the spirit, has become the willing and obedient servant, eager to listen to and carry out the will of the Father on earth, even as it is done in heaven. Those who find it difficult to distinguish between the voice of the higher self, conscience, and the desires of the human personality, can readily determine which is speaking if they will remember that when they ask in the silence for guidance and put themselves in a listening attitude of soul, the reply will come either audibly or as a mental impression, but it will always come as a plain statement clearly and concisely, requiring neither argument nor justification. The instant you begin to argue with yourself or need to justify your decision, know well that you are not heeding the voice of your Father in heaven, but are following the wisdom of the human intellect or catering to the human desire. The personal self always endeavors to justify its decisions with most plausible arguments, while the higher self simply asserts a fact or commands. The word or the God within is divine essence or love, for God is love. The lost word, in one sense, is simply the lost power of hearing the voice of the Father in heaven or realizing and correlating with the Christ within. The wisdom religion as set forth in the Christian Bible, while recognizing gods, angels, seraphim, and cherubim, and spiritual beings of every kind, no one would think of calling idolatrous. The recognition of all these manifestations of deity in no way conflicts with the injunction, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, for it recognizes the divine unity of all. In its esoteric teaching, it helps man to understand the deep, underlying meaning of this unity and to worship divine love, which is the God before whom alone man shall have no other, and which alone he must worship in spirit and in truth. This one God he must seek and find in all things, firstly in himself, then by a recognition of his oneness with all it is, must find him in all things. He must reverence, but never worship or idolize any manifestations of him, be they planetary angels, seraphim, divas, avatara, masters, or what not, nor must he worship him as his own personal God, the word incarnate in him, but must learn to separate the deity from his manifestations and listen to the voice of the one God, divine love, of which alone it is said, I am the Lord thy God. As Epicurus said, 
The God exists, but they are not what the multitude suppose them to be. He is not an infidel or atheist who denies the existence of God whom the multitudes worship, but he is such who fastens on the gods the opinions of the multitude. Only they are heathen who refuse to recognize and worship divine love or the word made flesh. Also bear in mind the creative aspect of the word. We read much of the limitless power of the word properly pronounced, and it is indeed all true. But before man can pronounce it, he must gain the power of expressing every tone and semitone in nature, for only then can the creative word be sounded. This creative word is continually pronounced within him by his Father in heaven, for it is this word pronounced within him that is bringing forth his spiritual life, but ere he can pronounce it for himself, man must become more than man. All created things are the expressions of coarser or finer vibrations, hence the voice of conscience, the word, manifesting through exceedingly high and fine vibrations, finds it difficult to call forth the response from a mind given over entirely to worldly affairs and consequently attuned to a much lower rate of vibration. But if the voice is listened for, and an effort is made to follow its guidance, it has the power to create conditions at which it can manifest more plainly. Since during involition... The word of the Lord, or divine law, penetrating through all the spheres, created the heavens and firmament, and the earth, and thereby incorporated itself within every particle of matter composing them. So, during evolution, must it evolve back to its source, lifting up or redeeming all through which it is manifested, thus creating a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. The creative word manifests through nature as tone, color, form, and number, just as a written word is composed of numbers, letters, symbols, syllabus, and the meaning expressed. Hence, every tone in nature, be it song or bird, roar of beast, thunder of the heaven, be it a twinkle of a fountain, surge of ocean, or rustle of leafy boughs, is an expression of the word. And not a note in nature can be left out and the creative word be complete. Could man respond to and manifest his true vibration, his keynote, in the creative word, with the single-mindedness of nature, all would be at peace, harmony, and love. Man alone strikes a discordant note, not only himself, but also in the noises of his creation, factory whistles, street noises, etc. And the effect of this in harmony is impressed upon all creation, so that thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. As man advances and learns to listen to the still small voice, and as the word unfolds within his heart and manifests in his life, so will the tones of his voice grow more tender and loving and lose their power to wound. Thus will he become more able to comfort and cheer, lead and command, for he then expresses more of the creative power of the word, until at last the word is made flesh and manifest continually. This is the secret of the power of great speakers, for they express, to a greater or lesser degree, the creative power of the word and literally create within the minds of the hearers that which they wish to impress upon them. The pronunciation of the word is a question of manifesting its guidance in the life, for every discord in the life produces a false note in the voice. Strive, therefore, to be absolutely true to the word and be willing to face yourself and to find and express truth in every tone and action. Thus will you learn to take your true place and express your true keynote in the grand symphony of life. Chapter 30. Illumination. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the ego, which is seated in the hearts of all beings. I am the beginning, the middle, and the end of all existing things. The Bhagavad Gita. Pupils are asking continually for some formula, some prescribed practical thing to do to advance their spiritual evolution, complaining that they have read and studied all forms of philosophy and are now ready for something definite. Because of this widespread demand, they have sprung up on every hand those who are professing to give practical directions that shall lead this pupil into illumination and give miraculous power. On the other hand, an equally large number are writing that they have studied various systems, spent large sums of money for advanced teachings, received the lessons of the intersection of many organizations, have passed through many mysterious degrees of various societies with high-sounding titles and yet found their hunger unappeased the net result being a mass of so-called formulas and a greater amount of discouragement. Others turn to the wisdom religion, supposing it has to do with the development of psychic power and the performance of magical rites, but in truth it has primarily to do with the development of the Christ force within and the showing of it forth in the life. So-called magic is dual. If it is a result of the recognition and outward manifestation of the Christ within it, it is white magic and right. 
if the result of seeking for power or personal stature becomes black magic and evil. Therefore, to all these classes of seekers, as well as to many other hungry hearts, we bring the old, old message. I, the Christ within, am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. What is it that all these are seeking? It is so-called illumination, yet few there be who have any realization of what this means. We have considered various phases of this illumination in previous lessons, and we will try herein to show what the real illumination is and how it is attained. Illumination is the perfect blending of the self with the divine or the Christ power, so that divine wisdom can guide every thought and act of the mortal man, and the light of divinity can shed its radiance over the entire life. When it is remembered that the Bible story of the Christ is the most complete and all-embracing narrative ever written, not of the man Jesus or even of God, but a synthetic picture of the Son of God, the emanation from the Father, the Christ force in humanity or the Word made flesh, which symbolizes the various steps each soul must pass through and conquer. It becomes quite plain that this, as union with the divine, takes place the life of the disciple must manifest truth. The whole mysterious transformation must be a growth similar to the gradual assimilation of the life-giving constituents of the sun by the plant, until the full fruition or the indwelling of the life force is accomplished in the fruit. When we grasp this thought firmly, we will understand that we must and shall do works of our Father in exact proportion to our ability to make the correlation with Him, just as the plant does the works of its Father the Son, just as the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. Therefore, there can be no rigid observance laid down for the attainment of perfection, any more than there can be for the perfection of every individual plant. There can, however, be practices which develop the will, awaken the intuition, and stimulate aspiration, and there are environments which will foster spiritual growth. Within the ranks of any spiritual movements, these teachings satisfy your soul hunger. But these have been fully covered in other lessons. To the average 20th century student, the effort to conquer himself is quite sufficient to develop his will, and the only stimulant necessary is a burning, ardent seeking for the realization of the Christ love. Illumination, however, can never be attained through the mere reading of lessons or the observance of rules. It must be the result of a vital force that comes into each life. The gardener may prepare the soil, tend and water a plant, but the plant itself must assimilate the light and force of the sun and literally transmute them into living tissue within its body ere the blossom of the fruit can appear. So it is with the illumination that each soul is seeking. Only the Christ force, not only talked about and in a sense realized, but literally absorbed and built into living tissue in the flesh, the mind and the spirit, can bring about this mystical union. It is the Christ and the Christ alone who is the way, the truth, and the life. As certain plants gather from the sun force the power to produce poison, so can man, by using for his own personal ends the godlike powers with which he can identify himself, produce evil. We do not create power. We only identify our consciousness with the divine, which is all power, just as we might attach a wire to a dynamo and obtain power. Of the divine self alone it is said, All power is given unto thee in heaven and earth. This is literally true. All power is ours when we identify ourselves with the divine, and the synthesis of this power is the ability to merge the personality into the divine, or become one with the Father through the Christ. This gives all power because having accomplished this all things are possible. As man is endowed with free will, he can choose to take either the right-hand path, merge the human into the divine, and use his God-power to do the work of his Father in heaven, or he can graft his God-power onto the stock of personality, and by making the intellect alone his guiding star, deliberately forswear his Father in heaven and become a child of evil, or the devil, and do the works of his Father the devil, the concentrated force of man's wrong thoughts, acts, and creations, the perverted reflection of the good law, the Lord on earth. By refusing to let the light of the divine penetrate farther than the intellect, he closes the door of his heart and allows the light to illumine only his human brain, which, without the guidance of the heart, permits evil to manifest, especially intellectual and spiritual pride, which are the most subtle and insidious of all evils. Therefore, to teach mankind how to unfold inner faculties and how to use their power for personal ends would be quite as reprehensible as for a gardener to propagate in a garden devoted to raising food for man some poisonous vine which the gardener knew the very richness of the soil, the sunshine, and the cultivation would cause to grow and finally either destroy the food or impregnate it with poison. 
This is why the inner teaching of the sacred mysteries are given only to a few. It is no being who gives. It is the blossom of the soul which opens and receives the light of illumination, as the rose unfolds its petal to the light of the sun. If you do not receive this light, know well that the blossoming time has not arrived for you. Had it arrived, no one could withhold the light from you. When the divine mystery of the indwelling of the Christ has taken place in the soul, and the disciple has begun to realize in a vital living way that the overshadowing of his divine self is a real blending or indwelling, then the works of his Father will unfold within him, just as the blade, the ear, and the full corn and the ear unfold in the plant. Then, and then only, is he ready for the inner teaching, for he must be trained to put forth his blossoms in a manner best for humanity. Each step gained must not only show in the life, but the powers that go with that step must also manifest. If we control one selfish trait, which before held us captive, we may know that we have taken a real step upward. And the first and greatest of all magical powers to be attained by the pupil is the magical power of controlling himself, of day after day mastering the little things, with no heroics, perhaps with no one to commend him or realize that he has taken any effort, yet still controlling his little temper, his little impatiences, little acts of selfishness, his tendency to criticize and all the little trifling things he knows are wrong, but which seem too petty to be worth mentioning. Let no pupil ask for special lessons until these little things are in a measure conquered, for the building of these little lessons into his life is the most practical formula that can be given him. And if there is anyone who has thus assimilated the Christ and grown to live the Christ life, who has gained the power of looking at the self, who has fulfilled the injunction, Know thyself, yet who says he still lacks illumination, let him know well that there is some hidden corner in his heart or life into which the light is not able to penetrate, some closed door which he refuses to open. To him we would say, Look deeper and meditate in the silence and pray for a knowledge of thyself. At the same time, go forth and help to bring the light to some other soul, for in so doing some part of your nature you will find that which keeps out the full radiance of the Christ light. Let him learn to look intelligently into the hearts of men. Regard most earnestly your own heart, for through your own heart comes the one light which can illumine life and make it clear to your eyes. Occult formulas are more apt to emphasize self-satisfaction and self-righteousness than to help toward self-mastery. John the Baptist had been educated in all the law of the mysteries, had lived apart from the world in the caves of the wilderness, had fed on locusts and wild honey, and had spent his life following out the most rigid formularies of the Essenes. Yet Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. This means that the very humblest person who is correlated with the Christ within, which is entering the kingdom of heaven, is greater than even a great intellectual teacher such as John the Baptist. Both intellectual development and heart development are necessary, but if the heart is first developed and a conscious union made with the Christ within, all things are revealed unto you. This is, as it were, the shortcut to mastery. It is a singular fact that none of the great teachers, Krishna, Buddha, Jesus, etc., ever wrote a word or were in their day looked upon as great intellectual teachers. But the example of their life lives in the world today and can never die, because they made this divine correlation, literally manifesting God in the flesh. It is neither the words you speak nor the routine of your life that affects the world, but something more. It is the power of that which is the way, the truth, and the life. In other words, both that which you teach and the example of your life must prove conclusively that it is the Christ within you that worketh through you both to will and to do. It must not be a mere lip service. It must be so true and so convincing that it will radiate from you rather than be a garment assumed before the world or a mere intellectual cloak that blinds your own eyes. For the Christ within you must be the truth as well as the way in the life. If there is any doubt left in regard to the path we point out to reach its attainment, we will briefly recapitulate. Think only constructively if you desire spiritual growth. Do cheerfully and well the duty that lies nearest. Conquer the little faults as they show themselves. Never let a day pass without its period of self-examination, meditation, and communion with the divine. Do unto others as you would that others should do unto you. Learn to love in its truest and grandest sense. Do not criticize others, even though your criticism seems just, for to do so you must dwell mentally in the conditions you criticize. 
Be not afraid to face and recognize your own faults. At the same time, be not discouraged. Have perfect confidence in your power ultimately to conquer through the Christ within. For the voice of the Christ declares, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The following are the requirements given by a great teacher to those who seek illumination. 1. Behold the truth before you. 2. A clean life. 3. An open mind. 4. A pure heart. 5. An eager intellect. 6. An unveiled spiritual perception. 7. A brotherliness for one's co-disciple. 8. A readiness to give and receive instruction. 9. A loyal sense of duty to the teacher. 10. A willing obedience to the behest of truth once we have placed our confidence in and believe the teacher to be in possession of it. 11. A courageous endurance of personal injustice. 12. A brave declaration of principle. 13. A valiant defense of those who are unjustly attacked. 14. A constant eye to the ideal of human progression and perfection which the secret science depicts. 15. These are the golden stairs up the steps of which the learner may climb to the temple of divine wisdom. All things are possible unto him who believes. Chapter 31 The Symbol of the Salt Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out, and to be trodden under foot of men. Matthew 5.13 Salt plays a most important role in all life, both in man and in nature. It has also played its part in the advance of civilization. The first great highways known to history were caravan routes formed by transporting salt from the deserts to point of civilization. Salt thus became the great reason for communication between different people, and hence the means by which civilization spread. The use of salt marks an advance in civilization from a wandering nomadic life, in which the people subsist chiefly upon animal food containing a large proportion of salt, to an agricultural life in which vegetables requiring salt for flavoring form a large proportion of the diet. Salt in the diet is necessary for the health of all herbivorous animals. It is necessary constituents of all animal tissue and of the blood. Experiments have repeatedly proven that the heart will not beat unless there is dissolved in the blood a certain percentage of common salt. Its use in everyday life is as a purifier and preservative. This means its chief function in the world. Like the heart of man, the heart of nature will not beat, nor will life continue without a proper proportion of salt, for salt preserves the force which makes life possible. Salt was one of the ingredients in the great work of the old alchemist who reduced all elements to their mystic sulfur, mercury, and salt, salt symbolizing that which purifies and preserves the life principle. Salt is found in oceans, deserts, salt lakes, and mines, the latter being deposits left by the evaporation of ancient seas. But wherever salt is found, the significance of its presence is due to its purifying and preserving qualities. The earth is a living entity, and when a portion of its surface becomes diseased beyond repair, when weighted down with the wickedness, crime, and sin of the people inhabiting it, that portion gives way under the load and through great cataclysm sinks down to be covered by the salt brine of the sea where the putrefaction of the mass is completed. Putrefaction is a form of digestion or disintegration which breaks up old forms or bodies and liberates their life essence. These essence being sublimed by the heat of the putrefaction rise up, and certain of them combine with the various salts in solution and are thus preserved. Others, in passing up to the brine, are purified ere they pass into the regions above. As these purified essences rise from the sea, certain of them are swept inward over the land, where they are assimilated by both vegetable and animal life, including man. In this way, all the advances in intelligence, as well as all the advances in art, science, and invention, brought forth for the benefit of mankind, the so-called lost arts, are still preserved in the thought or of the locality. When subsequent races reach a corresponding stage of mental development, they are able to respond to the purified thought forms of the former civilizations and reproduce them as apparently new ideas or inventions. It is often noted that new ideas, new thoughts, and tendencies seem to sweep over communities in waves. They are indeed waves in the mental and even physical atmosphere, sweeping in from the sea, invigorating, stimulating, and advancing all forms of life. All essences not absorbed by vegetable and animal life or utilized by man 
pass into the aura of the earth as a permanent acquisition or seed for the use of future races. The modern airplane is but an imperfect expression of the thought forms left in the aura of the earth by the ancient Atlanteans, who had developed aeronautics to a far higher degree than has yet been attained in this age. There is no so-called lost art, but will in due time be recovered or discovered in the same way. For every thought and act of man is imprinted upon the Akashic records, and tends to reproduce itself through the brain of the reincarnated soul who has first produced it. And when so reproduced, it tends to be further perfected or redeemed, for such is the law of eternal progress. After the rise of the submerged land from beneath the brine of the sea, the waters drain off or evaporate, and the purifying process is continued in the resulting deserts. Following cyclic law, when disintegration of old forms is completed, and the combination of the lower essence with the salts of the sea is accomplished, the land, thus freed from its magnetic burdens of impurity, slowly rise above the surface, the waters evaporating, leaving behind their accumulated salt to the further action of the sun and the air. Thus are formed the vast tracts of land we call deserts. As in the body an excess of salt is injurious, so in the desert, where for ages no vegetables or animal life can exist. Yet in the fullness of time the salt is gradually disintegrated, sublimed or carried away by the action of the elements, and the land again becomes habitable. The great salt lake in Utah, the deserts of the Sahara, and the great plains of western United States are example of different steps in the process. Thus, little by little, is the prophecy fulfilled. The desert shall bloom as the rose. Man passes through the same stages of purification by salt as does the earth. His youth is fresh and pure, is filled with high ideals, beautiful thoughts, and vast energy. Gradually, as he reaches his maturity, his pure ideals become overlaid with selfishness, dissimulation, greed, and impurity, and his life becomes weighted down with the weaknesses, material desires, and impurities of the world. Then come the purifying cataclysms of sorrow and suffering, in which all his boasted attainments dissolve from under him, and he sinks down under the brine poured out by the salt tears that flow from his eyes. Here is in the ocean, the salt purifies the nature and preserves the essence of good and the experiences he passes through, building it into his aura for future use. The lessons of sorrow must be well learned, or they will be repeated again and again until learned. After a period of desolation, when all comfort fails, comparable to a lonely desert, the paralyzing effects of sorrow gradually lessen and pass away. Then the rose that is born of suffering and watered with tears puts forth its bud and begins to open its petal in the purified and freshened soil of his heart. Analyzed from the higher standpoint, a drop of sea water contains every constituent necessary to life, and the same constituents are found in the salt, waters of life or tears. The well-known aphorism in Light on the Path is based upon the purifying action of salt. Before the eyes can see, they must be incapable of tears. does not mean that you must be cold or lacking in understanding, in appreciation of the trials your brothers or sister are undergoing, or that you must be lacking in sympathy. For Jesus, the type of perfected man, wept in sympathy with the sisters at Lazarus' tomb, although possessing in his fullness the power to bring Lazarus back with a word. But it does mean that there will come a period in your life when your passions, emotions, and thoughts will be so mastered and purified by the action of the salt tears, which in your present stage of development are necessary, that there will be no further need of tears, for the salt has done its work. As in the desert, where only after the salt has been absorbed can the roses bloom, so only after the purifying and cleansing has been accomplished, in your life can the rose bloom in your heart and your eyes truly see. Many ceremonies are connected with the partaking of salt. In the Middle Ages, the dish of salt was placed in the center of the long banquet board, and those who sat between the salt and the host were said to sit above the salt. Only members of the family were permitted this honor. Hence, when a guest was seated above the salt, he was accepted as a member of the family for the time being and accorded all the privileges and honors due a son of the house. Those who sat below the salt were the squires, retainers, and followers of the lord of the house, and could rise above the salt only by valiant deeds. Among the Arabs to this day salt is held sacred. One with whom they have partaken of salt becomes their friend, and if by chance they partake of salt with an enemy, that enmity must be forsworn. This ceremony is called the Covenant of Salt and is but another remnant of the ancient ceremony which symbolized the covenant between man and his higher self. Traces of the symbolic meaning are found in many religions, the Roman Catholics still using salt in the baptismal service. These customs are remnants of the beautiful symbology taught the early races by the elder brothers of humanity, 
in which is symbolic purifying by the salt admitted the neophyte to spiritual sonship. The self-conquering, purifying, and cleansing which lifted the neophyte above the salt made it possible for him to enter the higher realms and become one with his Father in heaven. The first conscious step of the neophyte is a strong desire to purify his body, mind, and life, and preserve the divine attributes within his soul. This step is symbolized by the effect of the salt. Each of you who is ready to make the covenant of salt with your higher self agrees to let your life be purified of all its faults, both great and small, through the action of salt tears, even though sorrow and suffering are necessary to accomplish the result. When you have been thoroughly salted and cleansed from earthly impurities, then will you become clear crystal grains wherewith to salt the earth. Then indeed will the eyes be incapable of tears and be able to see the things of the Spirit. However, this does not mean that you are to encourage mere emotionalism or to look on the sorrowful side of life. For just as in a desert an excess of salt kills out vegetation, so giving away to excessive weeping or emotion will make a desert of your heart and life, and you will remain in that state until you have conquered. You will never gain the victory until, as in the desert, the salt has been absorbed, the soil of your heart enriched by experience, and your life has brought forth its roses. Jesus said to his initiated disciples, Ye are the salt of the earth. Have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. As you start out to be the salt of the earth, be not dismayed that you are such a teeny grain compared to the great world around you. Determine not to lose your savor. The little grain of salt stops not to consider if it can accomplish its mission. It simply gives forth its innate qualities in perfect confidence. For if it has not lost its savor, everything it contacts must be salted. And the more it gives, the more it has to give, for its crystals grow and reproduce according to their saltiness. Let the light of your purified life so shine before men that they shall recognize in you the element of purification. Earnestly determine that the salt shall not lose its savor, but that you will do your duty as a grain of salt to wipe out and purify the world's misconception. In your daily life, like grains of salt, radiate the spiritual force which you draw from the Christ and transmute the putrefying conditions in the thought of humanity into love and purity. Chapter 32 Thou shall not kill. Life runs its rounds of living, climbing up from moat and gnat, and worm, reptile and fish, bird and shagged beast, man, demon, diva, god. If one might save man from his curse, the whole wide world should share the lightened horror of this ignorance, whose shadow is chill fear and cruelty its bitter pastime. Light of Asia. Note, this lesson is intended to advocate neither meat-eating nor non-meat-eating but to inculcate in all the tolerance which can see others follow lines of conduct differing from their own without condemnation or a feeling of superiority. The command, Thou shalt not kill, is plain and distinct, with no modifying conditions, yet it is given upon the same authority as that which in the vision of Peter said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Although the vision of Peter is primarily to teach him that even though a Jew he should call no man unclean, nevertheless the voice of God commanded him to kill and he had to learn his lesson through his willingness to do even though against his race prejudice. We have explained to our pupils something of the great law of the one life, or the great creative principle set into chaos to evolve through all forms and bring the world stuff left over from a previous world period to perfection through physical and spiritual evolution. We have tried to picture this great principle as a stream of life force animating and evolving everything through which it passes. As this is the force back of all evolution, an emanation from the Absolute which is all life, there can be no such thing as killing in the sense of annihilating this stream of life force. But since the above command is given, and not only in one sacred scripture but in many, it must have an important inner meaning as well as an outer. The only sense in which man can kill is to separate any form of life from this stream of life force, or to dam it up or refuse to permit it to manifest. A good example of such killing is given by the yogis, brahmacharis, and bhikshus, the so-called holy mendicants of India, described in the light of Asia. Some day and night had stood with lifted arms till drained of blood and withered by disease, their slowly wasting joints and stiffened limbs jutted from sapless shoulders like dead forks from forest trunks. Such practices prevent the one life from manifesting through certain parts of the body, hence such parts may be said to be killed. Another form of killing is found in the various kinds of mental torture which, even in this so-called enlightened and Christian country, are assiduously followed by many who are earnestly seeking spiritual enlightenment. 
While we are wont to look upon all forms of bodily torture as horrible and revolting, many hold the soul torture is the only path to perfection. Such think they must make life as hard and unhappy both for themselves and for others as it is possible, that they must refuse to eat that which they enjoy, must starve their bodies, or must scourge their mind and conscience. These are also forms of killing, because they damn up and refuse to permit the life force to manifest in and through these conditions. Just as mind and spirit are more important than body, so is mental and spiritual torture far more harmful and degenerating than any merely bodily torture that can be conceived of. And it is exactly the same effect, namely, to separate the tortured parts from the stream of life-giving creative force, which is the Christ, or the creative principle of the Godhead. The one fact which we would have that we could proclaim in words of fire that all the world might comprehend is, God is love, and love is life, and growth, and joy, and peace, and immortality. The only bar to evolution is to kill to separate either body, mind, or heart from God-love, no matter what mistaking teaching brings us about. Just as long as the idea prevails that to be joyous and happy in life is to be far from God, just as long as love is considered a clandestine fruit, something forbidden to be eaten only in secret and bitterly repented on later, that to gain the pleasant things of life you must close the door on God and turn aside the stream of the vital Christ life from you. Just so long will this world be a hell as it is today. The only way to cleanse the Augean stables of life miseries is once more to turn the living waters of the rivers Elpheus and Peneus into their old and originally intended channels, and let the streams of love and life and immortality flow into and through all. This was one of the fabled labors of Hercules, who symbolizes strength or power to accomplish that God-given power by which mankind can find its birthright. Through the strength gained by accepting and believing that God has sent His Son, the Christ Principle, the creative aspect of the Absolute, into chaos, because His force was all that was needed to awaken seemingly dead matter into life, that it might evolve toward perfection. We open the floodgates, and like Hercules, turn this river of force into the stables that are filled with man's animal passions and emotions, and the stables are cleansed. Thou shalt not kill means that you shall in no way dam up or cut off the life force. But the question Peter had to face was, Has man the right to destroy any lower form of life, either for food, self-preservation, or for the purpose of hygiene? The Hindus have carried the literal interpretation of the command, Thou shalt not kill, to its extreme limits, practically sacrificing human life in preference to that of insects and other noxious and pestiferous forms of life. Poisonous snakes, which the Hindus refuse to kill, cause the death of thousands of human beings annually. Yet it is a common sight to see these same Hindus treat their domestic animals with such cruelty that a European can scarce endure the sight of their suffering. It is known that the plague, which so frequently devastates the country with its toll millions of lives, is transmitted by rats and other rodents, and is largely made possible by the unclean condition which permits fees, lice, and other blood-sucking parasites, infesting indiscriminately the dead and the living, to flourish undisturbed, that fatal fevers are transmitted by mosquitoes, and that many other scourges of mankind can be traced to similar sources, and yet there are serious and earnest seekers after truth who ask if it is right to destroy such forms of life. There are many in this country who say they have no right to kill the disease-transmitting housefly, but who will carefully exclude it from their dwelling without a thought of the suffering poor who cannot afford screens, who are too ignorant to protect their children from flies, Hence disease and death is spread among the poor by the very flies of the well-meaning students have excluded from their own homes. As to the killing of the dumb beast, your brothers, the literal view of not killing animals for food may be a helpful step at a certain stage of spiritual growth, but later on it is well to consider a wider view of creation and the interdependence of all kingdoms. For using vegetables for food is just as much taking life as to use animals for food, Man, being a step above the lower kingdoms, owes love and helpfulness to all. The matter of what kind of food you place in your stomach, as long as it is as wholesome and satisfying, is of so little importance to spiritual growth that we give it so little attention, leaving such matters of personal preference to a common sense of each pupil. Each one, however, is responsible for the condition of all his bodies and must give them due attention, the attention necessary to keep any high-bred animal of which high-grade work is expected in good physical condition. The one essential thing is to have a strong mind and a strong body, to live in such a way that no part of the body, mind or soul, is shut off from the stream of divine life. 
will ye, for love of soul, so loathe your flesh, so scourge and maim it, that it shall not serve to bear the spirit on, searching for home? In fact, thou shalt not kill any cell, molecule, or atom in any of our bodies, hence we do not presume to lay down set rules as to diet. For spiritual growth is not a matter of what goes into the stomach, else those races who have been vegetarians for ages would be spiritual masters long ago, but of the devotion with which you live out the ideals of your heart. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. If your ideal is not to eat meat, and if you find your body and mind thrive, and if you have gained more strength, courage, and vital force, and mental power without it, then live out that ideal, and find out by the results of your life if it be best for you. Study your fellow men, and see if a purely vegetarian diet has brought to its devotees greater health of body, vigor of mind, breadth of soul, love, tolerance, and compassion. One of the objections frequently brought against meat-eating is a supposition that by eating flesh man will be taken on the passions of the animal. These are two points to be considered in this theory. All occult students know that the desire body is karma or the animal soul, and that it leaves the body at the moment of death. Hence, could not in any way be taken on by eating the flesh from which it was withdrawn. The second point is the claim commonly made by vegetarians, that by abstaining from meat their animal passions are lessened. The fact is that this result is attained simply because, by a decrease in their stamina and virility, their passions are temporarily amassed. A perfect man must be one with all his forces in full vigor, but under perfect control. To weaken his powers to such an extent that they no longer require control is taking a step backward rather than forward, for such weakened forces are only dormant, not mastered, and in some life will assert themselves with all their accumulated power and demand expression. Persons who have thus weakened their powers are very apt to think they have no passion, hence permit a feeling of superiority to grow up in them. Some time in their evolution, however, they must experience the full strength of all animal desires ere they can even begin really to conquer. But this does not mean, as taught by some schools, that it is well deliberately to arouse the passions for the sake of controlling them. It does mean that each must be in full possession of all his powers and learn to master them and make them his servants, for they are stepping stones by which he must climb. We also hear much to the effect that all masters and adepts were vegetarians, while the truth is that only those who have reached mastery from non-meat-eating races were vegetarians. Right here comes in a fact we have so often reiterated, namely, that to reach mastery each soul must live up to the light and conception of truth as revealed to him in his own religion, nation, and environment. The truth is that many, many souls have reached mastery through races that did eat meat, such as the Egyptians, the Norsemen, Celts, etc., and especially those who, living in a cold climate, subsisted almost entirely on meat, and yet reached mastery, all of whom are largely represented among the masters of the Great White Lodge. Hence the importance of a vegetarian diet in attaining mastery cannot be very great, for we cannot believe that the Elohim, having created a planet with so many differing climates, necessitating such a variety of diets, would shut out from attaining ultimate perfection all who were placed in parts of that planet where climatic conditions made animal food a necessity for life and warmth. It is the thought force put into the subject that is a great factor, namely, what thoughts you hold to what you constantly direct your mind. If you think continually of what you are not to eat, and how you are to manage without it, you are putting quite as much creative thought force upon your food as is the glutton who thinks only of what he is to eat. In both cases, the subject of food is taken out of its proper place, as anything wholesome that will properly nourish the body, and is given undue prominence, even worshipped, making those who worship its slaves to their stomachs, instead of looking upon food as the mere fuel that runs the engine. The mind cannot run constantly upon food and at the same time meditate on spiritual things or be filled with loving thoughts for the help of humanity. Instead, you are apt to divide the world into meat-eaters and non-meat-eaters. As good must evolve out of all evil, so must we gain wisdom to handle this problem, and by our thought force help make it possible for the masters of wisdom to use everything in condition, no matter how apparently evil, to bring about ultimate good. There is no such thing as death, merely various changes in form in the manifestation of the one life. Man is the result of the normal development of all the lower kingdoms. His body contains all the elements, mineral, vegetable, and animal. This fact alone shows that man has absorbed and transmuted all the lower kingdoms and has thereby raised them into a higher expression of the one self. 
Hence the atoms of the mineral, vegetable, and animal kingdom, which have been swallowed up by man, have thereby reached the fullness of life expression, just as a man must be swallowed up, and from one viewpoint be killed and absorbed, into the spiritualized being who shall be more than man. The mineral is killed and eaten, or absorbed from the earth, and its form of life expression destroyed, that the vegetable may live. The vegetable is killed and eaten, or absorbed, that the animal may live. And the animal gives up its life for man, just as the lower personal man gives up his life for the spiritual man. Every form of life is born into the environment where its natural prey, food, is found. If you reject the teaching of the evolution of the one life through the sacrifice of the lower form, then in despair you must agree with the dictum of certain scientists who declare the world to be but a monstrous, charnel house. In each instance, however, it is the mere physical expression of the one life that is altered, for it is not cut off from the stream of life force, but is brought into contact with a higher and more perfect expression of that force, and hence cannot be said to be killed. It is much as though a plant, having outgrown a confining pot, was transplanted into a larger one, where it would have greater freedom and could express a greater amount of life force, or is like a tadpole absorbed and transmuted into a frog. This is the true meaning of the Mosaic Law, a life for a life, exchanging a lower form of life for a higher, so commonly misinterpreted in favor of capital punishment. Jesus expressed the same truth when he said, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. For the seed must be killed or give up its form of life and be absorbed and transmuted ere the higher form of expression can evolve. This is the scheme of evolution, as it would be if there were no sin and no disobedience to the law. If love prevailed, evolution would be but one continued sacrifice of the lower form of the one life to the next higher, that the more highly evolved form might express to a greater degree the one life. But man's disobedience to his divine guidance has brought cruelty and suffering into the world, so that all creation groaneth and travaileth together. That is, all creation, whose end and aims is to give birth to, and to bring to perfection spiritual beings now brings forth in pain and anguish, where it should bring forth in joy and thanksgiving. Now everything preys upon something instead of yielding itself a glad sacrifice to the next higher form. If no life were taken in cruelty, it would naturally and without pain give up its life current, that it might be turned into a higher and more advanced channel of expression. If this did not take place, evolution would cease, and the life wave could not lift the mineral into the animal kingdom, nor the vegetable into the animal, the animal into the human, or the human into the divine. Through man's selfishness and unbrotherliness, there is enmity and lack of understanding between man and all the lower kingdoms, which can only be remedied by love and wisdom. For instance, if meat-eating were abolished, would that overcome enmity and cruelty? Such change must come from a change in man's attitude toward life, from within, from the heart, and not from any outward act or the mere abstaining from an act. At present man is swayed mainly through his love of gain. As long as the flesh of animals has a commercial value and commands a higher price, when the animal is improved in quality, well cared for, well fed and sheltered, man will go on improving conditions for the animal, and thus perfecting and advancing it in evolution far more rapidly than ages of wild life could accomplish even though he does this merely because he finds it to his financial advantage. All these factors are utilized by the masters of wisdom who are guiding evolution, to give a decided impetus upward to the evolution of the animal kingdom. For the animals must reach a state of perfection as animals ere the wave of evolution could sweep them into the next higher kingdom. On the other hand, if animals had no commercial value, they would receive no attention from man, would be allowed to run wild, would be cruelly hunted for sport, killed off to rid the fields of them, and many starved or frozen in the winter. Thus it would take many, many more lives as animals ere they learned all the lessons and reached perfection as animals. For even the animals must learn the lessons of love and brotherhood, with man in all kingdoms, ere they are done with their experience as animals, and these lessons they must learn from man. The mere killing, which is but a momentary pang, does not cause a thousandth part of the suffering experienced in a wild and neglected state. The slow dying of starvation, the being torn to pieces by other animals, or put to death by their own kind, as happens to the old, the sick, or disabled among most animals. Another objection to meat-eating is the brutalizing effect the killing has upon the butchers. This is indeed a serious question, but those who are butchers today are also evolving, and are today a step above their former incarnations, in which they may have been human butchers, that is, the executioners, inquisitors, or the hired assassins so common in former ages. 
By the time there are no more souls who need such an environment in which to learn their lessons and evolve, there will be no more need of butchers, for the great law never places a soul in an environment that is not needed for its further evolution. In protecting himself against mosquitoes, flies, and other noxious insects, man has the right to sacrifice their form of life for all lower forms of life which prey upon or work injury to man are the result of man's abuse of the life force. Hence, he has the right to make the life force manifest through other forms which will be helpful to the race. Therefore, when you destroy these lower forms, hold the thought that their life force shall manifest through forms that shall be helpful and not inimical to man. It is not true brotherhood merely to drive them away from you to prey upon your less fortunate brothers and sisters. At no point in evolution, however, has any form of life the right to take the life of its kind, for by so doing it could not fulfill the law of compensation by raising it to a higher stage of evolution. Nor would any form do this did not man send forth murderous thoughts and emanations. This applies even to the poisonous weed which chokes out the life of the flower beside it, to the forms of life which devour their young and their kind. For in such cases, instead of being raised to a higher step, they have to repeat the same step again. But it does not apply to those forms of fish and animal life which prey upon less evolved forms of their own kind. The whole keynote of the universe is love, and as long as man sends out the reverse of love, or in harmony, death instead of life must result. However, the plea of advancing evolution cannot be used to excuse or palliate the taking of life for sport or vanity. Man has no right to assume the responsibility of changing a form of life unless conditions have proved that the sacrifice of the lower form is necessary for the life or best good of a higher form mankind. To kill animals for amusement, or to kill birds for their plumage, that it may add to the vanity of women, or to foster the state of mind which cannot see anything beautiful or uplifting in the song of birds, or the gambols of a young animal, the sight of which only arouses the desire to kill, is not only pushing man back to the level of wild beast, but because it is not transmuted into the higher form, is retarding the evolution of the stream of life force, and is spreading enmity toward man among the lower kingdoms. It also dams up love and compassion in his heart and prevents his spiritual evolution. This is killing in the full sense of the term. Man is a free will agent and can choose his own path, but certain it is that ultimately love and harmony must prevail, else man fails to do his duty to the lower kingdoms by failing to put the imprint of love and brotherhood upon them, for all forms must evolve together. Man is responsible for the lower kingdom, thus do his duty by them and help them to take their next step in evolution, for he has reached a point in evolution where he must consciously become a co-worker with the forces of evolution, must recognize, correlate with, and begin to use the great creative Christ principle, which is the one way, the truth, and the life, by which alone evolution can reach its ultimate perfection. If man fails to do this, he stops his own evolution, for he cannot expect to receive from the kingdoms above him that love and help which he withholds from the kingdom below him. Man will never lay down the tasks of aiding the lower kingdoms until all are lifted up and redeemed through divine love. There is always an inner or esoteric truth beneath every phase of life, for all things work together for good, even man's mistakes being utilized. All steps are necessary to make up the ladder. The vices of men become steps in the ladder one by one as they are surmounted. Wisdom seeks deep in the mysteries of life, being for the germ of good beneath every outward seeming air condemning anything. Seek it the way, by testing all experience, by utilizing the senses, in order to understand the growth and meaning of individuality, and the beauty and obscurity of those other divine fragments which are struggling side by side with you, and form the race to which you belong. Do not condemn anything but cruelty, impurity, and want of tolerance and brotherly love. Cultivate love and tolerance for all your brethren, and avoid the thought that your way or your view is superior, or is in any way better than another's except for yourself. Above all, avoid the spiritual pride that results from the thought that because you do not or do eat meat, fletcherize your food, eat raw foods, follow a particular dietary or bathe in a particular fashion, you are holier than your brothers who do differently. For there is no one thing that holds back soul growth more, that is more subtle or is harder to overcome than spiritual pride. Thou shalt not kill means then, that thou shalt not do anything to retard evolution on any plane, to shut away any portion of the universe from the universal life force, to foster separateness, or to retard the spread of brotherhood, harmony, and unity on all planes. In the light on the path we read, Each man is to himself absolutely the way, the truth, and the life, 
And Master Jesus said, speaking of the Christ within, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. These two texts have literally the same meaning. The letter I is formed by a straight line which geometrically represents the Christ principle descending into matter. Hence it is this life-giving force or principle which is the way, the truth, and the life. But as each one manifests this in his life, he can individually become the I, meaning, however, not the human personal self, which is matter, but the animating principle of deity manifesting through him. Therefore, from this standpoint, each one must take upon himself the responsibility of becoming the way, the truth, and the life. Not only for himself, but by his life, his influence and example, because he stands upon what is at present the crest of the wave of evolution on this planet, for all the kingdoms below him, as well as for all his fellow beings, for the way and the truth is unity or the one life, as above, so below. Therefore, as to diet, we lay down no set rules, we only state principles. Let each pupil take the matter of meat-eating into the silence, and find out the best way for him to attain the above-mentioned end. And we feel sure that after that he has wrestled with the question conscientiously, and has found the many differences and the many apparent contradictions which must be reconciled and blended ere this oneness with all can be even approximately attained, there will grow up in his heart such a tolerance and patience with all his fellow students, whom he can plainly see are seeing the same end. There will be no condemnation possible. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. The instant any soul reaches this point where he recognizes the unity of all, and the diversity of methods by which all are seeking unity, he can but reflect in his life and conversation the illuminating power of the divine Christ love, and will then become an avenue through which this creative life stream must flow to all humanity. Chapter 33 Prayer of Consecration the following mantra are specially given by the Masters of Wisdom as a link to bind all disciples into one great unified body. You are requested to repeat them with morning, noon, and night, keeping in mind the ideas given in the explanation below and trying to realize their meaning in your daily life. The power or prayers or mantra to harmonize the mind and body and bring about suitable conditions for spiritual communications has been recognized in all countries and all ages sound being the most potent and effectual magic agent, and the first of the keys which open the doors of communication between mortals and immortals. To pronounce a word is to evoke a thought, and make it present. The magnetic potency of human speech is the commencement of every manifestation in the occult world. Verse We, recognizing the omnipotent power of the great creative force, do make most solemn covenant to present our whole selves, our bodies, our minds, our souls, a living sacrifice to Thee. We yield all personal desires unto the one great desire, to be used as instruments to create a center through which the Lodge can work. Recognizing the oneness of Thy all-pervading force, we give back to Thee, for Thy use, all that we possess. And by the power of the living Christ, demand that all obstacles be removed, and Thy work be speedily established in perfect justice. These mantra, while apparently but affirmations, nevertheless contain the spirit of true prayer, for all prayer is but a recognition of the one life, the great universal creative force. This force is love in its highest conception, and it is with this conception of love as being one with the creative energy of the great breath of Brahman that we desire our students to identify themselves. It is also the force that is meant in the passage, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, just as the physical sun sends its force into the heart of the seed, and by breaking up its confining sheath or shell utterly transforms it and causes it to grow into a plant, a flower, or a tree, so this force of divine love pours out its power upon the immortal seed within our hearts. It is the Son of God come to earth that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is that which is created from the father-mother principle and sent into the world to redeem it. A true conception of this great truth confronts every neophyte at the threshold. He must recognize this force and correlate its inner meaning within his own heart. This is the step so often spoken of as, Know thyself, or present yourself a living sacrifice, your bodies, mind, and soul. That is, seek for and find this stream of divine creative energy, an unbroken thread binding and holding body, mind, and soul to the Son of the Father Mother. For this force is the creative aspect of your higher soul. Such a conception alone of the love principle can bring redemption. Without this redemption and a comprehension of what is meant by divine love, 
the student, no matter how much occult theory, fact, or knowledge he may store up, will still wander in outer darkness and never find or recognize his father's face. Once grasp this truth with soul knowledge, not mere intellect, and you will find that you have a hole in your father's hand, and nothing can ever separate you from him. For the Comforter has come who will abide with you forever. Thus will you find the key that unlocks all mysteries, that overcomes sickness and conquers death, and that will ultimately place your feet upon the highest mount of attainment. This is the center that each disciple must find within his own heart, yea, within his own body, that he may realize how this creative force works within himself. Having found it, let him purify the center and sanctify it to the work of the masters, and pour out its force into the great center which the masters of wisdom are forming upon the earth plane. This is the only way to prepare for the coming avatar, all who use this force wisely, with an understanding of its tremendous power and how it works in and through humanity, are doing their part to prepare a place for the avatar to manifest. This force verily is God or the devil according to its use or misuse. Special Concentration Hours We request that all pupils who earnestly desire to cooperate in this movement, or who have the success of this order at heart, to pause for a moment each day upon the stroke of noon and send a vital creative thought of love to the Creator, that it may be perfected in purity and power to accomplish its great mission for humanity. This should not interfere with your daily activities, for you have only to turn mentally to this center and say, In the name of the living Christ may the heart center of the order of the fifteen be preserved as pure channel through which divine love, life, and wisdom may manifest. May increasing power be given to it to accomplish its great work for humanity. When repeating this prayer, realize that the heart center includes more than those personalities at the center who are engaged in the work of the order, for the heart center of every movement includes the heart love of every member, no matter where they may be. Hence your loving thoughts directed toward helping the order will form a magic chain uniting all true members in love. It will also create a vortex into which there will irresistibly be drawn the positive force of the divine. Do not try to make the time coincide with the local hour in Los Angeles. Take the time of your own locality, for as we have pupils in all parts of the world, the repetition of this prayer at noon will make a continuous stream of force pouring into the center unceasingly. To come into close vital touch with this order, each pupil should set apart at least 15 minutes, 30 if possible, every Sunday evening at 8.30, during which the effort should be made to correlate with the special meeting held at the center at time. At that time, each should repeat, either aloud or mentally, the prayer of consecration and the healing prayer, and concentrate on coming to the center in thought, realizing at this time the Master is in the midst of his children, that his love includes all, no matter how distant, that at this time especially he is gathering all together to bless them, and that the streams of love and healing power are going out over the lines of force which connect each pupil with his center. Over these lines of force the pupils on their part should send their love and help and a strong will that this movement shall lack for nothing, either spiritually or materially, to make it a powerful factor on all planes to help humanity. While the helpful forces are sent out to all alike, nevertheless, those who thus consciously correlate with them, and who give of their substance, which includes their love and earnest desire to help on all planes, will receive an exact proportion to the earnestness and devotion they express. For by their desire to become co-workers in this movement for the uplifting of humanity, they are literally merging themselves into oneness with the streams of living force poured out by the Lodge to this order. For their desires are creative and will bring forth after their kind. If any find it impossible to be alone at this time, let them at least send us a strong thought of loving help, even if they are in the midst of a crowd. The secretary would be glad to know of any experiences the pupils may have in correlating with the center in this service. Chapter 34 The Meaning of the Symbol The symbol of an order is its standard or flag. It symbolizes both its source, its object, and its policy, and sets the standard by which it must be judged. Hence it is important that persons belonging to or coming in touch with any order of movement should understand something of the emblem by which it is known on the higher planes. The seal. This seal, like all true symbols, has many shades of interpretation, all of which are included in the figure and can be applied to various conditions. These shades of meanings are applications suitable to various conditions and circumstances rather than contradictions. We will take it, however, as the seal of the Order of the Fifteen, and endeavor to point out not only its meaning, but also how it can be made a positive help to all who are striving to reach the goal of spiritual attainment over the path marked out by this order. The seal consists of a double triangle inscribed in a circle, with an open eye in the center and three five-pointed stars in the spaces between the sides of the triangle and the circle. The circle represents boundless space and limitless time and eternity. 
It marks off the space in which creation takes place, or the circle formed by the down point of the great creative force, in this case the circumference within which this order is working. It is much like the circle of light projected by a magic lantern, with it when the pictures are to appear. In one sense, it is the circle of the zodiac, the pathway of our solar system, from the twelve gates of houses of which issues the radiant light of the crystals, represented as focused in the center of the open eye. In another sense, the circle is the ring pass not, or the limit of the auric zone, which every true disciple should put around himself, and whose gates, corresponding to the centers of the body, he must open and close at will to admit or exclude that which he chooses. Thus the all-seen eye, the absolute, sheds its sevenfold creative rays within its creation. In case of the ring pass not, the eye is the divine flame, or the Christ force within each heart. In this order it is the sacred altar upon which burns the eternal flame of spiritual light, from whose illuminating rays emanate the inspired teaching. The triangle symbolizes the Trinity, and is the universal symbol of deity, the three aspects of the Logos, whether taken as the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost of the Christians, the Osiris, Isis, and Horus of the Egyptians, or the more ancient Father, Mother, Son. The apex of the triangle represents the dual creative force of the Logos, separating into its positive and negative rays. The Mother, Isis, or the Holy Ghost, and the right-hand line from the Father, Osiris, these two send out their forces to form the baseline, Horus, the Son, the Christ principle poured forth and raining down upon the lower world, to manifest in all kingdoms as the great creative principle which shall redeem it. As used in this seal, the triangle is composed of two sets of lines, representing either the masculine and feminine forces, or involution and evolution. The inner line, the feminine, also stands for intuition and love, while the outer line represents intellect and wisdom. The spaces between the lines represent the three planes of manifestation, physical, mental, and spiritual. Just as it is impossible to draw an equilateral triangle within a circle without leaving three spaces, so it is impossible for the Trinity to express itself within the circle of manifestation without manifesting the three worlds. Hence, these three spaces symbolize the three worlds or three states of consciousness. Within each of these three spaces there is a five-pointed star representing man with his five senses and five extremities, hands, feet, head. The symbol represents man as existing upon the three planes of manifestation and using his five senses in each of the three states of consciousness. A man using his five senses on three planes of manifestation makes the number 15, also 1 plus 5 equals 6, thus announcing through the symbol that this order is a sixth race movement and that only by teaching man to use his five senses on all three planes can he prepare for the sixth great race. As six is a number of the Christ, man five plus divinity one, it symbolizes that this movement is another attempt to bring the teaching of the Christ to humanity. In other words, the symbol should inspire man to stand erect, and with all his known faculties illumined by the light of truth, fearlessly penetrate into the mysteries of this being. The motto. The motto of the order is, Dare, do, keep silent. Hence this must be the measure of its work. These words being placed between the double lines of the triangle show how man can conquer the three planes of consciousness. He must dare to penetrate into the deeper mysteries of life, dare to follow the guidance of his Father in heaven, and dare to face himself, and live up to his highest ideals without regard to the opinions of his friends or enemies. He must do the will of his higher self and manifest it in his daily life. He must do with all his heart the duty that his hands find to do, the duty that lies nearest, and do unto others as he would they should do unto him. He should keep silent concerning the sacred experiences of his inner life when among those who cannot understand, should keep silent concerning his own attainment, also when tempted to criticize others. Keep silent also has reference to that silent hush of the physical and mental activities that must come ere the higher centers can catch and transmit the vibrations from the higher plane. These words form the triple key that will unlock for man the doors of his inner consciousness and enable him to function on all planes and master all states of consciousness. Taking the seal in its entirety, it shows to an initiate that this order is put forth by the Lodge to help man, through the use of his five known senses on all planes, to unfold his higher or unknown faculties and reach up to the divine. Many students of the higher life are striving to unfold and use their six and seven senses before they have learned to use their five known senses on all planes. 
If such a thing were possible, it would make a gap in their evolution which nothing could bridge, and they would sooner or later find themselves plunged into the depth of error. The whole, being inscribed in a circle representing limitless time and eternity, shows that the symbol is active within this cycle of manifestation, moreover that it is intended as a direct preparation for the sixth great race. Prayers Prayers of the Order of Christian Mystics The Prayer for Light O Christ, light thou within my heart, the flame of divine love and wisdom, that I may dwell forever in the radiance of thy countenance and rest in the light of thy smile. Morning Prayer I have within me the power of the Christ. I can conquer all that comes to me today. I am strong enough to bear every trial and accept every joy, and to say, Thy will be done. Healing Prayer O Thou loving and helpful Master Jesus, Thou who gavest to Thy disciples power to heal the sick, we, recognizing Thee and realizing Thy divine presence with us, ask Thee to lay Thy hands upon us in healing love. Cleanse us from all our sins, and by the divine power of omnipotent life, drive out the atoms of inharmony and disease, and fill our bodies full to overflowing with life, love, and purity. Prayer of Protection O Christ, surround and fill me in thy order with the flame of divine love and wisdom, that it may purify, illumine, and guide us in all things. May its spiritual fire form a rampart of living flame around me in thy order, to protect us from all harm. May it radiate to every heart, consuming all evil and intensifying all good. In the name of the living Christ. Amen. Prayer of Demonstration I am a child of the living God. I have within me the all-creating power of the Christ. It radiates from me and blesses all I contact. It is my health, my strength, my courage, my patience, my peace, my poise, my power, my wisdom, my understanding, my joy, my inspiration, and my abundant supply. Unto this great power I entrust all my problems, knowing they will be solved in love and justice. O Lord Christ, I have laid upon thy altar all my wants and desires. I know thy love, thy wisdom, thy power, and thy graciousness. In thee I peacefully rest, knowing that all is well. For thy will is my will. Amen. Prayer to the Divine Indweller Come, O Lord of life and love and beauty, thou who art myself and yet art God, and dwell in this body of flesh radiating all the beauty of holiness and perfection, that the flesh may outpicture all that thou art within. Even so, come, O Lord. Amen. Prayer to the Divine Mother O Divine Mother, illumine me with divine wisdom. Vivify me with divine life and purify me with divine love, that in all I think and say and do I may be more and more thy child. Amen. Grace Before Meals I am a creator. By the will of my spiritualized will I consciously gather all the forces from this food and use them to create food, health, strength, and harmony in all my bodies, physical, astral, and mental. Prayer of Devotion We, thy chosen servants, to whom thou hast given the great privilege of becoming co-workers with the masters of wisdom, ask that we may have wisdom and power and courage and humility to carry us through the work of this day. We open our hearts that the divine love of the masters may fill us, that all irritation, inharmony, and slothfulness may be transmuted into love, that shall draw us closer in unity to all our fellow workers both seen and unseen, that we may grow absolutely one with the force of wisdom and compassion that is sent forth to accomplish the great work for humanity. Give us all things necessary, that there may be no hampering conditions. Lead us through this day, in the name of the divine everlasting Christ, that the will of the Father may be done in us and through us forevermore. Amen. Prayer for World Harmony Glory and honor and worship be unto thee, O Lord Christ, thou who art the life and light of all mankind. Thou art the King of glory to whom all peoples of the earth should give joyful allegiance and service. 
inspire mankind with the realization of true brotherhood, teach us the wisdom of peace, harmony, and cooperation, breathe into our hearts the understanding that only as we see ourselves as parts of the one body of humanity can peace, harmony, success, and plenty descend upon us. Help us to conquer all manifestations of inharmony and evil in ourselves and in the world. May all persons and classes and nations cease their conflicts and unselfishly strive for peace and goodwill, that the days of tribulation may be shortened. Bless us all with the radiance of thy divine love and wisdom, that we may ever worship thee in the beauty of holiness. In the name of the living Christ we ask it. Amen. Prayer for the Christ Power O Lord Christ, Thou who hast planted within me the immortal power of spiritual love and life, help me so to correlate with Thy divine overshadowing presence that all hampering conditions shall be swallowed up in the light of the living Christ power. Amen. Evening Prayer As the physical sun disappears from our sight, may the spiritual sun arise in our hearts illumine our minds, and shed its radiant blessings upon all we contact.